Daenerys. Her Dothraki scouts had told her how it was, but Dany wanted to see for herself. Sir Jorah Mormont rode with her through a birchwood forest and up a slanting sandstone ridge. Near enough, he warned her at the crest. Dany reined in her mare and looked across the fields to where the Yunkish host lay athwart her path. Whitebeard had been teaching her how best to count the numbers of a foe. Five thousand, she said after a moment. I'd say so, said Jorah pointed. Those are cell swords on the flanks, lances and mounted bowmen, with swords and axes for the close work. The second sons on the left wing, the storm crows to the right. About five hundred men apiece. See the banners? Young Kai's harpy grasped a whip and iron collar in her talons instead of a length of chain, but the soul swords flew their own standards beneath those of the city they served. On the right, four crows between crossed thunderbolts, on the left, a broken sword. The Young Kai hold the center themselves, Denny noted. Their officers looked indistinguishable from Astapor's at a distance. Tall, bright helms and cloaks sewn with flashing copper discs. Are those slave soldiers they lead? In large part, but not the equal of Unsullied. Yunkai is known for training bed slaves, not warriors. What say you? Can we defeat this army? Easily, Sir Jorah said. But not bloodlessly. Blood aplenty had soaked into the bricks of Astapor the day that city fell, though little of it belonged to her or hers. We might win a battle here, but at such cost we cannot take the city. That is ever a risk, Khaleesi. Astapor was complacent and vulnerable. Yunkai is forewarned. Dany considered. The slaver host seemed small compared to our own numbers, but the sellswords were a horse. She had ridden too long with Dothraki not to have a healthy respect for what mounted warriors could do to foot. The unsullied could withstand their charge, but my freedmen will be slaughtered. The slavers like to talk, she said. Send word that I will hear them this evening in my tent, and invite the captains of the soul-sword companies to call on me as well, but not together. The storm crows at midday, the second sun's two hours later. As you wish, Sir Jorah said. But if they do not come, they'll come. They will be curious to see the dragons and hear what I might have to say and the clever ones will see it for a chance to gauge my strength. She wheeled her silver mare about. I'll await them in my pavilion. Slate skies and brisk winds saw Dany back to her host. The deep ditch that would encircle her camp was already half dug, and the woods were full of unsullied lopping branches off birch trees to sharpen into stakes. The eunuchs could not sleep in an unfortified camp, or so Grey Worm insisted. He was there watching the work. Dany halted a moment to speak with him. Yunkai has girded up her loins for battle. This is good, your grace. These ones thirst for blood. When she had commanded the unsullied to choose officers from amongst themselves, Grey Worm had been their overwhelming choice for the highest rank. Dany had put Ser Jorah over him to train him for command, and the exile knight said that so far the young eunuch was hard but fair, quick to learn, tireless, and utterly unrelenting in his attention to detail. The wise masters have assembled a slave army to meet us. A slave in Yunkai learns the way of seven sighs and the sixteen seats of pleasure, your grace. The unsullied learn the way of the three spears. Your grey worm hopes to show you. One of the first things Dany had done after the fall of Astapor was abolish the custom of giving the unsullied new slave names every day. Most of those born free had returned to their birth names, those who still remembered them at least. Others had called themselves after heroes or gods, and sometimes weapons, gems, and even flowers, which resulted in soldiers with some very peculiar names. To Dany's ears, Grey Worm had remained Grey Worm. When she asked him why, he said, It is a lucky name. The name this one was born to was accursed. That was the name he had when he was taken for a slave. But Grey Worm is the name this one drew the day Daenerys Stormborn set him free. If battle is joined, let Grey Worm show wisdom as well as valor, Denny told him. Spare any slave who runs or throws down his weapon. The few are slain, the more remain to join us after. This one will remember. I know he will. Be at my tent by midday. I want you there with my other officers when I treat with the sellsword captains. 
Danny spurred her silver onto Kemp. Within the perimeter the Unsullied had established, the tents were going up in orderly rows, with their own tall golden pavilion at the center. A second encampment lay close beyond her own, five times the size, sprawling and chaotic. This second camp had no ditches, no tents, no sentries, no horse lines. Those who had horses or mules slept beside them, for fear they might be stolen. Goats, sheep, and half-starved dogs wandered freely amongst hordes of women, children, and old men. Danny had left Astapor in the hands of a council of former slaves, led by a healer, a scholar, and a priest. Wise men all, she thought, and just. Yet even so, tens of thousands preferred to follow her to Yunkai, rather than remain behind in Astapor. I gave them the city, and most of them were too frightened to take it. The raggle-taggle host of freedmen dwarfed her own, but they were more burdened than benefit. Perhaps one in a hundred had a donkey, a camel, or an ox. Most carried weapons looted from some slaver's armory. But only one in ten was strong enough to fight, and none was trained. They ate the land bare as they passed, like locusts in sandals. Yet Dany could not bring herself to abandon them, as Sir Jorah and her blood-biders urged. I told them they were free. I cannot tell them now they are not free to join me. She gazed at the smoke rising from their cook-fires and swallowed a sigh. She might have the best foot-soldiers in the world, but she also had the worst. Arstan Whitebeard stood outside the entrance of her tent, while strong Belwas sat cross-legged on the grass nearby, eating a bowl of figs. On the march the duty of guarding her fell upon their shoulders. She had made Jogo, Ago, and Rokaro her coes, as well as her blood-riders, and just now she needed them more to command her Dothraki than to protect her person. Her colossar was tiny, some thirty-odd mounted warriors, and most of them braidless boys and bent-back old men. Yet they were all the horse she had, and she dared not go without them. The unsullied might be the finest infantry in all the world, as Sir Jorah claimed, but she needed scouts and outriders as well. Yunkai will have war, Dinny told Whitebeard inside the pavilion. Eri and Jiki had covered the floor with carpets, while Masandi lit a stick of incense to sweeten the dusty air. Drogon and Regal were asleep atop some cushions curled about each other, but Viserion perched on the edge of her empty bath. Masandi, what language will these Yunkai speak? Valyrian? Yes, Your Grace, the child said, a different dialect than Astapor's, yet close enough to understand. The slavers name themselves the Wise Masters. Wise? Dany sat cross-legged on a cushion, and Viserion spread his white and gold wings and flapped to her side. We shall see how wise they are, she said, as she scratched the dragon's scaly head behind the horns. Sir Jorah Mormont returned an hour later, accompanied by three captains of the Stormcrows. They wore black feathers on their polished helms, and claimed to be all equal in honor and authority. Dany studied them as Eri and Jiki poured the wine. Prendal Nagizen was a thick-set Giscari, with a broad face and dark hair going gray. Salor the Bald had a twisting scar across his pale Carthine cheek, and Daario Naharis was flamboyant even for a Tarashi. His beard was cut into three prongs and dyed blue, the same color as his eyes and the curly hair that fell to his collar. His pointed mustachios were painted gold. His clothes were all shades of yellow, a foam of mirish lace, the color of butter spilled from his collar and cuffs. His doublet was sewn with brass medallions in the shape of dandelions, and ornamental gold work crawled up his high leather boots to his thighs. Gloves of soft yellow suede were tucked into a belt of gilded rings, and his fingernails were enameled blue. But it was Prendal Nargesin who spoke for the sellswords. "'You would do well to take your rabble elsewhere,' he said. "'You took Astapor by treachery, but Yunkai shall not fall so easily.' Five hundred of your storm-crows, against ten thousand of my unsullied,' said Dany. "'I am only a young girl, and do not understand the ways of war, yet these odds seem poor to me.' "'The storm-crows do not stand alone,' said Prendal. "'Storm-crows do not stand at all. They fly, at the first sign of thunder. Perhaps you should be flying now. I have heard that sell-swords are notoriously unfaithful.' 
What will it avail you to be staunch when the second sons change sides? That will not happen, Prendall insisted, unmoved. And if it did, it would not matter. The second sons are nothing. We fight beside the stalwart men of Yunkai. You fight beside bed boys, armed with spears. When she turned her head, the twin bells in her braid rang softly. Once battle is joined, do not think to ask for quarter. Join me now, however, and you shall keep the gold the Yunkai paid you and claim a share of the plunder besides, with greater rewards later when I come into my kingdom. Fight for the wise masters, and your wages will be death. Do you imagine that Yunkai will open its gates when my unsullied are butchering you beneath the walls? Woman, you bray like an ass and make no more sense. Woman, she chuckled, is that meant to insult me? I would return the slap if I took you for a man. Dany met his stare. I am Daenerys Stormborn of House Targaryen, the unburnt mother of dragons, Khaleesi to Drogo's riders, and Queen of the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. What you are, said Prendal Nagesin, is a horse lord's whore. When we break you, I will breed you to my stallion. Strong Belwas drew his arrack. Strong Belwas will give his ugly tongue to the little queen if she likes. No, Belwas. I have given these men my safe conduct. She smiled. Tell me this. Are the storm crows slave or free? We are a brotherhood of free men, Salor declared. Good. Then he stood. Go back and tell your brothers what I said, then. It may be that some of them would sooner sup on gold and glory than on death. I shall want your answer on the morrow. The Stormcrow captains rose in unison. Our answer is no, said Prendal Nagesin. His fellows followed him out of the tent. But the Ario Naharis glanced back as he left and inclined his head in polite farewell. Two hours later, the commander of the Second Sons arrived alone. He proved to be a towering bravosi, with pale green eyes and a bushy red-gold beard that reached nearly to his belt. His name was Miro, but he called himself the Titan's Bastard. Miro tossed down his wine straight away, wiped his mouth with the back of his hand, and leered at Dany. I believe I fucked your twin sister in a pleasure house back home. What was it you? I think not. I would remember a man of such magnificence, I have no doubt. Yes, that is so. No woman has ever forgotten the titan's bastard. The bravosi held out his cup to Jicky. What say you take those clothes off and come sit on my lap? If you please me, I might bring the second sons over to your side. If you bring the second sons over to my side, I might not have you gelded. The big man laughed. Little girl, another woman once tried to geld me with her teeth. She has no teeth now, but my sword is as long and thick as ever. Shall I take it out and show you? No need. After my eunuchs cut it off, I can examine it at my leisure. Danny took a sip of wine. It is true that I am only a young girl and do not know the ways of war. Explain to me how you propose to defeat ten thousand unsullied with your five hundred... Innocent as I am, these odds seem poor to me. The second sons have faced worse odds and won. The second sons have faced worse odds and run. At Kohor, when the three thousand made their stand, or do you deny it? That was many and more years ago, before the second sons were led by the titan's bastard. So it is from you they get their courage. Then he turned to Sir Jorah. When the battle is joined, kill this one first. The exile knight smiled. Gladly, Your Grace. Of course, she said to Miro, you could run again. We will not stop you. Take your yunkish gold and go. Had you ever seen the titan of Bravo's foolish girl, you would know that it has no tail to turn. Then stay and fight for me. You are worth fighting for, it is true, the Bravosi said, and I would gladly that you kiss my sword if I were free. But I have taken Yunkai's coin and pledged my holy word. Coins can be returned, she said. I will pay you as much and more. I have other cities to conquer, and a whole kingdom awaiting me half a world away. Serve me faithfully, and the second sons need never seek higher again. 
The bravosi tugged on his thick red beard. As much and more, and perhaps a kiss besides, eh? Or more than a kiss, for a man as magnificent as me? Perhaps. I will like the taste of your tongue, I think. She could sense Sir Jorah's anger. My black bear does not like this talk of kissing. Think on what I've said tonight. Can I have your answer on the morrow? You can, the titan's bastard grinned. Can I have a flagon of this fine wine to take back to my captains? You may have a ton. It is from the cellars of the good masters of Astapor, and I have wagons full of it. Then give me a wagon, a token of your good regard. You have a big thirst. I am big all over, and I have many brothers. The titan's bastard does not drink alone, Khaleesi. A wagon it is, if you promise to drink to my health. Done, he boomed. And done and done. Three toasts will drink you and bring you an answer when the sun comes up. But when Miro was gone, Arstan Whitebeard said, That one has an evil reputation, even in Westeros. Do not be misled by his manner, your grace. He will drink three toasts to your health tonight and rape you on the morrow. The old man's right for once, said Jorah said. The second sons are an old company and not without valor. But under Miro they've turned near as bad as the brave companions. The man is as dangerous to his employers as to his foes. That's why you find him out here. None of the free cities will hire him any longer. It is not his reputation that I want. It's his five hundred horse. What of the storm crows? Is there any hope there? No, Sir Jorah said bluntly. That Prendal is Giscari by blood. Likely he had kin in Astapor. A pity. Well, perhaps we will not need to fight. Let us wait and hear what the Yunkai have to say. The envoys from Yunkai arrived as the sun was going down. Fifty men on magnificent black horses, and one on a great white camel. Their helms were twice as tall as their heads, so as not to crush the bizarre twists and towers and shapes of their oiled hair beneath. They dyed their linen skirts and tunics a deep yellow, and sewed copper discs to their cloaks. The man on the white camel named himself Grazdan Moeraz. Lean and hard, he had a white smile such as Krasnus had worn until Drogon burned off his face. His hair was drawn up in a unicorn's horn that jutted from his brow, and his tokar was fringed with golden mirish lace. "'Ancient and glorious is Yunkai, the queen of cities,' he said when Dany welcomed him to her tent. Our walls are strong, our nobles proud and fierce, our common folk without fear. Ours is the blood of ancient geese, whose empire was old when Valyria was yet a squalling child. You were wise to sit and speak, Khaleesi. You shall find no easy conquest here. Good. My unsullied will relish a bit of a fight. She looked to Grey Worm, who nodded. Grasdan shrugged expansively. If blood is what you wish, let it flow. I am told you have freed your eunuchs. Freedom means as much to an unsullied as a hat to a haddock. He smiled at Grey Worm, but the eunuch might have been made of stone. Those who survive we shall enslave again, and use to retake Astapor from the rabble. We can make a slave of you as well, do not doubt it. There are pleasure houses in Lys and Tirosh, where men would pay handsomely to bed the last Targaryen. It is good to see you know who I am, said Dany mildly. I pride myself on my knowledge of the savage, senseless West. Grasdan spread his hands, a gesture of conciliation. And yet why should we speak thus harshly to one another? It is true that you committed savageries in Astapor, but we Yunkai are a most forgiving people. Your quarrel is not with us, your grace. Why squander your strength against our mighty walls when you will need every man to regain your father's throne in far Westeros? Young Kai wishes you only well in that endeavor. And to prove the truth of that, I have brought you a gift. He clapped his hands, and two of his escort came forward, bearing a heavy cedar chest bound in bronze and gold. They set it at her feet. Fifty thousand golden marks, Grasdan said smoothly. Yours, as a gesture of friendship from the wise masters of Yunkai. Gold given freely is better than plunder bought with blood, surely? 
So I say to you, Daenerys Targaryen, take this chest and go. Danny pushed open the lid of the chest with a small slippered foot. It was full of gold coins, just as the envoy said. She grabbed a handful and let them run through her fingers. They shone brightly as they tumbled and fell, new-minted, most of them, stamped with a stepped pyramid on one face and the harpy of geese on the other. Very pretty. I wonder how many chests like this I shall find when I take your city. He chuckled. None. For that you shall never do. I have a gift for you as well. She slammed the chest shut. Three days. On the morning of the third day, send out your slaves. All of them. Every man, woman, and child shall be given a weapon, and as much food, clothing, coin, and goods as he or she can carry. These they shall be allowed to choose freely from among their master's possessions, as payment for the years of servitude. When all the slaves have departed, you will open your gates, and allow my unsullied to enter and search your city, to make certain none remain in bondage. If you do this, Yunkai will not be burned or plundered, and none of your people shall be molested. The wise masters will have the peace they desire, and will have proved themselves wise indeed. What say you? I say you are mad. Am I? Then he shrugged and said, Dracarys. The dragons answered. Rhaegal hissed and smoked. Viserion snapped, and Drogon spat swirling red-black flame. It touched the drape of Grazdan's tokar, and the silk caught in half a heartbeat. Golden marks spilled across the carpets as the envoy stumbled over the chest, shouting curses and beating at his arm until Whitebeard flung a flagon of water over him to douse the flames. "'You swore I should have safe conduct!' the Yunkish envoy wailed. "'Do all the Yunkai whine so over a singed tokar? I shall buy you a new one, if you deliver up your slaves within three days.' Elsewise, Drogon shall give you a warmer kiss. She wrinkled her nose. You soiled yourself. Take your gold and go, and see that the wise masters hear my message. Grazdan Mo Iraz pointed a finger. You shall rue this arrogance, whore. These little lizards will not keep you safe, I promise you. We will fill the air with arrows if they come within a league of Yunkai. Do you think it is so hard to kill a dragon? Harder than to kill a slaver. Three days, Grazdan. Tell them, by the end of the third day, I will be in Yunkai, whether you open your gates for me or no. Full dark had fallen by the time the Yunkai departed from her camp. It promised to be a gloomy night, moonless, starless, with a chill, wet wind blowing from the west. A fine black night, thought Danny. The fires burned all around her, small orange stars strewn across hill and field. Sir Jorah, she said, summon my blood riders. Dany seated herself on a mound of cushions to await them, her dragons all about her. When they were assembled, she said, An hour past midnight should be time enough. Yes, Colisi, said Rakaro. Time for what? To mount our attack. Sir Jorah Mormont scowled. You told the sellswords that I wanted their answers on the morrow. I made no promises about tonight. The storm crows will be arguing about my offer. The second sons will be drunk on the wine I gave Miro. And the Yunkai believe they have three days. We will take them under cover of this darkness. They will have scouts watching for us. And in the dark they will see hundreds of campfires burning, said Danny, if they see anything at all. Kalisi, said Jogo, I will deal with these scouts. They are no riders, only slavers on horses. Just so, she agreed. I think we should attack from three sides. Grey Worm, your unsullied shall strike at them from right and left, while my coes lead my horse in wedge for a thrust through their centre. Slave soldiers will never stand before Mount Dothraki. She smiled. To be sure, I am only a young girl and know little of war. What do you think, my lords? I think you are Rhaegar Targaryen's sister, Sir Jorah said with a rueful half-smile. Aye, said Arstan Whitebeard, and a queen as well. It took an hour to work out all the details. Now begins the most dangerous time, Danny thought, as her captains departed to their commands. She could only pray that the gloom of the night would hide her preparations from the foe. 
Near midnight she got a scare when Sir Jorah bowled his way past Strong Belwas. The Unsullied caught one of the soul swords trying to sneak into the camp. A spy? That frightened her. If they'd caught one, how many others might have gotten away? He claims to come bearing gifts. It's the yellow fool with the blue hair. To Ario Naharis. That one. I'll hear him then. When the exile knight delivered him, she asked herself whether two men had ever been so different. The Tarashi was fair, where Sir Jorah was swarthy, lithe, where the knight was brawny, graced with flowing locks, where the other was balding, yet smooth-skinned, where Mormont was hairy, and her knight dressed plainly, while this other made a peacock look drab, though he had thrown a heavy black cloak over his bright yellow finery for this visit. He carried a heavy canvas sack slung over one shoulder. Khaleesi, he cried, I bring gifts and glad tidings. The storm crows are yours. A golden tooth gleamed in his mouth when he smiled. And so is Daario Naharis. Dany was dubious. If this Tiroshi had come to spy, this declaration might be no more than a desperate plot to save his head. What do Prendal Nagezin and Salor say of this? Little. Daario upended the sack, and the heads of Salor the Bald and Prendal Nargesin spilled out upon her carpets. My gifts to the Dragon Queen. Viserion sniffed the blood leaking from Prendal's neck, and let loose a gout of flame that took the dead man full in the face, blackening and blistering his bloodless cheeks. Drogon and Regal stirred the smell of roasted meat. You did this? Dany asked queasily. None other. If her dragons discomfited the Ario Naharis, he hid it well. For all the mind he paid then, they might have been three kittens playing with a mouse. Why? Because you are so beautiful. His hands were large and strong, and there was something in his hard blue eyes and great curving nose that suggested the fierceness of some splendid bird of prey. Prendal talked too much and said too little. His garb, rich as it was, had seen hard wear. Salt stains patterned his boots. The enamel of his nails was chipped. His lace was soiled by sweat. And she could see where the end of his cloak was fraying. And Salor picked his nose as if his snot was gold. He stood with his hands crossed at the wrists, his palms resting on the pommels of his blades. A curving Dothraki arak on his left hip, a mirish stiletto on his right. Their hilts were a matched pair of golden women, naked and wanton. "'Are you skilled in the use of those handsome blades?' Dany asked him. "'Prendal and Sala would tell you so, if dead men could talk. "'I count no day as lived, unless I have loved a woman, slain a foeman, and eaten a fine meal. "'And the days that I have lived are as numberless as the stars in the sky.' I make of slaughter a thing of beauty, and many a tumbler and fire-dancer has wept to the gods that they might be half so quick, a quarter so graceful. I would tell you the names of all the men I have slain, but before I could finish your dragons would grow large as castles. The walls of Yunkai would crumble into yellow dust, and winter would come and go and come again. Dany laughed. She liked the swagger she saw in this Daario Naharis. Draw your sword and swear it to my service. In a blink, De Ario's Arak was free of its sheath. His submission was as outrageous as the rest of him, a great swoop that brought his face down to her toes. My sword is yours, my life is yours, my love is yours. My blood, my body, my songs, you own them all. I live and die at your command, fair queen. Then live, Dany said, and fight for me tonight. That would not be wise, my queen, said Jorah gave to Ario a cold, hard stare. Keep this one here under guard until the battle's fought and won. She considered a moment, then shook her head. If he can give us the storm crows, surprise is certain. And if he betrays you, surprise is lost. Dany looked down to the cell sword again. He gave her such a smile that she flushed and turned away. He won't. How can you know that? 
She pointed to the lumps of blackened flesh the dragons were consuming, bite by bloody bite. I would call that proof of his sincerity. To Ario Naharis, have your storm crows ready to strike the Yunkish rear when my attack begins. Can you get back safely? If they stop me, I will say I have been scouting and saw nothing. The Tarashi rose to his feet, bowed, and swept out. Sir Jorah Mormont lingered. Your grace, he said, too bluntly. That was a mistake. We know nothing of this man. We know that he is a great fighter. A great talker, you mean? He brings us the storm crows. And he has blue eyes. Five hundred cell swords of uncertain loyalty. All loyalties are uncertain in such times as these, Denny reminded him. And I shall be betrayed twice more. Once for gold, and once for love. Dangerous, I am thrice your age, said Jorah said. I have seen how false men are. Very few are worthy of trust, and Ario Naharis is not one of them. Even his beard wears false colors. That angered her. Whilst you have an honest beard, is that what you are telling me? You are the only man I should ever trust? He stiffened. I did not say that. You say it every day. Piot Pree's a liar. Zaro's a schemer. Belwas a braggart. Arstan an assassin. Do you think I'm still some virgin girl that I cannot hear the words behind the words? Your Grace. She bowled over him. You have been a better friend to me than any I have known, a better brother than Viserys ever was. You are the first of my Queen's Guard, the commander of my army, my most valued counsellor, my good right hand. I honour and respect and cherish you, but I do not desire you. Jorah Mormont, and I am weary of your trying to push every other man in the world away from me. So I must needs rely on you and you alone. It will not serve, and it will not make me love you any better. Mormont had flushed red when she first began, but by the time Denny was done his face was pale again. He stood still as stone. If my queen commands, he said, curt and cold. Denny was warm enough for both of them. She does, she said. She commands. Now go see to your unsullied, sir. You have a battle to fight and win. When he was gone, Dany threw herself down on her pillows beside her dragons. She had not meant to be so sharp with Sir Jorah, but his endless suspicion had finally woken her dragon. He will forgive me, she told herself. I am his liege. Denny found herself wondering whether he was right about D'Ario. She felt very lonely all of a sudden. Miriam Osdur had promised that she would never bear a living child. House Targaryen will end with me. That made her sad. You must be my children, she told the dragons, my three fierce children. Arstan says dragons live longer than men, so you will go on after I am dead. Drogon looped his neck around to nip at her hand. His teeth were very sharp, but he never broke her skin when they played like this. Denny laughed and rolled him back and forth until he roared, his tail lashing like a whip. It is longer than it was, she saw, and tomorrow it will be longer still. They grow quickly now, and when they are grown I shall have my wings. Mounted on a dragon, she could lead her own men into battle— as she had an astapor, but as yet they were still too small to bear her weight. A stillness settled over her camp when midnight came and went. Denny remained in her pavilion with her maids, while Arstan Whitebeard and strong Belwas kept the guard. The waiting is the hardest part. To sit in her tent with idle hands while her battle was being fought without her made Denny feel half a child again. The hours crept by on turtle feet. Even after Jicky rubbed the knots from her shoulders, Denny was too restless for sleep. Masandi offered to sing her a lullaby of the peaceful people. But Denny shook her head. Bring me Ostan, she said. When the old man came, she was curled up inside her rakar pelt, whose musty smell still reminded her of Drogo. I cannot sleep when men are dying for me, Whitebeard, she said. Tell me more of my brother Rhaegar, if you would. I liked the tale you told me on the ship, of how he decided that he must be a warrior. Your grace is kind to say so. Viserys said that our brother won many tourneys. Arstan bowed his white head respectfully. 
It is not meet for me to deny his grace's words. But, said Danny sharply, tell me, I command it. Prince Rhaegar's prowess was unquestioned, but he seldom entered the lists. He never loved the Song of Swords the way that Robert did, or Jamie Lannister. It was something he had to do, a task the world had set him. He did it well, for he did everything well. That was his nature. But he took no joy in it. Men said that he loved his harp much better than his lance. He won some tourneys, surely, said Danny, disappointed. When he was young, his grace rode brilliantly an attorney at Storm's End, defeating Lord Stephen Baratheon, Lord Jason Malister, the Red Viper of Dawn, and a mystery knight who proved to be the infamous Simon Toyne, chief of the Kingswood outlaws. He broke twelve lances against Sir Arthur Dane that day. Was he the champion, then? No, Your Grace. That honor went to another knight of the King's Guard, who unhorsed Prince Rhaegar in the final tilt. Danny did not want to hear about Rhaegar being unhorsed. But what tourneys did my brother win? Your Grace, the old man hesitated. He won the greatest tourney of them all. Which was that? Danny demanded. The tourney Lord Went staged at Harrenhal, beside the God's Eye, in the year of the False Spring. A notable event. Besides the jousting, there was a melee in the old style, fought between seven teams of knights, as well as archery and axe-throwing, a horse-race, a tournament of singers, a mummer-show, and many feasts and frolics. Lord Went was as open-handed as he was rich. The lavish purses, he proclaimed, drew hundreds of challengers. Even your royal father came to Harrenhal, when he had not left the Red Keep for long years. The greatest lords and mightiest champions of the Seven Kingdoms rode in that tourney, and the Prince of Dragonstone bested them all. But that was the tourney when he crowned Lyanna Stark as Queen of Love and Beauty, said Danny. Princess Elia was there, his wife, and yet my brother gave the crown to the Stark girl, and later stole her away from her betrothed. How could he do that? Did the Dornish woman treat him so ill? It is not for such as me to say what might have been in your brother's heart, Your Grace. The Princess Elia was a good and gracious lady, though her health was ever delicate. Danny pulled the lion pelt tighter about her shoulders. Viserys said once that it was my fault for being born too late. She had denied it hotly, she remembered, going so far as to tell Viserys that it was his fault for not being born a girl. He beat her cruelly for that insolence. If I had been born more timely, he said, Rhaegar would have married me instead of Elia, and it would all have come out different. If Rhaegar had been happy in his wife, he would not have needed the Stark girl. Perhaps so, Your Grace. Whitebeard paused a moment. But I am not certain it was in Rhaegar to be happy. You make him sound so sour, Denny protested. Not sour, no, but... There was a melancholy to Prince Rhaegar, a sense— The old man hesitated again. Say it, she urged, a sense— Of doom. He was born in grief, my queen, and that shadow hung over him all his days. Viserys had spoken of Rhaegar's birth only once. Perhaps the tale saddened him too much. It was the shadow of Summerhall that haunted him, was it not? Yes. And yet Summerhall was the place the prince loved best. He would go there from time to time with only his harp for company. Even the knights of the king's guard did not attend him there. He liked to sleep in the ruined hall beneath the moon and stars, and whenever he came back he would bring a song. When you heard him play his high harp with the silver strings and sing of twilights and tears and the death of kings, you could not but feel that he was singing of himself and those he loved. What of the usurper? Did he play sad songs as well? Arstan chuckled. Robert? Robert liked songs that made him laugh. The bawdier, the better. He only sang when he was drunk, and then it was like to be a cask of ale, or fifty-four tons, or the bear and the maiden fair. Robert was much as one her dragons lifted their heads and roared. Horses! Denny leapt to her feet, clutching the lion pelt. Outside she heard strong bellwas bellow something, and then other voices, and the sounds of many horses. Eerie! Go see who—
The tent flap pushed open, and Sir Jorah Mormont entered. He was dusty and spattered with blood, but otherwise none the worse for battle. The exile knight went to one knee before Dany and said, "'Your grace, I bring you victory.' The storm crows turned their cloaks, the slaves broke, and the second sons were too drunk to fight, just as you said. Two hundred dead, Yunkai for the most part. Their slaves threw down their spears and ran, and their cell swords yielded. We have several thousand captives. Our own losses? A dozen, if that many. Only then did she allow herself to smile. Rise, my good, brave bear. Was Grasdan taken, or the Titan's bastard? Grasdan went to Yunkai to deliver your terms. Sir Jorah got to his feet. Miro fled once he realized the storm crows had turned. I have men hunting him. He shouldn't escape us long. Very well, Danny said. Sell sword or slave. Spare all those who will pledge me their faith. If enough of the second sons will join us, keep the company intact. The next day they marched the last three leagues to Yunkai. The city was built of yellow bricks instead of red. Elsewhere it was Astapor all over again, with the same crumbling walls and high-stepped pyramids, and a great harpy mounted above its gates. The wall and towers swarmed with crossbowmen and slingers. Sir Jorah and Grey Worm deployed her men, Eerie and Jicky raised her pavilion, and Dany sat down to wait. On the morning of the third day the city gates swung open and a line of slaves began to emerge. Dany mounted her silver to greet them. As they passed, little Miss Andy told them that they owed their freedom to Daenerys Stormborn, the Unburnt, Queen of the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros and Mother of Dragons. Mysa! a brown-skinned man shouted out at her. He had a child on his shoulder, a little girl, and she screamed the same word in a thin voice. Mysa! Mysa! Dany looked at Miss Andy. What are they shouting? It is Giscari. The old pure tongue. It means mother. Denny felt a lightness in her chest. I will never bear a living child, she remembered. Her hand trembled as she raised it. Perhaps, she smiled. She must have, because the man grinned and shouted again, and others took up the cry. My sir, they called. My sir, my sir. They were all smiling at her, reaching for her, kneeling before her. Myala. Some called her, while others cried, Alala, or Kathai, or Tato, but whatever the tongue, it all meant the same thing. Mother. They are calling me Mother. The chant grew, spread, swelled. It swelled so loud that it frightened her horse, and the mare backed and shook her head, and lashed her silver-gray tail. It swelled until it seemed to shake the yellow walls of Yunkai. More slaves were streaming from the gates every moment, and as they came, they took up the call. They were running toward her now, pushing, stumbling, wanting to touch her hand, to stroke her horse's mane, to kiss her feet. Her poor blood riders could not keep them all away, and even strong Belwas grunted and growled in dismay. Sir Jorah urged her to go, but Denny remembered a dream she had dreamed in the house of the undying. They will not hurt me, she told him. They are my children, Jorah. She laughed, put her heels into her horse, and rode to them, the bells in her hair ringing sweet victory. She trotted, then cantered, then broke into a gallop, her braid streaming behind. The freed slaves parted before her. Mother! they called from a hundred throats, a thousand, ten thousand. Mother! they sang, their fingers brushing her legs as she flew by. Mother! 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 Arya when Arya saw the shape of a great hill looming in the distance, golden in the afternoon sun, she knew it at once. They had come all the way back to High Heart. By sunset they were at the top, making camp where no harm could come to them. Arya walked around the circle of weirwood stumps with Lord Beric's squire Ned, and they stood on top of one watching the last light fade in the west. From up here she could see a storm raging to the north, but High Heart stood above the rain. It wasn't above the wind, though. The gusts were blowing so strongly that it felt like someone was behind her, yanking on her cloak. Only when she turned, no one was there. Ghosts, she remembered. High Heart is haunted. They built a great fire atop the hill, and Thoros of Mir sat cross-legged beside it, gazing deep into the flames as if there was nothing else in all the world. 
"'What is he doing?' Arya asked Ned. "'Sometimes he sees things in the flames,' the squire told her. "'The past, the future, things happening far away.' Arya squinted at the fire to see if she could see what the Red Priest was seeing, but it only made her eyes water, and before long she turned away. Gendry was watching the Red Priest as well. "'Can you truly see the future there?' he asked suddenly. Thoros turned from the fire, sighing, "'Not here. Not now. But some days, yes. The Lord of Light grants me visions.' Gendry looked dubious. My master said you were a sot and a fraud, as bad a priest as there ever was. That was unkind, Thoros chuckled. True, but unkind. Who was this master of yours? Did I know you, boy? I was apprenticed to the master armorer Tobo Mott on the Street of Steel. You used to buy your swords from him. Just so. He charged me twice what they were worth, then scolded me for setting them afire. Thoros laughed. Your master had it right. I was no very holy priest. I was born youngest of eight, so my father gave me over to the Red Temple, but it was not the path I would have chosen. I prayed the prayers, and I spoke the spells, but I would also lead raids on the kitchens, and from time to time they found girls in my bed. Such wicked girls, I never knew how they got there. I had a gift for tongues, though— and when I gazed into the flames, well, from time to time I saw things. Even so, I was more bother than I was worth, so they sent me finally to King's Landing to bring the Lord's light to seven besotted Westeros. King Ares so loved fire it was thought he might make a convert. Alas, his paramancers knew better tricks than I did. King Robert was fond of me, though. The first time I rode into a melee with a flaming sword, Kevin Lannister's horse reared and threw him— and his grace laughed so hard I thought he might rupture. The Red Priest smiled at the memory. It was no way to treat a blade, though. Your master had the right of that, too. Fire consumes. Lord Beric stood behind them, and there was something in his voice that silenced Thoros at once. It consumes, and when it is done there is nothing left. Nothing. Beric, sweet friend— the priest touched the lightning lord on the forearm. What are you saying? Nothing I have not said before. Six times, Thoros? Six times is too many. He turned away abruptly. That night the wind was howling almost like a wolf, and there were some real wolves off to the west giving it lessons. Notch, Angie, and Merritt Moontown had the watch. Ned, Gendry, and many of the others were fast asleep when Arya spied the small, pale shape creeping behind the horses, thin white hair flying wild as she leaned upon a gnarled cane. The woman could not have been more than three feet tall. The firelight made her eyes gleam as red as the eyes of John's wolf. He was a ghost, too. Arya stole closer and knelt to watch. Thoros and Lem were with Lord Beric when the dwarf woman sat down uninvited by the fire. She squinted at them with eyes like hot coals. The ember and the lemon come to honor me again, and his grace the lord of corpses. An ill-omened name, I have asked you not to use it. Ay, you have. But the stink of death is fresh on you, my lord. She had but a single tooth remaining. Give me wine, or I will go. My bones are old, my joints ache when the winds do blow, and up here the winds are always blowing. A silver stag for your dreams, my lady, Lord Beric said with solemn courtesy. Another, if you have news for us. I cannot eat a silver stag, nor ride one. A skin of wine for my dreams, and for my news a kiss from the great oaf in the yellow cloak. The little woman cackled. Aye, a sloppy kiss, a bit of tongue. It has been too long, too long. His mouth will taste of lemons, and mine of bones. I am too old. Aye, Lem complained. Too old for wine and kisses. All you'll get from me is the flat of my sword, crone. 
My hair comes out in handfuls, and no one has kissed me for a thousand years. It is hard to be so old. Well, I will have a song, then. A song from Thomas Evans for my news. You will have your song from Tom, Lord Berwick promised. He gave her the wineskin himself. The dwarf woman drank deep, the wine running down her chin. When she lowered the skin, she wiped her mouth with the back of a wrinkled hand and said, Sour wine for sour tidings, what could be more fitting? The king is dead. Is that sour enough for you? Arya's heart caught in her throat. Which bloody king is dead, crone? Lem demanded. The wet one. The crocking king, my lords. I dreamt him dead, and he died, and the iron squids now turn on one another. Oh, and Lord Hoster Tully's died too, but you know that, don't you? In the Hall of Kings the goat sits alone, and fevered as the great dog descends on him. The old woman took another long gulp of wine, squeezing the skin as she raised it to her lips. The great dog! Did she mean the hound? Or maybe his brother, the mountain that rides? Arya was not certain. They bore the same arms, three black dogs in a yellow field. Half the men whose deaths she prayed for belonged to Sir Gregor Clegane, Polliver, Dunson, Rath the Sweetling, the Tickler, and Sir Gregor himself. Maybe Lord Berwick will hang them all. I dreamt a wolf howling in the rain, but no one heard his grief, the dwarf woman was saying. I dreamt such a clangor I thought my head might burst, drums and horns and pipes and screams, but the saddest sound was the little bells. I dreamt of a maid at a feast with purple serpents in her hair, venom dripping from their fangs. And later I dreamt that maid again, slaying a savage giant in a castle built of snow. She turned her head sharply and smiled through the gloom right at Arya. You cannot hide from me, child. Come closer now. Cold fingers walked down Arya's neck. Fear cuts deeper than swords, she reminded herself. She stood and approached the fire warily, light on the balls of her feet, poised to flee. The dwarf woman studied her with dim red eyes. I see you, she whispered. I see you, wolf child, blood child. I thought it was the Lord who smelled of death. She began to sob, her little body shaking. You are cruel to come to my hill, cruel. I gorged on grief at Summer Hall. I need none of yours. Be gone from here, dark heart. Be gone. There was such fear in her voice that Arya took a step backward, wondering if the woman was mad. "'Don't frighten the child,' Thoros protested. "'There's no harm in her.' Lem Lemoncloak's finger went to his broken nose. "'Don't be so bloody sure of that.' "'She will leave on the morrow with us,' Lord Beric assured the little woman. "'We're taking her to River Run to her mother.' "'Nay,' said the dwarf, "'you're not. The blackfish holds the rivers now. If it's the mother you want, seek her at the twins, for there's to be a wedding. She cackled again. Look in your fires, pink priest, and you will see. Not now, though, not here. You'll see nothing here. This place belongs to the old gods still. They linger here as I do, shrunken and feeble, but not yet dead. Nor do they love the flames, for the oak recalls the acorn, the acorn dreams the oak. The stump lives in them both. And they remember when the first men came with fire in their fists. She drank the last of the wine in four long swallows, flung the skin aside, and pointed her stick at Lord Berwick. I'll have my payment now. I'll have the song you promised me. And so Lim woke Tom Seven Strings beneath his furs and brought him yawning to the fireside with his wood harp in hand. "'The same song as before?' he asked. "'Oh, ay, my Jenny's song. Is there another?' And so he sang, and the dwarf woman closed her eyes and rocked slowly back and forth, murmuring the words and crying, 
Thoros took Arya firmly by the hand and drew her aside. Let her say the her song in peace, he said. It is all she has left. I wasn't going to hurt her, Arya thought. What did she mean about the twins? My mother's at River Run, isn't she? She was, the Red Priest rubbed beneath his chin. A wedding, she said. We shall see. Whenever she is, Lord Beric will find her, though. Not long after, the sky opened. Lightning cracked and thunder rolled across the hills, and the rain fell in blinding sheets. The dwarf woman vanished as suddenly as she had appeared, while the outlaws gathered branches and threw up crude shelters. It rained all through that night, and come morning Ned, Lem, and Watty the Miller awoke with chills. Watty could not keep his breakfast down, and young Ned was feverish and shivering by turns, with skin clammy to the touch. There was an abandoned village half a day's ride to the north, Notch told Lord Berwick. They'd find better shelter there, a place to wait out the worst of the rains. So they dragged themselves back into the saddles and urged their horses down the great hill. The rains did not let up. They rode through woods and fields, fording swollen streams where the rushing water came up to the bellies of their horses. Arya pulled up the hood of her cloak and hunched down, sodden and shivering, but determined not to falter. Merritt and Mudge were soon coughing as bad as Watty, and poor Ned seemed to grow more miserable with every mile. "'When I wear my helm, the rain beats against the steel and gives me headaches,' he complained. "'But when I take it off, my hair gets soaked and sticks to my face and in my mouth.' "'You have a knife,' Jenry suggested. "'If your hair annoys you so much, shave your bloody head.' "'He doesn't like Ned. "'The squire seemed nice enough to Arya, maybe a little shy, but good-natured. "'She had always heard that Dornish men were small and swarthy, "'with black hair and small black eyes, but Ned had big blue eyes, "'so dark that they looked almost purple, "'and his hair was a pale blonde, more ash than honey. "'How long have you been Lord Berwick's squire?' she asked, to take his mind from his misery. "'He took me for his page when he espoused my aunt,' he coughed. "'I was seven, but when I turned ten he raised me to squire. I won a prize once, riding at rings.' "'I never learned the lance, but I could beat you with a sword,' said Arya. "'Have you killed anyone?' That seemed to startle him. "'I'm only twelve. "'I killed a boy when I was eight, Arya almost said, but she thought she'd better not. You've been in battles, though. Yes. He did not sound very proud of it. I was at the Mummer's Ford. When Lord Berwick fell into the river, I dragged him up onto the bank so he wouldn't drown and stood over him with my sword. I never had to fight, though. He had a broken lance sticking out of him, so no one bothered us. When we regrouped, Green Gurgen helped pull his lordship back onto a horse. Arya was remembering the stable boy at King's Landing. After him there had been that guard whose throat she cut at Harrenhal, and Sir Amory's men at that holdfast by the lake. She didn't know if Weiss and Chiswick counted, or the ones who'd died on account of the weasel soup. All of a sudden she felt very sad. "'My father was called Ned, too,' she said. "'I know. I saw him at the hands tourney. I wanted to go up and speak with him, but I couldn't think what to say.' Ned shivered beneath his cloak a sodden length of pale purple. "'Were you at the tourney? I saw your sister there. Sir Loras Tyrell gave her a rose.' "'She told me. It all seemed so long ago. Her friend Jane Poole fell in love with your Lord Berwick. "'He's promised to my aunt.' Ned looked uncomfortable. "'That was before, though, before he—' "'Died,' she thought, as Ned's voice trailed off into an awkward silence. Their horses' hooves made sucking sounds as they pulled free of the mud. "'My lady,' Ned said at last, "'you have a base-born brother, John Snow?' "'He's with the Night's Watch on the wall. "'Maybe I should go to the wall instead of River Run. "'John wouldn't care who I killed or whether I brushed my hair. "'John looks like me, even though he's bastard-born. "'He used to muss my hair and call me little sister.' Arya oh, yeah, missed John most of all. Just saying his name made her sad. How do you know about John? He is my milk brother. Brother? Arya oh, did not understand. But you're from Dorne. How could you and John be blood? Milk brothers, not blood. My lady mother had no milk when I was little, so Willa had to nurse me. Arya oh, yeah, was lost. Who's Willa? 
Jon Snow's mother. He never told you? She's served us for years and years, since before I was born. John never knew his mother, not even her name. Arya gave Ned a wary look. You know her? Truly? Is he making mock of me? If you lie, I'll punch your face. Willa was my wet nurse, he repeated solemnly. I swear it in the honor of my house. You have a house? That was stupid. He was a squire. Of course he had a house. Who are you? My lady? Ned looked embarrassed. I'm Edric Dane, the, the Lord of Starfall. Behind them, Gendry groaned. Lords and ladies, he proclaimed in a disgusted tone. Arya plucked a withered crabapple off a passing branch and whipped it at him, bouncing it off his thick bull head. Ow! he said. That hurt! He felt the skin above his eye. What kind of lady throws crabapples at people? The bad kind, said Arya, suddenly contrite. She turned back to Ned. I'm sorry I didn't know who you were, my lord. The fault is mine, my lady. He was very polite. John has a mother. Willa, her name is Willa. She would need to remember so she could tell him the next time she saw him. She wondered if he would still call her little sister. I'm not so little any more. He'd have to call me something else. Maybe once she got to River Run, she could write John a letter and tell him what Ned Dane had said. There was an Arthur Dane, she remembered, the one they called the Sword of the Morning. My father was Sir Arthur's elder brother. Lady Ashara was my aunt. I never knew her, though. She threw herself into the sea from atop the pale stone sword before I was born. Why would she do that? said Arya, startled. Ned looked wary. Maybe he was afraid that she was going to throw something at him. Your lord father never spoke of her, he said. The lady Ashara Dane of Starfall? No. Did he know her? Before Robert was king. She met your father and his brothers at Harrenhal during the year of the fall spring. Oh, Arya did not know what else to say. Why did she jump in the sea, though? Her heart was broken. Sansa would have sighed and shed a tear for true love, but Arya just thought it was stupid. She couldn't say that to Ned, though, not about his own aunt. Did someone break it? He hesitated. Perhaps it's not my place. Tell me. He looked at her uncomfortably. My Aunt Illyria says Lady Ashara and your father fell in love at Harrenhal. That's not so. He loved my lady mother. I'm sure he did, my lady, but... She was the only one he loved. He must have found that bastard under a cabbage leaf, then, Gendry said behind them. Arya wished she had another crabapple to bounce off his face. My father had honor, she said angrily, and we weren't talking to you anyway. Why don't you go back to Stony Sept and ring that girl's stupid bells? Gendry ignored that. At least your father raised his bastard, not like mine. I don't even know my father's name. Some smelly drunk, I'd wager, like the others my mother dragged home from the alehouse. Whenever she got mad at me, she'd say, If your father was here, he'd beat you bloody. That's all I know of him. He spat. Well, if he was here now, maybe I'd beat him bloody. But he's dead, I figure, and your father's dead too, so what does it matter who he lay with? It mattered to Arya, though. She could not have said why. Ned was trying to apologize for upsetting her, but she did not want to hear it. She pressed her heels into her horse and left them both. Angie the archer was riding a few yards ahead. When she caught up with him, she said, Dornishmen lie, don't they? They're famous for it, the bowman grinned. Of course they say the same of us marchers, so there you are. What's the trouble now? Ned's a good lad. He's just a stupid liar. Arya left the trail, leapt the rotten log, and splashed across a stream bed. Ignoring the shouts of the outlaws behind her, they just want to tell me more lies. She thought about trying to get away from them, but there were too many, and they knew these lands too well. What was the use of running if they caught you? It was Harwin who rode up beside her in the end. Where do you think you're going, my lady? You shouldn't run off. There are wolves in these woods, and worse things. I'm not afraid, she said. That boy Ned said, Aye, he told me. Lady Ashara Dane, it's an old tale, that one. I heard it once at Winterfell, when I was no older than you are now. 
He took hold of her bridle firmly and turned her horse around. I doubt there's any truth to it. But if there is, what of it? When Ned met this Dornish lady, his brother Brandon was still alive, and it was him betrothed to Lady Caitlin. So there's no stain on your father's honor. There's naught like attorney to make the blood run hot, so maybe some words were whispered in the tent of a night. Who can say? Words or kisses may be more, but where's the harm in that? Spring had come, or so they thought, and neither one of them was pledged. She killed herself, though, said Arya uncertainly. Ned says she jumped from a tower into the sea. So she did, Harwin admitted, as he led her back. But that was for grief, I'd wager. She'd lost a brother, the soul of the morning. He shook his head. Let it lie, my lady. They're dead, all of them. Let it lie. And please, when we come to River Run, say naught of this to your mother. The village was just where Notch had promised it would be. They took shelter in a grey stone stable. Only half a roof remained, but that was half a roof more than any other building in the village. It's not a village, it's only black stones and old bones. Did the Lannisters kill the people who lived here? Arya asked as she helped Angie dry the horses. No, he pointed. Look at how thick the moss grows on the stones. No one's moved them for a long time. And there's a tree growing out of the wall there, see? This place was put to the torch a long time ago. Who did it then? asked Gendry. Hoster Tully. Notch was a stooped, thin, grey-haired man, born in these parts. This was Lord Goodbrook's village. When River Run declared for Robert, Goodbrook stayed loyal to the king, so Lord Tully came down on him with fire and sword. After the trident, Goodbrook's son made his peace with Robert and Lord Hoster, but that didn't help the dead none. A silence fell. Gendry gave Arya a queer look, then turned away to brush his horse. Outside the rain came down and down. "'I say we need a fire,' Thoros declared. "'The night is dark and full of terrors. "'And wet, too, eh? "'Too very wet.' "'Jack be lucky hacked some dry wood from a stall, "'while Notch and Merritt gathered straw for kindling. "'Thoros himself struck the spark, "'and Lem fanned the flames with his big yellow cloak "'until they roared and swirled. "'Soon it grew almost hot inside the stable. "'Thoros sat before it cross-legged, "'devouring the flames with his eyes "'just as he had a top high heart. Arya watched him closely, and once his lips moved, and she thought she heard him mutter, River Run. Lem paced back and forth, coughing, a long shadow matching him stride for stride, while Thomas Evans pulled off his boots and rubbed his feet. I must be mad to be going back to River Run, the singer complained. The Tullys have never been lucky for old Tom. It was that Lisa sent me up the high road when the moon men took my gold and my horse and all my clothes as well. There's knights in the vale still telling how I came walking up to the bloody gate with only my harp to keep me modest. They made me sing the name-day boy and the king without courage before they opened that gate. My only solace was that three of them died laughing. I haven't been back to the airy since, and I won't sing the king without courage either, not for all the gold and casterly Lannisters, Thoros said, roaring red and gold. He lurched to his feet and went to Lord Berwick. Lem and Tom wasted no time joining them. Arya could not make out what they were saying, but the singer kept glancing at her, and one time Lem got so angry he pounded a fist against the wall. That was when Lord Berwick gestured for her to come closer. It was the last thing she wanted to do, but Harwin put a hand in the small of her back and pushed her forward. She took two steps and hesitated, full of dread. My lord... She waited to hear what Lord Berwick would say. "'Tell her,' the Lightning Lord commanded Thoros. The Red Priest squatted down beside her. "'My lady,' he said, "'the Lord granted me a view of River Run. An island in a sea of fire, it seemed. The flames were leaping lions with long crimson claws, and how they roared! A sea of Lannisters, my lady! River Run will soon come under attack.' Arya felt as though he'd punched her in the belly. No! Sweetling, said Thoros, the flames do not lie. Sometimes I read them wrongly, blind fool that I am, but not this time, I think. The Lannisters will soon have River Run under siege. Rob will beat them. Arya got a stubborn look. He'll beat them like he did before. Your brother may be gone, said Thoros. Your mother as well. I did not see them in the flames. 
this wedding the old one spoke of, a wedding on the twins? She has her own ways of knowing things, that one. The weirwoods whisper in her ear when she sleeps. If she says your mother is gone to the twins— Arya turned on Tom and Lem. If you hadn't caught me, I would have been there. I would have been home. Lord Berwick paid no heed to her outburst. My lady, he said with weary courtesy, would you know your grandfather's brother by sight? Sir Brynden Tully called the Blackfish. Would he know you, perchance? Arya shook her head miserably. She had heard her mother speak of Sir Brynden Blackfish, but if she had ever met him herself, it had been when she was too little to remember. "'Small chance the Blackfish will pay good coin for a girl he doesn't know,' said Tom. "'Those Tullys are a sour, suspicious lot. He's like to think we're selling him false goods.' "'We'll convince him,' Lem Lemon Cloak insisted. "'She will, or Harwin. River Run is closest. I say we take her there, get the gold, and be bloody well done with her.' "'And if the lions catch us inside the castle?' said Tom. They'd like nothing better than to hang his lordship in a cage from the top of Casterly Rock. I do not mean to be taken, said Lord Berwick. A final word hung unspoken in the air. Alive. They all heard it, even Arya, though it never passed his lips. Still, we dare not go blindly here. I want to know where the armies are, the wolves and lions both. Sharna will know something, and Lord Vance's maester will know more. Acorn Hall's not far. Biddy Smallwood will shelter us for a time while we send scouts ahead to learn. His words beat at her ears like the pounding of a drum, and suddenly it was more than Arya could stand. She wanted Riverrun, not Acorn Hall. She wanted her mother and her brother Rob, not Lady Smallwood or some uncle she never knew. Whirling, she broke for the door, and when Harwin tried to grab her arm, she spun away from him quick as a snake. Outside the stables the rain was still falling, and distant lightning flashed in the west. Arya ran as fast as she could. She did not know where she was going, only that she wanted to be alone, away from all the voices, away from their hollow words and broken promises. All I wanted was to go to River Run. It was her own fault, for taking Gendry and Hot Pie with her when she left Harren Hall. She would have been better alone. If she had been alone, the outlaws would never have caught her, and she'd be with Rob and her mother by now. They were never my pack. If they had been, they wouldn't leave me. She splashed through a puddle of muddy water. Someone was shouting her name, Harwin, probably, or Gendry, but the thunder drowned them out as it rolled across the hills. Half a heart beat behind the lightning. The lightning, Lord, she thought angrily. Maybe he couldn't die, but he could lie. Somewhere off to her left a horse whinnied. Arya couldn't have gone more than fifty yards from the stables, yet already she was soaked to the bone. She ducked around the corner of one of the tumble-down houses, hoping the mossy walls would keep the rain off, and almost bowled right into one of the sentries. A mailed hand closed hard around her arm. "'You're hurting me,' she said, twisting in his grasp. "'Let go! I was going to go back. I... "'Back!' Sandor Clegane's laughter was iron scraping over stone. "'Bugger that, wolf girl! You're mine!' He needed only one hand to yank her off her feet and drag her kicking toward his waiting horse. The cold rain lashed them both and washed away her shouts, and all that Arya could think of was the question he had asked her. "'Do you know what dogs do to wolves?' Jamie. Though his fever lingered stubbornly, the stump was healing clean, and Kyburn said his arm was no longer in danger. Jamie was anxious to be gone, to put Harren Hall, the Bloody Mummers, and Brienne of Tarth all behind him. A real woman waited for him in the Red Keep. I am sending Kyburn with you to look after you on the way to King's Landing, Roos Bolton said on the morn of their departure. He has a fond hope that your father will force the Citadel to give him back his chain in gratitude. We all have fond hopes. If he grows me back a hand, my father will make him Grand Maester. Steelshanks Walton commanded Jamie's escort, blunt, brusque, brutal, at heart a simple soldier. Jamie had served with his sword all his life. Men like Walton would kill at their lord's command, rape when their blood was up after battle, and plunder wherever they could. But once the war was done, they would go back to their homes, trade their spears for hoes, wed their neighbors' daughters, and raise a pack of squalling children. Such men obeyed without question, but the deep, malignant cruelty of the brave companions was not a part of their nature. 
Both parties left Harren Hall the same morning, beneath a cold grey sky that promised rain. Sir Anise Frey had marched three days before, striking northeast for the King's Road. Bolton meant to follow him. The trident is in flood, he told Jamie. Even at the Ruby Ford, the crossing will be difficult. You will give my warm regards to your father? So long as you give mine to Rob Stark? That I shall. Some brave companions had gathered in the yard to watch them leave. Jamie trotted over to where they stood. Zala, how kind of you to see me off. Pig, Timian, will you miss me? No last jest to share, Shagwell? To lighten my way down the road? And Rorg, did you come to kiss me goodbye? Bugger off, cripple, said Rorg, if you insist. Rest assured, though, I will be back. A Lannister always pays his debts. Jamie wheeled his horse around and rejoined Steelshanks, Walton, and his two hundred. Lord Bolton had accrued him as a knight, preferring to ignore the missing hand that made such warlike garb a travesty. Jamie rode with sword and dagger on his belt, shield and helm hung from his saddle, chain-mail under a dark brown surcoat. He was not such a fool as to show the lion of Lannister on his arms, though, nor the plain white blazon that was his right as a sworn brother of the Kingsguard. He found an old shield in the armory, battered and splintered, the chipped paint still showing most of the great black bat of House Lothston upon a field of silver and gold. The Lothstons held Harrenhal before the Wents, and had been a powerful family in their day, but they had died out ages ago, so no one was likely to object to him bearing their arms. He would be no one's cousin, no one's enemy, no one's sworn sword. In some, no one. They left through Harrenhal's smaller eastern gate, and took their leave of Roose Bolton and his host six miles farther on, turning south to follow along the lake road for a time. Walton meant to avoid the King's Road as long as he could, preferring the farmer's tracks and game trails near the God's Eye. The King's Road would be faster. Jimmy was anxious to return to Circe as quickly as he could. If they made haste, he might even arrive in time for Joffrey's wedding. "'I want no trouble,' said Steelshanks. "'Gods know who we'd meet along that King's Road.' "'No one you need fear, surely. You have two hundred men. Aye, but others might have more.' My lord said to bring you safe to your lord father, and that's what I mean to do. I have come this way before, Jamie reflected a few miles further on, when they passed a deserted mill beside the lake. Weeds now grew where once the miller's daughter had smiled shyly at him, and the miller himself had shouted out, Attorney's back the other way, sir! As if I had not known. King Ares made a great show of Jamie's investiture. He said his vows before the king's pavilion, kneeling on the green grass in white armor while half the realm looked on. When Sir Gerald Hightower raised him up and put the white cloak about his shoulders, a roar went up that Jamie still remembered all these years later. But that very night Ares had turned sour, declaring that he had no need of seven king's guard here at Harren Hall. Jamie was commanded to return to King's Landing to guard the queen and little Prince Viserys, who'd remained behind. Even when the White Bull offered to take that duty himself, so Jamie might compete in Lord Wentz tourney, Ares had refused. He'll win no glory here, the king had said. He's mine now, not Tywin's. He'll serve as I see fit. I am the king, I rule, and he'll obey. That was the first time that Jamie understood. It was not his skill with sword and lance that had won him his white cloak, nor any feats of valor he'd performed against the King's Wood Brotherhood. Ares had chosen him to spite his father, to rob Lord Tywin of his heir. Even now, all these years later, the thought was bitter. And that day, as he'd ridden south in his new white cloak to guard an empty castle, it had been almost too much to stomach. He would have ripped the cloak off then and there if he could have, but it was too late. He had said the words whilst half the realm looked on, and a king's guard served for life. Kyburn fell in beside him. Is your hand troubling you? The lack of my hand is troubling me. The mornings were the hardest. In his dreams, Jamie was a whole man, and each dawn he would lie half awake and feel his fingers move. It was a nightmare, some part of him would whisper, refusing to believe even now, only a nightmare. But then he would open his eyes. 
I understand you had a visitor last night, said Kyburn. I trust that you enjoyed her. Jamie gave him a cool look. She did not say who sent her. The maester smiled modestly. Your fever was largely gone, and I thought you might enjoy a bit of exercise. Pia is quite skilled, would you not agree? And so willing. She had been that, certainly. She had slipped in his door and out of her clothes so quickly that Jamie had thought he was still dreaming. It hadn't been until the woman slid in under his blanket and put his good hand on her breast that he roused. She was a pretty little thing, too. I was a slip of a girl when you came for Lord Wentz Turney and the king gave you your cloak, she confessed. You were so handsome, all in white, and everyone said what a brave knight you were. Sometimes, when I'm with some man, I close my eyes and pretend it's you on top of me, with your smooth skin and gold curls. I never truly thought I'd have you, though. Sending her away had not been easy after that, but Jamie had done it all the same. I have a woman, he reminded himself. Do you send girls to everyone you leech? he asked Kyburn. More often, Lord Vargo sends them to me. He likes me to examine them before... Well, suffice it to say that once he loved unwisely, and he has no wish to do so again. But have no fear, Pia is quite healthy, as is your maid of Tarth. Jamie gave him a sharp look. Brienne? Yes, a strong girl, that one. And her maidenhead is still intact. As of last night, at least. Kyburn gave a chuckle. He sent you to examine her? To be sure. He is fastidious, shall we say. Does this concern the ransom? Jamie asked. Does her father require proof she is still maiden? You have not heard? Kyburn gave a shrug. We had a bird from Lord Selwyn, an answer to mine. The Evenstar offers three hundred dragons for his daughter's safe return. I had told Lord Vargo there were no sapphires on Tarth, but he will not listen. He is convinced the Evenstar intends to cheat him. Three hundred dragons is a fair ransom for a knight. The goat should take what he can get. The goat is Lord of Harrenhal, and the Lord of Harrenhal does not haggle. The news irritated him, though he supposed he should have seen it coming. The lie spared you a while, wench. Be grateful for that much. If her maiden head's as hard as the rest of her, the goat will break his cock off trying to get in. He jested. Brienne was tough enough to survive a few rapes, Jamie judged, though if she resisted too vigorously, Vargo Hoet might start lopping off her hands and feet. And if he does, why should I care? I might still have a hand if she had let me have my cousin's sword without getting stupid. He had almost taken off her leg himself with that first stroke of his, but after that she had given him more than he wanted. Oh, it may not know how freakish strong she is. He had best be careful, or she'll snap that skinny neck of his, and wouldn't that be sweet? Kyburn's companionship was wearing on him. Jamie trotted toward the head of the column. A round little tick of a Northman name of Nage went before steel shanks with a peace banner, a rainbow-striped flag with seven long tails on a staff topped by a seven-pointed star. "'Shouldn't you Northmen have a different sort of peace banner?' he asked Walton. "'What are the seven to you?' "'Southron gods,' the man said. "'But it's a Southron peace we need to get you safe to your father.' "'My father.' Jimmy wondered whether Lord Tywin had received the goat's demand for ransom, with or without his rotted hand. "'What is a swordsman worth without his sword hand? Half the gold in Casterly Rock? Three hundred dragons?' Well, nothing. His father had never been unduly swayed by sentiment. Tywin Lannister's own father, Lord Tytos, had once imprisoned an unruly bannerman, Lord Tarbeck. The redoubtable Lady Tarbeck responded by capturing three Lannisters, including young Stafford, whose sister was betrothed to cousin Tywin. Send back my lord and love, or these three shall answer for any harm that comes him, she had written to Casterly Rock. Young Tywin suggested his father oblige by sending back Lord Tarbeck in three pieces. 
Lord Titos was a gentler sort of lion, however, so Lady Tarbeck won a few more years for her mutton-headed lord, and Stafford wed and bred and blundered on till Oxcross. But Tywin Lannister endured, eternal as Casterly Rock. And now you have a cripple for a son as well as a dwarf, my lord. How you will hate that. The road led them through a burned village. It must have been a year or more since the place had been put to torch. The hovels stood blackened and roofless, but weeds were growing waist-high in all the surrounding fields. Steelshanks called a halt to allow them to water the horses. "'I know this place, too,' Jamie thought, as he waited by the well. There had been a small inn where only a few foundation stones and a chimney now stood, and he had gone in for a cup of ale. A dark-eyed serving wench brought him cheese and apples, but the innkeep had refused his coin. "'It's an honour to have a knight of the King's Guard under my roof, sir,' the man had said. "'It's a tale I'll tell my grandchildren.' Jamie looked at the chimney poking out of the weeds and wondered whether he had ever gotten those grandchildren. Did he tell them the Kingslayer once drank his ale and ate his cheese and apples? Or was he ashamed to admit he fed the likes of me? Not that he would ever know. Whoever burned the inn had likely killed the grandchildren as well. He could feel his phantom fingers clench. When Steel Shanks said that perhaps they should have a fire and a bit of food, Jimmy shook his head. I mislike this place. We'll ride on. By evenfall they had left the lake to follow a rutted track through a wood of oak and elm. Jamie's stump was throbbing dully when Steelshanks decided to make a camp. Kyburn had brought a skin of dream wine, thankfully. While Walton set the watches, Jamie stretched out near the fire and propped a rolled-up bearskin against a stump as a pillow for his head. The wench would have told him he had to eat before he slept to keep his strength up, but he was more tired than hungry. He closed his eyes and hoped to dream of Circe. The fever dreams were all so vivid. Naked and alone he stood, surrounded by enemies, with stone walls all around him, pressing close. The rock, he knew. He could feel the immense weight of it above his head. He was home. He was home and whole. He held his right hand up and flexed his fingers to feel the strength in them. It felt as good as sex, as good as swordplay. Four fingers and a thumb. He had dreamed that he was maimed, but it wasn't so. Relief made him dizzy. My hand, my good hand! Nothing could hurt him so long as he was whole. Around him stood a dozen tall, dark figures in cowled robes that hid their faces. In their hands were spears. "'Who are you?' he demanded of them. "'What business do you have in Casterly Rock?' They gave no answer, only prodded him with the points of their spears. He had no choice but to descend. Down a twisting passageway he went— Narrow steps carved from the living rock, down and down. I must go up, he told himself. Up, not down. Why am I going down? Below the earth his doom awaited. He knew with the certainty of dream. Something dark and terrible lurked there, something that wanted him. Jamie tried to halt, but their spears prodded him on. If only I had my sword, nothing could harm me. The steps ended abruptly on echoing darkness. Jamie had the sense of vast space before him. He jerked to a halt, teetering on the edge of nothingness. A spear-point jabbed the small of the back, shoving him into the abyss. He shouted, but the fall was short. He landed on his hands and knees upon soft sand and shallow water. There were watery caverns deep below Casterly Rock, but this one was strange to him. What place is this? Your place. The voice echoed. It was a hundred voices, a thousand, the voices of all the Lannisters since Lan the Clever, who had lived at the dawn of days. But most of all it was his father's voice, and beside Lord Tywin stood his sister, pale and beautiful, a torch burning in her hand. Joffrey was there as well, the son they'd made together, and behind them a dozen more dark shapes with golden hair. "'Sister, why has father brought us here?' "'Us? This is your place, brother.' This is your darkness. Her torch was the only light in the cavern. Her torch was the only light in the world. She turned to go. Stay with me, Jemmy pleaded. Don't leave me here alone. But they were leaving. Don't leave me in the dark. Something terrible lived down here. Give me a sword at least. I gave you a sword, Lord Tywin said. It was at his feet. Jemmy groped under the water until his hand closed upon the hilt. Nothing can hurt me so long as I have a sword. As he raised the sword, a finger of pale flame flickered at the point and crept up along the edge, stopping a hand's breadth from the hilt. 
The fire took on the color of the steel itself, so it burned with a silvery blue light, and the gloom pulled back. Crouching, listening, Jamie moved in a circle, ready for anything that might come out of the darkness. The water flowed into his boots, ankle-deep and bitterly cold. Beware the water, he told himself. There may be creatures living in it, hidden deeps. From behind came a great splash. Jamie whirled toward the sound, but the faint light revealed only Brienne of Tarth her hands bound in heavy chains. "'I swore to keep you safe,' the wench said stubbornly. "'I swore an oath.' Naked, she raised her hands to Jamie. "'Sir, please, if you would be so good.' The steel links parted like silk. "'A sword,' Brienne begged, and there it was, scabbard belt and all. She buckled it around her thick waist. The light was so dim that Jamie could scarcely see her, though they stood a scant few feet apart. In this light she could almost be a beauty, he thought. In this light she could almost be a knight. Brienne's sword took flame as well, burning silvery blue. The darkness retreated a little more. The flames will burn so long as you live, he heard Circe call. When they die, so must you. Sister, he shouted, stay with me, stay. There was no reply but the soft sound of retreating footsteps. Brienne moved her long sword back and forth, watching the silvery flames shift and shimmer. Beneath her feet, a reflection of the burning blade shone on the surface of the flat black water. She was as tall and strong as he remembered, yet it seemed to Jamie that she had more of a woman's shape now. "'Do they keep a bear down here?' Brienne was moving slow and wary, sword to hand, step, turn and listen. Each step made a little splash. "'A cave lion, dire wolves? Some bear?' Tell me, Jamie, what lives here? What lives in the darkness? Doom. No bear, he knew. No lion. Only doom. In the cool, silvery blue light of the swords, the big wench looked pale and fierce. I mislike this place. I'm not fond of it myself. Their blades made a little island of light, but all around them stretched a sea of darkness, unending. My feet are wet. We could go back the way they brought us. If you climbed on my shoulders, you'd have no trouble reaching that tunnel mouth. Then I could follow Circe. He could feel himself growing hard at the thought, and turned away so Brienne would not see. Listen. She put a hand on his shoulder, and he trembled at the sudden touch. She's warm. Something comes. Brienne lifted her sword to point off to his left. There. He peered into the gloom until he saw it, too. Something was moving through the darkness. He could not quite make it out. A man on a horse. No, two. Two riders, side by side. Down here, beneath the rock? It made no sense. Yet there came two riders on pale horses, men and mounts both armored. The destriers emerged from the blackness at a slow walk. They make no sound, Jimmy realized. No splashing, no clink of mail, nor clop of hoof. He remembered Eddard Stark riding the length of Ares' throne room, wrapped in silence. Only his eyes had spoken, a lord's eyes, cold and gray and full of judgment. "'Is it you, Stark?' Jimmy called. "'Come ahead. I never feared you living. I do not fear you dead.' Brienne touched his arm. "'There are more.' He saw them, too. They were armored all in snow, it seemed to him, and ribbons of mist swirled back from their shoulders. The visors of their helms were closed, but Jamie Lannister did not need to look upon their faces to know them. Five had been his brothers. Oswell Went and John Darry, Lewin Martell, a Prince of Dorne, the White Bull, Gerald Hightower, Sir Arthur Dane, Sword of the Morning, and beside them, crowned in mist and grief, with his long hair streaming behind him, rode Rhaegar Targaryen. Prince of Dragonstone, and rightful heir to the Iron Throne. "'You don't frighten me,' he called, turning as they split to either side of him. He did not know which way to face. "'I will fight you one by one or all together. But who is there for the wench to duel? She gets cross when you leave her out.' "'I swore an oath to keep him safe,' she said to Rhaegar's shade. "'I swore a holy oath.' "'We all swore oaths.' said Sir Arthur Dane, so sadly. The shades dismounted from their ghostly horses. When they drew their long swords, it made not a sound. 
He was going to burn the city, Jamie said, to leave Robert only ashes. He was your king, said Darry. You swore to keep him safe, said Went. And the children, them as well, said Prince Lewin. Prince Rhaegar burned with a cold light, now white, now red, now dark. I left my wife and children in your hands. I never thought he'd hurt them. Jamie's sword was burning less brightly now. I was with the king. Killing the king, said Sir Arthur. Cutting his throat, said Prince Lewin. The king you had sworn to die for, said the white bull. The fires that ran along the blade were guttering out, and Jamie remembered what Circe had said. No. Terra closed a hand about his throat. Then his sword went dark, and only Brienne's burned, as the ghosts came rushing in. No, he said. No, 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 no! Heart pounding, he jerked awake, and found himself in starry darkness amidst a grove of trees. He could taste bile in his mouth, and he was shivering with sweat, hot and cold at once. And when he looked down for his sword hand... His wrist ended in leather and linen, wrapped snug around an ugly stump. He felt sudden tears well up in his eyes. I felt it. I felt the strength in my fingers and the rough leather of the sword's grip. My hand. My lord, Kyburn knelt beside him, his fatherly face all crinkly with concern. What is it? I heard you cry out. Steel Shanks Walton stood above them, tall and dour. What is it? Why did you scream? A dream. Only a dream. Jamie stared at the camp around him, lost for a moment. I was in the dark, but I had my hand back. He looked at the stump and felt sick all over again. There's no place like that beneath a rock, he thought. His stomach was sour and empty, and his head was pounding where he'd pillowed it against the stump. Kyburn felt his brow. You still have a touch of fever. A fever dream. Jamie reached up. Help me. Steelshanks took him by his good hand and pulled him to his feet. "'Another cup of dream wine?' asked Kyburn. "'No, I've dreamt enough this night.' He wondered how long it was till dawn. Somehow he knew that if he closed his eyes he would be back in that dark, wet place again. "'Milk of the poppy, then, and something for your fever. You are still weak, my lord. You need to sleep, to rest.' "'That is the last thing I mean to do.' The moonlight glimmered pale upon the stump where Jamie had rested his head. The moss covered it so thickly he had not noticed before, but now he saw that the wood was white. It made him think of Winterfell and Ned Stark's heart tree. It was not him, he thought. It was never him. But the stump was dead, and so was Stark, and so were all the others. Prince Rhaegar and Sir Arthur and the children and Ares. Ares is most dead of all. "'Do you believe in ghosts, maester?' he asked Kyburn. The man's face grew strange. "'Once, at the Citadel, I came into an empty room and saw an empty chair. Yet I knew a woman had been there only a moment before. The cushion was dented where she'd sat, the cloth was still warm, and her scent lingered in the air. If we leave our smells behind us when we leave a room, surely something of our souls must remain when we leave this life?' Kyburn spread his hands. The archmaesters did not like my thinking, though. Well, Marwyn did, but he was the only one. Jamie ran his fingers through his hair. Walton, he said, saddle the horses. I want to go back. Back? Steelshanks regarded him dubiously. He thinks I've gone mad. And perhaps I have. I left something at Harrenhal. Lord Vargo holds it now, him and his bloody mummers. You have twice the men he does. If I don't serve you up to your father as commanded, Lord Bolton will have my hide. We press on to King's Landing. Once Jamie might have countered with a smile and a threat, but one-handed cripples do not inspire much fear. He wondered what his brother would do. Tyrion would find a way. Lannisters lie, Steelshanks. Didn't Lord Bolton tell you that? The man frowned suspiciously. What if he did? Unless you take me back to Harrenhal, the song I sing my father may not be the one the Lord of the Dreadfort would wish to hear. 
I might even say it was Bolton ordered my hand cut off, and Steel Shanks Walton who swung the blade. Walton gaped at him. That isn't so. No, but who will my father believe? Jamie made himself smile the way he used to smile when nothing in the world could frighten him. It will be so much easier if we just go back. We'd be on our way again soon enough, and I'd sing such a sweet song in King's Landing, you'll never believe your ears. You'd get the girl and a nice fat purse of gold as thanks. Gold? Walton liked that well enough. How much gold? I have him. Why, how much would you want? And by the time the sun came up, they were halfway back to Harrenhal. Jamie pushed his horse much harder than he had the day before, and Steel Shanks and the Northmen were forced to match his pace. Even so, it was midday before they reached the castle on the lake. Beneath the darkening sky that threatened rain, the immense walls and five great towers stood black and ominous. It looked so dead. The walls were empty, the gates closed and barred, but high above the barbican, a single banner hung limp. The black goat of Cohor, he knew. Jamie cupped his hands to shout, You in there! Open your gates or I'll kick them down! It was not until Kyburn and Steelshanks added their voices that a head finally appeared in the battlements above them. He goggled down at them, then vanished. A short time later they heard the portcullis being drawn upward. The gates swung open, and Jamie Lannister spurred his horse through the walls, scarcely glancing at the murder holes as he passed beneath them. He had been worried that the goat might not admit them, but it seemed as if the brave companions still thought of them as allies. Fools. The outer ward was deserted. Only the long, slate-roofed stables showed any signs of life, and it was not horses that entered to Jamie just then. He reined up and looked about. He could hear sounds from somewhere behind the Tower of Ghosts, and men shouting in half a dozen tongues. Steel Shanks and Kyburn rode up on either side. "'Get what you came back for, and we'll be gone again,' said Walton. "'I want no trouble with the mummers.' "'Tell your men to keep their hands on their sword hilts, and the mummers will want no trouble with you. Two to one, remember?' Jamie's head jerked round at the sound of a distant roar, faint but ferocious. It echoed off the walls of Harrenhal, and the laughter swelled up like the sea. All of a sudden he knew what was happening. "'Have we come too late?' His stomach did a lurch, and he slammed his spurs into his horse, galloping across the outer ward, beneath an arched stone bridge, around the wailing tower, and through the flowstone yard. They had her in the bear pit. King Harren the Black had wished to do even his bear-baiting in lavish style. The pit was ten yards across and five yards deep, walled in stone, floored with sand, and encircled by six tiers of marble benches. The brave companions filled only a quarter of the seats, Jamie saw as he swung down clumsily from his horse. The cell swords were so fixed on the spectacle beneath that only those across the pit noticed their arrival. Brienne wore the same ill-fitting gown she'd worn to supper with Roose Bolton. No shield, no breastplate, no chain mail, not even boiled leather, only pink satin and mirish lace. Maybe the goat thought she was more amusing when dressed as a woman. Half her gown was hanging off in tatters, and her left arm dripped blood where the bear had raked her. At least they gave her a sword. The wench held it one-handed, moving sideways, trying to put some distance between her and the bear. That's no good. The ring's too small. She needed to attack to make a quick end to it. Good steel was a match for any bear. But the wench seemed afraid to close. The mummers showered her with insults and obscene suggestions. This is none of our concern, Steel Shanks warned Jamie. Lord Bolton said the wench was theirs to do with as they liked. Her name's Brienne. Jamie descended the steps, past a dozen startled sellswords. Vargo Hoad had taken the Lord's box in the lowest tier. Lord Vargo! he called over the shouts. The Cohoric almost spilt his wine. King Slayer! The left side of his face was bandaged clumsily, the linen over his ear spotted with blood. Pull her out of there! Stay out of this, King Slayer, unless you'd like another thump. He waved a wine cup. Your Themuth bit off my ear. Small wonder her father will not ransom such a freak. A roar turned Jamie back around. The bear was eight feet tall. Gregor Clegane with a pelt, he thought, though likely smarter. The beast did not have the reach the mountain had with that monster greatsword of his, though. Bellowing in fury, the bear showed a mouth full of great yellow teeth, then fell back to all fours and went straight at Brienne. There's your chance, Jamie thought. Strike now! 
Instead, she poked out ineffectually with a point of her blade. The bear recoiled, then came on rumbling. Brienne slid to her left and poked again at the bear's face. This time he lifted a paw to swat the sword aside. He's wary, Timmy realized. He's gone up against other men. He knows swords and spears can hurt him. But that won't keep him off her long. Kill him! he shouted, but his voice was lost amongst all the other shouts. If Brienne heard, she gave no sign. She moved around the pit, keeping the wall at her back. Too close. If the bear pins her by the wall... The beast turned clumsily, too far and too fast. Quick as a cat, Brienne changed direction. There's the winch, I remember. She leapt in to land a cut across the bear's back. Roaring, the beast went up on his hind legs again. Brienne scrambled back away. Where's the blood? Then suddenly he understood. Jamie rounded on Howitt. You gave her a tourney sword. The goat brayed laughter, spraying him with wine and spittle. Of course. I'll pay her bloody ransom. Gold, sapphires, whatever you want. Pull her out of there. You want her? Go get her. So he did. He put his good hand on the marble rail and vaulted over, rolling as he hit the sand. The bear turned to the thump, sniffing, watching this new intruder warily. Jamie scrambled to one knee. Oh, what in seven hells do I do now? He filled his fist with sand. Kingslayer? he heard Brienne say, astonished. Jamie! He uncoiled, flinging the sand at the bear's face. The bear mauled the air and roared like blazes. What are you doing here? Something stupid. Get behind me. He circled a toe at her, putting himself between Brienne and the bear. You get behind. I have the sword. A sword with no point and no edge. Get behind me. He saw something half buried in the sand and snatched it up with his good hand. It proved to be a human jawbone with some greenish flesh still clinging to it, crawling with maggots. Charming, he thought, wondering whose face he held. The bear was edging closer, so Jamie whipped his arm around and flung bone, meat, and maggots at the beast's head. He missed by a good yard. I ought to lop my left hand off as well, for all the good it does me. Brienne tried to dart around, but he kicked her legs out from under her. She fell on the sand, clutching the useless sword. Jamie straddled her, and the bear came charging. There was a deep twang, and a feathered shaft sprouted suddenly beneath the beast's left eye. Blood and slaver ran from his open mouth, and another bolt took him in the leg. The bear roared, reared. He saw Jamie and Brienne again and lumbered toward them. More crossbows fired, the quarrels ripping through fur and flesh. At such short range, the bowmen could hardly miss. The shafts hit as hard as maces, but the bear took another step. The poor, dumb, brave brute. When the beast swiped at him, he danced aside, shouting, kicking sand. The bear turned to follow his tormentor, and took another two quarrels in the back. He gave one last, rumbling growl, settled back onto his haunches, stretched out on the blood-stained sand, and died. Brienne got back to her knees, clutching the sword and breathing short, ragged breaths. Steelshank's archers were winding their crossbows and reloading while the bloody mummers shouted curses and threats at them. Rorg and Three Toes had swords out, Jamie saw, and Zalo was uncoiling his whip. "'You threw my bear!' Varga Hoat shrieked. "'And I'll serve you the same if you give me trouble,' Steelshanks threw back. "'We're taking the winch.' "'Her name is Brienne,' Jamie said. Brienne, the maid of Tarth. You are still maiden, I hope. Her broad, homely face turned red. Yes. Oh, good, Jamie said. I only rescue maidens. To Howard, he said, you'll have your ransom for both of us. A Lannister pays his debts. Now fetch some ropes and get us out of here. Bugger that, Rorg growled. Kill them, Howard, or you'll bloody well wish you had. The Cahoric hesitated. Half his men were drunk, the Northmen stone sober, and there were twice as many. Some of the crossbowmen had reloaded by now. Pull them out, Howitt said, and then to Jamie, I have chosen to be merciful. Tell your lord father. I will, my lord. Not that it will do you any good. Not until they were half a league from Harrenhal and out of range of archers on the walls did Steel Shanks Walton let his anger show. Are you mad, Kingslayer? Did you mean to die? No man can fight a bear with his bare hands. One bare hand and one bare stump, Jamie corrected. But I hoped you'd kill the beast before the beast killed me. Elsewise, Lord Bolton would have peeled you like an orange, no? Steelshanks cursed him roundly for a fool of Lannister, spurred his horse, and galloped away up the column. Sir Jamie, 
Even in soiled pink satin and torn lace, Brienne looked more like a man in a gown than a proper woman. I am grateful, but you are well away. Why come back? A dozen quips came to mind, each crueler than the one before, but Jamie only shrugged. I dreamed of you, he said. Caitlin. Rob bid farewell to his young queen thrice, once in the godswood before the heart tree, in sight of gods and men, the second time beneath the portcullis, where Jane sent him forth with a long embrace and a longer kiss, and finally an hour beyond the tumblestone, when the girl came galloping up on a well-lathered horse to plead with her young king to take her along. Rob was touched by that, Caitlin saw, but abashed as well. The day was damp and gray, a drizzle had begun to fall, and the last thing he wanted was to call a halt to his march, so he could stand in the wet and console a tearful young wife in front of half his army. He speaks so gently, she thought as she watched them together, but there is anger underneath. All the time the king and queen were talking, Grey Wind prowled around them, stopping only to shake the water from his coat and bare his teeth at the rain. When at last Rob gave Jane one final kiss, dispatched a dozen men to take her back to River Run, and mounted his horse once more, the dire wolf raced off ahead as swift as an arrow loosed from a longbow. Queen Jane has a loving heart, I see, said lame Lothar Frey to Caitlin. Not unlike my own sister's. Why, I would wager a guess that even now Rosalind is dancing round the twins, chanting, Lady Tully, Lady Tully, Lady Roslyn Tully. By the morrow she'll be holding swatches of river run red and blue to her cheek to picture how she'll look in her bride's cloak. He turned in the saddle to smile at Edmure. But you are strangely quiet, Lord Tully. How do you feel, I wonder? Much as I did to the stone mill just before the war horn sounded, Edmure said, only half in jest. Lothar gave a good-natured laugh. Let us pray your marriage ends as happily, my lord. And may the gods protect us if it does not. Caitlin pressed her heels into her horse, leaving her brother and lame Lothar to each other's company. It had been her who had insisted that Jane remain at River Run, when Rob would sooner have kept her by his side. Lord Walder might well construe the Queen's absence from the wedding as another slight, yet her presence would have been a different sort of insult, salt in the old man's wound. Walder Frey has a sharp tongue and a long memory, she had warned her son. I do not doubt that you are strong enough to suffer an old man's rebukes as the price of his allegiance, but you have too much of your father in you to sit there while he insults Jane to her face. Rob could not deny the sense of that. Yet all the same, he resents me for it, Caitlin thought wearily. He misses Jane already, and some part of him blames me for her absence, though he knows it was good counsel. Of the six westerlings who had come with her son from the crag, only one remained by his side, Sir Reynold, Jane's brother, the royal banner-bearer. Rob had dispatched Jane's uncle, Rolf Spicer, to deliver young Martin Lannister to the Golden Tooth the very day he received Lord Tywin's assent to the exchange of captives. It was deftly done. Her son was relieved of his fear for Martin's safety. Galbart Glover was relieved to hear that his brother Robert had been put on a ship at Duskendale, Sir Rolf had important and honourable employment, and Greywind was at the king's side once more, where he belongs. Lady Westerling had remained at River Run with her children, Jane, her little sister Elena, and young Rollam, Rob's squire, who complained bitterly about being left. Yet that was wise as well. Oliver Frey had squired for Rob previously, and would doubtless be present for his sister's wedding. To parade his replacement before him would be as unwise as it was unkind. As for Sir Reynold, he was a cheerful young knight who swore that no insult of Walder Frey's could possibly provoke him. And let us pray that insults are all we need to contend with. Caitlin had her fears on that score, though. Her lord father had never trusted Walder Frey after the trident, and she was ever mindful of that. Queen Jane would be safest behind the high, strong walls of River Run, with a blackfish to protect her. Rob had even created him a new title, Warden of the Southern Marches. Sir Brynden would hold the trident if any man could. 
All the same, Caitlin would miss her uncle's craggy face, and Rob would miss his counsel. Sir Brynden had played a part in every victory her son had won. Galbart Glover had taken command of the scouts and outriders in his place, a good man, loyal and steady, but without the blackfish's brilliance. Behind Glover's screen of scouts, Rob's line of march stretched several miles. The great John led the van. Caitlin traveled in the main column, surrounded by plodding war horses with steel-clad men on their backs. Next came the baggage train, a procession of wains laden with food, fodder, camp supplies, wedding gifts, and the wounded too weak to walk, under the watchful eye of Sir Wendell Manderley and his White Harbor Knights. Herds of sheep and goats and scrawny cattle trailed behind, and then a little tail of footsore camp followers. Even farther back was Robin Flint and the rear guard. There was no enemy in back of them for hundreds of leagues, but Rob would take no chances. Thirty-five hundred they were, thirty-five hundred who had been blooded in the Whispering Wood, who had reddened to their swords at the Battle of the Camps, at Ox Cross, Ashmark, and the Crag, and all through the gold-rich hills of the Lannister West. Aside from her brother Edmure's modest retinue of friends, the lords of the Trident had remained to hold the riverlands while the king retook the north. Ahead awaited Edmure's bride and Rob's next battle. And for me, two dead sons, an empty bed, and a castle full of ghosts. It was a cheerless prospect. Brienne, where are you? Bring my girls back to me, Brienne. Bring them back safe. The drizzle that had sent them off turned into a soft, steady rain by midday, and continued well past nightfall. The next day the Northmen never saw the sun at all, but rode beneath leaden skies with their hoods pulled up to keep the water from their eyes. It was a heavy rain, turning roads to mud and fields to quagmires, swelling the rivers and stripping the trees of their leaves. The constant patter made idle chatter more bother than it was worth, so men spoke only when they had something to say, and that was seldom enough. "'We are stronger than we seem, my lady,' Lady Meg Mormont said as they rode. Caitlin had grown fond of Lady Meg and her eldest daughter, Dacey. They were more understanding than most in the matter of Jamie Lannister, she had found. The daughter was tall and lean, the mother short and stout, but they dressed alike in mail and leather, with a black bear of House Mormont on shield and surcoat. By Caitlin's lights that was queer garb for a lady, yet Dacey and Lady Meg seemed more comfortable, both as warriors and as women, than ever the girl from Tarth had been. "'I have fought beside the young wolf in every battle,' Dacey Mormont said cheerfully. "'He has not lost one yet.' "'No, but he has lost everything else,' Caitlin thought, but it would not do to say it aloud. The Northmen did not lack for courage, but they were far from home, with little enough to sustain them but for their faith in their young king. That faith must be protected at all costs. "'I must be stronger,' she told herself. "'I must be strong for Rob. "'If I despair, my grief will consume me. "'Everything would turn on this marriage. "'If Edmure and Rosalind were happy in one another, "'if the late Lord Frey could be appeased "'and his power once more wedded to Rob's, "'even then what chance will we have "'caught between Lannister and Greyjoy? "'It was a question Caitlin dared not dwell on, "'though Rob dwelt on little else. "'She saw how he studied his maps "'whenever they made camp,' searching for some plan that might win back the north. Her brother Edmure had other cares. "'You don't suppose all Lord Walder's daughters look like him, do you?' he wondered, as he sat in his tall, striped pavilion with Caitlin and his friends. "'With so many different mothers, a few of the maids are bound to turn up comely,' said Sir Mark Piper. "'But why should the old wretch give you a pretty one?' "'No reason at all,' said Edmure in a glum tone. It was more than Caitlin could stand. Cersei Lannister is comely, she said sharply. You'd be wiser to pray that Rosalind is strong and healthy, with a good head and a loyal heart. And with that she left them. Edmure did not take that well. The next day he avoided her entirely on the march, preferring the company of Mark Piper, Lyman Goodbrook, Patrick Malister, and the young Vances. They do not scold him except in jest, Caitlin told herself when they raced by her that afternoon with nary a word. I have always been too hard with Edmure, and now grief sharpens my every word. She regretted her rebuke. There was rain enough falling from the sky without her making more. And was it really such a terrible thing to want a pretty wife? She remembered her own childish disappointment the first time she had laid eyes on Eddard Stark. 
She had pictured him as a younger version of his brother Brandon, but that was wrong. Ned was shorter and plainer of face, and so somber. He spoke courteously enough, but beneath the words she sensed a coolness that was all at odds with Brandon, whose mirths had been as wild as his rages. Even when he took her maidenhood, their love had more of duty to it than of passion. We made Rob that night, though. We made a king together. And after the war at Winterfell I had love enough for any woman, once I found the good sweetheart beneath Ned's solemn face. There is no reason Edmure should not find the same with his Roslyn. As the gods would have it, their route took them through the Whispering Wood, where Rob had won his first great victory. They followed the course of the twisting stream on the floor of that pinched, narrow valley, much as Jamie Lannister's men had done that fateful night. It was warmer then, Caitlin remembered. The trees were still green, and the stream did not overflow its banks. Fallen leaves choked the flow now, and lay in sodden snarls among the rocks and roots, and the trees that had once hidden Rob's army had exchanged their green raiment for leaves of dull gold spotted with brown, and a red that reminded her of rust and dry blood. Only the spruce and the soldier pines still showed green, thrusting up at the belly of the clouds like tall dark spears. More than the trees have died since then, she reflected. On the night of the Whispering Wood, Ned was still alive in his cell beneath Aegon's high hill. Bran and Rickon were safe behind the walls of Winterfell. And Theon Greyjoy fought at Rob's side and boasted of how he had almost crossed swords with the Kingslayer. Would that he had. If Theon had died in place of Lord Karstark's sons, how much ill would have been undone. As they passed through the battleground, Caitlin glimpsed signs of the carnage that had been, an overturned helm filling with rain, a splintered lance, the bones of a horse. Stone cairns had been raised over some of the men who had fallen here, but scavengers had already been at them. Amidst the tumbles of rock she spied brightly colored cloth and bits of shiny metal. Once she saw a face peering out at her, the shape of the skull beginning to emerge from beneath the melting brown flesh. It made her wonder where Ned had come to rest. The silent sisters had taken his bones north, escorted by Hollis Mullen and a small honor guard. Had Ned ever reached Winterfell, to be interred beside his brother Brandon in the dark crypts beneath the castle? Or did the door slam shut at Moat Kalin before Hal and the sisters could pass? Thirty-five hundred riders wound their way along the valley floor through the heart of the Whispering Wood, but Caitlin Stark had seldom felt lonelier. Every league she crossed took her farther from River Run, and she found herself wondering whether she would ever see the castle again. Or was it lost to her forever like so much else? Five days later their scouts rode back to warn them that the rising waters had washed out the wooden bridge at Fairmarket. Galbert Glover and two of his bolder men had tried swimming their mounts across the turbulent Blue Fork at Ramsford. Two of the horses had been swept under and drowned, and one of the riders. Glover himself managed to cling to a rock until they could pull him in. "'The river hasn't run this high since spring,' Edmure said, "'and if this rain keeps falling it will go higher yet.' "'There's a bridge further upstream near Old Stones,' remembered Caitlin, who had often crossed these lands with her father. It's older and smaller, but if it still stands— It's gone, my lady, Galbart Glover said, washed away even before the one at Fairmarket. Rob looked to Caitlin. Is there another bridge? No, and the fords will be impassable. She tried to remember. If we cannot cross the Blue Fork, we'll have to go around it, through Seven Streams and Hagsmire. Bogs and bad roads are none at all, warned Edmure. The going will be slow— but we'll get there, I suppose. Lord Walder will wait, I'm sure, said Rob. Lothar sent him a bird from River Run. He knows we are coming. Yes, but the man is prickly and suspicious by nature, said Caitlin. He may take this delay as a deliberate insult. Very well, I'll beg his pardon for our tardiness as well. A sorry king I'll be, apologizing with every second breath. Rob made a wry face. I hope Bolton got across the trident before the rains began. The King's Road runs straight north. He'll have an easy march. Even afoot he should reach the twins before us. And when you've joined his men to yours, and seen my brother married, what then? Caitlin asked him. North, 
Rob scratched Grey Wind behind an ear. By the causeway? Against Moat Galen? He gave her an enigmatic smile. That's one way to go, he said, and she knew from his tone that he would say no more. A wise king keeps his own counsel, she reminded herself. They reached Old Stones after eight more days of steady rain and made their camp upon the hill overlooking the Blue Fork, within a ruined stronghold of the ancient River Kings. Its foundations remained amongst the weeds to show where the walls and keeps had stood, but the local small folk had long ago made off with most of the stones to raise their barns and septs and holdfasts. Yet in the center of what once would have been the castle's yard, a great carved sepulchre still rested, half hidden in waist-high brown grass amongst a stand of ash. The lid of the sepulchre had been carved into a likeness of the man whose bones lay beneath, but the rain and the wind had done their work. The king had worn a beard, they could see, but otherwise his face was smooth and featureless, with only vague suggestions of a mouth, a nose, eyes, and the crown about the temples. His hands folded over the shaft of a stone warhammer that lay upon his chest. Once the warhammer would have been carved with runes that told its name in history, but all that the centuries had worn away. The stone itself was cracked and crumbling at the corners, discolored here and there by spreading white splotches of lichen, while wild roses crept up over the king's feet almost to his chest. It was there that Caitlin found Rob, standing somber in the gathering dusk, with only grey wind beside him. The rain had stopped for once, and he was bareheaded. "'Does this castle have a name?' he asked quietly when she came up to him. Old stones, all the small folk called it when I was a girl, but no doubt it had some other name when it was still a hall of kings. She had camped here once with her father on their way to Seaguard. Peter was with us, too. There's a song, he remembered, Jenny of old stones, with the flowers in her hair. We're all just songs in the end, if we are lucky. She had played at being Jenny that day, had even wound flowers in her hair and Peter had pretended to be her prince of dragonflies. Caitlin could not have been more than twelve, Peter, just a boy. Rob studied the sepulchre. Whose grave is this? Here lies Christopher, the fourth of his name, king of the rivers and the hills. Her father had told her his story once. He ruled from the trident to the neck, thousands of years before Jenny and her prince, in the days when the kingdoms of the first men were falling one after the other before the onslaught of the Andals. The Hammer of Justice, they called him. He fought a hundred battles, and won nine and ninety, or so the singers say, and when he raised this castle it was the strongest in Westeros. She put a hand on her son's shoulder. He died in his hundredth battle, when seven Andal kings joined forces against him. The fifth, Christopher, was not his equal, and soon the kingdom was lost, and then the castle, and last of all the line. With Christopher the fifth died House Mud, that had ruled the Riverlands for a thousand years before the Andals came. His heir failed him. Rob ran a hand over the rough weathered stone. I had hoped to leave Jane with child. We tried often enough, but I'm not certain— it does not always happen the first time, though it did with you, nor even the hundredth. You are very young. Young and a king, he said. A king must have an heir. If I should die in my next battle, the kingdom must not die with me. By law, Sansa is next in line of succession, so Winterfell in the north would pass to her. His mouth tightened to her and her lord husband, Tyrion Lannister. I cannot allow that. I will not allow that. That dwarf must never have the north. No, Caitlin agreed. You must name another heir until such time as Jane gives you a son. She considered a moment. Your father's father had no siblings, but his father had a sister who married a younger son of Lord Raymar Royce of the junior branch. They had three daughters, all of whom wed Vale lordlings, a Wainwood and a Corbray for certain. The youngest, it might have been a Templeton, but— Mother! There was a sharpness in Rob's tone. You forget. My father had four sons. She had not forgotten. She had not wanted to look at it. Yet there it was. A snow is not a stark. 
"'John's more a Stark than some lordlings from the Vale "'who have never so much as set eyes on Winterfell. "'John is a brother of the Night's Watch, "'sworn to take no wife and hold no lands. "'Those who take the Black serve for life. "'So do the Knights of the King's Guard. "'That did not stop the Lannisters from stripping the white cloaks "'from Sir Barristan Selmy and Sir Boris Blount "'when they had no more use for them. "'If I send the Watch a hundred men in John's place, "'I'll wager they find some way to release him from his vows.' "'He is set on this.' Caitlin knew how stubborn her son could be. A bastard cannot inherit. Not unless he's legitimized by a royal decree, said Rob. There is more precedent for that than for releasing a sworn brother from his oath. Precedent, she said bitterly. Yes, Aegon the Fourth legitimized all his bastards on his deathbed. And how much pain, grief, war, and murder grew from that. I know you trust John, but can you trust his sons, or their sons? The Blackfire pretenders troubled the Targaryens for five generations until Baristan the Bold slew the last of them on the stepstones. If you make John legitimate, there is no way to turn him bastard again. Should he wed and breed, any sons you may have by Jane will never be safe. John would never harm a son of mine, no more than Theon Greyjoy would harm Bran or Rickon. Grey Wind leapt up atop King Christopher's crypt, his teeth bared. Rob's own face was cold. That is as cruel as it is unfair. John is no Theon. So you pray. Have you considered your sisters? What of their rights? I agree that the North must not be permitted to pass to the imp. But what of Arya? By law she comes after Sansa. Your own sister, true-born, and dead. No one has seen or heard of Arya since they cut father's head off. Why do you lie to yourself? Arya's gone, the same as Bran and Rickon, and they'll kill Sansa too once the dwarf gets a child from her. John is the only brother that remains to me. Should I die without issue, I want him to succeed me as king in the north. I had hoped you would support my choice. I cannot, she said. In all else, Rob, in everything, but not in this, this folly, do not ask it. I don't have to. I'm the king. Rob turned and walked off, Grey Wind bounding down from the tomb and loping after him. What have I done? Caitlin thought wearily as she stood alone by Christopher's stone sepulchre. First I anger Edmure, and now Rob, but all I have done is speak the truth. Are men so fragile they cannot bear to hear it? She might have wept then, had not the sky begun to do it for her. It was all she could do to walk back to her tent and sit there in the silence. In the days that followed, Rob was everywhere and anywhere, riding at the head of the van with the great John, scouting with Grey Wind, racing back to Robin Flint in the rearguard. Men said proudly that the young wolf was the first to rise each dawn and the last to sleep at night, but Caitlin wondered whether he was sleeping at all. He grows as lean and hungry as his dire wolf. "'My lady,' Meg Mormont said to her one morning as they rode through a steady rain, "'you seem so somber as autumn is. My lord husband is dead, as is my father. Two of my sons have been murdered. My daughter has been given to a faithless dwarf to bear his vile children. My other daughter is vanished and likely dead, and my last son and my only brother are both angry with me. What could possibly be amiss? That was more truth than Lady Meg would wish to hear, however. This is an evil reign, she said instead. We have suffered much, and there is more peril and more grief ahead. We need to face it boldly, with horns blowing and banners flying bravely. But this rain beats us down. The banners hang limp and sodden, and the men huddle under their cloaks and scarcely speak to one another. Only an evil rain would chill our hearts when most we need them to burn hot. Daisy Mormont looked up at the sky. I would sooner have water raining down on me than arrows. Caitlin smiled despite herself. You are braver than I am, I fear. Are all your Bear Island women such warriors? She bears, I, said Lady Meg. We have needed to be. In olden days the Iron Men would come raiding in their long boats or wildlings from the frozen shore. The men would be off fishing, like as not. The wives they left behind had to defend themselves and their children, or else be carried off. There's a carving on our gate, said Daisy. A woman in a bearskin, with a child in one arm suckling at her breast. In the other hand she holds a battle-axe. 
She's no proper lady, that one, but I always loved her. My nephew Jorah brought home a proper lady once, said Lady Meg. He won her an attorney. How she hated that carving. I and all the rest, said Daisy. She had hair like spun gold, that Liness, skin like cream, but her soft hands were never made for axes. Nor her tits for giving suck, her mother said bluntly. Caitlin knew of whom they spoke. Jorah Mormont had brought his second wife to Winterfell for feasts, and once they had guested for a fortnight. She remembered how young the Lady Liness had been, how fair and how unhappy. One night, after several cups of wine, she had confessed to Caitlin that the North was no place for a high tower of Oldertown. There was a Tully of River Run who felt the same once, she had answered gently, trying to console, but in time she found much here she could love. All lost now, she reflected. Winterfell and Ned, Bran and Rickon, Sansa, Arya, all gone, only Rob remains. Had there been too much of Liness Hightower in her, after all, and too little of the Starks? Would that I had known how to wield an axe, perhaps I might have been able to protect them better. Day followed a day, and still the rain kept falling. All the way up the Blue Fork they rode, past seven streams, where the river unraveled into a confusion of rills and brooks, then through Hagsmire, where glistening green pools waited to swallow the unwary, and the soft ground sucked at the hooves of their horses like a hungry babe at its mother's breast. The going was worse than slow. Half the wains had to be abandoned to the muck, their loads distributed amongst mules and draft horses. Lord Jason Malister caught up with them amidst the bogs of Hagsmire. There was more than an hour of daylight remaining when he rode up with his column, but Rob called a halt at once, and Sir Reynold Westerling came to escort Caitlin to the king's tent. She found her son seated beside a brazier, a map across his lap. Grey wind slept at his feet. The great John was with him, along with Galbart Glover, Meg Mormont, Edmure, and a man that Caitlin did not know, a fleshy, balding man with a cringing look to him. No lordling this one, she knew the moment she laid eyes on the stranger. Not even a warrior. Jason Malister rose to offer Caitlin his seat. His hair had almost as much white in it as brown, but the Lord of Seaguard was still a handsome man, tall and lean, with a chiseled, clean-shaven face, high cheekbones, and fierce blue-gray eyes. Lady Stark, it is ever a pleasure. I bring good tidings, I hope. We are in sore need of some, my lord. She sat, listening to the rain patter down noisily against the canvas overhead. Rob waited for Sir Reynold to close the tent flap. The gods have heard our prayers, my lords. Lord Jason has brought us the captain of the Myraham, a merchanter out of Old Town. Captain, tell them what you told me. Aye, your grace. He licked his thick lips nervously. My last port of call, a four sea guard, that was Lord's Port and Pike. The ironmen kept me there more than half a year, they did. King Balan's command. Only, well, the long and the short of it is he's dead. Balan Greyjoy? Caitlin's heart skipped a beat. You are telling us that Balan Greyjoy is dead? The shabby little captain nodded. You know how Pike's built on a headland, and part on rocks and islands off the shore with bridges between? The way I heard it in Lordsport, there was a blow coming in from the west, rain and thunder, and old King Balan was crossing one of them bridges when the wind got hold of it and just tore the thing to pieces. He washed up two days later, all bloated and broken. Crabs ate his eyes, I hear. The great John laughed. King Crabs, I hope, to sup upon such royal jelly, eh? The captain bobbed his head. Aye, but that's not all of it, no. He leaned forward. The brother's back. Victorian? asked Galbard Glover, surprised. Euron. Crow's Eye, they call him, as black a pirate as ever raised a sail. He's been gone for years, but Lord Balan was no sooner cold than there he was, sailing into Lordsport in his silence, black sails in a red hall, and crewed by mutes. He'd been to a shy and back, I heard. Wherever he was, though, he's home now, and he marched right into Pike and sat his arse in the sea-stone chair, and drowned Lord Botley in a cask of seawater when he objected. That was when I ran back to Myraham and slipped anchor, hoping I could get away whilst things were confused. And so I did, and here I am. Captain, said Rob, when the man was done, you have my thanks, and you will not go unrewarded. 
Lord Jason will take you back to your ship when we are done. Pray wait outside. That I will, Your Grace, that I will. No sooner had he left the king's pavilion than the great John began to laugh, but Rob silenced him with a look. Euron Greyjoy is no man's notion of a king, if half of what Theon said of him was true. Theon is the rightful heir, unless he's dead. But Victorion commands the Iron Fleet. I can't believe he would remain at Moat Kaelin while Euron Crow's eye holds the sea stone chair. He has to go back. There's a daughter as well, Galbard Glover reminded him. The one who holds Deepwood Mott, and Robert's wife and child? If she stays at Deepwood Mott, that's all she can hope to hold, said Rob. What's true for the brothers is even more true for her. She will need to sail home to oust Euron and press her own claim. Her son turned to Lord Jason Malister. You have a fleet at Seaguard? A fleet, your grace? Half a dozen longships and two war galleys. Enough to defend my own shores against raiders, but I could not hope to meet the Iron Fleet in battle. No, what I ask it of you. The Ironborn will be setting sail toward Pike, I expect. Theon told me how his people think. Every captain a king on his own deck. They will all want a voice in the succession. My lord, I need two of your longships to sail around the Cape of Eagles and up the neck to Greywater Watch. Lord Jason hesitated. A dozen streams drain the wet word, all shallow, silty, and uncharted. I would not even call them rivers. The channels are ever drifting and changing. There are endless sandbars, deadfalls, and tangles of rotting trees, and grey water watch moves. How are my ships to find it? Go up river, flying my banner. The conic men will find you. I want two ships to double the chances of my message reaching Howland Reed. Lady Meg shall go on one. Galbart on the second. He turned to the two he'd named. You'll carry letters for those lords of mine who remain in the north. But all the commands within will be false in case you have the misfortune to be taken. If that happens, you must tell them that you were sailing for the north, back to Bear Island or for the Stony Shore. He tapped a finger on the map. Mount Kalin is the key. Lord Balan knew that, which is why he sent his brother Victarion there with the hard heart of the great joy strength. Succession squabbles or no, the Ironborn are not such fools as to abandon Moat Kalin, said Lady Meg. No, Rob admitted. Victarion will leave the best part of his garrison, I'd guess. Every man he takes will be one less man we need to fight, however. And he will take many of his captains, count on that. The leaders. He will need such men to speak for him if he hopes to sit the sea stone chair. You cannot mean to attack up the causeway, Your Grace, said Galbart Glover. The approaches are too narrow. There is no way to deploy. No one has ever taken the moat. From the south, said Rob. But if we can attack from the north and west simultaneously and take the ironmen in the rear while they are beating off what they think is my main thrust up the causeway, then we have a chance. Once I link up with Lord Bolton in the phrase, I will have more than twelve thousand men. I mean to divide them into three battles and start up the causeway a half day apart. If the Greyjoys have eyes south of the neck, they will see my whole strength rushing headlong at Moat Kalin. Roose Bolton will have the rear guard, while I command the center. Great John, you shall lead the van against Moat Kalin. Your attack must be so fierce that the Ironborn have no leisure to wonder if anyone is creeping down on them from the north. The Great John chuckled. Your creepers best come fast, or my men will swarm those walls and win the moat before you show your face. I'll make a gift of it to you when you come dawdling up. That's a gift I should be glad to have, said Rob. Edmure was frowning. You talk of attacking the ironmen in the rear, sire, but how do you mean to get north of them? There are ways through the neck that are not on any map, uncle. Ways known only to the Kranigmen, narrow trails between the bogs and wet roads through the reeds that only boats can follow. He turned to his two messengers. Tell Howland Reed that he is to send guides to me two days after I have started up the causeway, to the center battle where my own standard flies. Three hosts will leave the twins, but only two will reach Moat Kalin. Mine own battle will melt away into the neck to re-emerge on the fever. If we move swiftly once my uncle's wed, we can all be in position by year's end. We will fall upon the moat from three sides on the first day of the new century, as the Iron Men are waking with hammers beating at their heads from the mead they'll quaff the night before. I like this plan, said the Great John. I like it well. 
Galbart Glover rubbed his mouth. There are risks. If the chronic men should fail you, we will be no worse than before. But they will not fail. My father knew the worth of Howland Reed. Rob rolled up the map and only then looked at Caitlin. Mother? She tensed. Do you have some part in this for me? Your part is to stay safe. Our journey through the Neck will be dangerous, and naught but battle awaits us in the north. But Lord Malister has kindly offered to keep you safe at Seaguard until the war is done. You will be comfortable there, I know. Is this my punishment for opposing him about Jon Snow? Or for being a woman, and worse, a mother? It took her a moment to realize that they were all watching her. They had known, she realized. Caitlin should not have been surprised. She had won no friends by freeing the Kingslayer, and more than once she had heard the great John say that women had no place on a battlefield. Her anger must have blazed across her face, because Galbart Glover spoke up before she said a word. My lady, his grace is wise. It's best you do not come with us. Sigurd will be brightened by your presence, Lady Caitlin, said Lord Jason Malister. He would make me a prisoner, she said. An honored guest. Lord Jason insisted. Caitlin turned to her son. "'I mean no offence to Lord Jason,' she said stiffly. "'But if I cannot continue on with you, I would sooner return to River Run. "'I left my wife at River Run. I want my mother elsewhere. "'If you keep all your treasures in one purse, you only make it easier for those who would rob you. "'After the wedding you shall go to Seaguard. That is my royal command.' "'Rob stood, and as quick as that her fate was settled.' He picked up a sheet of parchment. One more matter. Lord Balan has left chaos in his wake, we hope. I would not do the same. Yet I have no son as yet. My brothers Bran and Rickon are dead, and my sister is wed to a Lannister. I thought long and hard about who might follow me. I command you now, as my true and loyal lords, to fix your seals to this document as witnesses to my decision. A king indeed. Caitlin thought, defeated. She could only hope that the trap he'd planned for Moat Caitlin worked as well as the one in which he'd just caught her. Samwell. White tree, Sam thought. Please let this be white tree. He remembered white tree. White tree was on the maps he'd drawn on their way north. If this village was white tree, he knew where they were. Please, it has to be... He wanted that so badly that he forgot his feet for a little bit. He forgot the ache in his calves and his lower back and the stiff, frozen fingers he could scarcely feel. He even forgot about Lord Mormont and Craster and the Whites and the others. White tree, Sam prayed, to any god that might be listening. All wildling villages looked much alike, though. A huge weirwood grew in the center of this one, but a white tree did not mean white tree, necessarily. Hadn't the weirwood at White Tree been bigger than this one? Maybe he was remembering it wrong. The face carved into the bone-pale trunk was long and sad. Red tears of dried sap leaked from its eyes. Was that how it looked when we came north? Sam couldn't recall. Around the tree stood a handful of one-room hovels with sod roofs, a long hall built of logs and grown over with moss, a stone well, a sheepfold, but no sheep nor any people. The wildlings had gone to join Mance Raider in the Frost Fangs, taking all they owned except their houses. Sam was thankful for that. Night was coming on, and it would be good to sleep beneath the roof for once. He was so tired. It seemed as though he had been walking half his life. His boots were falling to pieces, and all the blisters on his feet had burst and turned to callus, but now he had new blisters under the callus, and his toes were getting frostbitten. But it was either walk or die, Sam knew. Jilly was still weak from childbirth and carrying the baby sides. She needed the horse more than he did. The second horse had died on them three days out from Craster's keep. It was a wonder she lasted that long, poor half-starved thing. Sam's weight had probably done for her. They might have tried riding double, but he was afraid the same thing would happen again. It's better that I walk. Sam left Jilly in the long hall to make a fire while he poked his head into the hovels. She was better at making fires. He could never seem to get the kindling to catch, and the last time he tried to strike a spark off flint and steel, he managed to cut himself on his knife. Jilly bound up the gash for him, but his hand was stiff and sore, even clumsier than it had been before. 
He knew he should wash the wound and change the binding, but he was afraid to look at it. Besides, it was so cold that he hated taking off his gloves. Sam did not know what he hoped to find in the empty houses. Maybe the wildlings had left some food behind. He had to take a look. John had searched the huts at White Tree on their way north. Inside one hovel, Sam heard a rustling of rats from a dark corner, but otherwise there was nothing in any of them but old straw, old smells, and some ashes beneath a smoke hole. He turned back to the weirwood and studied the carved face a moment. It is not the face we saw, he admitted to himself. The tree's not half as big as the one at White Tree. The red eyes wept blood, and he didn't remember that either. Clumsily, Sam sank to his knees. Old gods, hear my prayer. The seven were my father's gods, but I said my words to you when I joined the watch. Help us now. I fear we might be lost. We're hungry, too, and so cold. I don't know what gods I believe in now, but please, if you're there, help us. Jilly has a little son. That was all that he could think to say. The dusk was deepening, the leaves of the weirwood rustling softly, waving like a thousand blood-red hands. Whether John's gods had heard him or not, he could not say. By the time he returned to the long hall, Jilly had the fire going. She sat close to it, with her furs open, the babe at her breast. He's as hungry as we are, Sam thought. The old women had smuggled out food for them from Craster's, but they had eaten most of it by now. Sam had been a hopeless hunter, even at Hornhill, where game was plentiful, and he had hounds and huntsmen to help him. Here, in this endless, empty forest, the chances of him catching anything were remote. His efforts at fishing the lakes and half-frozen streams had been dismal failures as well. "'How much longer, Sam?' Jilly asked. "'Is it far still?' "'Not so far.' Not so far as it was. Sam shrugged out of his pack, eased himself awkwardly to the floor, and tried to cross his legs. His back ached so abominably from the walking that he would have liked to lean up against one of the carved wooden pillars that supported the roof. But the fire was in the center of the hall, beneath the smoke hole, and he craved warmth even more than comfort. Another few days should see us there. Sam had his maps, but if this wasn't White Tree, then they weren't going to be much use. We went too far east to get around that lake, he fretted, or maybe too far west when I tried to double back. He was coming to hate lakes and rivers. Up here there was never a ferry or bridge, which meant walking all the way around the lakes and searching for places to ford the rivers. It was easier to follow a game trail than to struggle through the brush, easier to circle a ridge instead of climbing it. If Bannon or Dywin were with us, we'd be at Castle Black by now, warming our feet in the common room. Bannon was dead, though, and Dywin gone with Gren and Dolores Ed and the others. The wall is three hundred miles long and seven hundred feet high, Sam reminded himself. If they kept going south, they had to find it, sooner or later. And he was certain that they had been going south. By day he took directions from the sun, and on clear nights they could follow the ice dragon's tail, though they hadn't traveled much by night since the second horse had died. Even when the moon was full, it was too dark beneath the trees, and it would have been so easy for Sam or the last Garon to break a leg. We have to be well south by now. We have to be. What he wasn't so certain of was how far east or west they might have strayed. They would reach the wall, yes. In a day or a fortnight, it couldn't be farther than that, surely. Surely. But where? It was the gate at Castle Black they needed to find, the only way through the wall for a hundred leagues. Is the wall as big as Craster used to say? Jilly asked. Bigger, Sam tried to sound cheerful. So big you can't even see the castles hidden behind it. But they're there, you'll see. The wall is all ice, but the castles are stone and wood. There are tall towers and deep vaults and a huge long hall with a great fire burning on the hearth day and night. It's so hot in there, Jilly, you'll hardly believe it. Could I stand by the fire, me and the boy? Not for a long time, just till we're good and warm. You can stand by the fire as long as you like. You'll have food and drink, too. Hot mulled wine and a bowl of venison stewed with onions, and Hobbs bread right out of the oven, so hot it will burn your fingers. Sam peeled a glove off to wriggle his own fingers near the flames, and soon regretted it. They had been numb with cold, but as feeling returned, they hurt so much he almost cried. Sometimes one of the brothers will sing, he said to take his mind off the pain. Darion sang best, but they sent him to Eastwatch. 
It is still Walder, though, and Toad. His real name is Totter, but he looks like a toad, so we call him that. He likes to sing, but he has an awful voice. Do you sing? Jilly rearranged her furs, and she moved the babe from one breast to the other. Sam blushed. I, I know some songs. When I was little, I liked to sing. I danced, too, but my lord father never liked me to. He said if I wanted to prance around, I should do it in the yard with a sword in my hand. Could you sing some Southern song for the babe? If you like, Sam thought for a moment. There's a song our Septon used to sing to me and my sisters when we were little and it was time for us to go to sleep. The Song of the Seven, it's called. He cleared his throat and softly sang. The father's face is stern and strong. He sits and judges right from wrong. He weighs our lives, the short and long, and loves the little children. The mother gives the gift of life and watches over every wife. Her gentle smile ends all strife, and she loves her little children. The warrior stands before the foe, protecting us where'er we go. With sword and shield and spear and bow, he guards the little children. The crone is very wise and old, and sees our fates as they unfold. She lifts her lamp of shining gold to lead the little children. The smith, he labors day and night to put the world of men to right. With hammer, plow, and fire bright, he builds for little children. The maiden dances through the sky. She lives in every lover's sigh. Her smiles teach the birds to fly and give dreams to little children. The seven gods who made us all are listening if we should call. So close your eyes, you shall not fall. They see you, little children. Just close your eyes, you shall not fall. They see you, little children. Sam remembered the last time he'd sung the song with his mother to lull baby Dickon to sleep. His father had heard their voices and come barging in angry. I will have no more of that, Lord Randall told his wife harshly. You ruined one boy with those soft septon songs. Do you mean to do the same to this babe? Then he looked at Sam and said, Go sing to your sisters if you must sing. I don't want you near my son. Jilly's babe had gone to sleep. He was such a tiny thing and so quiet that Sam feared for him. He didn't even have a name. He had asked Jilly about that, but she said it was bad luck to name a child before he was two. So many of them died. She tucked her nipple back inside her furs. That was pretty, Sam. You seem good. You should hear Darion. His voice is sweet as mead. We drank the sweetest mead the day Craster made me a wife. It was summer then and not so cold. Julie gave him a puzzled look. Did you only sing of six gods? Craster always told us you Southrons had seven. Seven, he agreed. But no one sings of the stranger. The stranger's face was the face of death. Even talking of him made Sam uncomfortable. We should eat something, a bite or two. Nothing was left but a few black sausages, as hard as wood. Sam sawed off a few thin slices for each of them. The effort made his wrist ache, but he was hungry enough to persist. If you chewed the slices long enough, they softened up and tasted good. Craster's wives seasoned them with garlic. After they had finished, Sam begged her pardon and went out to relieve himself and look after the horse. A biting wind was blowing from the north, and the leaves in the trees rattled at him as he passed. He had to break the thin scum of ice on top of the stream so the horse could get a drink. I had better bring her inside. He did not want to wake up at break of day to find that the horse had frozen to death during the night. Jilly would keep going even if that happened. The girl was very brave, not like him. He wished he knew what he was going to do with her back at Castle Black. She kept saying how she'd be his wife if he wanted, but Black Brothers didn't keep wives. Besides, he was a Tarly of Horn Hill. He could never wed a wildling. I'll have to think of something. So long as we reach the wall alive, the rest doesn't matter. It doesn't matter one little bit. Leading the hawks to the long hall was simple enough. Getting her through the door was not, but Sam persisted. Jilly was already dozing by the time he got the garron inside. He hobbled the horse in a corner, fed some fresh wood to the fire, took off his heavy cloak, and wriggled it down under the furs beside the wildling woman. His cloak was big enough to cover all three of them and keep in the warmth of their bodies. Jilly smelled of milk and garlic and musty old fur, but he was used to that by now. 
They were good smells, so far as Sam was concerned. He liked sleeping next to her. It made him remember times long past when he had shared a huge bed at Horn Hill with two of his sisters. That had ended when Lord Randall decided it was making him soft as a girl. Sleeping alone in my own cold cell never made me any harder or braver, though. He wondered what his father would say if he could see him now. I killed one of the others, my lord, he imagined, saying. I stabbed him with an obsidian dagger, and my sworn brothers call me San the Slayer now. But even in his fancies, Lord Randall only scowled, disbelieving. His dreams were strange that night. He was back at Horn Hill at the castle, but his father was not there. It was Sam's castle now. John Snow was with him, Lord Mormont too, the old bear, and Grin and Dolorous Ed and Pip and Toad and all his other brothers from the watch. But they wore bright colors instead of black. Sam sat at the high table and feasted them all, cutting thick slices off a roast with his father's great sword, Heartsbane. There were sweet cakes to eat and honeyed wine to drink. There was singing and dancing, and everyone was warm. When the feast was done, he went up to sleep, not to the Lord's bedchamber, where his mother and father lived, but to the room he had once shared with his sisters. Only instead of his sisters, it was Jilly waiting in the huge soft bed, wearing nothing but a big shaggy fur, milk leaking from her breasts. He woke suddenly, in cold and dread. The fire had burned down to smoldering red embers. The air itself seemed frozen, it was so cold. In the corner, the garron was whinnying and kicking the logs with their hind legs. Jilly sat beside the fire, hugging her babe. Sam sat up groggy, his breath puffing pale from his open mouth. The long hall was dark with shadows, black and blacker. The hair on his arms was standing up. "'It's nothing,' he told himself. "'I'm cold, that's all.' Then by the door one of the shadows moved. A big one. "'This is still a dream,' Sam prayed. "'Oh, make it that I'm still asleep. Make it a nightmare. He's dead, he's dead. I saw him die.' "'He's come for the babe,' Jilly wept. "'He smells him. A babe fresh-born stinks a life. He's come for the life.' The huge dark shape stooped under the lintel, into the hall, and shambled toward them. In the dim light of the fire the shadow became a small paw. "'Go away!' Sam croaked. "'We don't want you here!' Paul's hands were cold. His face was milk. His eyes shone a bitter blue. Hoarfrost whitened his beard, and on one shoulder hunched a raven, pecking at his cheek, eating the dead white flesh. Sam's bladder let go, and he felt the warmth ring down his legs. "'Jilly, calm the horse and lead her out. You do that.' "'You—' she started. "'I have the knife, the dragon-glass dagger.' He fumbled it out as he got to his feet. He'd given the first knife to Grin, but thankfully he'd remembered to take Lord Mormont's dagger before fleeing Craster's keep. He clutched it tight, moving away from the fire, away from Jilly and the babe. Paul? He meant to sound brave, but it came out in a squeak. Small Paul, do you know me? I'm Sam, Fat Sam, Sam the Scared. You saved me in the woods. You carried me when I couldn't walk another step. No one else could have done that, but you did. Sam backed away, knife in hand, sniveling. I am such a coward. Don't hurt us, Paul. Please, why would you want to hurt us? Jilly scrabbled backward across the hard dirt floor. The white turned his head to look at her, but Sam shouted, No! and he turned back. The raven on his shoulder ripped a strip of flesh from his pale, ruined cheek. Sam held the dagger before him, breathing like a blacksmith's bellows. Across the long hall, Jilly reached the garron. Gods, give me courage, Sam prayed. For once, give me a little courage, just long enough for her to get away. Small Paul moved toward him. Sam backed off until he came up against the rough log wall. He clutched the dagger with both hands to hold it steady. The white did not seem to fear the dragon glass. Perhaps he did not know what it was. He moved slowly, but small Paul had never been quick, even when he'd been alive. Behind him, Jilly murmured to calm the garron and tried to urge it toward the door, but the horse must have caught a whiff of the white's queer cold scent. Suddenly she balked, rearing, her hooves lashing at the frosty air. Paul swung toward the sound and seemed to lose all interest in Sam. There was no time to think, or pray, or be afraid. Samuel Tarley threw himself forward and plunged the dagger down into small Paul's back. Half turned, the white never saw him coming. The raven gave a shriek and took to the air. "'You're dead!' Sam screamed as he stabbed. "'You're dead! You're dead!' He stabbed and screamed again and again, tearing huge rents in Paul's heavy black cloak. Shards of dragon glass flew everywhere as the blades shattered on the iron mail beneath the wool. 
Sam's wail made a white mist in the black air. He dropped the useless hilt and took a hasty step backwards, a small paw twisted around. Before he could get out his other knife, the steel knife that every brother carried, the white's black hands locked beneath his chins. Paul's fingers were so cold they seemed to burn. They burrowed deep into the soft flesh of Sam's throat. "'Run, Jilly, run!' he wanted to scream, but when he opened his mouth only a choking sound emerged. His fumbling fingers finally found the dagger, but when he slammed it up into the white's belly, the point skidded off the iron links, and the blade went spinning from Sam's hand. Small Paul's fingers tightened inexorably and began to twist. "'He's going to rip my head off!' Sam thought in despair. His throat felt frozen, his lungs on fire. He punched and pulled at the white's wrists to no avail. He kicked Paul between the legs uselessly. The world shrank to two blue stars, a terrible crushing pain and a cold so fierce that his tears froze over his eyes. Sam squirmed and pulled, desperate, and then he lurched forward. Small Paul was big and powerful, but Sam still outweighed him, and the whites were clumsy. He had seen that on the fist. The sudden shift sent Paul staggering back a step, and the living man and the dead one went crashing down together. The impact knocked one hand from Sam's throat, and he was able to suck in a quick breath of air before the icy black fingers returned. The taste of blood filled his mouth. He twisted his neck around, looking for his knife, and saw a dull orange glow. The fire! Only ember and ashes remained, but still he could not breathe or think. Sam wrenched himself sideways, pulling Paul with him. His arms flailed against the dirt floor, groping, reaching, scattering the ashes, until at last they found something hot, a chunk of charred wood smoldering red and orange within the black. His fingers closed around it, and he smashed it into Paul's mouth so hard he felt teeth shatter. Yet even so, the white's grip did not loosen. Sam's last thoughts were for the mother who had loved him and the father he had failed. The long hall was spinning around him when he saw the wisp of smoke rising from between Paul's broken teeth. Then the dead man's face burst into flame, and the hands were gone. Sam sucked in air and rolled feebly away. The white was burning, hoar-frost dripping from his beard as the flesh beneath blackened. Sam heard the raven shriek, but Paul himself made no sound. When his mouth opened, only flames came out, and his eyes. It's gone. The blue glow is gone. He crept to the door. The air was so cold that it hurt to breathe, but such a fine, sweet hurt. He ducked from the long hall. Jilly, he called. Jilly, I killed it. Jill. She stood with her back against the weirwood, the boy in her arms. The whites were all around her. There were a dozen of them, a score or more. Some had been wildlings once, and still wore skins and hides. But more had been his brothers. Sam saw Lark, the sister-man, Softfoot, Riles. The wen on Chet's neck was black, his boils covered with a thin film of ice. And that one looked like Hake, though it was hard to know for certain with half his head missing. They had torn the poor Garon apart, and were pulling out her entrails with dripping red hands. Pale steam rose from her belly. Sam made a whimpery sound. It's not fair. Fair, the raven landed on his shoulder. Fair, far, fair. It flapped its wings and screamed along with Jilly. The whites were almost on her. He heard the dark red leaves of the weirwood rustling, whispering to one another in a tongue he did not know. The starlight itself seemed to stir, and all around them the trees groaned and creaked. Sam Tarley turned the color of curdled milk, and his eyes went wide as plates. Ravens! They were in the weirwood, hundreds of them, thousands, perched on the bone-white branches, peering between the leaves. He saw their beaks open as they screamed, saw them spread their black wings. Shrieking, flapping, they descended on the whites in angry clouds. They swarmed round Chet's face and pecked at his blue eyes. They covered the sister-man like flies. They plucked gobbets from inside Hake's shattered head. There were so many that when Sam looked up he could not see the moon. Go, said the bird on his shoulder. Go, go, go. Sam ran, puffs of frost exploding from his mouth. All around him the whites flailed at the black wings and sharp beaks that assailed them, falling in an eerie silence with never a grunt nor cry. But the ravens ignored Sam. He took Jilly by the hand and pulled her away from the weirwood. We have to go. But where? Jilly hurried after him, holding her baby. You killed our horse. How will we— Brother! The shout cut through the night, through the shrieks of a thousand ravens. Beneath the trees, a man muffled head to heels in mottled blacks and greys sat astride an elk. Here, the rider called. A hood shadowed his face. He's wearing blacks, Sam urged Jilly toward him. 
The elk was huge, a great elk, ten feet tall at the shoulder, with a rack of antlers near as wide. The creature sank to his knees to let them out. Here, the rider said, reaching down with a gloved hand to pull Jilly up behind him. Then it was Sam's turn. My thanks, he puffed. Only when he grasped the offered hand did he realize that the rider wore no glove. His hand was black and cold, with fingers hard as stone. Are you? When they reached the top of the ridge and saw the river, Sandor Clegane reined up hard and cursed. The rain was falling from a black iron sky, pricking the green and brown torrent with ten thousand swords. It must be a mile across, Arya thought. The tops of half a hundred trees poked up out the swirling waters, their limbs clutching for the sky like the arms of drowning men. Thick mats of sodden leaves choked the shoreline, and farther out in the channel she glimpsed something pale and swollen, a deer or perhaps a dead horse moving swiftly downstream. There was a sound, too, a low rumble at the edge of hearing, like the sound a dog makes just before he growls. Arya squirmed in the saddle and felt the links of the hound's mail digging into her back. His arms encircled her. On the left, the burned arm, he'd donned a steel vambrace for protection, but she'd seen him change the dressings, and the flesh beneath was still raw and seeping. If the burns pained him, though, Sandor Clegane gave no hint of it. Is this the Blackwater Rush? They had ridden so far in rain and darkness through trackless woods and nameless villages that Arya had lost all sense of where they were. It's a river we need to cross, that's all you need to know. Clegane would answer her from time to time, but he had warned her not to talk back. He had given her a lot of warnings that first day. The next time you hit me, I'll tie your hands behind your back, he'd said. The next time you try and run off, I'll bind your feet together. Scream or shout or bite me again, and I'll gag you. We can ride double, or I can throw you across the back of the horse trussed up like a sow for slaughter. Your choice. She had chosen to ride, but the first time they made camp she'd waited until she thought he was asleep and found a big jagged rock to smash his ugly head in. Quiet as a shadow, she told herself as she crept toward him, but that wasn't quiet enough. The hound hadn't been asleep after all, or maybe he'd woken. Whichever it was, his eyes opened, his mouth twitched, and he took the rock away from her as if she were a baby. The best she could do was kick him. I'll give you that one he said, when he flung the rock into the bushes. But if you're stupid enough to try again, I'll hurt you. Why don't you just kill me like you did Micah? Arya had screamed at him. She was still defiant then, more angry than scared. He answered by grabbing the front of her tunic and yanking her within an inch of his burned face. The next time you say that name, I'll beat you so bad you'll wish I killed you. After that he rolled her in his horse blanket every night when he went to sleep, and tied ropes around her top and bottom so she was bound up as tight as a babe in swaddling clothes. It has to be the black water, Arya decided as she watched the rain lash the river. The hound was Joffrey's dog. He was taking her back to the Red Keep to hand to Joffrey and the Queen. She wished that the sun would come out so she could tell which way they were going. The more she looked at the moss on the trees, the more confused she got. The black water wasn't so wide at King's Landing, but that was before the rains. The fords will all be gone, Sandor Clegane said, and I wouldn't care to try and swim over, neither. There's no way across, she thought. Lord Berwick will catch us for sure. Clegane had pushed his big black stallion hard, doubling back thrice to throw off pursuit, once even riding half a mile up the center of a swollen stream. But Arya still expected to see the outlaws every time she looked back. She had tried to help them by scratching her name on the trunks of trees when she went in the bushes to make water, but the fourth time she did it he caught her, and that was the end of that. It doesn't matter, Arya told herself. Thoros will find me in his flames. Only he hadn't, not yet anyway, and once they crossed the river... Far away town shouldn't be far, the hound said where Lord Root stables old King Andahar's two-headed war horse. Maybe we'll ride across. Arya had never heard of old King Andahar. She'd never seen a horse with two heads, either, especially not one who could run on water, but she knew better than to ask. She held her tongue and sat stiff as the hound turned the stallion's head and trotted along the ridgeline, following the river downstream. At least the rain was at their backs this way. She'd had enough of it stinging her eyes half-blind and washing down her cheeks, 
like she was crying. Wolves never cry, she reminded herself again. It could not have been much past noon, but the sky was dark as dusk. They had not seen the sun in more days than she could count. Arya was soaked to the bone, saddle sore, sniffling and achy. She had a fever, too, and sometimes shivered uncontrollably, but when she'd told the hound that she was sick, he'd only snarled at her. "'Wipe your nose and shut your mouth,' he told her. Half the time he slept in the saddle now, trusting his stallion to follow whatever rutted farm track or game trail they were on. The horse was a heavy courser, almost as big as a destrier, but much faster. "'Stranger,' the hound called him. Arya had tried to steal him once when Clegane was taking a piss against a tree, thinking she could ride off before he could catch her. Stranger had almost bitten her face off. He was gentle as an old gelding with his master, but otherwise he had a temper as black as he was. She had never known a horse so quick to bite or kick. They rode beside the river for hours, splashing across two muddy vassal streams, before they reached the place that Sandor Clegane had spoken of. "'Lord Haraway's town,' he said, and then when he saw it, "'Seven hells!' The town was drowned and desolate. The rising waters had overflowed the river banks. All that remained of Haraway Town was the upper story of a Darl and Wattle Inn, the seven-sided dome of a sunken sept, two-thirds of a stone round tower, some mouldy thatch roofs, and a forest of chimneys. But there was smoke coming from the tower, Arya saw, and below one arched window a wide, flat-bottomed boat was chained up tight. The boat had a dozen oarlocks and a pair of great, carved wooden horse-heads mounted fore and aft. The two-headed horse, she realized. There was a wooden house with a sod roof right in the middle of the deck, and when the hound cupped his hands around his mouth and shouted, two men came spilling out. A third appeared in the window of the round tower, clutching a loaded crossbow. What do you want? he shouted across the swirling brown waters. Take us over, the hound shouted back. The men in the boat conferred with one another. One of them, a grizzled, gray-haired man with thick arms and a bent back, stepped to the rail. "'It will cost you.' "'Then I'll pay.' "'With what?' Arya wondered. The outlaws had taken Clegane's gold, but maybe Lord Berwick had left him some silver and copper. A ferry ride shouldn't cost more than a few coppers. The ferrymen were talking again. Finally the bent-backed one turned away and gave a shout. Six more men appeared, pulling up hoods to keep the rain off their heads. Still more squirmed out the hold-fast window and leapt down onto the deck. Half of them looked enough like the bent-backed man to be his kin. Some of them undid the chains and took up long poles, while the others slid heavy, wide-bladed oars through the locks. The ferry swung about and began to creep slowly toward the shallows, oars stroking smoothly on either side. Sandor Clegane rode down the hill to meet it. When the aft end of the boat slammed into the hillside, the ferryman opened a wide door beneath the carved horse's head and extended a heavy oaken plank. Stranger balked at the water's edge, but the hound put his heels into the cautious flank and urged him up the gangway. The bent-backed man was waiting for them on deck. "'Wet enough for you, sir?' he asked, smiling. The hound's mouth gave a twitch. "'I need your boat, not your bloody wit!' He dismounted and pulled Arya down beside him. One of the boatmen reached for Stranger's bridle. "'I wouldn't,' Clegane said, as the horse kicked. The man leapt back, slipped on the rain-slick deck, and crashed onto his arse, cursing. The ferryman with the bent back wasn't smiling any longer. "'We can get you across,' he said sourly. "'It will cost you a gold piece. Another for the horse, a third for the boy.' Three dragons?' Clegane gave a bark of laughter. "'For three dragons I should own the bloody ferry!' Last year might be you could. But with this river I'll need extra hands on the poles and oars just to see we don't get swept a hundred miles out to sea. Here's your choice. Three dragons, or you teach that hell horse how to walk on water. I like an honest brigand. Have it your way. Three dragons. When you put us ashore safe on the north bank. I'll have them now, or we don't go. The man thrust out a thick calloused hand, palm up. Clegane rattled his longsword to loosen the blade in the scabbard. "'Here's your choice. Gold on the north bank or steel on the south?' The ferryman looked up at the hound's face. Arya could tell that he didn't like what he saw there. He had a dozen men behind him, strong men with oars and hardwood poles in their hands, but none of them were rushing forward to help him. 
Together they could overwhelm Sandor Clegane, though he'd likely kill three or four of them before they took him down. How do I know you're good for it? The bent-backed man asked after a moment. He's not, she wanted to shout. Instead, she bit her lip. Knight's honor, the hound said, unsmiling. He's not even a knight. She did not say that, either. That will do, the ferryman spat. Come on, then, we can have you across before dark. Tie the horse up, I don't want him spooking when we're underway. There's a brazier in the cabin if you and your son want to get warm. I'm not his stupid son, said Arya furiously. That was even worse than being taken for a boy. She was so angry that she might have told them who she really was, only Sandor Clegane grabbed her by the back of the collar and hoisted her one-handed off the deck. How many times do I need to tell you to shut your bloody mouth? He shook her so hard her teeth rattled, then let her fall. Get in there and get dry like the man said. Arya did as she was told. The big iron brazier was glowing red, filling the room with a sullen, suffocating heat. It felt pleasant to stand beside it, to warm her hands and dry off a little bit, but as soon as she felt the deck move under her feet, she slipped back out through the forward door. The two-headed horse eased slowly through the shallows, picking its way between the chimneys and rooftops of drowned Haraway. A dozen men labored at the oars, while four more used the long poles to push off whenever they came too close to a rock, a tree, or a sunken house. The bent-backed man had the rudder. Rain pattered against the smooth planks of the deck and splashed off the tall carved horse heads fore and aft. Arya was getting soaked again, but she didn't care. She wanted to see. The man with a crossbow still stood in the window of the round tower, she saw. His eyes followed her as the ferry slid by underneath. She wondered if he was this Lord Root that the hound had mentioned. He doesn't look much like a lord, but then she didn't look much like a lady either. Once they were beyond the town and out in the river proper, the current grew much stronger. Through the gray haze of rain, Arya could make out a tall stone pillar on the far shore that surely marked the ferry landing, but no sooner had she seen it than she realized that they were being pushed away from it, downstream. The oarsmen were rowing more vigorously now, fighting the rage of the river. Leaves and broken branches swirled past as fast as if they'd been fired from a scorpion. The men with the poles leaned out and shoved away anything that came too close. It was windier out here, too. Whenever she turned to look upstream, Arya got a face full of blowing rain. Stranger was screaming and kicking as the deck moved underfoot. If I jumped over the side, the river would wash me away before the hound even knew that I was gone. She looked back over her shoulder and saw Sandor Clegane struggling with his frightened horse, trying to calm him. She would never have a better chance to get away from him. I might drown, though. John used to say that she swam like a fish, but even a fish might have trouble in this river. Still, drowning might be better than King's Landing. She thought about Joffrey and crept up to the prow. The river was murky brown with mud and lashed by rain, looking more like soup than water. Arya wondered how cold it would be. I couldn't get much wetter than I am now. She put a hand on the rail. But a sudden shout snapped her head about before she could leap. The ferrymen were rushing forward, poles in hand. For a moment she did not understand what was happening. Then she saw it, an uprooted tree, huge and dark, coming straight at them. A tangle of roots and limbs poked up out of the water as it came, like the reaching arms of a great kraken. The oarsmen were backing water frantically, trying to avoid a collision that could capsize them or stove their hull in. The old man had wrenched the rudder about, and the horse at the prow was swinging downstream, but too slowly, glistening brown and black, the tree rushed toward them like a battering ram. It could not have been more than ten feet from their prow when two of the boatmen somehow caught it with their long poles. One snapped, and the long, splintering crack made it sound as if a ferry were breaking up beneath them. But the second man managed to give the trunk a hard shove, just enough to deflect it away from them. The tree swept past the ferry with inches to spare, its branches scrabbling like claws against the horsehead. Only just when it seemed as if they were clear, one of the monster's upper limbs dealt them a glancing thump. The ferry seemed to shudder, and Arya slipped, landing painfully on one knee. The man with the broken pole was not so lucky. She heard him shout as he stumbled over the side. Then the raging brown water closed over him, and he was gone in the time it took Arya to climb back to her feet. One of the other boatmen snatched up a coil of rope, but there was no one to throw it to. Maybe he'll wash up some place downstream, Arya tried to tell herself, but the thought had a hollow ring. She had lost all desire to go swimming. 
When Sandor Clegane shouted to her to get back inside before he beat her bloody, she went meekly. The ferry was fighting to turn back on course by then, against a river that wanted nothing more than to carry it down to the sea. When they finally came ashore, it was a good two miles down river of their usual landing. The boat slammed into the bank so hard that another pole snapped, and Arya almost lost her feet again. Sandor Clegane lifted her onto Stranger's back as if she weighed no more than a doll. The boatmen stared at them with dull, exhausted eyes, all but the bent-backed man, who held his hand out. Six dragons, he demanded. Three for the passage and three for the man I lost. Sandor Clegane rummaged in his pouch and shoved a crumpled wad of parchment into the boatman's palm. There, take ten. Ten? The ferryman was confused. What's this now? A dead man's note, good for nine thousand dragons or nearabouts. The hound swung up into the saddle behind Arya and smiled down unpleasantly. Ten of it is yours. I'll be back for the rest one day, so see you don't go spending it. The man squinted down at the parchment. Writing. What good's writing? You promised gold. Knight's honor, you said. Knights have no bloody honor. Time you learned that, old man. The hound gave Stranger the spur and galloped off through the rain. The ferrymen threw curses at their backs, and one or two threw stones. Clegane ignored rocks and words alike, and before long they were lost in the gloom of the trees, the river a dwindling roar behind them. The ferry won't cross back till morning, he said, and that lot won't be taking paper promises from the next fools to come along. If your friends are chasing us, they're going to need to be bloody strong swimmers. Arya huddled down and held her tongue. Foul armor, Gullus, she thought sullenly. Sir Illin, Sir Merin, King Joffrey, Queen Circe, Dunson, Polliver, Wrath the Sweetling, Sir Gregor, and the Tickler, and the Hound, the Hound, the Hound. By the time the rain stopped and the clouds broke, she was shivering and sneezing so badly that Clegane called a halt for the night and even tried to make a fire. The wood they gathered proved too wet, though. Nothing he tried was enough to make the spark catch. Finally, he kicked it all apart in disgust. Seven bloody hells, he swore. I hate fires. They sat on damp rocks beneath an oak tree, listening to the slow patter of water dripping from the leaves, as they ate a cold supper of hard bread, moldy cheese, and smoked sausage. The hound sliced the meat with his dagger, and narrowed his eyes when he caught Arya looking at the knife. Don't even think about it. I wasn't, she lied. He snorted to show what he thought of that, but he gave her a thick slice of sausage. Arya worried it with her teeth, watching him all the while. I never beat your sister, the hound said, but I'll beat you if you make me. Stop trying to think up ways to kill me. None of it will do you a bit of good. She had nothing to say to that. She gnawed on the sausage and stared at him coldly. Hard as stone, she thought. At least you look at my face. I'll give you that, you little she-wolf. How do you like it? I don't. It's all burned and ugly. Clegane offered her a chunk of cheese on the point of his dagger. You're a little fool. What good would it do if you did get away? You'd just get caught by someone worse. I would not, she insisted. There is no one worse. You never knew my brother. Gregor once killed a man for snoring. His own man. When he grinned, the burned side of his face pulled tight, twisting his mouth in a queer, unpleasant way. He had no lips on that side, and only the stump of an ear. I did so know your brother. Maybe the mountain was worse now that Arya thought about it. Him and Dunson and Polliver and Rath the Sweetling and the Tickler. The hound seemed surprised. And how would Ned Stark's precious little daughter come to know the likes of them? Gregor never brings his pet rats to court. I know them from the village. She ate the cheese and reached for a hunk of hard bread. The village by the lake where they caught Gendry, me and Hot Pie. They caught Lamy Greenhands, too, but Rath the Sweetling killed him because his leg was hurt. Clegane's mouth twitched. Caught you? My brother caught you? That made him laugh a sour sound, part rumble and part snarl. Gregor never knew what he had, did he? He couldn't have, or he would have dragged you back kicking and screaming to King's Landing and dumped you in Cersei's lap. 
Oh, that's bloody sweet. I'll be sure and tell him that before I cut his heart out. It wasn't the first time he had talked of killing the mountain. But he's your brother, Arya said dubiously. Didn't you ever have a brother you wanted to kill? He laughed again. Or maybe a sister? He must have seen something in her face then, for he leaned closer. Sansa, that's it, isn't it? The wolf bitch wants to kill the pretty bird. No. Arya spat back at him. I'd like to kill you. Because I hacked your little friend in two? I've killed a lot more than him, I promise you. You think that makes me some monster? Well, maybe it does. But I saved your sister's life, too. The day the mob pulled her off her horse, I cut through them and brought her back to the castle. Else she would have gotten what Lala Stokeworth got. And she sang for me. You didn't know that, did you? Your sister sang me a sweet little song. You're lying, she said at once. You don't know half as much as you think you do. The Blackwater? Where in seven hells do you think we are? Where do you think we're going? The scorn in his voice made her hesitate. Back to King's Landing, she said. You're bringing me to Joffrey and the Queen? That was wrong, she realized all of a sudden, just from the way he asked the questions. But she had to say something. Stupid, blind little wolf bitch. His voice was rough and hard as an iron rasp. Bugger Joffrey, bugger the queen, and bugger that twisted little gargoyle she calls a brother. I'm done with their city, done with their king's guard, done with Lannisters. What's a dog to do with lions, I ask you? He reached for his water skin, took a long pull. As he wiped his mouth, he offered the skin to Arya and said, The river was the trident, girl, the trident, not the black water. Make the map in your head if you can. On the morrow we should reach the King's Road. We'll make good time after that, straight up to the Twins. It's going to be me who hands you over to that mother of yours. Not the noble Lightning Lord or that flaming fraud of a priest, the monster. He grinned at the look on her face. You think your outlaw friends are the only ones who can smell a ransom? Dondarrion took my gold, so I took you. You're worth twice what they stole from me, I'd say. Maybe even more if I sold you back to the Lannisters like you fear, but I won't. Even a dog gets tired of being kicked. If this young wolf has the wits the gods gave a toad, he'll make me a lordling and beg me to enter his service. He needs me, though he may not know it yet. Maybe I'll even kill Gregor for him. He'd like that. He'll never take you, she spat back. Not you! Then I'll take as much gold as I can carry, laugh in his face, and ride off. If he doesn't take me, he'd be wise to kill me. But he won't. Too much his father's son, from what I hear. Fine with me. Either way, I win. And so do you, she-wolf. So stop whimpering and snapping at me. I'm sick of it. Keep your mouth shut and do as I tell you, and maybe we'll even be in time for your uncle's bloody wedding. John. The mare was blown, but John could not let up on her. He had to reach the wall before the Magnar. He would have slept in the saddle if he'd had one. Lacking that, it was hard enough to stay a horse while awake. His wounded leg grew ever more painful. He dare not rest long enough to let it heal. Instead, he ripped it open anew each time he mounted up. When he crested a rise and saw the brown, rutted King's Road before him wending its way north through hill and plain, he patted the mare's neck and said, now all we need to do is follow the road, girl. Soon the wall. His leg had gone as stiff as wood by then, and fever had made him so light-headed that twice he found himself riding in the wrong direction. Soon the wall. He pictured his friends drinking mulled wine in the common hall. Hob would be with his kettles, Donald Noy at his forge, Maester Amon in his rooms beneath the rookery. And the old bear. Sam Grin. Dolorous Ed, Dywin with his wooden teeth. John could only pray that some had escaped the fist. Egret was much in his thoughts as well. He remembered the smell of her hair, the warmth of her body, and the look on her face as she slit the old man's throat. You were wrong to love her, a voice whispered. You were wrong to leave her, a different voice insisted. 
He wondered if his father had been torn the same way when he left John's mother to return to Lady Caitlin. He was pledged to Lady Stark, and I am pledged to the Night's Watch. He almost rode through Molestown so feverish that he did not know where he was. Most of the village was hidden underground, only a handful of small hovels to be seen by the light of the waning moon. The brothel was a shed no bigger than a privy, its red lantern creaking in the wind, a bloodshot eye peering through the blackness. John dismounted at the adjoining stable, half stumbling from the mare's back as he shouted two boys awake. "'I need a fresh mount, with saddle and bridle,' he told them, in a tone that brooked no argument. They brought him that, a skin of wine as well, and half a loaf of brown bread. "'Wake the village,' he told them. "'Warn them. There are wildlings south of the wall. Gather your goods and make for Castle Black.' He pulled himself onto the black gelding they'd given him, gritting his teeth at the pain in his leg, and rode hard for the north. As the stars began to fade in the eastern sky, the wall appeared before him, rising above the trees in the morning mists. Moonlight glimmered pale against the ice. He urged the gelding on, following the muddy slick road, until he saw the stone towers and timbered halls of Castle Black, huddled like broken toys beneath a great cliff of ice. By then the wall glowed pink and purple with the first light of dawn. No sentries challenged him as he rode past the outbuildings. No one came forth to bar his way. Castle Black seemed as much a ruin as Grey Guard. Brown, brittle weeds grew between cracks in the stones of the courtyards. Old snow covered the roof of the flint barracks and lay in drifts against the north side of Hardin's Tower, where John used to sleep before being made the old bear's steward. Fingers of soot streaked the Lord Commander's Tower, where the smoke had boiled from the windows. Mormont had moved to the King's Tower after the fire, but John saw no lights there either. From the ground he could not tell if there were sentries walking the wall seven hundred feet above. But he saw no one on the huge switchback stair that climbed the south face of the ice like some great wooden thunderbolt. There was smoke rising from the chimney of the armory, though, only a wisp, almost invisible against the grey northern sky, but it was enough. John dismounted and limped toward it. Warmth poured out the open door like the hot breath of summer. Within, one-armed Donald Noy was working his bellows at the fire. He looked up at the noise. John Snow? None else. Despite fever, exhaustion, his leg, the Magnar, the old man, Ygritte, Mance, despite it all, John smiled. It was good to be back, good to see Noy with his big belly and pinned-up sleeve, his jaw bristling with black stubble. The smith released his grip on the bellows. "'Your face!' He had almost forgotten about his face. "'A skin-changer tried to rip out my eye.' Noy frowned. "'Scarred or smooth, it's a face I thought I'd seen the last of. We heard you'd gone over to Mance Raider.' John grasped the door to stay upright. "'Who told you that?' "'Jarman Buckwell. He returned a fortnight past.' His scouts claim they saw you with their own eyes, riding along beside the wildling column and wearing a sheepskin cloak. Noy eyed him. I see the last part's true. It's all true, John confessed, as far as it goes. Should I be pulling down a sword to gut you, then? No, I was acting on orders. Corn Halfhand's last command. Noy, where is the garrison? Defending the wall against your wildling friends. Yes, but where? Everywhere. I'm a dog's head was seen at Woods Watch by the pool. Rattleshirt at Long Barrow, the weeper near Ice Mark. All along the wall. They're here, they're there, they're climbing near Queen's Gate, they're hacking at the gates of Greyguard, they're mashing against East Watch. But one glimpse of a black cloak and they're gone. Next day they're somewhere else. John swallowed a groan. Faints. Mance wants us to spread ourselves thin, don't you see? And Bowen Marsh has obliged him. The gate is here, the attack is here. Noy crossed the room. Your leg is drenched in blood. John looked down dully. It was true. His wound had opened again. An arrow wound? A wildling arrow. It was not a question. Noy had only one arm, but that was thick with muscle. He slid it under John's to help support him. You're white as milk and burning hot besides. I'm taking you to Amon. There's no time. There are wildlings south of the wall coming up from Queen's Crown to open the gate. How many? Noy half carried John out the door. A hundred and twenty, and well armed for wildlings. Bronze armor, some bits of steel. How many men are left here? 
Forty odd, said Donald Noy, the crippled and infirm, and some green boy still in training. If Marsh is gone, who did he name as Castellan? The armorer laughed. Sir Winton, gods preserve him. Last night in the castle and all. The thing is, Stout seems to have forgotten, and no one's been rushing to remind him. I suppose I'm as much a commander as we have now, the meanest of the cripples. That was for the good, at least. The one-armed armorer was hard-headed, tough, and well-seasoned in war. Sir Winton Stout, on the other hand, well, he had been a good man once, everyone agreed, but he had been eighty years a ranger, and both strength and wits were gone. Once he'd fallen asleep at supper and almost drowned in a bowl of pea soup. "'Where's your wolf?' Noy asked as they crossed the yard. "'Ghost, I had to leave him when I climbed the wall. I'd hoped he'd make his way back here.' "'I'm sorry, lad. There's been no sign of him.' They limped up to the maester's door and the long wooden keep beneath the rookery. The armorer gave it a kick. Clytus! After a moment, a stooped, round-shouldered little man in black peered out. His small pink eyes widened at the sight of John. Lay the lad down. I'll fetch the maester. A fire was burning in the hearth, and the room was almost stuffy. The warmth made John sleepy. As soon as Noy eased him down onto his back, he closed his eyes to stop the world from spinning. He could hear the ravens quarking and complaining in the rookery above. Snow, one bird was saying. Snow, snow, snow. That was Sam's doing, John remembered. Had Samuel Tarley made it home safely, he wondered, or only the birds? Maester Amon was not long in coming. He moved slowly, one spotted hand on Clytus's arm, as he shuffled forward with small, careful steps. Around his thin neck his chain hung heavy, gold and silver links glinting amongst iron, lead, tin, and other base metals. "'John Snow,' he said, "'you must tell me all you've seen and done when you are stronger. Donald, put a kettle of wine on the fire, and my irons as well. I will want them red-hot. Clytus, I shall need that good sharp knife of yours.' The maester was more than a hundred years old, shrunken, frail, hairless, and quite blind— but if his milky eyes saw nothing, his wits were still as sharp as they had ever been. "'There are wildlings coming,' John told him, as Clytus ran a blade up the leg of his breeches, slicing the heavy black cloth, crusty with old blood and sodden with new. "'From the south we climbed the wall.' Maester Amon gave John's crude bandage a sniff when Clytus cut it away. "'We? Oui? I was with them. Corn Halfhand commanded me to join them.' John winced as the maester's finger explored his wound, poking and prodding. "'The Magnar of Fen—' "'Ah! That hurts!' He clenched his teeth. "'Where is the old bear?' "'John, it grieves me to say, but Lord Commander Mormont was murdered at Craster's Keep, at the hands of his sworn brothers.' Br "'Our own men?' Amon's words hurt a hundred times worse than his fingers. John remembered the old bear as last he'd seen him, standing before his tent with his raven on his arm, croaking for corn. Mormont gone? He had feared it ever since he'd seen the aftermath of battle on the fist, yet it was no less a blow. Who was it? Who turned on him? Garth of Old Town, Hollow Lophand, Dirk. Thieves, cowards, and killers, the lot of them. We should have seen it coming. The watch is not what it was. Too few honest men to keep the rogues in line. Donald Noy turned the maester's blades in the fire. A dozen true men made it back. Dolores said, Giant, your friend the Aurochs. We had the tale from them. Only a dozen? Two hundred men had left Castle Black with Lord Commander Mormont. Two hundred of the watch's best. Does this mean Marsh is Lord Commander, then? The old pomegranate was amiable and a diligent first steward but he was woefully ill-suited to face a wildling host. "'For the nonce, until we can hold a choosing,' said Maester Amon. "'Clytus, bring me the flask.' "'A choosing? With Corin Halfhand and Sir Jeremy Riker both dead, and Ben Stark still missing, who was there? Not Bowen Marsh or Sir Winton Stout, that was certain. Had Thorin Smallwood survived the fist, or Sir Otten Withers?' No, it will be Cotter Pike or Sir Dennis Malister. Which, though? The commanders of the Shadow Tower and East Watch were good men, but very different. Sir Dennis courtly and cautious, as chivalrous as he was elderly. Pike younger, bastard-born, rough-tongued, and bold to a fault. 
Worse, the two men despised each other. The old bear had always kept them far apart at opposite ends of the wall. The Malisters had a bone-deep mistrust of the ironborn, John knew. A stab of pain reminded him of his own woes. The maester squeezed his hand. Clytus is bringing milk of the puppy. John tried to rise. I don't need— You do, Amon said firmly. This will hurt. Donald Noy crossed the room and shoved John back onto his back. Be still or I'll tear you down. Even with only one arm, the smith handled him as if he were a child. Clytus returned with a green flask and a rounded stone cup. Maester Amon poured it full. Drink this. John had bitten his lip in his struggles. He could taste blood mingled with a thick, chalky potion. It was all he could do not to retch it back up. Clytus brought a basin of warm water, and Maester Amon washed the pus and blood from his wound. Gentle as he was, even the lightest touch made John want to scream. The Magnar's men are disciplined, and they have bronze armor, he told them. Talking helped keep his mind off his leg. The Magnar is a lord on Skagos, Noy said. There were Skagossans at East Watch when I first came to the wall. I remember hearing them talk of him. John was using the word in its older sense, I think, Maester Amon said. Not as a family name, but as a title. It derives from the old tongue. It means lord, John agreed. Steer is the Magnar of some place called Then in the far north of the Frostfangs. He has a hundred of his own men and a score of raiders who know the gift almost as well as we do. Mance never found the horn, though. That's something. The horn of winter. That's what he was digging for up along the milk water. Maester Amon paused, washcloth in hand. The horn of winter is an ancient legend. Does the king beyond the wall truly believe that such a thing exists? They all do, said John. Egrit said they opened a hundred graves, graves of kings and heroes all over the valley of the Milkwater, but they never— Who is Egrit? Donald Noy asked pointedly. A woman of the free folk. How could he explain Egrit to them? She's warm and smart and funny, and she can kiss a man or slit his throat. She's with Steer, but she's not— She's young, only a girl in truth. Wild, but she— She killed an old man for building a fire. His tongue felt thick and clumsy. The milk of the poppy was clouding his wits. I broke my vows with her. I never meant to, but it was wrong. Wrong to love her, wrong to leave her. I wasn't strong enough. The half-hand commanded me, ride with them, watch. I must not walk. I... His head felt as if it were packed with wet wool. Maester Amon sniffed John's wound again. Then he put the bloody cloth back in the basin and said, Donald the hot knife, if you please. I shall need you to hold him still. I will not scream, John told himself when he saw the blade glowing red hot. But he broke that vow as well. Donald Noy held him down while Clytus helped guide the maester's hand. John did not move except to pound his fist against the table again and again and again. The pain was so huge he felt small and weak and helpless inside it, a child whimpering in the dark. A grit, he thought, when the stench of burning flesh was in his nose and his own shriek echoing in her ears. A grit, I had to. For half a heartbeat the agony started to ebb. But then the iron touched him once again, and he fainted. When his eyelids fluttered open, he was wrapped in thick wool and floating. He could not seem to move, but that did not matter. For a time he dreamed that Egrit was with him, tending him with gentle hands. Finally he closed his eyes and slept. The next waking was not so gentle. The room was dark, but under the blankets the pain was back, a throbbing in his leg that turned into a hot knife at the least motion. John learned that the hard way when he tried to see if he still had a leg. Gasping, he swallowed a scream and made another fist. John? A candle appeared, and a well-remembered face was looking down on him, big ears and all. You shouldn't move. Pip? John reached up, and the other boy clasped his hand and gave it a squeeze. I thought you'd gone with the old pomegranate. Now he thinks I'm too small and green. Gren's here, too. I'm here, too. Gren stepped to the other side of the bed. I fell asleep. John's throat was dry. Water, he gasped. Gren brought it and held it to his lips. I saw the fist, he said after a long swallow. The blood and the dead horses. Noise said a dozen made it back. Who? Dywin did. Giant. Dolores said, Sweet Donald Hill, Ulmer, 
Left hand Lou, Garth Greyfeather, four or five more. Me. Sam? Gran looked away. He killed one of the others, John. I saw it. He stabbed him with that dragon-glass knife you made him, and we started calling him Sam the Slayer. He hated that. Sam the Slayer. John could hardly imagine a less likely warrior than Sam Tarley. What happened to him? We left him. Gren sounded miserable. I shook him and screamed at him, even slapped his face. Giant tried to drag him to his feet, but he was too heavy. Remember in training how he'd curl up on the ground and lie there whimpering? At Craster's he wouldn't even whimper. Dirk and Allo were tearing up the walls looking for food. Garth and Garth were fighting. Some of the others were raping Craster's wives. Dolores Head figured Dirk's punch would kill all the loyal men to keep us from telling what they'd done. And they had us two to one. We'd up Sam with the old bear. He wouldn't move, John. You were his brother, he almost said. How could you leave him amongst wildlings and murderers? He might still be alive, said Pip. He might surprise us all and come riding up tomorrow. With Mance Raider's head, I Gren was trying to sound cheerful, John could tell. Sam the Slayer. John tried to sit again. It was as much a mistake as the first time. He cried out, cursing. Gren, go wake Maester Amon, said Pip. Tell him John needs more milk of the poppy. Yes, John thought. No, he said. The Magnar... We know, said Pip. The sentries on the wall have been told to keep one eye on the south, and Donald Noy dispatched some men to Weatherback Ridge to watch the King's Road. Maester Amon's sent birds to East Watch in the Shadow Tower, too. Maester Amon shuffled to the bedside, one hand on Gren's shoulder. John, be gentle with yourself. It is good that you have woken, but you must give yourself time to heal. We drowned the wound with boiling wine and closed you up with a poultice of nettle, mustard seed, and moldy bread. But unless you rest... I can't, John fought through the pain to sit. Mance will be here soon. Thousands of men, giants, mammoths. Has word been sent to Winterfell, to the king? Sweat dripped off his brow. He closed his eyes a moment. Gren gave Pip a strange look. He doesn't know. John, said Maester Amon, much and more happened while you were away, and little of it good. Balan Greyjoy has crowned himself again and sent his long ships against the north. Kings sprout like weeds at every hand, and we have sent appeals to all of them, yet none will come. They have more pressing uses for their swords, and we are far often forgotten. And Winterfell... John, be strong. Winterfell is no more. No more? John stared at Amon's white eyes and wrinkled face. My brothers are at Winterfell, Bran and Rickon. The maester touched his brow. I am so very sorry, John. Your brothers died at the command of Theon Greyjoy, after he took Winterfell in his father's name. When your father's bannermen threatened to retake it, he put the castle to the torch. Your brothers were avenged, Gren said. Bolton's son killed all the ironmen, and it said he's flaying Theon Greyjoy inch by inch for what he did. I'm sorry, John, Pip squeezed his shoulder. We are all. John had never liked Theon Greyjoy, but he had been their father's ward. Another spasm of pain twisted up his leg, and the next he knew he was flat on his back again. There's some mistake, he insisted. At Queen's Crown I saw a direwolf, a grey direwolf. Grey, it knew me. If Bran was dead, could some part of him live on in his wolf, as Oral lived within his eagle? Drink this, Gran held a cup to his lips. John drank. His head was full of wolves and eagles, the sound of his brother's laughter. The faces above him began to blur and fade. They can't be dead. Theon would never do that. And Winterfell? Grey granite oak and iron crows wheeling around the towers, steam rising off the hot pools in the godswood, the stone kings sitting on their thrones. How could Winterfell be gone? When the dreams took him, he found himself back home once more, splashing in the hot pools beneath a huge white weirwood that had his father's face. Egrit was with him, laughing at him, shedding her skins till she was naked as her name day, trying to kiss him, but he couldn't, not with his father watching. He was the blood of Winterfell, a man of the Night's Watch. I will not father a bastard, he told her. I will not, I will not. You know nothing, Jon Snow, she whispered, her skin dissolving in the hot water, the flesh beneath sloughing off her bones until only skull and skeleton remained. 
and the pool bubbled thick and red. Caitlin. They heard the green fork before they saw it, an endless Ciceris, like the growl of some great beast. The river was a boiling torrent, half again as wide as it had been last year, when Rob had divided his army here and vowed to take a fray to bride as the price of his crossing. He needed Lord Walder and his bridge then, and he needs them even more now. Caitlin's heart was full of misgivings as she watched the murky green waters swirl past. There is no way we will ford this, nor swim across, and it could be a moon's turn before these waters fall again. As they neared the twins, Rob donned his crown and summoned Caitlin and Edmure to ride beside him. Sir Reynold Westerling bore his banner, the dire wolf of Stark on its ice-white field. The gatehouse towers emerged from the rain like ghosts, hazy grey apparitions that grew more solid the closer they rode. The Frey stronghold was not one castle but two, mirror images in wet stone standing on opposite sides of the water, linked by a great arched bridge. From the centre of its span rose the water tower, the river running straight and swift below. Channels had been cut from the banks to form moats that made each twin an island. The rains had turned the moats to shallow lakes. Across the turbulent waters, Caitlin could see several thousand men encamped round the eastern castle, their banners hanging like so many drowned cats from the lances outside their tents. The rain made it impossible to distinguish colors and devices. Most were gray, it seemed to her, though beneath such skies the whole world seemed gray. Tread lightly here, Rob, she cautioned her son. Lord Walder has a thin skin and a sharp tongue, and some of these sons of his will doubtless take after their father. You must not let yourself be provoked. I know the phrase, mother. I know how much I wronged them, and how much I need them. I shall be as sweet as a septon. Caitlin shifted her seat uncomfortably. If we are offered refreshment when we arrive, on no account refuse. Take what is offered, and eat and drink where all can see. If nothing is offered, ask for bread and cheese and a cup of wine. I'm more wet than hungry. Rob, listen to me. Once you have eaten of his bread and salt, you have the guest right and the laws of hospitality protect you beneath his roof. Rob looked more amused than afraid. I have an army to protect me, mother. I don't need to trust in bread and salt. But if it pleases Lord Walder to serve me stewed crow smothered in maggots, I'll eat it and ask for a second bowl. Four phrase rode out from the western gatehouse, wrapped in heavy cloaks of thick grey wool. Caitlin recognized Sir Ryman, son of the late Sir Stevron, Lord Walder's firstborn. With his father dead, Ryman was heir to the twins. The face she saw beneath his hood was fleshy, broad, and stupid. The other three were likely his own sons, Lord Walder's great-grandsons. Edmure confirmed as much. Edwin is eldest, the pale slender man with a constipated look. The wiry one with a beard is Black Walder, a nasty bit of business. Peter is on the bay, the lad with the unfortunate face. Peter Pimple, his brothers call him. Only a year or two older than Rob, but Lord Walder married him off at ten to a woman thrice his age. Gods, I hope Rosalind doesn't take after him. They halted to let their hosts come to them. Rob's banner drooped on its staff, and the steady sound of rainfall mingled with the rush of the swollen green fork on their right. Grey wind edged forward, tail stiff, watching through slitted eyes of dark gold. When the phrase were a half-dozen yards away, Caitlin heard him growl, a deep rumble that seemed almost one with the rush of the river. Rob looked startled. Grey wind, to me! To me! Instead, the dire wolf leapt forward, snarling. Sir Ryman's palfrey shied off with a whinny of fear, and Peter Pimples reared and threw him. Only Black Walder kept his mountain hand. He reached for the hilt of a sword. No! Rob was shouting. Grey wind, here, here! Caitlin spurred between the dire wolf and the horses. Mud spattered from the hooves of her mare as she cut in front of Grey Wind. The wolf veered away, and only then seemed to hear Rob calling. "'Is this how a Stark makes amends?' Black Walder shouted with naked steel in hand. "'A poor greeting, I call it, to set your wolf upon us. Is this why you've come?' Sir Raymond had dismounted to help Peter Pimple back to his feet. The lad was muddy, but unhurt. "'I've come to make my apology for the wrong I did your house, and to see my uncle wed.' Rob swung down from the saddle. "'Peter, take my horse.' Yours is almost back to the stable. Peter looked at his father and said, I can ride behind one of my brothers. 
The phrase made no sign of obeisance. You come late, Sir Raymond declared. The rains delayed us, said Rob. I sent a bird. I do not see the woman. By the woman, Sir Raymond meant Jane Westerling, all knew. Lady Caitlin smiled apologetically. Queen Jane was weary after so much travel, says. No doubt she will be pleased to visit when times are more settled. My grandfather will be displeased. Though Black Walder had sheathed his sword, his tone was no friendlier. I have told him much of the lady, and he wished to behold her with his own eyes. Edwin cleared his throat. We have chambers prepared for you in the water tower, your grace, he told Rob with careful courtesy, as well as for Lord Tully and Lady Stark. Your lord's bannermen are also welcome to shelter under our roof and partake of the wedding feast. And my men? asked Rob. My lord grandfather regrets that he cannot feed nor house so large a host. We have been sore pressed to find fodder and provender for our own levies. Nonetheless, your men shall not be neglected. If they will cross and set up their camp beside our own, we will bring out enough casks of wine and ale for all to drink the health of Lord Edmure and his bride. We have thrown up three great feast tents on the far bank to provide them with some shelter from the rains. Your lord father is most kind. My men will thank him. They have had a long wet ride. Edmure Tully edged his horse forward. When shall I meet my betrothed? She waits for you within, promised Edwin Frey. You will forgive her if she seems shy, I know. She has been awaiting this day most anxiously, poor maid. But perhaps we might continue this out of the rain? Truly, Sir Raymond mounted up again, pulling Peter Pimple up behind him. If you would follow me, my father awaits. He turned the palfrey's head back toward the twins. Edmure fell in beside Caitlin. The late Lord Frey might have seen fit to welcome us in person, he complained. I am his liege lord as well as his son-to-be, and Rob's his king. When you are one and ninety, brother, see how eager you are to go riding in the rain. Yet she wondered if that was the whole truth of it. Lord Walder normally went about in a covered litter, which would have kept the worst of the rain off him. A deliberate slight? If so, it might be the first of many yet to come. There was more trouble at the gatehouse. Grey wind balked in the middle of the drawbridge, shook the rain off, and howled at the portcullis. Rob whistled impatiently. Grey wind! What is it? Grey wind with me! But the dire wolf only bared his teeth. He does not like this place, Caitlin thought. Rob had to squat and speak softly to the wolf before he would consent to pass beneath the portcullis. By then, lame Lothar and Walder Rivers had come up. It's the sound of the water, he fears, Rivers said. Beasts know to avoid the river in flood. A dry kennel and a leg of mutton will see him right again, said Lothar cheerfully. Shall I summon our master of hounds? He's a dire wolf, not a dog, said Rob, and dangerous to men he does not trust. Sir Reynolds, stay with him. I won't take him into Lord Walder's hall like this. Deftly done, Caitlin decided. Rob keeps the westerling out of Lord Walder's sight as well. Gout and brittle bones had taken their toll of old Walder Frey. They found him propped up in his high seat with a cushion beneath him and an ermine robe across his lap. His chair was black oak, its back carved into the semblance of two stout towers joined by an arched bridge, so massive that its embrace turned the old man into a grotesque child. There was something of the vulture about Lord Walder, and rather more of the weasel. His bald head, spotted with age, thrust out from his scrawny shoulders on a long pink neck. Loose skin dangled beneath his receding chin, his eyes were runny and clouded, and his toothless mouth moved constantly, sucking at the empty air as a babe sucks at his mother's breast. The eighth Lady Frey stood beside Lord Walder's high seat. At his feet sat a somewhat younger version of himself, a stooped thin man of fifty, whose costly garb of blue wool and grey satin was strangely accented by a crown and collar ornamented with tiny brass bells. The likeness between him and his lord was striking, save for their eyes. Lord Frey's small, dim, and suspicious. The others large, amiable, and vacant. Caitlin recalled that one of Lord Walder's brood had fathered a half-wit long years ago. During past visits the Lord of the Crossing had always taken care to hide this one away. Did he always wear a fool's crown, or is that meant as mockery of Rob? It was a question she dare not ask. 
Frey, sons, daughters, children, grandchildren, husbands, wives, and servants crowded the rest of the hall, but it was the old man who spoke. "'You will forgive me if I do not kneel, I know. My legs no longer work as they did, though that which hangs between them serves well enough. <laughs> His mouth split in a toothless smile as he eyed Rob's crown. "'Some would say it's a poor king who crowns himself with bronze, your grace.' "'Bronze and iron are stronger than gold and silver,' Rob answered. "'The old kings of winter wore such a sword-crown. "'Small good it did them when the dragons came, eh? "'That eh, seemed to please the lackwit, who bobbed his head from side to side, "'jingling crown and collar. "'Sire,' Lord Walder said, "'forgive my Aegon the noise. "'He has less wits than a Cranach man, and he's never met a king before. "'One of Stevron's boys. We call him Jingle Bell.' "'Sir Stevron mentioned him, my lord.' Rob smiled at the lackwit. "'Well met, Aegon. Your father was a brave man.' Jingle Bell jingled his bells. A thin line of spit ran from one corner of his mouth when he smiled. "'Shave your royal breath. You'd do as well talking to a chamber pot. Lord Walder shifted his gaze to the others. "'Well, Lady Caitlin, I see you have returned to us.' And young Sir Edmure, the victor of the stone mill? Lord Tully, now, I'll need to remember that. You're the fifth Lord Tully I've known. I outlived the other four. Your bride's about here somewhere. I suppose you want to look at her. I would, my lord. Then you'll have it, but clothed. She's a modest girl and a maid. You won't see her naked till the bedding. Lord Walder cackled. <laughs> soon enough, soon enough. He craned his head about. Benfrey, go fetch your sister. Be quick about it. Lord Tully has come all the way from Riverrun. A young knight in a quartered surcoat bowed and took his leave, and the old man turned back to Rob. And where's your bride, your grace, the fair Queen Jane? A westerling of the crag, I'm told. I left her at Riverrun, my lord. She was too weary for more travel, as we told Sir Rynan. That makes me grievous sad. I wanted to behold her with mine own weak eyes. We all did, eh? Isn't that so, my lady? Pale, wispy Lady Frey seemed startled that she would be called upon to speak. Uh, yes, my lord. We all so wanted to pay homage to Queen Jane. She must be fair to look on. She is most fair, my lady. There was an icy stillness in Rob's voice that reminded Caitlin of his father. The old man either did not hear it or refused to pay it any heed. Fairer than my own get, eh? Elsewise, how could her face and form have made the king's grace forget his solemn promise? Rob suffered the rebuke with dignity. No words can set that right, I know. But I have come to make my apologies for the wrong I did your house, and to beg for your forgiveness, my lord. Apologies, eh? Yes, you vowed to make one, I recall. I'm old, but I don't forget such things. Not like some kings, it seems. The young remember nothing when they see a pretty face and a nice firm pair of tits, isn't that so? I was the same. Some might say I still am. <laughs> They'd be wrong, though, wrong as you were. But now you're here to make amends. It was my girls you spurned, though. Mayhaps it's them should hear you beg for pardon, Your Grace. My maiden girls. Here, yeah, have a look at them. When he waggled his fingers, a flurry of femininity left their places by the walls to line up beneath the dais. Jingle Bell started to rise as well, his bells ringing merrily, but Lady Frey grabbed the lackwit sleeve and tugged him back down. Lord Walder named the names. My Lady Arwin, he said of a girl of fourteen. Shiri, my youngest true-born daughter. Amy and Marianne are granddaughters. I married Amy to Sir Pate of Seven Streams, but the mountain killed the oaf, so I got her back. That's a Circe, but we call her Little Bee. Her mother's a Beesbury. More granddaughters. One's a Walder, and the others, well, they have names, whatever they are. I'm Mary, Lord Grandfather, one girl said. You're noisy, that's for certain. Next to Noisy is my daughter, Titer. Then another Walder. 
Alex, Marissa, are you Marissa? I thought you were. She's not always bald. The maester shaved her hair off, but he swears it will soon grow back. The twins are Sarah and Sarah. He squinted down at one of the younger girls. Heh, are you another Walder? The girl could not have been more than four. I'm Sir Amon Rivers's Walder, Lord Great Grandfather, she curtsied. How long have you been talking? Not that you like to have anything sensible to say. Your father never did. He's a bastard's son besides. <laughs> Go away. I wanted only phrase up here. The King of the North has no interest in base stock. Lord Walder glanced to Rob as Jingle Bell bobbed his head and chimed. There they are, all maidens. Well, and one widow, but there are some who like a woman broken in. You might have had any one of them. It would have been an impossible choice, my lord, said Rob with careful courtesy. They're all too lovely, Lord Walder snorted, and they say my eyes are bad. Some will do well enough, I suppose. Others, well, it makes no matter. They weren't good enough for the king in the north. Eh? Now, what is it you have to say? My ladies, Rob looked desperately uncomfortable. But he had known this moment must come, and he faced it without flinching. All men should keep their word, kings most of all. I was pledged to marry one of you, and I broke that vow. The fault is not in you. What I did was not done to slight you, but because I loved another. No words can set it right, I know, yet I come before you to ask forgiveness, that the frays of the crossing and the Starks of Winterfell may once again be friends. The smaller girls fidgeted anxiously. Their older sisters waited for Lord Walder on his black oak throne. Jingle Bell rocked back and forth, bells chiming on collar and crown. Good, the Lord of the Crossing said. That was very good, your grace. No words can set it right. <laughs> well said, well said. At the wedding feast I hope you will not refuse to dance with my daughters. It would please an old man's heart, eh? He bobbed his wrinkled pink head up and down in much the same way his lackwit grandson did, though Lord Walder wore no bells. And here she is, Lord Edmure, my daughter Rosalind, my most precious little blossom, eh? Sir Benfrey led her into the hall. They looked enough alike to be full siblings. Judging from their age, both were children of the sixth Lady Frey. A Rosby, Caitlin seemed to recall. Rosalind was small for her years, her skin as white as if she had just risen from a milk bath. Her face was comely, with a small chin, delicate nose, and big brown eyes. Thick chestnut hair fell in loose waves to a waist so tiny that Edmure would be able to put his hands around it. Beneath the lacy bodice of her pale blue gown her breasts looked small but shapely. "'Your Grace,' the girl went to her knees. Lord Edmure, I hope I am not a disappointment to you. Far from it, thought Caitlin. Her brother's face had lit up at the sight of her. You are a delight to me, my lady, Edmure said, and ever will be, I know. Rosalind had a small gap between two of her front teeth that made her shy with her smiles, but the floor was almost endearing. Pretty enough, Caitlin thought, but so small, and she comes of Rosby stock. The Rosbys had never been robust. She much preferred the frames of some of the older girls in the hall, daughters or granddaughters, she could not be sure. They had a crake hall look about them, and Lord Walder's third wife had been of that house. Wide hips to bear children, big breasts to nurse them, strong arms to carry them. The crake halls have always been a big-boned family and strong. "'My lord is kind,' the Lady Rosalind said to Edmure. "'My lady is beautiful.' Edmure took her hand and drew her to her feet. "'But why are you crying?' "'For joy,' Rosalind said. "'I weep for joy, my lord.' "'Enough!' Lord Walder broke in. "'You may weep and whisper after your wed, eh? "'Benfrey, see your sister back to her chambers. "'She has a wedding to prepare for. "'And a bedding, eh? "'The sweetest part.' "'For all, for all.' His mouth moved in and out. We'll have music, such sweet music, and wine, eh? The red will run, and we'll put some wrongs aright. But now you're weary, and wet as well, tripping on my floor. 
There's fires waiting for you, and hot mulled wine and baths if you want them. Lothar, show our guests to their quarters. I need to see my men across the river, my lord, Rob said. They shan't get lost, Lord Walder complained. They've crossed before, haven't they? When you came down from the north, you wanted crossing, and I gave it to you, and you never said mayhaps, eh? But suit yourself. Lead each man across by the hand, if you like. It's not to me. My lord, Caitlin had almost forgotten. Some food would be most welcome. We have ridden many leagues in the rain. Walder Frey's mouth moved in and out. Food, eh? A loaf of bread, a bite of cheese, mayhaps a sausage. Some wine to wash it down, Rob said. And salt? Bread and salt. Yeah, of course, of course. The old man clapped his hands together, and servants came into the hall, bearing flagons of wine and trays of bread, cheese, and butter. Lord Walder took a cup of bread himself, and raised it high with a spotted hand. My guests, he said, my honoured guests, be welcome beneath my roof and at my table. We thank you for your hospitality, my lord, Rob replied. Edmure echoed him, along with the great John, Sir Mark Piper, and the others. They drank his wine and ate his bread and butter. Caitlin tasted the wine and nibbled at some bread and felt much the better for it. Now we should be safe, she thought. Knowing how petty the old man could be, she had expected their rooms to be bleak and cheerless. But the phrase had made more than ample provision for them, it seemed. The bridal chamber was large and richly appointed, dominated by a great feather bed with corner posts carved in the likeness of castle towers. Its draperies were tully red and blue, a nice courtesy. Sweet-smelling carpets covered a plank floor, and a tall shuttered window opened to the south. Caitlin's own room was smaller, but handsomely furnished and comfortable, with a fire burning in the hearth. Lame Lothar assured them that Rob would have an entire suite, as befit a king. "'If there is anything you require, you need only tell one of the guards.' He bowed and withdrew, limping heavily as he made his way down the curving steps. "'We should post our own guards,' Caitlin told her brother. She would rest easier with Stark and Tullyman outside her door. The audience with Lord Walder had not been as painful as she feared, yet all the same she would be glad to be done with this. A few more days, and Rob will be off to battle, and me to a comfortable captivity at Seaguard. Lord Jason would show her every courtesy, she had no doubt, but the prospect still depressed her. She could hear the sounds of horses below as the long column of mounted men wound their way across the bridge from castle to castle. The stones rumbled to the passage of heavy-laden wains. Caitlin went to the window and gazed out to watch Rob's host emerge from the eastern twin. The rain seems to be lessening. Now that we're inside, Edmure stood before the fire, letting the warmth wash over him. What did you make of Rosalind? Too small and delicate. Childbirth will go hard on her. But her brother seemed well pleased with the girl, so all she said was, Sweet. I believe she liked me. Why was she crying? She's a maid on the eve of her wedding. A few tears are to be expected. Lisa had wept lakes the morning of their own wedding, though she had managed to be dry-eyed and radiant when John Arryn swept his cream and blue cloak about her shoulders. She's prettier than I dared hope. Edmure raised a hand before she could speak. I know there are more important things. Spare me the sermon, Septa. Even so, did you see some of those other maids Frey trotted out? The one with the twitch? Was that the shaking sickness? And those twins had more craters and eruptions on their faces than Peter Pimple. When I saw that lot, I knew Rosalind would be bald and one-eyed, with Jingle Bell's wits and Black Walder's temper. But she seems gentle as well as fair. He looked perplexed. Why would the old weasel refuse to let me choose unless he meant to foist off someone hideous? Your fondness for a pretty face is well known, Caitlin reminded him. Perhaps Lord Walder actually wants you to be happy with your bride. Or more like, he did not want you balking over a boil and upsetting all his plans. Or it may be that Rosalind is the old man's favorite. The Lord of Riveron is a much better match than most of his daughters can hope for. True. Her brother still seemed uncertain, however. Is it possible the girl is barren? Lord Walder wants his grandson to inherit Riverrun. How would it serve him to give you a barren wife? It rids him of a daughter no one else would take. Small good that will do him. 
Walder Frey is a peevish man, not a stupid one. Still, it is possible? Yes, Caitlin conceded reluctantly. There are illnesses a girl can have in childhood that leave her unable to conceive. There's no reason to believe that Lady Rosalind was so afflicted, though. She looked around the room. The phrase have received us more kindly than I had anticipated, if truth be told. Edmure laughed. A few barbed words and some unseemly gloating. From him, that's courtesy. I expected the old weasel to piss in our wine and make us praise the vintage. The jest left Caitlin strangely disquieted. If you will excuse me, I should change from these wet clothes. As you wish, Edmure yawned. I may nap an hour. She retreated to her own room. The chest of clothes she'd brought from River Run had been carried up and laid at the foot of the bed. After she'd undressed and hung her wet clothing by the fire, she donned a warm wool dress of tully red and blue, washed and brushed her hair and let it dry, and went in search of Frey's. Lord Walder's black oak throne was empty when she entered the hall, but some of his sons were drinking by the fire. Lame Lothar rose clumsily when he saw her. Oh, Lady Caitlin, I thought you would be resting. How may I be of service? Are these your brothers? she asked. Brothers, half-brothers, good brothers and nephews. Raymond and I shared a mother. Lord Lucius Viprin is my half-sister Lethine's husband, and Sir Damon is their son. My half-brother, Sir Hostine, I believe you know, and this is Sir Leslin Haig and his sons, Sir Harris and Sir Donal. Well met, sirs. Is Sir Perwin about? He helped escort me to Storm's End and back when Rob sent me to speak with Lord Renly. I was looking forward to seeing him again. Perwin is away, Lame Lothar said. I shall give him your regards. I know he will regret having missed you. Surely he will return in time for Lady Rosalind's wedding? He had hoped to, said Lame Lothar, but with this rain you saw how the rivers ran, my lady. I did indeed, said Caitlin. I wonder if you would be so good as to direct me to your maester. Are you unwell, my lady? asked Sir Hostine, a powerful man with a square, strong jaw. A woman's complaint, nothing to concern you, sir. Lothar, ever gracious, escorted her from the hall up some steps and across a covered bridge to another stair. You should find Maester Brennett in the turret on the top, my lady. Caitlin half expected that the Maester would be yet another son of Walder Frey's, but Brennett did not have the look. He was a great fat man, bald and double-chinned, and none too clean, to judge from the raven droppings that stained the sleeves of his robes. Yet he seemed amiable enough. When she told him of Edmure's concerns about Lady Rosalind's fertility, he chuckled. Your lord brother need have no fear, Lady Caitlin. She's small, I'll grant you, and narrow in the hips, but her mother was the same, and Lady Bethany gave Lord Walder a child every year. How many lived past infancy? she asked bluntly. Five, he ticked them off one finger's plump as sausages. Sir Perwin, Sir Benfrey, Maester Wellerman, who took his vows last year and now serves Lord Hunter in the Vale, Oliver, who squired for your son. And Lady Rosalind, the youngest. Four boys to one girl. Lord Edmure will have more sons than he knows what to do with. I'm sure that will please him. So the girl was like to be fertile as well as fair of face. That should put Edmure's mind at ease. Lord Walder had left her brother no cause for complaint so far as she could see. Caitlin did not return to her own room after leaving the maester. Instead, she went to Rob. She found Robin Flint and Sir Wendell Manderley with him, along with the great John and his son, who was still called the small John, though he threatened to overtop his father. They were all damp. Another man, still wetter, stood before the fire in a pale pink cloak trimmed with white fur. "'Lord Bolton,' she said. Uh, "'Lady Caitlin,' he replied, his voice faint. "'It is a pleasure to look on you again, even in such trying times. "'You are kind to say so.' Caitlin could feel gloom in the room. Even the great John seemed somber and subdued. She looked at their grim faces and said, "'What's happened?' "'Lannister's on the trident,' said Sir Wendell unhappily. "'My brother is taken again.' "'And Lord Bolton has brought us further word of Winterfell,' Rob added. "'Sir Roderick was not the only good man to die. Clay Serwin and Leobald Tallheart were slain as well.' Clay Serwin was only a boy. 
she said, saddened. Is this true, then? All dead and Winterfell gone? Bolton's pale eyes met her own. The Iron Men burned both Castle and Winterton. Some of your people were taken back to the Dreadfort by my son Ramsay. Your bastard was accused of grievous crimes, Caitlin reminded him sharply, of murder, rape, and worse. Yes, Bruce Bolton said. His blood is tainted. That cannot be denied. Yet he is a good fighter, as cunning as he is fearless. When the Iron Men cut down Sir Roderick and Leobald Tallheart soon after, it fell to Ramsay to lead the battle. And he did. He swears that he shall not sheathe his sword so long as a single grey joy remains in the north. Perhaps such service might atone in some small measure for whatever crimes his bastard blood has led him to commit. He shrugged. Or not. When the war is done, his grace must weigh and judge. By then I hope to have a true-born son by Lady Walder. This is a cold man, Caitlin realized, not for the first time. Did Ramsay mention Theon, Greyjoy? Rob demanded. Was he slain as well, or did he flee? Bruce Bolton removed a ragged strip of leather from the pouch at his belt. My son sent this with his letter. Sir Wendell turned his fat face away. Robin Flint and small John Umber exchanged a look, and the great John snorted like a bull. "'Is that skin?' said Rob. "'The skin from the little finger of Theon Greyjoy's left hand. My son is cruel, I confess it. And yet, what is a little skin against the lives of two young princes? You were their mother, my lady. May I offer you this small token of revenge?' Part of Caitlin wanted to clutch the grisly trophy to her heart, but she made herself resist. Put it away, please. Flaying Theon will not bring my brothers back, Rob said. I want his head, not his skin. He is Balan Greyjoy's only living son, Lord Bolton said softly, as if they had forgotten. And now rightful king of the Iron Islands. A captive king has great value as a hostage. Hostage? The word raised Caitlin's hackles. Hostages were oft exchanged. Lord Bolton, I hope you are not suggesting that we free the man who killed my sons. Whoever wins the sea stone chair will want Theon Greyjoy dead, Bolton pointed out. Even in chains he has a better claim than any of his uncles. Hold him, I say, and demand concessions from the Ironborn as the price of his execution. Rob considered that reluctantly, but in the end he nodded. Yes, very well. Keep him alive, then, for the present. Hold him secure at the dread fort till we've retaken the north. Caitlin turned back to Bruce Bolton. Sir Wendell said something of Lannister's on the trident. He did, my lady. I blame myself. I delayed too long before leaving Heron Hall. In East Frey, departed several days before me and crossed the trident to the Ruby Ford, though not without difficulty, but by the time we came up the river was a torrent. I had no choice but to ferry my men across in small boats, of which we had too few. Two-thirds of my strength was on the north side when the Lannisters attacked those still waiting to cross. Nor a lock and burly men chiefly, with Sir Willis Manderley and his white harbour knights as rear guard. I was on the wrong side of the trident, powerless to help them. Sir Willis rallied our men as best he could, but Gregor Clegane attacked with heavy horse and drove them into the river. As many drowned as were cut down, more fled, and the rest were taken captive. Gregor Clegane was always ill news, Caitlin reflected. Would Rob need to march south again to deal with him? Or was the mountain coming here? Is Clegane across the river, then? No. Bolton's voice was soft but certain. I left six hundred men at the ford. Spearmen from the rills, the mountains, and the white knife. A hundred hornwood longbows, some free riders and hedge knights, and a strong force of stout and serwin men to stiffen them. Ronald Stout and Sir Kyle Condon have the command. Sir Kyle was the late Lord Serwin's right hand, as I'm sure you know, my lady. Lions swim no better than wolves. So long as the river runs high, Sir Gregor will not cross. The last thing we need is the mountain at our backs when we start up the causeway, said Rob. You did well, my lord. Your grace is too kind. I suffered grievous losses on the Green Fork, and Glover and Tallheart worse at Duskendale. Duskendale! Dale. Rob made the word a curse. Robert Glover will answer for that when I see him, I promise you. A folly, Lord Bolton agreed. But Glover was heedless after he learned that Deepwood Mott had fallen. 
Grief and fear will do that to a man. Duskendale was done in cold. It was the battle still to come that worried Caitlin. How many men have you brought, my son? she asked Bruce Bolton pointedly. His queer, colorless eye studied her face a moment before he answered. Some five hundred horse and three thousand foot, my lady. Dreadfort men in chief, and some from Carhold. With the loyalty of the Carstocks so doubtful now, I thought it best to keep them close. I regret there are not more. It should be enough, said Rob. You will have command of my rear guard, Lord Bolton. I mean to start for the neck as soon as my uncle has been wedded and bedded. We're going home. Are you? The outriders came on them an hour from the Green Fork as the wain was slogging down a muddy road. Keep your head down and your mouth shut, the hound warned her as the three spurred toward them. A knight and two squires, lightly armored and mounted on fast palfreys. Clegane cracked his whip at the team, a pair of old drays that had known better days. The wain was creaking and swaying, its two huge wooden wheels squeezing mud up out of the deep ruts in the road with every turn. Stranger followed, tied to the wagon. The big, bad-tempered courser wore neither armor, barding, nor harness, and the hound himself was garbed in splotchy green rough spun and a soot-gray mantle with a hood that swaddled his head. So long as he kept his eyes down, you could not see his face, only the whites of his eyes peering out. He looked like some down-at-heels farmer. A big farmer, though. And under the rough spun was boiled leather and oiled mail, are you new? She looked like a farmer's son, or maybe a swineherd, and behind them were four squat casks of salt pork and one of pickled pig's feet. The riders split and circled them for a look before they came up close. Clegane drew the wain to a halt and waited patiently on their pleasure. The knight bore spear and sword while his squires carried longbows. The badges on their jerkins were smaller versions of the sigil sewn on their master surcoat, a black pitchfork on a golden bar sinister upon a russet field. Arya had thought of revealing herself to the first outriders they encountered, but she had always pictured grey-cloaked men with a direwolf on their breasts. She might have risked it even if they'd worn the umber giant or the glover fist, but she did not know this pitchfork knight or whom he served. The closest thing to a pitchfork she had ever seen at Winterfell was the trident in the hand of Lord Mandeville's merman. "'You have business at the twins?' the knight asked. "'Salt pork for the wedding feast, if it please you, sir.' The hound mumbled his reply, his eyes down, his face hidden. "'Salt pork never pleases me.' The pitchfork knight gave Clegane only the most cursory glance, and paid no attention at all to Arya, but he looked long and hard at Stranger. The stallion was no plough-horse, that was plain at a glance. One of the squires almost wound up in the mud when the big black courser bit at his own mount. "'How did you come by this beast?' the pitchfork knight demanded. "'My lady told me to bring him, sir,' Clegane said humbly. "'He's a wedding gift for young Lord Tully.' "'What, lady, who is it you serve?' "'Old lady went, sir.' "'Does she think she can buy Harren Hall back with a horse?' the knight asked. "'Gods, is there any fool like an old fool?' Yet he waved them down the road. "'Go on with you, then.' "'Aye, my lord.' The hound snapped his whip again, and the old drays resumed their weary trek. The wheels had settled deep into the mud during the halt, and it took several moments for the team to pull them free again. By then the outriders were riding off. Clegane gave them one last look and snorted. "'Sir Donald Haig,' he said, "'I've taken more horses off him than I can count. Armor as well. Once I near killed him in a melee.' "'How come he didn't know you, then?' Arya asked. "'Because knights are fools.' and it would have been beneath him to look twice at some poxy peasant. He gave the horses a lick with a whip. Keep your eyes down and your tone respectful and say sir a lot, and most knights will never see you. They pay more mind to horses than to small folk. He might have known stranger if he'd ever seen me ride him. He would have known your face, though. Why, oh, you had no doubt of that. Sandor Clegane's burns would not be easy to forget once you saw them. He couldn't hide the scars behind a helm, either not so long as the helm was made in the shape of a snarling dog. That was why they needed the wain and the pickled pig's feet. "'I'm not going to be dragged before your brother in chains,' the hound had told her, "'and I'd just as soon not have to cut through his men to get to him. 
So we play a little game. A farmer chance met on the king's road had provided them with wain, horses, garb, and casks, though not willingly. The hound had taken them at sword point. When the farmer cursed him for a robber, he said, No, a forager. Be grateful you get to keep your small clothes. Now take those boots off, or I'll take your legs off. Your choice. The farmer was as big as Clegane, but all the same he chose to give up his boots and keep his legs. Evenfall found them still trudging toward the Green Fork and Lord Frey's twin castles. I am almost there, Arya thought. She knew she ought to be excited, but her belly was all knotted up tight. Maybe that was just the fever she'd been fighting, but maybe not. Last night she'd had a bad dream, a terrible dream. She couldn't remember what she'd dreamed of now, but the feeling had lingered all day. If anything, it had only gotten stronger. Fear cuts deeper than swords. She had to be strong now, the way her father told her. There was nothing between her and her mother but a castle gate, a river, and an army. But it was Rob's army, so there was no real danger there. Was there? Roos Bolton was one of them, though. The Leech Lord, as the outlaws called him. That made her uneasy. She had fled Harrenhal to get away from Bolton as much as from the bloody mummers, and she'd had to cut the throat of one of his guards to escape. Did he know she'd done that? Or did he blame Gendry or Hot Pie? Would he have told her mother? What would he do if he saw her? He probably won't even know me. She looked more like a drowned rat than a lord's cup-bearer these days. A drowned boy rat. The hound had hacked handfuls of her hair off only two days past. He was an even worse barber than Yorin, and he'd left her half bald on one side. Rob won't know me either, I bet. Or even mother. She had been a little girl the last time she saw them, the day Lord Eddard Stark left Winterfell. They heard the music before they saw the castle, the distant rattle of drums, the brazen blare of horns, the thin skirling of pipes faint beneath the growl of the river and the sound of the rain beating on their heads. "'We've missed the wedding,' the hound said, "'but it sounds as though the feast is still going. I'll be rid of you soon.' "'No, I'll be rid of you,' Arya thought. The road had been running mostly northwest, but now it turned due west, between an apple orchard and a field of drowned corn beaten down by the rain. They passed the last of the apple trees and crested a rise, and the castles, river, and camps all appeared at once. There were hundreds of horses and thousands of men, most of them milling about the three huge feast tents that stood side by side facing the castle gates, like three great canvas long halls. Rob had made his camp well back from the walls on higher, drier ground, but the green fork had overflown its bank, and even claimed a few carelessly placed tents. The music from the castles was louder here. The sound of the drums and horns rolled across the camp. The musicians in the nearer castle were playing a different song than the ones in the castle on the far bank, though, so it sounded more like a battle than a song. They're not very good, Arya observed. The hound made a sound that might have been a laugh. There's old deaf women in Lannisport complaining of the din, I'll warrant. I'd heard Walter Frey's eyes were failing, but no one mentioned his bloody ears. Arya found herself wishing it were day. If the sun was out and the wind was blowing, she would have been able to see the banners better. She would have looked for the dire wolf of Stark, or maybe the Sirwin battle-axe or the glover fist. But in the gloom of night all the colors looked gray. The rain had dwindled down to a fine drizzle, almost a mist, but an earlier downpour had left the banners wet as dishrags, sodden and unreadable. A hedge of wagons and carts had been drawn up along the perimeter to make a crude wooden wall against any attack. That was where the guards stopped them. The lantern their sergeant carried shed enough light for Arya to see that his cloak was a pale pink, spotted with red teardrops. The men under him had the leech lord's badge sewn over their hearts, the flayed man of the dreadfort. Sandor Clegane gave them the same tale he'd used on the outriders, but the Bolton sergeant was a harder sort of nut than Sir Donal Haig had been. "'Salt pork's no fit meat for Lord's wedding feast,' he said scornfully. "'Got pickled pig's feet, too, sir. Not for the feast, you don't. The feast's half done. And I'm a Northman, not some milk-suck Southron knight.' "'I was told to see the steward or the cook. Castle's closed. The lordlings are not to be disturbed.' The sergeant considered a moment. "'You can unload by the feast tents there,' he pointed with a mailed hand. "'Ale makes a man hungry, and old Frey won't miss a few pig's feet. He don't have the teeth for such anyhow. Ask for sedgekins. You'll know what's to be done with you.' He barked a command, and his men rolled one of the wagons aside for them to enter. 
The hound's whip spurred the team toward the tents. No one seemed to pay them any mind. They splashed past rows of brightly colored pavilions, their walls of wet silk lit up like magic lanterns by lamps and braziers inside. Pink and gold and green they glimmered, striped and fretty and checky, emblazoned with birds and beasts, chevrons and stars, wheels and weapons. Arya spotted a yellow tent with six acorns on its panels, three over two over one. Lord Smallwood, she knew, remembering Acorn Hall so far away, and the lady who'd said she was pretty. But for every shimmering silk pavilion there were two dozen of felt or canvas, opaque and dark. There were barracks tents, too, big enough to shelter two score foot soldiers, though even those were dwarfed by the three great feast tents. The drinking had been going on for hours, it seemed. Arya heard shouted toasts and the clash of cups, mixed in with all the usual camp sounds, horses whinnying and dogs barking, wagons rumbling through the dark, laughter and curses, the clank and clatter of steel and wood. The music grew still louder as they approached the castle, but under that was a deeper, darker sound, the river, the swollen green fork growling like a lion in its den. Arya twisted and turned, trying to look everywhere at once, hoping for a glimpse of a dire wolf badge, for a tent done up in grey and white, for a face she knew from Winterfell. All she saw were strangers. She stared at a man, relieving himself in the reeds, but he wasn't ale-belly. She saw a half-dressed girl burst from a tent laughing, but the tent was pale blue, not grey like she'd thought at first, and the man who went running after her wore a tree-cat on his doublet, not a wolf. Beneath the tree four archers were slipping waxed strings over the notches of their long bows, but they were not her father's archers. A maester crossed their path, but he was too young and thin to be Maester Lewin. Arya gazed up at the twins, their high tower windows glowing softly wherever a light was burning. Through the haze of rain the castles looked spooky and mysterious, like something from one of old Nan's tales, but they weren't Winterfell. The press was thickest at the feast tents. The wide flaps were tied back, and men were pushing in and out with drinking horns and tankards in their hands, some with camp followers. Arya glanced inside as the hound drove past the first of the three, and saw hundreds of men crowding the benches and jostling around the casks of mead and ale and wine. There was hardly room to move inside, but none of them seemed to mind. At least they were warm and dry. Cold, wet Arya envied them. Some were even singing. The fine, misty rain was steaming all around the door from the heat escaping from inside. "'Here's to Lord Edmure and Lady Rosalind!' she heard a voice shout. They all drank, and someone yelled, "'Here's to the young wolf and Queen Jane!' "'Who is Queen Jane?' Arya wondered briefly. The only queen she knew was Circe. Fire pits had been dug outside the feast tents, sheltered beneath rude canopies of woven wood and hides that kept the rain out, so long as it fell straight down. The wind was blowing off the river, though, so the drizzle came in anyway, enough to make the fires hiss and swirl. Serving men were turning joints of meat on spits above the flames. The smells made Arya's mouth water. "'Shouldn't we stop?' she asked Sandor Clegane. "'There's Northmen in the tents.' She knew them by their beards, by their faces, by their cloaks of bearskin and sealskin, by their half-heard toasts and the songs they sang, Karstarks and Umbers and men of the mountain clans. "'I bet there are Winterfell men, too.' her father's men, the young wolf's men, the dire wolves of Stark. "'Your brother will be in the castle,' he said. "'Your mother, too. You want them or not?' "'Yes,' she said. "'What about Sedgkins?' The sergeant had told them to ask for Sedgkins. "'Sedgkins can bugger himself with a hot poker.' Clegane shook out his whip and sent it hissing through the soft rain to bite at a horse's flank. "'It's your bloody brother I want.' Caitlin. The drums were pounding, 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 and her head with them. Pipes wailed and flutes trilled from the musician's gallery at the foot of the hall. Fiddles screeched, horns blew, the skins skirled a lively tune, but the drumming drove them all. The sounds echoed off the rafters, whilst the guests ate, drank, and shouted at one another below. Walder Frey must be deaf as a stone to call this music. Caitlin sipped a cup of wine and watched Jingle Bell prance to the sounds of Alisan. At least she thought it was meant to be Alisan. With these players it might as easily have been the bear and the maiden fair. Outside the rain still fell, but within the twins the air was thick and hot. A fire roared in the hearth, and rows of torches burned smokily from iron sconces on the walls. 
Yet most of the heat came off the bodies of the wedding guests, jammed in so thick along the benches that every man who tried to lift his cup poked his neighbor in the ribs. Even on the dais they were closer than Caitlin would have liked. She had been placed between Sir Ryman Frey and Roose Bolton, and had gotten a good nose full of both. Sir Ryman drank as if Westeros was about to run short of wine, and sweated it all out under his arms. He had bathed in lemon water, she judged, but no lemon could mask so much sour sweat. Roose Bolton had a sweeter smell to him, yet no more pleasant. He sipped hippocras in preference to wine or mead, and ate but little. Caitlin could not fault him for his lack of appetite. The wedding feast began with a thin leek soup, followed by a salad of green beans, onions, and beets, river pike poached in almond milk, mounds of mashed turnips that were cold before they reached the table, jellied calves' brains, and a lesh of stringy beef. It was poor fare to set before a king, and the calves' brains turned Caitlin's stomach. Yet Rob ate it uncomplaining, and her brother was too caught up with his bride to pay much attention. You would never guess, Edmure complained, of Rosalind all the way from River Run to the twins. Husband and wife ate from a single plate, drank from a single cup, and exchanged chaste kisses between sips. Most of the dishes Edmure waved away. She could not blame him for that. She remembered little of the food served at her own wedding feast. Did I even taste it, or spend the whole time gazing at Ned's face, wondering who he was? Poor Rosalind's smile had a fixed quality to it, as if someone had sewn it onto her face. Well, she is a maid, wedded, but the bedding's yet to come. No doubt she's as terrified as I was. Rob was seated between Alex Frey and Fairwalder, two of the more noble Frey maidens. At the wedding feast, I hope you will not refuse to dance with my daughters, Walder Frey had said. It would please an old man's heart. His heart should be well pleased, then. Rob had done his duty like a king. He had danced with each of the girls, with Edmure's bride and the eighth Lady Frey, with the widow Amy and Roose Bolton's wife Fat Walder, with the pimply twins Sarah and Sarah, even with Shiri, Lord Walder's youngest, who must have been all of six. Caitlin wondered whether the Lord of the Crossing would be satisfied, or if he would find cause for complaint in all the other daughters and granddaughters who had not had a turn with the king. "'Your sisters dance very well,' she said to Sir Ryman Frey, trying to be pleasant. "'They're aunts and cousins,' Sir Ryman drank a swallow of wine, the sweat trickling down his cheek into his beard. "'A sour man, and in his cups,' Caitlin thought. The late Lord Frey might be niggardly when it came to feeding his guests, but he did not stint on the drink. The ale, wine, and mead were flowing as fast as the river outside. The great John was already roaring drunk. Lord Walder's son Merritt was matching him cup for cup, but Sir Waylon Frey had passed out trying to keep up with the two of them. Caitlin would sooner Lord Umber had seen fit to stay sober, but telling the great John not to drink was like telling him not to breathe for a few hours. Small John Umber and Robin Flint sat near Rob, to the other side of Fairwalder and Alex, respectively. Neither of them was drinking. Along with Patrick Malister and Daisy Mormont, they were her son's guards this evening. A wedding feast was not a battle, but there were always dangers when men were in their cups, and a king should never be unguarded. Caitlin was glad of that, and even more glad of the sword belts hanging on pegs along the walls. No man needs a long sword to deal with jellied calves' brains. "'Everyone thought my lord would choose fair Walder,' Lady Walder Bolton told Sir Wendell, shouting to be heard above the music. Fat Walder was a round pink butterball of a girl with watery blue eyes, limp yellow hair, and a huge bosom, yet her voice was a fluttering squeak. It was hard to picture her in the dread fort in her pink lace and cape of vair. "'My lord grandfather offered Roos his bride's weight in silver as a dowry, though so my lord of Bolton picked me.' The girl's chins jiggled when she laughed. I weigh six stone more than fair Walder, but that was the first time I was glad of it. I'm Lady Bolton now, and my cousin's still a maid, and she'll be nineteen soon, poor thing. The lord of the Dreadfort paid the chatter no mind, Caitlin saw. Sometimes he tasted a bite of this, a spoon of that, tearing bread from the loaf with short, strong fingers, but the meal could not distract him. Bolton had made a toast to Lord Walder's grandsons when the wedding feast began, pointedly mentioning that Walder and Walder were in the care of his bastard son. 
From the way the old man had squinted at him, his mouth sucking at the air, Caitlin knew he had heard the unspoken threat. Was there ever a wedding less joyful, she wondered, until she remembered her poor Sansa and her marriage to the imp? Mother, take mercy on her. She has a gentle soul. The heat and smoke and noise were making her sick. The musicians in the gallery might be numerous and loud, but they were not especially gifted. Caitlin took another swallow of wine and allowed a page to refill her cup. A few more hours, and the worst will be over. By this hour tomorrow, Rob would be off to another battle, this time with the Iron Men at Moat Caelin. Strange how that prospect seemed almost a relief. He will win his battle. He wins all his battles, and the Ironborn are without a king. Besides, Ned taught him well. The drums were pounding. A jingle bell hopped past her once again, but the music was so loud she could scarcely hear his bells. Above the din came a sudden snarling as two dogs fell upon each other over a scrap of meat. They rolled across the floor, snapping and biting, as a howl of mirth went up. Someone doused them with a flagon of ale, and they broke apart. One limped toward the dais. Lord Walder's toothless mouth opened in a bark of laughter as the dripping wet dog shook ale and hair all over three of his grandsons. The sight of the dogs made Caitlin wish once more for Grey Wind, but Rob's dire wolf was nowhere to be seen. Lord Walder had refused to allow him in the hall. "'Your wild beast has a taste for human flesh, I hear,' the old man had said. "'Rips out throats, yes. I'll have no such creature at my Rosalind's feast, amongst women and little ones, or my sweet innocence.' "'Grey wind is no danger to them, my lord,' Rob protested. "'Not so long as I am there.' "'You were there at my gates, were you not? When the wolf attacked the grandsons, I sent to greet you. I heard all about that. Don't think I didn't, eh?' "'No harm was done.' "'No harm, the king says. No harm. Peter fell from his horse. Fell. I lost a wife the same way, falling. His mouth worked in and out. Or was she just some stumpet? Bastard Walder's mother, yes, now I recall. She fell off her horse and cracked her head. What would your grace do if Peter had broken his neck, eh? Give me another apology in place of a grandson? No, no, no. Might be your king, I won't say you're not, the king in the north, eh? But under my roof, my rule, have your wolf or have your wedding, sire, you'll not have both. Caitlin could tell that her son was furious, but he yielded with as much courtesy as he could summon. If it pleases Lord Walter to serve me stewed crow smothered in maggots, he'd told her, I'll eat it and ask for a second bowl. And so he had. The great John had drunk another of Lord Walter's brood under the table, Peter Pimple this time. The lad has a third his capacity. What did he expect? Lord Umber wiped his mouth, stood, and began to sing. A bear there was, a bear, a bear, all black and brown and covered with hair. His voice was not at all bad, though somewhat thick from drink. Unfortunately, the fiddlers and drummers and flutists up above were playing Flowers of Spring, which suited the words of the bear and the maiden fair, as well as snails might suit a bowl of porridge. Even poor Jingle Bell covered his ears at the cacophony. Roos Bolton murmured some words too soft to hear, and went off in search of a privy. The cramped hall was in a constant uproar of guests and servants coming and going. A second feast, for knights and lords of somewhat lesser rank, was roaring along in the other castle, she knew. Lord Walder had exiled his base-born children and their offspring to that side of the river, so that Rob's Northmen had taken to referring to it as the Bastard Feast. Some guests were no doubt stealing off to see if the bastards were having a better time than they were. Some might even be venturing as far as the camps. The phrase had provided wagons of wine, ale, and mead, so the common soldiers could drink to the wedding of River Run and the twins. Rob sat down in Bolton's vacant place. "'A few more hours, and this farce is done, mother,' he said in a low voice, as the great John sang of the maid with honey in her hair. "'Rack Walder's been mild as a lamb for once.' And Uncle Edmure seems well content in his bride. He leaned across her. Sir Ryman. Sir Ryman Frey blinked and said, Sire, yes. I had hoped to ask Oliver to squire for me when we march north, said Rob. But I do not see him here. Would he be at the other feast? Oliver? Sir Ryman shook his head. No, not Oliver. Gone. Gone from the castle's duty. I see. Rob's tone suggested otherwise. When Sir Ryman offered nothing more, the king got to his feet again. Would you care for a dance, mother? Thank you, but no. 
A dance was the last thing she needed, the way her head was throbbing. No doubt one of Lord Walder's daughters would be pleased to partner you. Ah, uh, no doubt. His smile was resigned. The musicians were playing Iron Lances by then, while the great John sang The Lusty Lad. Someone should acquaint them with each other. It might improve the harmony. Caitlin turned back to Sir Ryman. I had heard that one of your cousins was a singer. Alexander, Simon's son. Alex is his sister. He raised a cup toward where she danced with Robin Flint. Will Alexander be playing for us tonight? Sir Ryman squinted at her. Not him. He's away. He wiped sweat from his brow and lurched to his feet. Pardons, my lady, pardons. Caitlin watched him stagger toward the door. Edmure was kissing Rosalind and squeezing her hand. Elsewhere in the hall, Sir Mark Piper and Sir Danwell Frey played a drinking game. Lame Lothar said something amusing to Sir Hostine. One of the younger Freys juggled three daggers for a group of giggly girls, and Jingle Bell sat on the floor sucking wine off his fingers. The servers were bringing out huge silver platters piled high with cuts of juicy pink lamb, the most appetizing dish they'd seen all evening. And Rob was leading Daisy Mormont in a dance. When she wore a dress in place of a hauberk, Lady Meg's eldest daughter was quite pretty, tall and willowy, with a shy smile that made her long face light up. It was pleasant to see that she could be as graceful on the dance floor as in the training yard. Caitlin wondered if Lady Meg had reached the neck as yet. She had taken her other daughters with her, but as one of Rob's battle companions, Daisy had chosen to remain by his side. He has Ned's gift for inspiring loyalty. Oliver Frey had been devoted to her son as well. Hadn't Rob said that Oliver wanted to remain with him even after he'd married Jane? Seated betwixt his black oak towers, the Lord of the Crossing clapped his spotted hands together. The noise they made was so faint that even those on the dais scarce heard it. But Sir Anise and Sir Hostine saw and began to pound their cups on the table. Lame Lothar joined them, then Mark Piper and Sir Danwell and Sir Raymond. Half the guests were soon pounding. Finally, even the mob of musicians in the gallery took note. The piping, drumming, and fiddling trailed off into quiet. "'Your Grace,' Lord Walder called out to Rob, "'the Septon has prayed his prayers, some words have been said, "'and Lord Edmure has wrapped my sweetling in a fish-cloak. "'But they are not yet man and wife. "'A sword needs a sheath, eh? "'And a wedding needs a bedding. "'What does my sire say? "'Is it meet that we should bed them?' A score or more of Walder Frey's sons and grandsons began to bang their cups again, shouting, To bed! To bed! To bed with them! Rosalind had gone white. Caitlin wondered whether it was the prospect of losing her maidenhead that frightened the girl, or the bedding itself. With so many siblings, she was not like to be a stranger to the custom, but it was different when you were the one being bedded. On Caitlin's own wedding night, Jory Castle had torn her gown in his haste to get her out of it, and drunken Desmond Grell kept apologizing for every body joke, only to make another. When Lord Dustin had beheld her naked, he'd told Ned that her breasts were enough to make him wish he'd never been weaned. Poor man, she thought. He had ridden south with Ned, never to return. Caitlin wondered how many of the men here tonight would be dead before the year was done. Too many, I fear. Rob raised a hand. If you think the time is meet, Lord Walder, by all means, let us bed them. A roar of approval greeted his pronouncement. Up in the gallery, the musicians took up their pipes and horns and fiddles again and began to play. The queen took off her sandal. The king took off his crown. Jingle Bell hopped from foot to foot, his own crown ringing. I hear Tully men have trout between their legs instead of cocks, Alex Frey called out boldly. Does it take a worm to make them rise? to which Sir Mark Piper threw back, "'I hear that fray women have two gates in place of one.' And Alex said, "'Aye, but both are closed and barred to little things like you.' A gust of laughter followed until Patrick Malister climbed up onto a table to propose a toast to Edmure's one-eyed fish. "'And a mighty pike it is!' he proclaimed. "'Nay, I'll wager it's a minnow!' Fat Walder Bolton shouted out from Caitlin's side. Then the general cry of, "'Bed them! Bed them!' went up again. The guests swarmed the dais, the drunkest in the forefront as ever. The men and boys surrounded Rosalind and lifted her into the air, whilst the maids and mothers in the hall pulled Edmure to his feet and began tugging at his clothing. He was laughing and shouting bawdy jokes back at them, though the music was too loud for Caitlin to hear. She heard the great John, though. 
Give this little bride to me, he bellowed as he shoved through the other men and threw Rosalind over one shoulder. Look at this little thing. No meat on her at all. Caitlin felt sorry for the girl. Most brides tried to return the banter, or at least pretended to enjoy it. But Rosalind was stiff with terror, clutching the great John as if she feared he might drop her. She's crying, too, Caitlin realized, as she watched Sir Mark Piper pull off one of the bride's shoes. I hope Edmure is gentle with the poor child. Jolly, bawdy music still poured down from the gallery. The queen was taking off her kirtle now, and the king his tunic. She knew she should join the throng of women round her brother, but she would only ruin their fun. The last thing she felt just now was bawdy. Edmure would forgive her absence, she did not doubt, much jollier to be stripped and bedded by a score of lusty laughing phrase than by a sour, stricken sister. As man and maid were carried from the hall, a trail of clothing behind them, Caitlin saw that Rob had also remained. Walder Frey was prickly enough to see some insult to his daughter in that. He should join in Rosalind's bedding, but is it my place to tell him so? She tensed until she saw that others had stayed as well. Peter Pimple and Sir Waylon Frey slept on, their heads on the table. Merritt Frey poured himself another cup of wine, while Jingle Bell wandered about stealing bites off the plates of those who left. Sir Wendell Manderley was lustily attacking a leg of lamb. And, of course, Lord Walder was far too feeble to leave his seat without help. He would expect Rob to go, though. She could almost hear the old man asking why his grace did not want to see his daughter naked. The drums were pounding again. Pounding and pounding and pounding. Daisy Mormont, who seemed to be the only woman left in the hall besides Caitlin, stepped up behind Edwin Frey and touched him lightly on the arm as she said something in his ear. Edwin wrenched himself away from her with unseemly violence. No, he said too loudly. I'm done with dancing for the nonce. Daisy paled and turned away. Caitlin got slowly to her feet. What just happened there? Doubt gripped her heart, where an instant before had been only weariness. It is nothing, she tried to tell herself. You are seeing grumkins in the woodpile. You are become an old, silly woman, sick with grief and fear. But something must have shown on her face. Even Sir Wendell Manderley took note. There's something amiss, he asked, the leg of lamb in his hands. She did not answer him. Instead, she went after Edwin Frey. The players in the gallery had finally gotten both king and queen down to their name-day suits. With scarcely a moment's respite, they began to play a very different sort of song. No one sang the words, but Caitlin knew the reins of Castamere when she heard it. Edwin was hurrying toward a door. She hurried faster, driven by the music. Six quick strides, and she caught him. "'And who are you?' the proud lord said, that I must bow so low." She grabbed Edwin by the arm to turn him and went cold all over when she felt the iron rings beneath his silken sleeve. Caitlin slapped him so hard she broke his lip. Oliver, she thought, and Perwin, Alessander, all absent. And Rosalind wept. Edwin Frey shoved her aside. The music drowned all other sound, echoing off the walls as if the stones themselves were playing. Rob gave Edwin an angry look and moved to block his way, and staggered suddenly as a quarrel sprouted from his side just beneath the shoulder. If he screamed then, the sound was swallowed by the pipes and horns and fiddles. Caitlin saw a second bolt pierce his leg, saw him fall. Up in the gallery, half the musicians had crossbows in their hands instead of drums or lutes. She ran toward her son until something punched in the small of the back, and the hard stone floor came up to slap her. Rob! she screamed. She saw small John Umber wrestle a table off its trestles. Crossbow bolts thudded into the wood, one, two, three, as he flung it down on top of his king. Robin Flint was ringed by Frey's, their daggers rising and falling. Sir Wendell Manderley rose ponderously to his feet, holding his leg of lamb. A quarrel went in his open mouth and came out the back of his neck. Sir Wendell crashed forward, knocking the table off its trestles and sending cups, flagons, trenchers, platters, turnips, beets, and wine, bouncing, spilling, and sliding across the floor. Caitlin's back was on fire. I have to reach him. The small John bludgeoned Sir Raymond Frey across the face with a leg of mutton. But when he reached for his sword belt, a crossbow bolt drove him to his knees. In a coat of gold or a coat of red, a lion still has claws. She saw Lucas Blackwood cut down by Sir Hostine Frey. One of the vances was hamstrung by Black Walder as he was wrestling with Sir Harris Haig. And mine are long and sharp, my lord, as long and sharp as yours. The crossbows took Donald Locke, Owen Norrie, and half a dozen more. 
Young Sir Benfrey had seized Daisy Mormont by the arm, but Caitlin saw her grab up a flagon of wine with her other hand, smash it full in his face, and run for the door. It flew open before she reached it. Sir Ryman Frey pushed into the hall, clad in steel from helm to heel. A dozen Frey men-at-arms packed the door behind him. They were armed with heavy long axes. Mercy! Caitlin cried, but horns and drums and the clash of steel smothered her plea. Sir Ryman buried the head of his axe in Daisy's stomach. By then men were pouring in the other doors as well, mailed men in shaggy fur cloaks with steel in their hands. Northmen! She took them for rescue for half a heartbeat, till one of them struck the small John's head off with two huge blows of his axe. Hope blew out like a candle in a storm. In the midst of slaughter, the Lord of the Crossing sat on his carved oaken throne, watching greedily. There was a dagger on the floor a few feet away. Perhaps it had skittered there when the small John knocked the table off its trestles, or perhaps it had fallen from the hand of some dying man. Caitlin crawled toward it. Her limbs were leaden, and the taste of blood was in her mouth. I will kill Walter Frey, she told herself. Jingle Bell was closer to the knife, hiding under a table, but he only cringed away as she snatched up the blade. I will kill the old man. I can do that much at least. Then the tabletop that the small John had flung over Rob shifted, and her son struggled to his knees. He had an arrow in his side, a second in his leg, a third through his chest. Lord Walder raised a hand, and the music stopped all but one drum. Caitlin heard the crash of distant battle, and closer the wild howling of a wolf. Grey wind, she remembered too late. Heh! <laughs> Lord Walder cackled at Rob. The king in the north arises. Seems we killed some of your men, your grace. Oh, but I'll make you an apology. That will mend them all again, heh! <laughs> Caitlin grabbed a handful of Jingle Bell Frey's long gray hair and dragged him out of his hiding place. Lord Walder! she shouted. Lord Walder! The drum beat slow and sonorous. Doom, boom, doom. Enough, said Caitlin. Enough, I say. You have repaid betrayal with betrayal. Let it end. When she pressed her dagger to Jingle Bell's throat, the memory of Bran's sick room came back to her with a feel of steel at her own throat. The drum went boom, doom, boom. Doom, boom, doom. Please, she said. He is my son, my first son and my last. Let him go. Let him go, and I swear we will forget this. Forget all you've done here. I swear it by the old gods and new. We, we will take no vengeance. Lord Walder peered at her in mistrust. Only a fool would believe such blather. Do you take me for a fool, my lady? I take you for a father. Keep me for a hostage, Edmure, as well, if you haven't killed him. But let Rob go. No. Rob's voice was whisper-faint. Mother, no. Yes, Rob, get up. Get up and walk out, please. Please save yourself, if not for me, for Jane. Jane? Rob grabbed at the edge of the table and forced himself to stand. Mother, he said. Grey wind, go to him. Now, Rob, walk out of here. Lord Walder snorted. And why would I let him do that? She pressed the blade deeper into Jingle Bell's throat. The lackwit rolled his eyes at her in mute appeal. A foul stench assailed her nose, but she paid it no more mind than she did the sullen, ceaseless pounding of that drum. Boom, doom, boom, doom, boom, doom. Sir Ryman and Black Walder were circling round her back, but Caitlin did not care. They could do as they wished with her, imprison her, rape her, kill her. It made no matter. She had lived too long, and Ned was waiting. It was Rob she feared for. On my honor as a Tully, she told Lord Walder, on my honor as a Stark, I will trade your boy's life for Rob's. A son for a son. Her hand shook so badly she was ringing Jingle Bell's head. Boom, the drum sounded. Boom, doom, boom, doom. The old man's lips went in and out. The knife trembled in Caitlin's hand, slippery with sweat. A son for a son, <laughs> he repeated. But that's a grandson, and he never was much use. A man in dark armor and a pale pink cloak spotted with blood stepped up to Rob. Jamie Lannister sends his regards. He thrust his longsword through her son's heart and twisted. Rob had broken his word, but Caitlin kept hers. She tugged hard on Aegon's hair and sawed at his neck until the blade grated on bone. Blood ran hot over her fingers. 
His little bells were ringing, 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 and the drum went boom, doom, boom. Finally, someone took the knife away from her. The tears burned like vinegar as they ran down her cheeks. Ten fierce ravens were raking her face with sharp talons and tearing off strips of flesh, leaving deep furrows that ran red with blood. She could taste it on her lips. It hurts so much, she thought. Our children, Ned, all our sweet babes, Rickon, Bran, Arya, Sansa, Rob, Rob, please, Ned, please make it stop, make it stop hurting. The white tears and the red ones ran together until her face was torn and tattered, the face that Ned had loved. Caitlin Stark raised her hands and watched the blood run down her long fingers over her wrists beneath the sleeves of her gown. Slow red worms crawled along her arms and under her clothes. It tickles. That made her laugh until she screamed. Mad, someone said. She's lost her wits. And someone else said, make an end. And a hand grabbed her scalp just as she'd done with Jingle Bell. And she thought, no, don't. Don't cut my hair. Ned loves my hair. Then the steel was at her throat, and its bite was red and cold. Arya. The feast tents were behind them now. They squished over wet clay and torn grass, out of the light and back into the gloom. Ahead loomed the castle gatehouse. She could see torches moving on the walls, their flames dancing and blowing in the wind. The light shone dully against the wet mail and helms. More torches were moving on the dark stone bridge that joined the twins, a column of them streaming from the west bank to the east. "'The castle's not closed,' Arya said suddenly. The sergeant had said it would be, but he was wrong. The portcullis was being drawn upward even as she watched, and the drawbridge had already been lowered to span the swollen moat. She had been afraid that Lord Frey's guardsmen would refuse to let them in. For half a heartbeat she chewed her lip, too anxious to smile. The hound reined up so suddenly that she almost fell off the wane. Seven bloody buggering hells! Arya heard him curse as their left wheel began to sink in soft mud. The wane tilted slowly. Get down! Clegane roared at her, slamming the heel of his hand into her shoulder to knock her sideways. She landed light, the way Sirio had taught her, and bounced up at once with a face full of mud. Why did you do that? she screamed. The hound had leapt down as well. He tore the seat off the front of the wane and reached in for the sword belt he'd hidden beneath it. It was only then that she heard the riders pouring out the castle gate in a river of steel and fire, the thunder of their destriers crossing the drawbridge almost lost beneath the drumming from the castles. Men and mounts wore plate armor, and one in every ten carried a torch. The rest had axes, long axes, with spiked heads and heavy, bone-crushing, armor-smashing blades. Somewhere far off she heard a wolf howling. It wasn't very loud compared to the camp noise and the music and the low ominous growl of the river running wild, but she heard it all the same. Only maybe it wasn't her ears that heard it. The sound shivered through Arya like a knife, sharp with rage and grief. More and more riders were emerging from the castle, a column four wide with no end to it, knights and squires and free riders, torches and long axes. And there was noise coming from behind as well. When Arya looked around, she saw that there were only two of the huge feast tents where once there had been three. The one in the middle had collapsed. For a moment she did not understand what she was seeing. Then the flames went licking up from the fallen tent, and now the other two were collapsing, heavy oiled cloth settling down on the men beneath. A flight of fire arrows streaked through the air. The second tent took fire, and then the third. The screams grew so loud she could hear words through the music. Dark shapes moved in front of the flames, the steel of their armor shining orange from afar. A battle, Arya knew. It's a battle. And the riders... She had no more time to watch the tents then. With the river overflowing its banks, the dark swirling waters at the end of the drawbridge reached as high as a horse's belly. But the riders splashed through them all the same, spurred on by the music. For once the same song was coming from both castles. I know this song. Arya realized suddenly. Thomas Evans had sung it for them, that rainy night the outlaws had sheltered in the brew house with the brothers. 
And who are you, the proud lord said, that I must bow so low? The fray riders were struggling through the mud and reeds, but some of them had seen the wane. She watched as three riders left the main column, pounding through the shallows. Only a cat of a different coat. That's all the truth I know. Clegane cut Stranger loose with a single slash of his sword and leapt onto his back. The courser knew what was wanted of him. He pricked up his ears and wheeled toward the charging destriers. In a coat of gold or a coat of red, a lion still has claws. And mine are long and sharp, my lord, as long and sharp as yours. Arya had prayed a hundred, hundred times for the hound to die, but now... There was a rock in her hand, slimy with mud, and she didn't even remember picking it up. Who do I throw it at? She jumped at the clash of metal as Clegane turned aside the first long axe. While he was engaged with the first man, the second circled behind him and aimed a blow for the small of his back. Stranger was wheeling, so the hound took only a glancing blow, enough to rip a great gash in his baggy peasant's blouse and expose the mail below. He is one against three. Arya still clutched her rock. They're sure to kill him. She thought of Micah, the butcher's boy, who had been her friend so briefly. Then she saw the third rider coming her way. Arya moved behind the wain. Fear cuts deeper than swords. She could hear drums and war-horns and pipes, stallions trumpeting, the shriek of steel on steel, but all the sound seemed so far away. There was only the oncoming horseman and the long axe in his hand. He wore a surcoat over his armor, and she saw the two towers that marked him for a fray. She did not understand. Her uncle was marrying Lord Frey's daughter. The Freys were her brother's friends. Don't! she screamed as he rode around the wain, but he paid no mind. When he charged, Arya threw the rock, the way she'd once thrown a crabapple at Gendry. She'd gotten Gendry right between the eyes, but this time her aim was off and the stone caromed sideways off his temple. It was enough to break his charge, but no more. She retreated, darting across the muddy ground on the balls of her feet, putting the wain between them once more. The knight followed at a trot, only darkness behind his eye slit. She hadn't even dented his helm. They went round once, twice, a third time. The knight cursed her. You can't run for— The axe head caught him square in the back of the head, crashing through his helm and the skull beneath, and sending him flying face first from his saddle. Behind him was the hound, still mounted on stranger. How did you get an axe? she almost asked before she saw. One of the other phrase was trapped beneath his dying horse, drowning in a foot of water. The third man was sprawled on his back, unmoving. He hadn't worn a gorget, and a foot of broken sword jutted from beneath his chin. "'Get my helm!' Clegane growled at her. It was stuffed at the bottom of a sack of dried apples on the back of the wain behind the pickled pig's feet. Arya up into the sack and tossed it to him. He snatched it one-handed from the air and lowered it over his head, and where the man had sat only a steel dog remained, snarling at the fires. "'My brother!' "'Dead!' he shouted back at her. "'Do you think they'd slaughter his men and leave him alive?' He turned his head back toward the camp. "'Look! Look, damn you!' The camp had become a battlefield. No, a butcher's den. The flames from the feasting tents reached halfway up the sky. Some of the barracks tents were burning, too, and half a hundred silk pavilions. Everywhere swords were singing, and now the rains weep o'er his hall with not a soul to hear. She saw two knights ride down a running man. A wooden barrel came crashing onto one of the burning tents and burst apart, and the flames leapt twice as high. A catapult, she knew. The castle was flinging oil or pitch or something. Come with me, Sandor Clegane reached down a hand. We have to get away from here, and now. Stranger tossed his head impatiently, his nostrils flaring at the scent of blood. The song was done. There was only one solitary drum, its slow, monotonous beats echoing across the river like the pounding of some monstrous heart. The black sky wept. The river grumbled. Men cursed and died. Arya had mud in her teeth, and her face was wet. Rain, it's only rain. That's all it is. We're here, she shouted. Her voice sounded thin and scared, a little girl's voice. Rob's just in the castle, and my mother. The gate's even open. There were no more frays riding out. I came so far. We have to go get my mother. Stupid little bitch. Fires blended off the snout of his helm and made the steel teeth shine. You go in there, you won't come out. Maybe Frey will let you kiss your mother's corpse. Maybe we can save her. 
Maybe you can. I'm not done living yet. He rode toward her, crowding her back toward the wain. Stay or go, she-wolf. Live or die. You're— Why, you spun away from him and darted for the gate. The portcullis was coming down, but slowly— I have to run faster. The mud slowed her, though, and then the water. Run fast as a wolf. The drawbridge had begun to lift, the water running off it in a sheet, the mud falling in heavy clots. Faster! She heard loud splashing and looked back to see Stranger pounding after her, sending up gouts of water with every stride. She saw the long axe, too, still wet with blood and brains, and Arya ran. Not for her brother now, not even for her mother, but for herself. She ran faster than she had ever run before, her head down and her feet churning up the river. She ran from him as Micah must have run. His axe took her in the back of the head. Tyrion. They supped alone, as they did so often. The peas are overcooked, his wife ventured once. No matter, he said. So is the mutton. It was a jest, but Sansa took it for criticism. I am sorry, my lord. Why? Some cook should be sorry, not you. The peas are not your province, Sansa. I am sorry that my lord husband is displeased. Any displeasure I'm feeling has not to do with peas. I have Joffrey and my sister to displease me and my lord father, and three hundred bloody Dornishmen. He had settled Prince Oberyn and his lords in a corner fort facing the city, as far from the Tyrells as he could put them without evicting them from the Red Keep entirely. It was not nearly far enough. Already there had been a brawl in a flea-bottom pot-shop that left one Tyrell man-at-arms dead, and two of Lord Gargollin's scalded, and an ugly confrontation in the yard when Mace Tyrell's wizened little mother called Elaria Sand the serpent's whore. Every time he chanced to see Oberyn Martell, the prince asked when the justice would be served. Overcooked peas were the least of Tyrion's troubles, but he saw no point in burdening his young wife with any of that. Sansa had enough griefs of her own. "'The peas suffice,' he told her curtly. "'They are green and round. What more can one expect of peas? Here, I'll have another serving that please my lady.' He beckoned, and Podrick Payne spooned so many peas onto his plate that Tyrion lost sight of his mutton. "'That was stupid,' he told himself. "'Now I have to eat them all, or she'll be sorry all over again.' The supper ended in a strained silence, as so many of their suppers did. Afterward, as Pod was removing the cups and platters, Sansa asked Tyrion for leave to visit the godswood. "'As you wish.' He had become accustomed to his wife's nightly devotions. She prayed at the royal sept as well, and often lit candles to mother, maid, and crone. Tyrion found all this piety excessive, if truth be told, but in her place he might want the help of the gods as well. "'I confess I know little of the old gods,' he said, trying to be pleasant. "'Perhaps some day you might enlighten me. I could even accompany you.' "'No,' Sansa said at once. You, "'You are kind to offer, but there are no devotions, my lord, no priests or songs or candles, only trees and silent prayer. You would be bored.' "'No doubt you're right. She knows me better than I thought.' though the sound of rustling leaves might be a pleasant change from some septon droning on about the seven aspects of grace. Tyrion waved her off. I won't intrude. Dress warmly, my lady. The wind is brisk out there. He was tempted to ask what she prayed for, but Sansa was so dutiful she might actually tell him, and he didn't think he wanted to know. He went back to work after she left, trying to track some golden dragons through the labyrinth of Littlefinger's ledgers. Peter Baelish had not believed in letting gold sit about and grow dusty, that was for certain. But the more Tyrion tried to make sense of his accounts, the more his head hurt. It was all very well to talk of breeding dragons instead of locking them up in the treasury, but some of these ventures smelled worse than weak old fish. I wouldn't have been so quick to let Joffrey fling the antler men over the walls if I'd known how many of the bloody bastards had taken loans from the crown. He would have to send Bronn to find their heirs, 
but he feared that would prove as fruitful as trying to squeeze silver from a silverfish. When the summons from his lord father arrived, it was the first time Tyrion could ever recall, being pleased to see Sir Boris Blount. He closed the ledgers gratefully, blew out the oil lamp, tied a cloak around his shoulders, and waddled across the castle to the Tower of the Hand. The wind was brisk, just as he'd warned Sansa, and there was a smell of rain in the air. Perhaps when Lord Tywin was done with him, he should go to the Godswood and fetch her home before she got soaked. But all that went straight out of his head when he entered the Hand's solar to find Cersei, Sir Kevin, and Grand Maester Purcell gathered about Lord Tywin and the King. Joffrey was almost bouncing, and Cersei was savouring a smug little smile, though Lord Tywin looked as grim as ever. I wonder if he could smile even if he wanted to. What's happened? Tyrion asked. His father offered him a roll of parchment. Someone had flattened it, but it still wanted to curl. Rosalind caught a fine, fat trout, the message read. Her brothers gave her a pair of wolf pelts for her wedding. Tyrion turned it over to inspect the broken seal. The wax was silvery gray, and pressed into it were the twin towers of House Frey. Does the Lord of the Crossing imagine he's being poetic? Or is this meant to confound us? Tyrion snorted. The trout would be Edmure Tully. The pelts... He's dead! Joffrey sounded so proud and happy you might have thought he'd skinned Rob Stark himself. First Greyjoy, and now Stark. Tyrion thought of his child wife, praying in the gods' wood even now, praying to her father's gods to bring her brother victory and keep her mother safe, no doubt. The old gods paid no more heed to prayer than the new ones, it would seem. Perhaps he should take comfort in that. Kings are falling like leaves this autumn, he said. It would seem our little war is winning itself. Wars do not win themselves, Tyrion, Cersei said with poisonous sweetness. Our Lord Father won this war. Nothing is won so long as we have enemies in the field, Lord Tywin warned them. The river lords are no fools, the Queen argued. Without the Northmen, they cannot hope to stand against the combined power of High Garden, Casterly Rock, and Dawn. Surely they will choose submission rather than destruction. Most, agreed Lord Tywin. River Run remains, but so long as Walder Frey holds Edmure Tully hostage, the Blackfish dare not mount a threat. Jason Malister and Titos Blackwood will fight on for honor's sake, but the Freys can keep the Malisters penned up at Seaguard, and with the right inducement, Jonas Bracken can be persuaded to change his allegiance and attack the Blackwoods. In the end, they will bend the knee, yes. I mean to offer generous terms. Any castle that yields to us will be spared, save one. Aaron Hall, said Tyrion, who knew his sire. The realm is best rid of these brave companions. I have commanded Sir Gregor to put the castle to the sword. Gregor Clegane. It appeared as if his lord father meant to mine the mountain for every last nugget of ore before turning him over to Dornish justice. The brave companions would end as heads on spikes, and Littlefinger would stroll into Harrenhal without so much as a spot of blood on those fine clothes of his. He wondered if Peter Baelish had reached the Vale yet. If the gods are good, he ran into a storm at sea and sank. But when had the gods ever been especially good? They should all be put to the sword, Joffrey declared suddenly. The Malisters and Blackwoods and Brackens, all of them. They're traitors. I want them killed, Grandfather. I won't have any generous terms. The king turned to Grand Maester Pasau. And I want Rob Stark's head, too. Write the Lord Frey and tell him. The king commands. I'm going to have it served to Sansa at my wedding feast. Sire, Sir Kevin said in a shocked voice, the lady is now your aunt by marriage. A jest, Cersei smiled. Joff did not mean it. Yes, I did. 
Joffrey insisted. He was a traitor, and I want his stupid head. I'm going to make Sansa kiss it. No. Tyrion's voice was hoarse. Sansa is no longer yours to torment. Understand that, monster. Joffrey sneered. You're the monster, uncle. Am I? Tyrion cocked his head. Perhaps you should speak more softly to me, then. Monsters are dangerous beasts, and just now kings seem to be dying like flies. I could have your tongue out for saying that, the boy king said, reddening. I'm the king. Cersei put a protective hand on her son's shoulder. Let the dwarf make all the threats he likes, Joff. I want my lord father and my uncle to see what he is. Lord Tywin ignored that. It was Joffrey he addressed. Ares also felt the need to remind men that he was king, and he was passing fond of ripping tongues out as well. You could ask Sir Illyn Payne about that, though you'll get no reply. Sir Illyn never dared provoke Ares the way your imp provokes Joff, said Cersei. You heard him? Monster! he said, to the king's grace, and he threatened him. Be quiet, Cersei. Joffrey, when your enemies defy you, you must serve them steel and fire. When they go to their knees, however, you must help them back to their feet. Elsewise, no man will ever bend the knee to you. And any man who must say, I am the king, is no true king at all. Ares never understood that. But you will. When I've won your war for you, we will restore the king's peace and the king's justice. The only head that need concern you is Marguerite Tyrell's maiden head. Joffrey had that sullen, sulky look he got. Cersei had him firmly by the shoulder, but perhaps she should have had him by the throat. The boy surprised them all. Instead of scuttling safely back under his rock, Joff drew himself up defiantly and said, You talk about Ares, grandfather, but you were scared of him. Oh, my, hasn't this gotten interesting, Tyrion thought. Lord Tywin studied his grandchild in silence, gold flecks shining in his pale green eyes. Joffrey, apologize to your grandfather, said Cersei. He wrenched free of her. Why should I? Everyone knows it's true. My father won all the battles. He killed Prince Rhaegar and took the crown, while your father was hiding under Casterly Rock. The boy gave his grandfather a defiant look. A strong king acts boldly. He doesn't just talk. Thank you for that wisdom, Your Grace. Lord Tywin said, with a courtesy so cold it was like to freeze their ears off. Sir Kevin, I can see the king is tired. Please see him safely back to his bedchamber. For Sarah, perhaps some gentle potion to help his grace sleep restfully? A dream wine, my lord. I don't want any dream wine, Joffrey insisted. Lord Tywin would have paid more heed to a mouse squeaking in the corner. Dream wine will serve. Cersei, Tyrion, remain. Sir Kevin took Joffrey firmly by the arm and marched him out the door, where two of the king's guard were waiting. Grand Maester Purcell scurried after them as fast as his shaky old legs could take him. Tyrion remained where he was. Father, I am sorry, Cersei said, when the door was shut. Joff has always been willful. I did warn you. There is a long league's worth of difference between willful and stupid. A strong king acts boldly. Who told him that? Not me, I promise you, said Cersei. Most like it was something he heard Robert say. Now, nah, part about you hiding under Casterly Rock does sound like Robert. Tyrion didn't want Lord Tywin forgetting that bit. Yes, I recall now, Cersei said. Robert often told Joff that a king must be bold. And what were you telling him, pray? I did not fight a war to seat Robert the Second on the Iron Throne. You gave me to understand the boy cared nothing for his father. Why would he? Robert ignored him. He would have beat him if I'd allowed it. 
That brute you made me marry once hit the boy so hard he knocked out two of his baby teeth over some mischief with a cat. I told him I'd kill him in his sleep if he ever did it again. And he never did, but sometimes he would say things. It appears things needed to be said. Lord Tywin waved two fingers at her, a brusque dismissal. Go. She went, seething. Not Robert the Second, Tyrion said. Ares the Third. The boy is thirteen. There is time yet. Lord Tywin paced to the window. That was unlike him. He was more upset than he wished to show. He requires a sharp lesson. Tyrion had gotten his own sharp lesson at thirteen. He felt almost sorry for his nephew. On the other hand, no one deserved it more. Enough of Joffrey, he said. Wars are won with quills and ravens. Wasn't that what you said? I must congratulate you. How long have you and Walder Frey been plotting this? I mislike that word, Lord Tywin said stiffly. And I mislike being left in the dark. There was no reason to tell you. You had no part in this. Was Cersei told? Tyrion demanded to know. No one was told, save those who had a part to play. And they were only told as much as they needed to know. You ought to know that there is no other way to keep a secret, here especially. My object was to rid us of a dangerous enemy as cheaply as I could, not to indulge your curiosity or make your sister feel important. He closed the shutters, frowning. You have a certain cunning, Tyrion, but the plain truth is you talk too much. That loose tongue of yours will be your undoing. You should have let Joff tear it out, suggested Tyrion. You would do well not to tempt me, Lord Tywin said. I'll hear no more of this. I have been considering how best to appease Oberyn Martell and his entourage. Oh, is this something I'm allowed to know, or should I leave so you can discuss it with yourself. His father ignored the sally. Prince Oberyn's presence here is unfortunate. His brother is a cautious man, a reasoned man, subtle, deliberate, even indolent to a degree. He is a man who weighs the consequences of every word and every action. But Oberyn has always been half-mad. Is it true he tried to raise Dorn for Viserys? No one speaks of it, but yes. Ravens flew and riders rode, with what secret messages I never knew. John Arryn sailed to Sunspear to return Prince Lewin's bones, sat down with Prince Doran, and ended all the talk of war. But Robert never went to dawn thereafter, and Prince Oberyn seldom left it. Well, he's here now, with half the nobility of dawn in his tail, and he grows more impatient every day said Tyrion. Perhaps I should show him the brothels of King's Landing. That might distract him. A tool for every task. Isn't that how it works? My tool is yours, father. Never let it be said that House Lannister blew its trumpets and I did not respond. Lord Tywin's mouth tightened. Very droll. Shall I have them sew you a suit of motley and a little hat with bells on it? If I wear it, do I have leave to say anything I want about his grace, King Joffrey? Lord Tywin seated himself again and said, I was made to suffer my father's follies. I will not suffer yours. Enough. Very well, as you ask so pleasantly. The Red Viper is not going to be pleasant, I fear. Nor will he content himself with Sir Gregor's head alone. All the more reason not to give it to him. Not to... Tyrion was shocked. I thought we were agreed that the woods were full of beasts. Lesser beasts. Lord Tywin's fingers laced together under his chin. Sir Gregor has served us well. No other knight in the realm inspires such terror in our enemies. Oberyn knows that Gregor was the one who... He knows nothing. He has heard tales, stable gossip and kitchen calumnies. He has no crumb of proof. Sir Gregor is certainly not about to confess to him. 
I mean to keep him well away for so long as the Dornishmen are in King's Landing. And when Oberyn demands the justice he's come for? I will tell him that Sir Amory Lorch killed Elia and her children, Lord Tywin said calmly. So will you, if he asks. Sir Amory Lorch is dead, Tyrion said flatly. Precisely. Vargo Howard had Sir Amory torn apart by a bear after the fall of Harrenhal. That ought to be sufficiently grisly to appease even Oberyn Martell. You may call that justice. It is justice. It was Sir Amory who brought me the girl's body, if you must know. He found her hiding under her father's bed, as if she believed Rhaegar could still protect her. Princess Elia and the babe were in the nursery a floor below. Well, it's a tale, and Sir Amory's not like to deny it. What will you tell Oberyn when he asks who gave Lorch his orders? Sir Amory acted on his own in the hope of winning favor from the new king. Robert's hatred for Rhaegar was scarcely a secret. It might serve, Tyrion had to concede, but the snake will not be happy. Far be it from me to question your cunning father, but in your place I do believe I'd have let Robert Baratheon bloody his own hands. Lord Tywin stared at him as if he had lost his wits. You deserve that motley, then. We had come late to Robert's cause. It was necessary to demonstrate our loyalty. When I laid those bodies before the throne, no man could doubt that we had forsaken House Targaryen forever. And Robert's relief was palpable. As stupid as he was, even he knew that Rhaegar's children had to die if his throne was ever to be secure. Yet he saw himself as a hero, and heroes do not kill children. His father shrugged. I grant you, it was done too brutally. Elia need not have been harmed at all. That was sheer folly. By herself, she was nothing. Then why did the mountain kill her? Because I did not tell him to spare her. I doubt I mentioned her at all. I had more pressing concerns. Ned Stark's van was rushing south from the Trident, and I feared it might come to swords between us. And it was in Ares to murder Jamie with no more cause than spite. That was the thing I feared most. That and what Jamie himself might do. He closed a fist. Nor did I yet grasp what I had in Gregor Clegane, only that he was huge and terrible in battle. The rape, even you will not accuse me of giving that command. I would hope. Sir Amory was almost as bestial with Rhaenys. I asked him afterward why it had required half a hundred thrusts to kill a girl of two, three. He said she'd kicked him and would not stop screaming. If Lorch had half the wits the gods gave a turnip, he would have calmed her with a few sweet words and used a soft silk pillow. His mouth twisted in distaste. The blood was in him. But not in you, father. There is no blood in Tywin Lannister. Was it a soft silk pillow that slew Rob Stark? It was to be an arrow at Edmure Tully's wedding feast. The boy was too wary in the field. He kept his men in good order and surrounded himself with outriders and bodyguards. So Lord Walder slew him under his own roof, at his own table? Tyrion made a fist. What of Lady Caitlin? Slain as well, I'd say. A pair of wolfskins? Frey had intended to keep her captive, but perhaps something went awry. So much for guest right. The blood is on Walder Frey's hands, not mine. Walder Frey is a peevish old man who lives to fondle his young wife and brood over all the slights he suffered. I have no doubt he hatched this ugly chicken. But he would never have dared such a thing without a promise of protection. I suppose you would have spared the boy and told Lord Frey you had no need of his allegiance? That would have driven the old fool right back into Stark's arms and won you another year of war. Explain to me why it is more noble to kill ten thousand men in battle than a dozen at dinner. When Tyrion had no reply to that, his father continued. The price was cheap by any measure. The crown shall grant Riveron to Sir Amon Frey once the blackfish yields. 
Lancel and Davin must marry Frey girls. Jory is to wed one of Lord Walder's natural sons when she's old enough. And Roose Bolton becomes Warden of the North and takes home Arya Stark. Arya Stark, Tyrion cocked his head. And Bolton? I might have known Frey would not have the stomach to act alone. But Arya? Varys and Sir Jacelyn searched for her for more than half a year. Arya Stark is surely dead. So was Rinley, until the Blackwater. What does that mean? Perhaps Littlefinger succeeded where you and Varys failed. Lord Bolton will wed the girl to his bastard son. We shall allow the Dreadfort to fight the Ironborn for a few years, and see if he can bring Stark's other bannermen to heel. Come spring, all of them should be at the end of their strength and ready to bend the knee. The North will go to your son by Sansa Stark. If you ever find enough manhood in you to breed one... Lest you forget, it is not only Joffrey who must needs take a maiden head. I had not forgotten, though I'd hoped you had. And when do you imagine Sansa will be at her most fertile? Tyrion asked his father in tones that dripped acid. Before or after I tell her how we murdered her mother and her brother. Davos for a moment it seemed as though the king had not heard. Stannis showed no pleasure at the news, no anger, no disbelief, not even relief. He stared at his painted table with teeth clenched hard. "'You are certain?' he asked. "'I am not seeing the body, nor your kingliness,' said Salador San. "'Yet in the city the lions prance and dance. The Red Wedding, the small folk are calling it. They swear Lord Frey had the boy's head hacked off sewed the head of his direwolf in its place, and nailed a crown about his ears. His lady mother was slain as well, and thrown naked in the river. At a wedding, thought Davos, as he sat at his slayer's board, a guest beneath his roof. These frays are cursed. He could smell the burning blood again, and hear the leech hissing and spitting on the brazier's hot coals. It was the Lord's wrath that slew him, Sir Axel Florent declared. It was the hand of a law. Praise the Lord of Light, sang out Queen Selyse, a pinched, thin, hard woman with large ears and a hairy upper lip. Is the hand of a law spotted and palsied? asked Stannis. This sounds more Walder Frey's handiwork than any god's. The law chooses such instruments as he requires. The ruby at Melisandre's throat shone redly. His ways are mysterious, but no man may withstand his fiery will. No man may withstand him, the queen cried. Be quiet, woman. You are not at a night fire now. Stannis considered the painted table. The wolf leaves no heirs. The crocking too many. The lions will devour them and us. Son, I will require your fastest ships to carry envoys to the Iron Islands and White Harbor. I shall offer pardons. The way he snapped his teeth showed how little he liked that word. Full pardons for all those who repent of treason and swear fealty to their rightful king. They must see. They will not. Melisandre's voice was soft. I am sorry, Your Grace. This is not an end. More false kings will soon rise to take up the crowns of those who've died. More! Stannis looked as though he would gladly have throttled her. More usurpers! More traitors! I have seen it in the flames. Queen Selyse went to the king's side. The Lord of Light sent Melisandre to guide you to your glory. Heed her, I beg you. The Lord's holy flames do not lie. There are lies and lies, woman. Even when these flames speak truly, they are full of tricks, it seems to me. An ant who hears the words of a king may not comprehend what he is saying, Melisandre said. And all men are ants before the fiery face of God. If sometimes I have mistaken a warning for a prophecy, or a prophecy for a warning, the fault lies in the reader, not the book. 
but this I know for a certainty. Envoys and pardons will not serve you now, no more than leeches. You must show the realm a sign, a sign that proves your power. Power! the king snorted. I have thirteen hundred men on Dragonstone, another three hundred at Storm's End. His hand swept over the painted table. The rest of Westeros is in the hands of my foes. I have no fleet but Salador Sands, no coin to hire sellswords, no prospect of plunder or glory to lure free riders to my cause. Lord Husband, said Queen Selys, you have more men than Aegon did three hundred years ago. All you lack are dragons. The look Stannis gave her was dark. Nine mages cross the sea to hatch Aegon the third's cache of eggs. Baylor the Blessed prayed over his for half a year. Aegon the fourth built dragons of wood and iron. Arion, bright flame, drank wildfire to transform himself. The mages failed, King Baylor's prayers went unanswered, the wooden dragons burned, and Prince Arion died screaming. Queen Selys was adamant. None of these was the chosen of the law. No red comet blazed across the heavens to herald their coming. None wielded Lightbringer, the red sword of heroes. And none of them paid the price. Lady Melisandre will tell you, my lord. Only death can pay for life. The boy! The king almost spat the words. The boy, agreed the queen. The boy, Sir Axel echoed. I was sick unto death of this wretched boy before he was even born, the king complained. His very name is a roaring in my ears and a dark cloud upon my soul. Give the boy to me, and you need never hear his name spoken again, Melisandre promised. No, but you'll hear him screaming when she burns him. Davos held his tongue. It was wiser not to speak until the king commanded it. Give me the boy for a lore, the red woman said, and the ancient prophecy shall be fulfilled. Your dragon shall awaken and spread his stony wings. The kingdom shall be yours. Sir Axel went to one knee. On bended knee, I beg you, sire. Wake the stone dragon and let the traitors tremble. Like Aegon, you begin as lord of Dragonstone. Like Aegon, you shall conquer. Let the false and the fickle feel your flames. Your own wife begs as well, Lord Husband. Queen Selyse went down on both knees before the king, hands clasped as if in prayer. Robert and Delina defiled our bed and laid a curse upon our union. This boy is the foul fruit of their fornications. Lift his shadow from my womb, and I will bear you many true-born sons. I know it. She threw her arms around his legs. He is only one boy, born of your brother's lust and my cousin's shame. He is mine own blood. Stop clutching me, woman. King Stannis put a hand on her shoulder, awkwardly untangling himself from her grasp. Perhaps Robert did curse our marriage bed. He swore to me that he never meant to shame me, that he was drunk and never knew which bedchamber he entered that night. But does it matter? The boy was not at fault, whatever the truth. Melisandre put her hand on the king's arm. The Lord of Light cherishes the innocent. There is no sacrifice more precious. From his king's blood and his untainted fire, a dragon shall be born. Stannis did not pull away from Melisandre's touch, as he had from his queen's. The red woman was all Selyse was not, young, full-bodied, and strangely beautiful, with her heart-shaped face, coppery hair, and unearthly red eyes. It would be a wondrous thing to see stone come to life, he admitted, grudging, and to mount a dragon. I remember the first time my father took me to court. Robert had to hold my hand. I could not have been older than four, which would have made him five or six. We agreed afterward that the king had been as noble as the dragons were fearsome. Stannis snorted. Years later our father told us that Ares had cut himself on the throne that morning, so his hand had taken his place. It was Tywin Lannister who'd so impressed us.
His fingers touched the surface of the table, tracing a path lightly across the varnished hills. Robert took the skulls down when he donned the crown, but he could not bear to have them destroyed. Dragon wings over Westeros. There would be such a... Your Grace! Davos edged forward. Might I speak? Stannis closed his mouth so hard his teeth snapped. My lord of the Rainwood, why do you think I made your hand, if not to speak? The king waved a hand. Say what you will. Warrior, make me brave. I know little of dragons, and less of gods. But the queen spoke of curses. No man is as cursed as the kinslayer in the eyes of gods and men. There are no gods, save Valor and the other, whose name must not be spoken. Melisandre's mouth made a hard red line, and small men curse what they cannot understand. I am a small man, Davos admitted. So tell me why you need this boy, Edric Storm, to wake your great stone dragon, my lady. He was determined to say the boy's name as often as he could. Only death can pay for life, my lord. A great gift requires a great sacrifice. Where is the greatness in a base-born child? He has king's blood in his veins. You have seen what even a little of that blood could do. I saw you burn some leeches, and two false kings are dead. Rob Stark was murdered by Lord Walder of the Crossing, and we have heard that Balan Greyjoy fell from a bridge. Who did your leeches kill? Do you doubt the power of a law? No. Davos remembered too well the living shadow that had squirmed from out her womb that night beneath Storm's End, its black hands pressing at her thighs. I must go carefully here, or some shadow may come seeking me as well. Even an onion smuggler knows two onions from three. You are short a king, my lady. Stannis gave a snort of laughter. He has you there, my lady. Two is not three. To be sure, Your Grace. One king might die by chance, even two. But three? If Joffrey should die in the midst of all his power, surrounded by his armies and his king's guard, would not that show the power of the Lord at work? It might. The king spoke as if he grudged each word. Or not. Davos did his best to hide his fear. Joffrey shall die, Queen Selyse declared, serene in her confidence. It may be that he is dead already, Sir Axel added. Stannis looked at them with annoyance. Are you trained crows to croak at me in turns? Enough! Husband, hear me, the Queen entreated. Why? Two is not three. Kings can count as well as smugglers. You may go. Stannis turned his back on them. Melisandre helped the queen to her feet. Selys swept stiffly from the chamber, the red woman trailing behind. Sir Axel lingered long enough to give Davos one last look. An ugly look on an ugly face, he thought, as he met the stare. After the others had gone, Davos cleared his throat. The king looked up. Why are you still here? Sire, about Edric Storm. Stannis made a sharp gesture. Spare me! Davos persisted. Your daughter takes her lessons with him and plays with him every day in Aegon's garden. I know that. Her heart would break if anything ill should— I know that as well. If you would only see him. I have seen him. He looks like Robert. I and worships him. Shall I tell him how often his beloved father ever gave him a thought? My brother liked the making of children well enough, but after birth they were a bother. He asks after you every day. He... You are making me angry, Davos. I will hear no more of this bastard boy. His name is Edric Storm, sire. I know his name. Was there ever a name so apt? It proclaims his bastardy, his high birth, and the turmoil he brings with him. Edric Storm! There I have said it. Are you satisfied, my lord hand? Edric, he started, is one boy! 
He may be the best boy who ever drew breath, and it would not matter. My duty is to the realm. His hand swept across the painted table. How many boys dwell in Westeros? How many girls? How many men? How many women? The darkness will devour them all, she says. The night that never ends. She talks of prophecies. A hero reborn in the sea, living dragons hatched from dead stone. She speaks of signs and swears they point to me. I never asked for this, no more than I asked to be king. Yet dare I disregard her? He ground his teeth. We do not choose our destinies. Yet we must, we must do our duty. No? Great or small, we must do our duty. Melisandre swears that she has seen me in her flames, facing the dock with Lightbringer raised on high. Lightbringer! Stannis gave a derisive snort. It glimmers prettily, I'll grant you, but on the Blackwater this magic sword served me no better than any common steel. A dragon would have turned that battle. Aegon once stood here, as I do, looking down on this table. Do you think we would name him Aegon the Conqueror today, if he had not had dragons? Your grace, said Davos, the cost. I know the cost. Last night, gazing into that hearth, I saw things in the flames as well. I saw a king, a crown of fire on his brows, burning, burning, Davos. His own crown consumed his flesh and turned him into ash. Do you think I need Melisandre to tell me what that means? Or you? The king moved, so his shadow fell upon King's Landing. If Joffrey should die, what is the life of one bastard boy against a kingdom? Everything, said Davos softly. Stannis looked at him, jaw clenched. Go, the king said at last, before you talk yourself back into the dungeon. Sometimes the storm winds blow so strong a man has no choice but to furl his sails. Ah, your grace, Davos bowed, but Stannis had seemingly forgotten him already. It was chilly in the yard when he left the stone drum. A wind blew briskly from the east, making the banners snap and flap noisily along the walls. Davos could smell salt in the air. The sea. He loved that smell. It made him want to walk a deck again, to raise his canvas and sail off south to Maria and his two small ones. He thought of them most every day now, and even more at night. Part of him wanted nothing so much as to take Devon and go home. I cannot, not yet. I am a lord now, and the king's hand. I must not fail him. He raised his eyes to gaze up at the walls. In place of Merlin's, a thousand grotesques and gargoyles looked down on him, each different from all the others, wyverns, griffins, demons, manticores, minotaurs, Basilisks, hellhounds, cockatrices, and a thousand queerer creatures sprouted from the castle's battlements as if they'd grown there. And the dragons were everywhere. The great hall was a dragon lying on its belly. Men entered through its open mouth. The kitchens were a dragon curled up in a ball with the smoke and steam of the ovens vented through its nostrils. The towers were dragons hunched above the walls or poised for flight. The windworm seemed to scream defiance, while Sea Dragon Tower gazed serenely out across the waves. Smaller dragons framed the gates. Dragon claws emerged from walls to grasp at torches. Great stone wings enfolded the smith and armory, and tails formed arches, bridges, and exterior stairs. Davos had often heard it said that the wizards of Valyria did not cut and chisel as common masons did, but worked stone with fire and magic as a potter might work clay. But now he wondered, what if they were real dragons, somehow turned to stone? 
And if the red woman brings them to life, the castle will come crashing down, I am thinking. What kind of dragons are full of rooms and stairs and furniture, and windows and chimneys and privy shafts? Davos turned to find Salador San beside him. Does this mean you have forgiven my treachery, Salah? The old pirate wagged a finger at him. Forgiving, yes, forgetting, no. All that good gold on Claw Isle that might have been mine, it makes me old and tired to think of it. When I die impoverished, my wives and concubines will curse you, Onion Lord. Lord Celtigar had many fine wines that now I am not tasting. A sea eagle he had trained to fly from the wrist, and a magic horn to summon krakens from the deep. Very useful such a horn would be to pull down Teroshi and other vexing creatures. But do I have this horn to blow? No, because the king made my old friend his hand. He slipped his arm through Davos's and said, The queen's men love you not, old friend. I am hearing that a certain hand has been making friends of his own. This is true, yes? You hear too much, you old pirate. A smuggler had best know men as well as tides, or he would not live to smuggle long. The Queen's men might remain fervent followers of the Lord of Light, but the lesser folk of Dragonstone were drifting back to the gods they'd known all their lives. They said Stannis was ensorcelled, that Melisandre had turned him away from the Seven to bow before some demon out of shadow, and, worst sin of all, that she and her god had failed him and there were knights and lordlings who felt the same. Davos had sought them out, choosing them with the same care with which he'd once picked his crews. Sir Gerald Gower fought stoutly on the Blackwater, but afterward had been heard to say that Valor must be a feeble god to let his followers be chased off by a dwarf and a dead man. Sir Andrew Estermont was the king's cousin, and had served as a squire years ago. The bastard of Night Song had commanded the rearguard that allowed Stannis to reach the safety of Salador San's galleys, but he worshipped the warrior with a faith as fierce as he was. King's men, not queen's men. But it would not do to boast of them. A certain Lassine pirate once told me that a good smuggler stays out of sight, Davos replied carefully. Black sails, muffled oars, and a crew that knows how to hold their tongues. The Lassini laughed. A crow with no tongues is even better. Big, strong mutes who cannot read or write. But then he grew more somber. But I am glad to know that someone watches your back, old friend. Will the king give the boy to the Red Priestess, do you think? One little dragon could end this great big war. Old habit made him reach for his luck, but his finger bones no longer hung about his neck, and he found nothing. He will not do it. Said Davos. He could not harm his own blood. Lord Renly will be glad to hear this. Renly was a traitor in arms. Edric Storm is innocent of any crime. His grace is a just man. Sala shrugged. We shall be seeing. Or you shall. For myself I am returning to sea. Even now rascally smugglers may be sailing across the Blackwater Bay, hoping to avoid paying their lord's lawful duties. He slapped Davos on the back. Take care, you with your mute friends. You are grown so very great now, yet the higher a man climbs, the farther he has to fall. Davos reflected on those words as he climbed the steps of Sea Dragon Tower to the maester's chambers below the rookery. He did not need Salah to tell him that he had risen too high. I cannot read, I cannot write. The lords despise me. I know nothing of ruling. How can I be the king's hand? I belong on the deck of a ship, not in a castle tower. He had said as much to Maester Pylos. You are a notable captain, the maester replied. A captain rules his ship, does he not? He must navigate treacherous waters, set his sails to catch the rising wind, know when a storm is coming and how best to weather it. This is much the same. Pylos meant it kindly, but his assurances rang hollow. "'It is not at all the same,' Davos had protested. "'A kingdom's not a ship, and a good thing or this kingdom would be sinking.' 
I know wood and rope and water, yes, but how will that serve me now? Where do I find the wind to blow King Stannis to his throne? The maester laughed at that. And there you have it, my lord. Words are wind, you know, and you've blown mine away with your good sense. His grace knows what he has in you, I think. Onions, said Davos glumly. That is what he has in me. The king's hand should be a high-born lord, someone wise and learned, a battle commander or a great knight. Sir Ryam Redwine was the greatest knight of his day, and one of the worst hands ever to serve a king. Septon Mimerson's prayers worked miracles, but as hand he soon had the whole realm praying for his death. Lord Butterwell was renowned for wit, Miles Smallwood for courage, Sir Otto Hightower for learning. Yet they failed as hands, every one. As for birth, the dragon kings oft chose hands from amongst their own blood, with results as various as Baylor Breakspear and Magor the Cruel. Against this you have Septon Barth, the blacksmith's son, the old king plucked from the Red Keep's library, who gave the realm forty years of peace and plenty. Pylos smiled. Read your history, Lord Davos, and you will see that your doubts are groundless. How can I read history when I cannot read? Any man can read, my lord, said Maester Pylos. There is no magic needed, nor high birth. I am teaching the art to your son at the king's command. Let me teach you as well. It was a kindly offer, and not one that Davos could refuse. And so every day he repaired to the maester's chambers, high atop Sea Dragon Tower, to frown over scrolls and parchments and great leather tomes, and try to puzzle out a few more words. His efforts often gave him headaches, and made him feel as big a fool as Patchface besides. His son Devon was not yet twelve, yet he was well ahead of his father, and for Princess Shireen and Edric Storm reading seemed as natural as breathing. When it came to books, Davos was more a child than any of them. Yet he persisted. He was the king's hand now, and a king's hand should read. The narrow, twisting steps of Sea Dragon Tower had been a sore trial to Maester Cresson after he broke his hip. Davos still found himself missing the old man. He thought Stannis must as well. Pylos seemed clever and diligent and well-meaning, but he was so young, and the king did not confide in him as he had in Cresson. The old man had been with Stannis so long, until he ran afoul of Melisandre and died for it. At the top of the steps Davos heard a soft jingle of bells that could only herald Patchface. The princess's fool was waiting outside the maester's door for her like a faithful hound. Doe soft and slump-shouldered, his broad face tattooed in a motley pattern of red and green squares, Patchface wore a helm made of a rack of deer antlers strapped to a tin bucket. A dozen bells hung from the tines and rang when he moved, which meant constantly, since the fool seldom stood still. He jingled and jangled his way everywhere he went. Small wonder that Pylos had exiled him from Shireen's lessons. Under the sea the old fish eat the young fish, the fool muttered to Davos. He bobbed his head, and his bells clanged and chimed and sang, I know, I know, oh, oh, oh. Up here the young fish teach the old fish, said Davos, who never felt so ancient as when he sat down to try and read. It might have been different if aged Maester Cresson had been the one teaching him, but Pylos was young enough to be his son. He found the maester seated at his long wooden table, covered with books and scrolls, across from their three children. Princess Shireen sat between the two boys. Even now Davos could take great pleasure in the sight of his own blood, keeping company with a princess and a king's bastard. Devon will be a lord now, not merely a knight, the lord of the Rainwood. Davos took more pride in that than in wearing the title himself. He reads, too. He reads and he writes as if he had been born to it. Pylos had naught but praise for his diligence, and the master-at-arms said Devon was showing promise with sword and lance as well. And he is a godly lad, too. My brothers have ascended to the Hall of Light to sit beside the Lord, Devon had said when his father told him how his four elder brothers had died. I will pray for them at the night-fires, and for you as well, father. 
so you might walk in the light of the Lord till the end of your days. Good morrow to you, father, the boy greeted him. He looks so much like Dale did at his age, Davos thought. His eldest had never dressed so fine as Devon in his squire's raiment, to be sure, but they shared the same square plain face, the same forthright brown eyes, the same thin brown fly-away hair. Devon's cheeks and chin were dusted with blonde hair, a fuzz that would have shamed a proper peach, though the boy was fiercely proud of his beard. Just as Dale was proud of his once, Devon was the oldest of the three children at the table. Yet Edric Storm was three inches taller and broader in the chest and shoulders. He was his father's son in that, nor did he ever miss a morning's work with sword and shield. Those old enough to have known Robert and Renly as children said that the bastard boy had more of their look than Stannis had ever shared. The coal black hair, the deep blue eyes, the mouth, the jaw, the cheekbones. Only his ears reminded you that his mother had been a Florent. Yes, good morrow, my lord, Edric echoed. The boy could be fierce and proud, but the maesters and castellans and masters at arms who'd raised him had schooled him well in courtesy. Do you come from my uncle? How fares his grace? Well, Davos lied. If truth be told, the king had a haggard, haunted look about him, but he saw no need to burden the boy with his fears. I hope we have not disturbed your lesson. We had just finished, my lord, Maester Pylos said. We were reading about King Daeron the first. Princess Shireen was a sad, sweet, gentle child, far from pretty. Stannis had given her his square jaw and Selyse her florent ears, and the gods in their cruel wisdom had seen fit to compound her homeliness by afflicting her with grayscale in the cradle. The disease had left one cheek and half her neck gray and cracked and hard, though it had spared both her life and her sight. He went to war and conquered Dorn, the young dragon they called him. He worshipped false gods, said Devon, but he was a great king otherwise and very brave in battle. He was, agreed Edric Storm, but my father was braver. The young dragon never won three battles in a day. The princess looked at him wide-eyed. Did Uncle Robert win three battles in a day? The bastard nodded. It was when he'd first come home to call his banners. Lords Grandison, Catherine, and Fell planned to join their strength at Summer Hall and march on Storm's End, but he learned their plans from an informer and rode at once with all his knights and squires. As the plotters came up on Summer Hall one by one, he defeated each of them in turn before they could join up with the others. He slew Lord Fell in single combat, and captured his son Silverax. Devon looked to Pylos. Is that how it happened? I said so, didn't I? Edric Storm said before the maester could reply. He smashed all three of them and fought so bravely that Lord Grandison and Lord Catherine became his men afterward, and Silverax too. No one ever beat my father. Edric, you ought not boast, Maester Pylos said. King Robert suffered defeats like any other man. Lord Tyrell bested him at Ashford, and he lost many a tourney tilt as well. He won more than he lost, though, and he killed Prince Rhaegar on the trident. That he did, the Maester agreed. But now I must give my attention to Lord Davos, who has waited so patiently. We will read more of King Daeron's Conquest of Dawn on the morrow. Princess Shireen and the boys said their farewells courteously. When they had taken their leaves, Maester Pylos moved closer to Davos. My lord, perhaps you would like to try a bit of Conquest of Dawn as well? He slid the slender, leather-bound book across the table. King Daeron wrote with an elegant simplicity, and his history is rich with blood, battle, and bravery. Your son is quite engrossed. My son is not quite twelve. I am the king's hand. Give me another letter, if you would. As you wish, my lord. Maester Pylos rummaged about his table, unrolling and then discarding various scraps of parchment. There are no new letters, perhaps an old one. Davos enjoyed a good story as well as any man, but Stannis had not named him Hand for his enjoyment, he felt. His first duty was to help his king rule, and for that he must needs understand the words the ravens brought. The best way to learn a thing was to do it, he had found. Sails or scrolls, it made no matter. This might serve our purpose. Pylos passed him a letter. 
Davos flattened down the little square of crinkled parchment and squinted at the tiny crabbed letters. Reading was hard on the eyes, that much he had learned early. Sometimes he wondered if the citadel offered a champion's purse to the maester who wrote the smallest hand. Pylos had laughed at the notion, but— Through the five kings, read Davos, hesitating briefly over five, which he did not often see written out. The king be the king. Beware? Beyond, the maester corrected. Davos grimaced. The king beyond the wall comes, comes south. He leads a, a fast, vast, a vast host of will, wild. Wildlings, Lord Mormont sent a raven from the uh, uh, haunted, the haunted forest. Pylos underlined the words with the point of his finger. The haunted forest. He is under a... Uh, attack? Yes. Pleased, he ploughed onward. Other, other birds have come since with no words. We fear. Mormont slain with all, with all his stench, no, strength. We fear Mormont slain with all his strength. Davos suddenly realized just what he was reading. He turned the letter over and saw that the wax that had sealed it had been black. This is from the Night's Watch. Maester, has King Stannis seen this letter? I brought it to Lord Alistair when it first arrived. He was the hand then. I believed he discussed it with the Queen. When I asked him if he wished to send a reply, he told me not to be a fool. His grace lacks the men to fight his own battles. He has none to waste on wildlings he said to me. That was true enough, and this talk of five kings would certainly have angered Stannis. Only a starving man begs bread from a beggar, he muttered. Pardon, my lord? Something my wife said once. Davos drummed his shortened fingers against the tabletop. The first time he had seen the wall, he had been younger than Devon, serving aboard the Cobble Cat under Roro Uhoris, a Tarashi known up and down the narrow sea as the blind bastard, though he was neither blind nor base-born. Roro had sailed past Skagos into the Shivering Sea, visiting a hundred little coves that had never seen a trading ship before. He brought steel, swords, axes, helms, good chain-mail, hauberks, to trade for furs, ivory, amber, and obsidian. When the cobble-cat turned back south, her holds were stuffed, but in the Bay of Seals three black galleys came out to herd her into Eastwatch. They lost their cargo, and the bastard lost his head, for the crime of trading weapons to the wildlings. Davos had traded at Eastwatch in his smuggling days. The black brothers made hard enemies, but good customers, for a ship with the right cargo. But while he might have taken their coin, he had never forgotten how the blind bastard's head had rolled across the cobblecat's deck. I met some wildlings when I was a boy, he told Maester Pylos. They were fair thieves, but bad hagglers. One made off with our cabin girl. All in all, they seemed men like any other men, some fair, some foul. Men are men, Maester Pylos agreed. Shall we return to our reading, my lord Hand? I am the Hand of the King, yes. Stannis might be the king of Westeros in name, but in truth he was the king of the painted table. He held Dragonstone and Storm's End, and had an ever more uneasy alliance with Salador San, but that was all. How could the Watch have looked to him for help? They may not know how weak he is, how lost his cause. King Stannis never saw this letter, you are quite certain? Nor Melisandre? No. "'Should I bring it to them, even now?' "'No,' Davos said at once. "'You did your duty when you brought it to Lord Alistair.' "'If Melisandre knew of this letter, 
What was it she had said? One whose name may not be spoken is marshalling his power, Davos Seaworth. Soon comes the cold and the night that never ends. And Stannis had seen a vision in the flames, a ring of torches in the snow, with terror all around. My lord, are you unwell? asked Pylos. I am frightened, maester, he might have said. Davos was remembering a tale Salador San had told him, of how Azor Ahai tempered Lightbringer by thrusting it through the heart of the wife he loved. He slew his wife to fight the dark. If Stannis is Azor Ahai come again, does that mean Edric Storm must play the part of Nissa Nissa? I was thinking, maester, my pardons. What harm if some wildling king conquers the north? It was not as though Stannis held the North. His grace could scarcely be expected to defend people who refused to acknowledge him as king. Give me another letter, he said abruptly. This one is too... Difficult, suggested Pylos. Soon comes the cold, whispered Melisandre, and the night that never ends. Troubling, said Davos. Too troubling. A different letter, please. John. They woke to the smoke of Molestown burning. Atop the King's Tower, John Snow leaned on the padded crutch that Maester Amon had given him and watched the grey plume rise. Steer had lost all hope of taking Castle Black unawares when John escaped him, yet even so he need not have warned of his approach so bluntly. You may kill us, he reflected, but no one will be butchered in their beds. That much I did at least. His leg still hurt like blazes when he put his weight on it. He'd needed Clytus to help him don his fresh-washed blacks and lace up his boots that morning, and by the time they were done he'd wanted to drown himself in the milk of the poppy. Instead he had settled for half a cup of dream wine, a chew of willow bark, and the crutch. The beacon was burning on Weatherback Ridge, and the Night's Watch had need of every man. "'I can fight,' he insisted when they tried to stop him. "'Your leg's healed, is it?' Noy snorted. You won't mind me giving it a little kick, then. I'd sooner you didn't. It's stiff, but I can hobble around well enough, and stand in fight if you have need of me. I have need of every man who knows which end of the spear to stab into the wildlings. The pointy end? John had told his little sister something like that once, he remembered. Noy rubbed the bristle on his chin. Might be you'll do. We'll put you in a tower with a longbow, but if you bloody well fall off, don't come crying to me. He could see the King's Road wending its way south through stony brown fields and over windswept hills. The Magnar would be coming up that road before the day was done, his thens marching behind him with axes and spears in their hands, and their bronze and leather shields on their backs. Grig the Goat, Court, Big Boyle, and the rest will be coming as well, and Egrit. The wildlings had never been his friends, he had not allowed them to be his friends, but her— he could feel the throb of pain where her arrow had gone through the meat and muscle of his thigh. He remembered the old man's eyes, too, and the black blood rushing from his throat as the storm cracked overhead. But he remembered the grotto best of all, the look of her naked in the torchlight, the taste of her mouth when it opened under his. Egret, stay away. Go south and raid. Go hide in one of those round towers you liked so well. You'll find nothing here but death. Across the yard, one of the bowmen on the roof of the old flint barracks had unlaced his breeches and was pissing through a crenel. Mully, he knew from the man's greasy orange hair. Men in black cloaks were visible on other roofs and tower tops as well, though nine of every ten happened to be made of straw. The scarecrow sentinels, Donald Noy called them. Only we're the crows, John mused, and most of us were scared enough. Whatever you call them, the straw soldiers had been Maester Amon's notion. They had more breeches and jerkins and tunics in the storerooms than they'd had men to fill them, so why not stuff some with straw, drape a cloak around their shoulders, and set them to standing watches? Noy had placed them on every tower and in half the windows. Some were even clutching spears or had crossbows cocked under their arms. The hope was that the Thens would see them from afar and decide that Castle Black was too well defended to attack. John had six scarecrows sharing the roof of the King's Tower with him, along with two actual breathing brothers. 
Deaf Dick Follard sat in a crunnel, methodically cleaning and oiling the mechanism of his crossbow to make sure the wheel turned smoothly, while the old town boy wandered restlessly around the parapets, fussing with the clothes on straw men. Maybe he thinks they will fight better if they're posed just right. Or maybe this waiting is fraying his nerves the way it's fraying mine. The boy claimed to be eighteen, older than John, but he was green as summer grass for all that. Satin, they called him, even in the wool and mail and boiled leather of the night's watch, the name he'd gotten in the brothel, where he'd been born and raised. He was pretty as a girl, with his dark eyes, soft skin, and raven's ringlets. Half a year at Castle Black had toughened up his hands, however, and Noy said he was passable with a crossbow. Whether he had the courage to face what was coming, though— John used the crutch to limp across the tower-top. The king's tower was not the castle's tallest. The high, slim, crumbling lance held that honor, though Othol Yarwick had been heard to say it might topple any day. Nor was the king's tower strongest. The tower of guards beside the king's road would be a tougher nut to crack. But it was tall enough, strong enough, and well placed beside the wall, overlooking the gate and the foot of the wooden stair. The first time he had seen Castle Black with his own eyes, John had wondered why anyone would be so foolish as to build a castle without walls. How could it be defended? It can't, his uncle told him. That is the point. The Night's Watch is pledged to take no part in the quarrels of the realm. Yet over the centuries certain lords' commander, more proud than wise, forgot their vows and near destroyed us all with their ambitions. Lord Commander Runcel Hightower tried to bequeath the watch to his bastard son. Lord Commander Roderick Flint thought to make himself king beyond the wall. Tristan Mudd, Mad Mark Rankenfell, Robin Hill, did you know that six hundred years ago the commanders at Snowgate and their night fort went to war against each other? And when the Lord Commander tried to stop them, they joined forces to murder him. The Stark and Winterfell had to take a hand and both their heads, which he did easily, because their strongholds were not defensible. The Night's Watch had nine hundred and ninety-six Lords Commander before J. R. Mormont, most of them men of courage and honor. But we have had cowards and fools as well, our tyrants and our madmen. We survive because the Lords and Kings of the Seven Kingdoms know that we pose no threat to them, no matter who should lead us. Our only foes are to the north, and to the north we have the wall. Only now those foes have gotten past the wall to come up from the south, John reflected, and the lords and kings of the seven kingdoms have forgotten us. We are caught between the hammer and the anvil. Without a wall, Castle Black could not be held. Donald Noy knew that as well as any. The castle does them no good, the armorer told his little garrison. Kitchens, common hall, stables, even the towers. Let them take it all. We'll empty the armory and move what stores we can to the top of the wall and make our stand around the gate. So Castle Black had a wall of sorts at last, a crescent-shaped barricade ten feet high made of stores, casks of nails and barrels of salt mutton, crates, bales of black broadcloth, stacked logs, sawn timbers, fire-hardened stakes, and sacks and sacks of grain. The crude rampart enclosed the two things most worth defending, the gate to the north and the foot of the great wooden switchback stair that clawed and climbed its way up the face of the wall like a drunken thunderbolt, supported by wooden beams as big as tree trunks driven deep into the ice. The last few moles were still making the long climb, John saw, urged on by his brothers. Gren was carrying a little boy in his arms, while Pip, two flights below, let an old man lean upon his shoulder. The oldest villagers still waited below for the cage to make its way back down to them. He saw a mother pulling along two children, one on either hand, as an older boy ran past her up the steps. Two hundred feet above them, Sky Blue Sue and Lady Meliana, who was no lady, all her friends agreed, stood on a landing looking south. They had a better view of the smoke than he did, no doubt. John wondered about the villagers who had chosen not to flee. There were always a few, too stubborn or too stupid or too brave to run, a few who preferred to fight or hide or bend the knee. Maybe the Thens would spare them. The thing to do would be to take the attack to them, he thought. With fifty rangers well mounted, we could cut them apart on the road. 
They did not have fifty rangers, though, nor half as many horses. The garrison had not returned, and there was no way to know just where they were, or even whether the riders that Noy had sent out had reached them. We are the garrison, John told himself, and look at us. The brothers Bowen Marsh had left behind were old men, cripples, and green boys, just as Donald Noy had warned him. He could see some wrestling barrels up the steps, others on the barricade, stout old kegs as slow as ever, spare boot hopping along briskly on his carved wooden leg, half-mad Easy, who fancied himself Florian the Fool reborn, Dornish Dilly, Red Allen of the Rosewood, Young Henley, well past fifty, Old Henley, well past seventy, Harry Howe, spotted pate of Maidenpool. A couple of them saw John looking down from atop the King's Tower and waved up at him. Others turned away. They still think me a turncloak. That was a bitter draught to drink, but John could not blame them. He was a bastard, after all. Everyone knew that bastards were wanton and treacherous by nature, having been born of lust and deceit. And he had made as many enemies as friends at Castle Black. Rast, for one. John had once threatened to have Ghost rip his throat out unless he stopped tormenting Samuel Tarley. And Rast did not forget things like that. He was raking dry leaves into piles under the stairs just now. But every so often he stopped long enough to give John a nasty look. No! Donald Noy roared at three of the Molestown men down below. The pitch goes to the hoist! The oil up the steps! Crossbow bolts to the fourth, fifth, and sixth landings! Spears to first and second! Stack the lard under the stair! Yes, there, behind the planks! The casks of meat are for the barricade! Now, you poxy plough-pushers! Now! He has a lord's voice, John thought. His father had always said that in battle a captain's lungs were as important as a sword-arm. It does not matter how brave or brilliant a man is if his commands cannot be heard, Lord Eddard told his sons, so Rob and he used to climb the towers of Winterfell to shout at each other across the yard. Donald Noy could have drowned out both of them. The moles all went in terror of him, and rightfully so, since he was always threatening to rip their heads off. Three-quarters of the village had taken John's warning to heart and come to Castle Black for refuge. Noy had decreed that every man still spry enough to hold a spear or swing an axe would help defend the barricade, else they could damn well go home and take their chances with the thins. He had emptied the armory to put good steel in their hands— big double-bladed axes, razor-sharp daggers, long-swords, maces, spiked morning-stars. Clad in studded leather jerkins and mail hauberks, with greaves for their legs and gorgets to keep their heads on their shoulders, a few of them even looked like soldiers. In a bad light, if you squint. Noy had put the women and children to work as well. Those too young to fight would carry water and tend the fires, the Molestown midwife would assist Clytus and Maester Amon with any wounded, and Three-Finger Hob suddenly had more spit-boys, kettle-stirrers, and onion-choppers than he knew what to do with. Two of the horrors had even offered to fight, and had shown enough skill with a crossbow to be given a place on the steps forty feet up. "'It's cold,' Satin stood with his hands tucked into his armpits under his cloak. His cheeks were bright red. John made himself smile. The frost fangs are cold. This is a brisk autumn day. I hope I never see the frost fangs, then. I knew a girl in Old Town who liked to ice her wine. That's the best place for ice, I think, in wine. Satin glanced south, frowned. You think the scarecrow sentinels scared them off, my lord? We can hope. It was possible, John supposed but more likely the wildlings had simply paused for a bit of rape and plunder in Molestown. Or maybe Steer was waiting for nightfall, to move up under cover of darkness. Midday came and went, with still no sign of Thens on the King's Road. John heard footsteps inside the tower, though, and Owen the Oaf popped up out of the trapdoor, red-faced from the climb. He had a basket of buns under one arm, a wheel of cheese under the other, a bag of onions dangling from one hand. Hobbs said to feed you in case you're stuck up here a while. That or for our last meal. Thank him for us, Owen. Dick Follard was deaf as a stone, but his nose worked well enough. The buns were still warm from the oven when he went digging in the basket and plucked one out. He found a crock of butter as well and spread some with his dagger. Raisins, 
he announced happily. Nuts, too! His speech was thick, but easy enough to understand once you got used to it. You can have mine, too, said Satin. I'm not hungry. Eat, John told him. There's no knowing when you'll have another chance. He took two buns himself. The nuts were pine nuts, and besides the raisins, there were bits of dried apple. Will the wildlings come today, Lord Snow? Owen asked. You'll know if they do, said John. Listen for the horns. Two. Two is for wildlings. Owen was tall, tow-headed, and amiable, a tireless worker, and surprisingly deft when it came to working wood and fixing catapults and the like. But as he'd gladly tell you, his mother had dropped him on his head when he was a baby, and half his wits had leaked out through his ear. You remember where to go? John asked him. I'm to go to the stairs, Donald Noy says. I'm to go up to the third landing and shoot my crossbow down to the wildlings if they try to climb over the barrier. The third landing. One, two, three. His head bobbed up and down. If the wildlings attack, the king will come and help us, won't he? He's a mighty warrior, King Robert. He's sure to come. Maester Amon sent him a bird. There was no use telling him that Robert Baratheon was dead. He would forget it, as he'd forgotten it before. Maester Amon sent him a bird, John agreed. That seemed to make Owen happy. Maester Amon had sent a lot of birds, not to one king, but to four. Wildlings at the gate, the message ran. The realm in danger. Send all the help you can to Castle Black. Even as far as Old Town and the Citadel, the ravens flew, and to half a hundred mighty lords in their castles. The northern lords offered their best hope, so to them Amon had sent two birds, to the Umbers and the Boltons, to Castle Sirwin and Torren Square, Carhold and Deepwood Mott, to Bear Island, Old Castle, Widow's Watch, White Harbor, Barrowton, and the Rills, to the mountain fastnesses of the Littles, the Burleys, the Norries, the Harclays, and the Wolves. The blackbirds brought their plea. Wildlings at the gate, the north in danger, come with all your strength. Well, ravens might have wings, but lords and kings do not. If help was coming, it would not come today. As morning turned to afternoon, the smoke of Molestown blew away, and the southern sky was clear again. No clouds, thought John. That was good. Rain or snow could doom them all. Clytus and Maester Amon rode the winch cage up to safety at the top of the wall, and most of the Molestown wives as well. Men in black cloaks paced restlessly on the tower tops and shouted back and forth across the courtyards. Septon Celador led the men on the barricade in a prayer, beseeching the warrior to give them strength. Deaf Dick Follard curled up beneath his cloak and went to sleep. Satin walked a hundred leagues in circles, round and round the crenellations. The wall wept, and the sun crept across a hard blue sky. Near evenfall, Owen the Oaf returned with a loaf of black bread and a pail of Hobbes' best mutton, cooked in a thick broth of ale and onions. Even Dick woke up for that. They ate every bit of it, using chunks of bread to wipe the bottom of the pail. By the time they were done, the sun was low in the west, the shadows sharp and black throughout the castle. "'Light the fire,' John told Satin, "'and fill the kettle with oil.' He went downstairs himself to bar the door, to try and work some of the stiffness from his leg. That was a mistake, and John soon knew it, but he clutched the crutch and saw it through all the same. The door to the king's tower was oak-studded with iron. It might delay the Thens, but it would not stop them if they wanted to come in. John slammed the bar down in its notches, paid a visit to the privy—it might well be his last chance—and hobbled back up to the roof, grimacing at the pain. The west had gone the color of a blood bruise, but the sky above was cobalt blue, deepening to purple, and the stars were coming out. John sat between two merlins with only a scarecrow for company, and watched the stallion gallop up the sky. Or was it the horned lord? He wondered where Ghost was now. He wondered about Ygritte as well, and told himself that way lay madness. They came in the night, of course. Like thieves, John thought, like murderers. Satin pissed himself when the horns blew, but John pretended not to notice. Go shake Dick by the shoulder, he told the old town boy, else he's liable to sleep through the fight. I'm frightened. Satin's face was a ghastly white. So are they. 
John leaned his crutch up against the Merlin and took up his longbow, bending the smooth, thick, dornish yew to slip a bowstring through the notches. "'Don't waste a quarrel unless you know you have a good clean shot,' he said, when Satin returned from waking Dick. "'We have an ample supply up here, but ample doesn't mean inexhaustible. And step behind a Merlin to reload. Don't try and hide in back of a scarecrow. They're made of straw. An arrow will punch through them.' He did not bother telling Dick Follard anything. Dick could read your lips if there was enough light, and he gave a damn what you were saying. But he knew it all already. The three of them took up positions on three sides of the round tower. John hung a quiver from his belt and pulled an arrow. The shaft was black, the fletching gray. As he notched it to his string, he remembered something that Theon Greyjoy had once said after a hunt. The boar can keep his tusks and the bear his claws, he had declared, smiling that way he did. There's nothing half so mortal as a gray goose feather. John had never been half the hunter that Theon was, but he was no stranger to the longbow, either. There were dark shapes slipping around the armory, backs against the stone, but he could not see them well enough to waste an arrow. He heard distant shouts and saw the archers on the Tower of Guards loosing shafts at the ground. That was too far off to concern John, but when he glimpsed three shadows detach themselves from the old stables fifty yards away, he stepped up to the colonel, raised his bow, and drew. They were running, so he led them, waiting, waiting. The arrow made a soft hiss as it left his string. A moment later there was a grunt, and suddenly only two shadows were loping across the yard. They ran all the faster, but John had already pulled a second arrow from his quiver. This time he hurried the shot too much and missed. The wildlings were gone by the time he knocked again. He searched for another target, and found four rushing around the empty shell of the Lord Commander's Keep. The moonlight glimmered off their spears and axes, and the gruesome devices on their round leathern shields. Skulls and bones, serpents, bear claws, twisted demonic faces. Free folk, he knew. The Thens carried shields of black boiled leather with bronze rims and bosses, but theirs were plain and unadorned. These were the lighter wicker shields of raiders. John pulled the goose feather back to his ear, aimed and loosed the arrow, then knocked and drew and loosed again. The first shaft pierced the bear claw shield, the second one a throat. The wildling screamed as he went down. He heard the deep thrum of deaf Dick's crossbow to his left and satins a moment later. I got one, the boy cried hoarsely. I got one in the chest. Get another, John called. He did not have to search for targets now, only choose them. He dropped a wildling archer as he was fitting an arrow to his string, then sent a shaft toward the axeman hacking at the door of Hardin's tower. That time he missed, but the arrow quivering in the oak made the wildling reconsider. It was only as he was running off that John recognized Big Boyle. Half a heartbeat later, old Mully put an arrow through his leg from the roof of the flint barracks, and he crawled off bleeding. That will stop him bitching about his boil, John thought. When his quiver was empty, he went to get another, and moved to a different kennel, side by side with Deaf Dick Follard. John got off three arrows for every bolt Deaf Dick discharged, but that was the advantage of the longbow. The crossbow penetrated better, some insisted, but it was slow and cumbersome to reload. He could hear the wildlings shouting to each other, and somewhere to the west a war-horn blew. The world was moonlight and shadow, and time became an endless round of notch and draw and loose. A wildling arrow ripped through the throat of the straw sentinel beside him, but John Snow scarcely noticed. "'Give me one clean shot at the Magnar of Then,' he prayed to his father's gods. The Magnar, at least, was a foe that he could hate. "'Give me steer.' His fingers were growing stiff, and his thumb was bleeding, but still John notched and drew and loosed. A gout of flame caught his eye, and he turned to see the door of the common hall afire. It was only a few moments before the whole great timbered hall was burning. Three-finger Hob and his Molestown helpers were safe atop the wall, he knew, but it felt like a punch in the belly all the same. "'John!' Deaf Dick yelled in his thick voice. "'The armory!' They were on the roof, he saw. One had a torch. Dick hopped up on the colonel for a better shot, jerked his crossbow to his shoulder, and sent a quarrel thrumming toward the torchman. He missed. The archer down below him didn't. Follard never made a sound, only toppled forward headlong over the parapet. It was a hundred feet to the yard below. John heard the thump as he was peering round a straw soldier, trying to see where the arrow had come from. 
Not ten feet from Death Dick's body he glimpsed a leather shield, a ragged cloak, a mop of thick red hair. Kissed by fire, he thought. Lucky. He brought his bow up, but his fingers would not part, and she was gone as suddenly as she'd appeared. He swiveled, cursing, and loosed a shaft at the men on the armory roof instead, but he missed them as well. By then the east stables were afire, too, black smoke and wisps of burning hay pouring from the stalls. When the roof collapsed, flames rose up roaring, so loud they almost drowned out the war horns of the Thens. Fifty of them were pounding up the King's Road in tight column, their shields held up above their heads. Others were swarming through the vegetable garden, across the flagstone yard, around the old dry well. Three had hacked their way through the doors of Maester Amon's apartments in the timber keep below the rookery, and a desperate fight was going on atop the silent tower, long swords against bronze axes. None of that mattered. The dance has moved on, he thought. John hobbled across to Satin and grabbed him by the shoulder. With me, he shouted. Together they moved to the north parapet, where the king's tower looked down on the gate and Donal Noy's makeshift wall of logs and barrels and sacks of corn. The Thens were there before them. They wore half-helms and had thin bronze discs sewn to their long leather shirts. Many wielded bronze axes, though a few were chipped stone. More had short stabbing spears with leaf-shaped heads that gleamed redly in the light from the burning stables. They were screaming in the old tongue as they stormed the barricade, jabbing with their spears, swinging their bronze axes, spilling corn and blood with equal abandon while crossbow quarrels and arrows rained down on them from the archers that Donal Noy had posted on the stair. "'What do we do?' Satin shouted. "'We kill them!' John shouted back, a black arrow in his hand. No archer could have asked for an easier shot. The Thens had their backs to the King's Tower as they charged the crescent, clambering over bags and barrels to reach the men in black. Both John and Satin chanced to choose the same target. He had just reached the top of the barricade when an arrow sprouted from his neck and a quarrel between his shoulder blades. Half a heartbeat later, a longsword took him in the belly and he fell back onto the man behind him. John reached down to his quiver and found it empty again. Satin was winding back his crossbow. He left him to it and went for more arrows, but he hadn't taken more than three steps before that trap slammed open three feet in front of him. Bloody hell! I never even heard the door break. There was no time to think or plan or shout for help. John dropped his bow, reached back over his shoulder, ripped long claw from its sheath, and buried the blade in the middle of the first head to pop out of the tower. Bronze was no match for Valyrian steel. The blow sheared right through the thin's helm and deep into his skull, and he went crashing back down where he'd come from. There were more behind him, John knew from the shouting. He fell back and called to Satin. The next man to make the climb got a quarrel through his cheek. He vanished, too. "'The oil,' John said. Satin nodded. Together they snatched up the thick quilted pads they'd left beside the fire, lifted the heavy kettle of boiling oil, and dumped it down the hole on the thens below. The shrieks were as bad as anything he had ever heard, and Satin looked as though he was going to be sick. John kicked the trap door shut, set the heavy iron kettle on top of it, and gave the boy with a pretty face a hard shake. "'Wretch later!' John yelled. "'Come!' They had only been gone from the parapets for a few moments, but everything below had changed. A dozen black brothers and a few moles' town men still stood atop the crates and barrels, but the wildlings were swarming over all along the crescent, pushing them back. John saw one shove his spear up through Rast's belly so hard he lifted him into the air. Young Henley was dead, and old Henley was dying, surrounded by foes. He could see Easy spinning and slashing, laughing like a loon, his cloak flapping as he leapt from cask to cask. A bronze axe caught him just below the knee, and the laughter turned into a bubbling shriek. "'They're breaking,' Satin said. "'No,' said John, "'they're broken.' It happened quickly. One mole fled, and then another, and suddenly all the villagers were throwing down their weapons and abandoning the barricade. The brothers were too few to hold alone. John watched them try and form a line to fall back in order, but the Thens washed over them with spear and axe, and then they were fleeing too. Dornish Dilly slipped and went down on his face, and a wildling planted a spear between his shoulder blades. Keggs, slow and short of breath, had almost reached the bottom step when the Thens caught the end of his cloak and yanked him around. But a crossbow quarrel dropped the man before his axe could fall. "'Got him!' Satin crowed, as Keggs staggered to the stair and began to crawl up the steps on hands and knees. The gate is lost. Donald Noy had closed and chained it, but it was there for the taking, the iron bars glimmering red with reflected firelight, the cold black tunnel behind. 
No one had fallen back to defend it. The only safety was on top of the wall, seven hundred feet up the crooked wooden stairs. "'What gods do you pray to?' John asked Satin. "'The seven, the boy from Old Town said. "'Pray, then,' John told him. "'Pray to your new gods, and I'll pray to my old ones.' It all turned here. With the confusion at the trapdoor, John had forgotten to fill his quiver. He limped back across the roof and did that now, and picked up his bow as well. The kettle had not moved from where he'd left it, so it seemed as though they were safe enough for the nonce. The dance has moved on, and we're watching from the gallery, he thought as he hobbled back. Satin was losing quarrels at the wildlings on the steps, then ducking down behind a Merlin to cock the crossbow. He may be pretty, but he's quick. The real battle was on the steps. Noy had put spearmen on the two lowest landings, but the headlong flight of the villagers had panicked them, and they had joined the flight, racing up toward the third landing, with the thens killing anyone who fell behind. The archers and crossbowmen on the higher landings were trying to drop shafts over their heads. John knocked an arrow, drew, and loosed, and was pleased when one of the wildlings went rolling down the steps. The heat of the fires was making the wall weep, and the flames danced and shimmered against the ice. The steps shook to the footsteps of men running for their lives. Again John notched and drew and loosed, but there was only one of him and one of Satin, and a good sixty or seventy thens pounding up the stairs, killing as they went, drunk on victory. On the fourth landing, three brothers in black cloaks stood shoulder to shoulder with long swords in their hands, and battle was joined again, briefly. But there were only three, and soon enough the wildling tide washed over them, and their blood dripped down the steps. A man is never so vulnerable in battle as when he flees, Lord Eddard had told John once. A running man is like a wounded animal to a soldier. It gets his bloodlust up. The archers on the fifth landing fled before the battle even reached them. It was a rout, a red rout. Fetch the torches, John told Satin. There were four of them stacked beside the fire, their heads wrapped in oily rags. There were a dozen fire arrows, too. The old town boy thrust one torch into the fire until it was blazing brightly, and brought the rest back under his arm, unlit. He looked frightened again, as well he might. John was frightened, too. It was then that he saw Steer. The Magnar was climbing up the barricade, over the gutted corn sacks and smashed barrels, and the bodies of friends and foe alike. His bronze scale armor gleamed darkly in the firelight. Steer had taken off his helm to survey the scene of his triumph, and the bald, earless horse son was smiling. In his hand was a long, weirwood spear with an ornate bronze head. When he saw the gate, he pointed the spear at it and barked something in the old tongue to the half-dozen thens around him. Too late, John thought. You should have led your men over the barricade. You might have been able to save a few. Up above, a war horn sounded, long and low, not from the top of the wall, but from the ninth landing, some two hundred feet up where Donald Noy was standing. John notched a fire arrow to his bowstring and sat and lit it from the torch. He stepped to the parapet, drew, aimed, loosed. Ribbons of flame trailed behind as the shaft sped downward and thudded into its target, crackling. Not steer. The steps, or more precisely the casks and kegs and sacks that Donald Noy had piled up beneath the steps, as high as the first landing, the barrels of lard and lamp oil, the bags of leaves and oily rags, the split logs, bark, and wood shavings. Again, said John, and again, and... Again? Other long bowmen were firing, too, from every tower top and range, some sending their arrows up in high arcs to drop before the wall. When John ran out of fire arrows, he and Satin began to light the torches and fling them from the crennels. Up above, another fire was blooming. The old wooden steps had drunk up oil like a sponge, and Donald Noy had drenched them from the ninth landing all the way down to the seventh. John could only hope that most of their own people had staggered up to safety before Noy threw the torches. The black brothers at least had known the plan, but the villagers had not. Wind and fire did the rest. All John had to do was watch. With flames below and flames above, the wildlings had nowhere to go. Some continued upward and died. Some went downward and died. Some stayed where they were. They died as well. Many leapt from the steps before they burned and died from the fall. Twenty-odd thens were still huddled together between the fires when the ice cracked from the heat and the whole lower third of the stair broke off along with several tons of ice. That was the last that John Snow saw of Steer, the Magnar of Then. The wall defends itself, he thought. John asked Satin to help him down to the yard. 
His wounded leg hurt so badly that he could hardly walk, even with the crutch. "'Bring the torch,' he told the boy from Old Town. "'I need to look for someone.' It had been mostly Thens on the steps. Surely some of the free folk had escaped. Mance's people, not the Magnars. She might have been one. So they climbed down past the bodies of the men who'd tried the trapdoor, and John wandered through the dark with his crutch under one arm, and the other around the shoulders of a boy who'd been a whore in Old Town. The stables and the common hall had burned down to smoking cinders by then, but the fire still raged along the wall, climbing step by step and landing by landing. From time to time they'd hear a groan, and then a crack, and another chunk would come crashing off the wall. The air was full of ash and ice crystals. He found Court dead, and Stone Thumbs dying. He found some dead and dying thens he had never truly known. He found Big Boyle, weak from all the blood he'd lost, but still alive. He found Egrit, sprawled across a patch of old snow beneath the Lord Commander's tower, with an arrow between her breasts. The ice crystals had settled over her face, and in the moonlight it looked as though she were a glittering silver mask. The arrow was black, John saw, but it was fletched with white duck feathers. Not mine, he told himself. Not one of mine. But he felt as if it were. When he knelt in the snow beside her, her eyes opened. John Snow, she said very softly. It sounded as though the arrow had found a lung. Is this a proper castle now? Not just a tower? It is. John took her hand. Good, she whispered. I wanted to see one proper castle before... before I... You'll see a hundred castles, he promised her. The battle's done. Maester Amon will see to you. He touched her hair. You're kissed by fire, remember? Lucky. It will take more than an arrow to kill you. Amon will draw it out and patch you up, and will get you some milk of the poppy for the pain. She just smiled at that. Do you remember that cave? We should have stayed in that cave. I told you so. We'll go back to the cave, he said. You're not going to die, Egret. You're not. Oh, Egret cupped his cheek with her hand. You know nothing, Jon Snow. She sighed, dying. Bran. It is only another empty castle, Mira Reed said, as she gazed across the desolation of rubble, ruins, and weeds. No, thought Bran, it is the night fort, and this is the end of the world. In the mountains, all he could think of was reaching the wall and finding the three-eyed crow. But now that they were here, he was filled with fears. The dream he'd had, the dream Summer had had. No, I mustn't think about that dream. He had not even told the reeds, though Mira at least seemed to sense that something was wrong. If he never talked of it, maybe he could forget he ever dreamed it, and then it wouldn't have happened, and Rob and Grey Wind would still be— Odor! Odor shifted his weight, and Bran with it. He was tired. They had been walking for hours. At least he's not afraid. Bran was scared of this place, and almost as scared of admitting it to the reeds. I'm a prince of the north, a Stark of Winterfell. Almost a man grown. I have to be as brave as Rob. Jojen gazed up at him with his dark green eyes. There's nothing here to hurt us, Your Grace. Bran wasn't so certain. The night fort had figured in some of old Nan's scariest stories. It was here that Night's King had reigned before his name was wiped from the memory of man. This was where the rat cook had served the Andal King his prince and bacon pie, where the seventy-nine sentinels stood their watch where brave young Danny Flint had been raped and murdered. This was the castle where King Sherrod had called down his curse on the andals of old, where the Prentice boys had faced the thing that came in the night, where blind Simeon Star-Eyes had seen the hellhounds fighting. Mad-Axe had once walked these yards and climbed these towers, butchering his brothers in the dark. All that had happened hundreds and thousands of years ago, to be sure, and some maybe never happened at all. Maester Lewin always said that old Nan's stories shouldn't be swallowed whole. But once his uncle came to see father, and Bran asked about the night fort. 
Benjamin Stark never said the tales were true, but he never said they weren't. He only shrugged and said, We left the night fort two hundred years ago, as if that was an answer. Bran forced himself to look around. The morning was cold but bright, the sun shining down from a hard blue sky. But he did not like the noises. The wind made a nervous whistling sound as it shivered through the broken towers. The keeps groaned and settled, and he could hear rats scrabbling under the floor of the great hall. The rat cooks children running from their father. The yards were small forests where spindly trees rubbed their bare branches together, and dead leaves scuttled like roaches across patches of old snow. There were trees growing where the stables had been, and a twisted white weirwood pushing up through the gaping hole in the roof of the domed kitchen. Even summer was not at ease here. Bran slipped inside his skin just for an instant to get the smell of the place. He did not like that either. And there was no way through. Bran had told them there wouldn't be. He had told them and told them, but Jojen Reed had insisted on seeing for himself. He had had a green dream, he said, and his green dreams did not lie. They don't open any gates either, thought Bran. The gate the night fort guarded had been sealed since the day the Black Brothers had loaded up their mules and garons and departed for Deep Lake. Its iron portcullis lowered, the chains that raised it carried off, the tunnel packed with stone and rubble, all frozen together until they were as impenetrable as the wall itself. "'We should have followed John,' Bran said when he saw it. He thought of his bastard brother often since the night that summer had watched him ride off through the storm. "'We should have found the King's Road and gone to Castle Black.' "'We dare not, my prince,' Jojen said. "'I've told you why.' "'But there are wildlings!' They killed some man, and they wanted to kill John, too. Jojen, there were a hundred of them. So you said. We are four. You helped your brother, if that was him in truth, but it almost cost you summer. I know, said Bran miserably. The direwolf had killed three of them, maybe more, but there had been too many. When they formed a tight ring around the tall, earless man, he had tried to slip away through the rain, but one of their arrows had come flashing after him and the sudden stab of pain had driven Bran out of the wolf's skin and back into his own. After the storm finally died, they had huddled in the dark without a fire, talking in whispers, if they talked at all, listening to Hodor's heavy breathing and wondering if the wildlings might try and cross the lake in the morning. Bran had reached out for summer time and time again, but the pain he found drove him back, the way a red-hot kettle makes you pull your hand back even when you mean to grab it. Only Hodor slept that night, muttering, Hodor, Hodor, as he tossed and turned. Bran was terrified that Summer was off dying in the darkness. "'Please, you old gods,' he prayed. "'You took Winterfell and my father and my legs. Please don't take Summer, too. And watch over Jon Snow, too. And make the wildlings go away.' No weirwoods grew on that stony island in the lake, yet somehow the old gods must have heard. The wildlings took their sweet time about departing the next morning, stripping the bodies of their dead and the old man they'd killed, even pulling a few fish from the lake, and there was a scary moment when three of them found the causeway and started to walk out. But the path turned, and they didn't, and two of them nearly drowned before the others pulled them out. The tall, bald man yelled at them, his words echoing across the water in some tongue that even Jojen did not know, and a little while later they gathered up their shields and spears and marched off north by east, the same way John had gone. Bran wanted to leave, too, to look for summer, but the reed said no. "'We will stay another night,' said Jojen. "'Put some leagues between us and the wildlings. You don't want to meet them again, do you?' Late that afternoon summer returned from wherever he'd been hiding, dragging his back leg. He ate parts of the bodies in the inn, driving off the crows, then swam out to the island. Mira had drawn the broken arrow from his leg and rubbed the wound with the juice of some plants she found growing around the base of the tower. The dire wolf was still limping, but a little less each day, it seemed to Bran. The gods had heard. "'Maybe we should try another castle,' Mira said to her brother. "'Maybe we could get through the gate somewhere else. I could go scout if you wanted. I'd make better time by myself.' Bran shook his head. "'If you go east, there's Deep Lake, then Queen's Gate. West is Ice Mark.' but they'll be the same, only smaller. All the gates are sealed except the ones at Castle Black, East Watch, and the Shadow Tower. 
Hodor said, Hodor, to that, and the reeds exchanged a look. At least I should climb to the top of the wall, Mira decided. Maybe I'll see something up there. What could you hope to see? Jojen asked. Something, said Mira, and for once she was adamant. It should be me. Bran raised his head to look up at the wall and imagined himself climbing inch by inch, squirming his fingers into cracks in the ice and kicking footholds with his toes. That made him smile in spite of everything, the dreams and the wildlings and John and everything. He had climbed the walls of Winterfell when he was little, and all the towers too, but none of them had been so high, and they were only stone. The wall could look like stone, all grey and pitted, but then the clouds would break and the sun would hit it differently, and all at once it would transform and stand there, white and blue and glittering. It was the end of the world, old Anne always said. On the other side were monsters and giants and ghouls, but they could not pass so long as the wall stood strong. I want to stand on top with Mira, Bran thought. I want to stand on top and see. But he was a broken boy with useless legs, so all he could do was watch from below as Mira went up in his stead. She wasn't really climbing the way he used to climb. She was only walking up some steps that the Night's Watch had hewn hundreds and thousands of years ago. He remembered Maester Lewin saying the Night Fort was the only castle where the steps had been cut from the ice of the wall itself. Or maybe it had been Uncle Benjamin. The newer castles had wooden steps, or stone ones, or long ramps of earth and gravel. Ice is too treacherous. It was his uncle who told him that. He said that the outer surface of the wall wept icy tears sometimes, though the core inside stayed frozen hard as rock. The steps must have melted and refrozen a thousand times since the last Black Brothers left the castle, and every time they did they shrunk a little and got smoother and rounder and more treacherous and smaller. It's almost like the wall was swallowing them back into itself. Mira Reed was very sure-footed, but even so she was going slowly, moving from nub to nub. In two places, where the steps were hardly there at all, she got down on all fours. It will be worse when she comes down, Bran thought, watching. Even so, he wished it was him up there. When she reached the top, crawling up the icy knobs that were all that remained of the highest steps, Mira vanished from his sight. "'When will she come down?' Bran asked Jojen. "'When she is ready. She will want to have a good look at the wall and what's beyond. We should do the same down here.' "'Hodor,' said Hodor doubtfully. "'We might find something,' Jojen insisted. "'Well, something might find us.' Bran couldn't say it, though. He did not want Jojen to think he was craven. So they went exploring, Jojen Reed leading, Bran in his basket on Hodor's back, Summer padding by their side. Once the dire wolf bolted through a dark door and returned a moment later with a gray rat between his teeth. The rat cook, Bran thought, but it was the wrong color and only as big as a cat. The rat cook was white and almost as huge as a sow. There were a lot of dark doors in the night fort and a lot of rats. Bran could hear them scurrying through the vaults and cellars and the maze of pitch-black tunnels that connected them. Jojen wanted to go poking around down there, but Hodor said, Hodor, to that, and Bran said, No! There were worse things than rats down in the dark beneath the night fort. This seems an old place, Jojen said as they walked down a gallery where the sunlight fell in dusty shafts through empty windows. Twice as old as Castle Black, Bran said remembering. It was the first castle on the wall, and the largest. But it had also been the first abandoned, all the way back in the time of the old king. Even then it had been three-quarters empty and too costly to maintain. Good Queen Alisanne had suggested that the watch replace it with a smaller, newer castle, at a spot only seven miles east, where the wall curved along the shore of a beautiful green lake. Deep Lake had been paid for by the Queen's jewels, and built by the men the old king had sent north, and the Black Brothers had abandoned the night fort to the rats. That was two centuries past, though. Now Deep Lake stood as empty as the castle it had replaced, and the night fort. There are ghosts here, Bran said. Hodor had heard all the stories before, but Jojen might not have. 
old ghosts from before the old king, even before Aegon the dragon, seventy-nine deserters who went south to be outlaws. One was Lord Risewell's youngest son, so when they reached the Barrowlands, they sought shelter at his castle, but Lord Risewell took them captive and returned them to the night fort. The Lord Commander had holes hewn in the top of the wall, and he put the deserters in them and sealed them up alive in the ice. They have spears and horns, and they all face north. The seventy-nine sentinels, they're called. They left their posts in life, so in death their watch goes on forever. Years later, when Lord Risewell was old and dying, he had himself carried to the night fort, so he could take the black and stand beside his son. He'd sent him back to the wall for honor's sake, but he loved him still, so he came to share his watch. They spent half the day poking through the castle. Some of the towers had fallen down, and others looked unsafe, but they climbed the bell tower, the bells were gone, and the rookery, the birds were gone. Beneath the brew house they found a vault of huge oaken casks that boomed hollowly when Hodor knocked on them. They found a library. The shelves and bins had collapsed, the books were gone, and rats were everywhere. They found a dank and dim-lit dungeon with cells enough to hold five hundred captives, but when Bran grabbed hold of one of the rusted bars it broke off in his hand. Only one crumbling wall remained of the great hall. The bathhouse seemed to be sinking into the ground, and a huge thornbush had conquered the practice yard outside the armory, where black brothers had once labored with spear and shield and sword. The armory and the forge still stood, however, though cobwebs, rats, and dust had taken the places of blades, bellows, and anvil. Sometimes Summer would hear sounds that Bran seemed deaf to, or bare his teeth at nothing, the fur on the back of his neck bristling. But the rat cook never put in an appearance, nor the seventy-nine sentinels, nor Mad Axe. Bran was much relieved. Maybe it is only a ruined, empty castle. By the time Mira returned, the sun was only a sword's breadth above the western hills. What did you see? her brother Jojen asked her. I saw the haunted forest, she said in a wistful tone. Hills rising wild as far as the eye can see covered with trees that no axe has ever touched. I saw the sunlight glinting off a lake, and clouds sweeping in from the west. I saw patches of old snow and icicles long as pikes. I even saw an eagle circling. I think he saw me, too. I waved at him. "'Did you see a way down?' asked Jojen. She shook her head. "'No. It's a sheer drop, and the ice is so smooth. I might be able to make the descent if I had a good rope and an axe to chop out handholds, but—' "'But not us,' Jojen finished. "'No,' his sister agreed. "'Are you sure this is the place you saw in your dream? Maybe we have the wrong castle.' "'No, this is the castle. There is a gate here.' "'Yes,' thought Bran, "'but it's blocked by stone and ice.' As the sun began to set, the shadows of the towers lengthened, and the wind blew harder, sending gusts of dry, dead leaves rattling through the yards. The gathering gloom put Bran in mind of another of old Nan's stories, the tale of Night's King. He had been the thirteenth man to lead the night's watch, she said, a warrior who knew no fear. And that was the fault in him, she would add, for all men must know fear. A woman was his downfall, a woman glimpsed from atop the wall, with skin as white as the moon and eyes like blue stars. Fearing nothing, he chased her and caught her and loved her, though her skin was cold as ice, and when he gave his seed to her, he gave his soul as well. He brought her back to the night fort and proclaimed her a queen, and himself her king, and with strange sorceries he bound his sworn brothers to his will. For thirteen years they had ruled, Knight's King and his corpse queen, till finally the Stark of Winterfell and Joraman of the Wildlings had joined to free the watch from bondage. After his fall, when it was found he had been sacrificing to the others, all records of Knight's King had been destroyed, his very name forbidden. Some say he was a Bolton, old man would always end. Some say a Magnar out of Skagos. Some say Umber Flint or Nori. Some would have you think he was a Woodfoot, from them who ruled Bear Island before the Ironmen came. He never was, 
He was a Stark, the brother of the man who brought him down. She always pinched Bran on the nose then. He would never forget it. He was a Stark of Winterfell, and who can say? Mayhaps his name was Brandon. Mayhaps he slept in this very bed, in this very room. No, Bran thought. But he walked in this castle, where we'll sleep tonight. He did not like that notion very much at all. Night's king was only a man by light of day, old Nan would always say, but the night was his to rule. And it's getting dark. The reeds decided that they would sleep in the kitchens, a stone octagon with a broken dome. It looked to offer better shelter than most of the other buildings, even though a crooked weirwood had burst up through the slate floor beside the huge central well, stretching slantwise toward the hole in the roof, its bone-white branches reaching for the sun. It was a queer kind of tree, skinnier than any other weirwood that Bran had ever seen, and faceless as well, but it made him feel as if the old gods were with him here, at least. That was the only thing he liked about the kitchens, though. The roof was mostly there, so they'd be dry if it rained again, but he didn't think they would ever get warm here. You could feel the cold seeping up through the slate floor. Bran did not like the shadows, either, or the huge brick ovens that surrounded them like open mouths, or the rusted meat hooks, or the scars and stains he saw on the butcher's block along one wall. That was where the rat cooked and chopped the prince to pieces, he knew, and he baked the pie in one of these ovens. The well was the thing he liked the least, though. It was a good twelve feet across, all stone, with steps built into its side, circling down and down into darkness. The walls were damp and covered with nitre, but none of them could see the water at the bottom, not even Mira with her sharp hunter's eyes. "'Maybe it doesn't have a bottom,' Bran said uncertainly. Hodor peered over the knee-high lip of the well and said, "'Hodor!' The word echoed down the well. Hodor, 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 Hodor. Fainter and fainter. Hodor, 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 Hodor. Until it was less than a whisper. Hodor looked startled. Then he laughed and bent to scoop a broken piece of slate off the floor. Hodor, don't, said Bran, but too late. Hodor tossed the slate over the edge. You shouldn't have done that. You don't know what's down there. You might have hurt something or, or woken something up. Hodor looked at him innocently. Hodor? Far, far, far below, they heard the sound as the stone found water. It wasn't a splash, not truly. It was more a gulp, as if whatever was below had opened a quivering, jellied mouth to swallow Hodor's stone. Faint echoes traveled up the well, and for a moment Bran thought he heard something moving, thrashing about in the water. Maybe we shouldn't stay here, he said uneasily. By the well? asked Mira. Or in the night fort? Yes, said Bran. She laughed and sent Hodor out to gather wood. Summer went too. It was almost dark by then, and the dire wolf wanted to hunt. Hodor returned alone, with both arms full of dead wood and broken branches. Jojen Reed took his flint and knife and set about lighting a fire while Mira boned the fish she'd caught to the last stream they'd crossed. Bran wondered how many years had passed since there had last been a supper cooked in the kitchens of the night fort. He wondered who had cooked it, too, though maybe it was better not to know. When the flames were blazing nicely, Mira put the fish on. At least it's not a meat pie. The rat cook had cooked the son of the Andal king in a big pie with onions, carrots, mushrooms, lots of pepper and salt, a rasher of bacon, and a dark red Dornish wine. Then he served him to his father, who praised the taste and had a second slice. Afterward the gods transformed the cook into a monstrous white rat who could only eat his own young. He had roamed the night fort ever since, devouring his children, but still his hunger was not sated. It was not for murder that the gods cursed him, old Nan said, nor for serving the Andal king his son in a pie. A man has a right to vengeance but he slew a guest beneath his roof, and that the gods cannot forgive. "'We should sleep,' Jojen said solemnly, after they were full. The fire was burning low. He stirred it with a stick. "'Perhaps I'll have another green dream to show us the way.' 
Hodor was already curled up and snoring lightly. From time to time he thrashed beneath his cloak and whimpered something that might have been Hodor. Bran wriggled closer to the fire. The warmth felt good, and the soft crackling of flames soothed him, but sleep would not come. Outside the wind was sending armies of dead leaves marching across the courtyards to scratch faintly at the doors and windows. The sounds made him think of old man's stories. He could almost hear the ghostly sentinels calling to each other atop the wall and winding their ghostly war-horns. Pale moonlight slanted down to the hole in the dome, painting the branches of the weirwood as they strained up toward the roof. It looked as if the tree was trying to catch the moon and drag it down into the well. "'Old gods,' Bran prayed, "'if you hear me, don't send a dream tonight. Or if you do, make it a good dream.' The gods made no answer. Bran made himself close his eyes. Maybe he even slept some, or maybe he was just drowsing, floating the way you do when you are half awake and half asleep, trying not to think about Mad Axe or the Rat Cook or the thing that came in the night. Then he heard the noise. His eyes opened. What was that? He held his breath. Did I dream it? Was I having a stupid nightmare? He didn't want to wake Mira and Jojin for a bad dream, but... There! A soft scuffling sound far off. Leaves, its leaves rattling off the walls outside and rustling together. Or oh, the wind, it could be the wind. The sound wasn't coming from outside, though. Bran felt the hairs on his arms start to rise. The sound's inside. It's in here with us, and it's getting louder. He pushed himself up onto an elbow, listening. There was wind and blowing leaves as well, but this was something else. Footsteps. Someone was coming this way. Some thing was coming this way. It wasn't the sentinels, he knew. The sentinels never left the wall. But there might be other ghosts in the night fort, ones even more terrible. He remembered what old Nan had said of Mad Axe, how he took his boots off and prowled the castle halls barefoot in the dark, with never a sound to tell you where he was except for the drops of blood that fell from his axe, and his elbows, and the end of his wet red beard. Or maybe it wasn't Mad Axe at all, maybe it was the thing that came in the night. The Prentice boys all saw it, old Nan said, but afterward, when they told their lord commander, every description had been different. And three died within the year and the fourth went mad, and a hundred years later, when the thing had come again, the Prentice boys were seen shambling along behind it, all in chains. That was only a story, though. He was just scaring himself. There was no thing that comes in the night. Maester Lewin had said so. If there had ever been such a thing, it was gone from the world now, like giants and dragons. It's nothing, Bran thought. But the sounds were louder now. It's coming from the well, he realized. That made him even more afraid. Something was coming up from under the ground, coming up out of the dark. Hodor woke it up. He woke it up with that stupid piece of slate, and now it's coming. It was hard to hear over Hodor's snores and the thumping of his own heart. Was that the sound blood made dripping from an axe, or was it the faint, far-off rattling of ghostly chains? Bran listened harder. Footsteps. It was definitely footsteps, each one a little louder than the one before. He couldn't tell how many, though. The well made the sounds echo. He didn't hear any dripping or change either, but there was something else. A high, thin, whimpering sound, like someone in pain, and heavy, muffled breathing. But the footsteps were loudest. The footsteps were coming closer. Bran was too frightened to shout. The fire had burned down to a few faint embers, and his friends were all asleep. He almost slipped his skin and reached out for his wolf, but Summer might be miles away. He couldn't leave his friends helpless in the dark to face whatever was coming up out of the well. I told them not to come here, he thought miserably. I told them there were ghosts. I told them that we should go to Castle Black. The footfalls sounded heavy to Bran, slow, ponderous, scraping against the stone. It must be huge. Mad Axe had been a big man in Old Nan's story, and the thing that came in the night had been monstrous. Back in Winterfell, Sansa had told him that the demons of the dark couldn't touch him if he hid beneath his blanket. 
He almost did that now, before he remembered that he was a prince, and almost a man grown. Bran wriggled across the floor, dragging his dead legs behind him until he could reach out and touch Mira on the foot. She woke at once. He had never known anyone to wake as quick as Mira Reed, or to be so alert so fast. Bran pressed a finger to his mouth so she'd know not to speak. She heard the sound at once. He could see that on her face, the echoing footfalls, the faint whimpering, the heavy breathing. Mira rose to her feet without a word and reclaimed her weapons. With her three-pronged frog-spear in her right hand and the folds of her net dangling from her left, she slipped barefoot toward the well. Jojin dozed on, oblivious, while Hodor muttered and thrashed in restless sleep. She kept to the shadows as she moved, stepped around the shaft of moonlight as quiet as a cat. Bran was watching her all the while, and even he could barely see the faint sheen of her spear. "'I can't let her fight the thing alone,' he thought. Summer was far away, but he slipped his skin and reached for Hodor. It was not like sliding into summer. That was so easy now that Bran hardly thought about it. This was harder, like trying to pull a left boot on your right foot. It fit all wrong, and the boot was scared, too. The boot didn't know what was happening. The boot was pushing the foot away. He tasted vomit in the back of Hodor's throat, and that was almost enough to make him flee. Instead, he squirmed and shoved, sat up, gathered his legs under him, his huge, strong legs, and rose. I'm standing, he took a step. I'm walking. It was such a strange feeling that he almost fell. He could see himself on the cold stone floor, a little broken thing, but he wasn't broken now. He grabbed Hodor's longsword. The breathing was as loud as a blacksmith's bellows. From the well came a wail, a piercing creech that went through him like a knife. A huge black shape heaved itself up into the darkness and lurched toward the moonlight, and the fear rose up in Bran so thick that before he could even think of drawing Hodor's sword the way he'd meant to, he found himself back on the floor again with Hodor roaring, Hodor, 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 the way he had in the lake tower whenever the lightning flashed. But the thing that came in the night was screaming too and thrashing wildly in the folds of Mira's net. Bran saw her spear dart out of the darkness to snap at it, and the thing staggered and fell, struggling with the net. The wailing was still coming from the well, even louder now. On the floor, the black thing flopped and fought, screeching, No! No, don't, please! Don't! Mira stood over him, the moonlight shining silver off the prongs of her frog spear. Who are you? she demanded. I'm Sam, the black thing sobbed. Sam! Sam! I'm Sam! Let me out! You stabbed me! He rolled through the puddle of moonlight, flailing and flopping in the tangles of Mira's net. Hodor was still shouting, Hodor, Hodor, Hodor. It was Jojen who fed the sticks to the fire and blew on them until the flames leapt up crackling. Then there was light, and Bran saw the pale, thin-faced girl by the lip of the well, all bundled up in furs and skins beneath an enormous black cloak, trying to shush the screaming baby in her arms. The thing on the floor was pushing an arm through the net to reach his knife, but the loops wouldn't let him. He wasn't any monster beast or even Mad Axe drenched in gore. Only a big, fat man dressed up in black wool, black fur, black leather, and black mail. He's a black brother, said Bran. Mira, he's from the Night's Watch. Hodor? Hodor squatted down on his haunches to peer at the man in the net. Hodor, he said again, hooting. The Night's Watch, yes. The fat man was still breathing like a bellows. I'm a brother of the Watch. He had one cord under his chins, forcing his head up, and others digging deep into his cheeks. I'm a crow, please. Let me out of this. Bran was suddenly uncertain. Are you the three-eyed crow? He can't be the three-eyed crow. I don't think so. The fat man rolled his eyes, but there were only two of them. I'm only Sam, Samwell Tarley. Let me out. It's hurting me. He began to struggle again. Mira made a disgusted sound. Stop flopping around. If you tear my net, I'll throw you back down the well. Just lie still, and I'll untangle you. Who are you? Jojen asked the girl with the baby. Jilly, she said. For the Jilly flower? He's Sam. We never meant to scare you. She rocked her baby and murmured at it, and finally it stopped crying. Mira was untangling the fat brother, and Jojen went to the well and peered down. 
Where did you come from? From Craster's, the girl said. Are you the one? Jojen turned to look at her. The one? He said that Sam wasn't the one, she explained. There was someone else, he said. The one he was sent to find. Who said? Bran demanded. Cold hands, Jilly answered softly. Mira peeled back one end of her net, and the fat man managed to sit up. He was shaking, Bran saw, and still struggling to catch his breath. He said there would be people, he huffed. People in the castle. I didn't know you'd be right at the top of the steps, though. I didn't know you'd throw a gnat on me or stab me in the stomach. He touched his belly with a black-gloved hand. Am I bleeding? I can't see. It was just a poke to get you off your feet, said Mira. Here, let me have a look. She went to one knee and felt around his navel. You're wearing mail. I never got near your skin. Well, it hurt all the same, Sam complained. Are you really a brother of the Night's Watch? Bran asked. The fat man's chins jiggled when he nodded. His skin looked pale and saggy. Only a steward. I took care of Lord Mormont's ravens. For a moment he looked like he was going to cry. I lost them at the fist, though. It was my fault. I got us lost, too. I couldn't even find the wall. It's a hundred leagues long and seven hundred feet high, and I couldn't find it. Well, you've found it now, said Mira. Lift your rump off the ground. I want my net back. How did you get through the wall? Jojen demanded as Sam struggled to his feet. Does the well lead to an underground river? Is that where you came from? You're not even wet. There's a gate, said Fat Sam, a hidden gate, as old as the wall itself. The Black Gate, he called it. The reeds exchanged a look. We'll find this gate at the bottom of the well, asked Jojen. Sam shook his head. You won't. I have to take you. Why? Mira demanded. If there's a gate... You won't find it. If you did, it wouldn't open. Not for you. It's the black gate. Sam plucked at the faded black wool of his sleeve. Only a man of the Night's Watch can open it, he said. A sworn brother who has said his words. He said, Trojan frowned. This cold hands? That wasn't his true name, said Jilly, rocking. We only called him that, Sam and me. His hands were cold as ice, but he saved us from the dead men, him and his ravens, and he brought us here on his elk. His elk, said Bran, wonderstruck. His elk, said Mira, startled. His ravens, said Jojen. Hodor, said Hodor. Was he green? Bran wanted to know. Did he have antlers? The fat man was confused. The elk? Cold hands, said Bran impatiently. The green men ride on elks, old Nan used to say. Sometimes they have antlers, too. He wasn't a green man. He wore blacks like a brother of the watch. But he was pale as a white, with hands so cold that at first I was afraid. The whites have blue eyes, though, and they don't have tongues, or they've forgotten how to use them. The fat man turned to Jojen. He'll be waiting. We should go. Do you have anything warmer to wear? The black gate is cold, and the other side of the wall is even colder. You— Why didn't he come with you? Mira gestured toward Jilly and her babe. They came with you. Why not him? Why didn't you bring him through this black gate, too? He— He can't. Why not? The wall. The wall is more than just ice and stone, he said. There are spells woven into it, old ones and strong. He cannot pass beyond the wall. It grew very quiet in the castle kitchen then. Bran could hear the soft crackle of the flames, the wind stirring the leaves in the night, the creak of the skinny weirwood reaching for the moon. Beyond the gates the monsters live, and the giants and the ghouls, he remembered old Nan saying, but they cannot pass so long as the walls stand strong. So go to sleep, my little Brandon, my baby boy. You needn't fear. There are no monsters here. I am not the one you were told to bring, Jojen Reed told Fat Sam in his stained and baggy blacks. He is. Oh, 
Sam looked down at him uncertainly. It might have been just then that he realized Bran was crippled. I don't... I'm not strong enough to carry you. I, Hodor can carry me, Bran pointed at his basket. I ride in that, up on his back. Sam was staring at him. You're Jon Snow's brother, the one who felt... No, said Jojen. That boy is dead. Don't tell, Bran warned. Please. Sam looked confused for a moment, but finally he said, I, I can keep a secret. Jilly, too. When he looked at her, the girl nodded. John, John was my brother, too. He was the best friend I ever had, but he went off with Corrin Halfhand to scout the Frostfangs and never came back. We were waiting for him on the fist when, when... John's here, Bran said. Summer saw him. He was with some wildlings, but they killed a man, and John took his horse and escaped. I bet he went to Castle Black. Sam turned big eyes on Mira. You're certain it was John? You saw him? I'm Mira, Mira said with a smile. Summer is... A shadow detached itself from the broken dome above and leapt down to the moonlight. Even with his injured leg, the wolf landed as light and quiet as a snowfall. The girl, Jilly, made a frightened sound and clutched her babe so hard against her that it began to cry again. He won't hurt you, Bran said. That's Summer. John said you all had wolves. Sam pulled off a glove. I know, ghost. He held out a shaky hand. The fingers white and soft and fat as little sausages. Summer padded closer, sniffed them, and gave the hand a lick. That was when Bran made up his mind. We'll go with you. All of you? Sam seemed surprised by that. Mira ruffled Bran's hair. He's our prince. Summer circled the well, sniffing. He paused by the top step and looked back at Bran. He wants to go. Will Jilly be safe if I leave her here till I come back? Sam asked them. She should be, said Mira. She's welcome to our fire. Jojen said, The castle is empty. Jilly looked around. Craster used to tell us tales of castles, but I never knew they'd be so big. It's only the kitchens. Bran wondered what she'd think when she saw Winterfell, if she ever did. It took them a few minutes to gather their things and hoist Bran into his wicker seat on Hodor's back. By the time they were ready to go, Jilly sat nursing her babe by the fire. "'You'll come back for me,' she said to Sam. "'As soon as I can,' he promised. "'Then we'll go somewhere warm.' When he heard that, part of Bran wondered what he was doing. "'Will I ever go someplace warm again?' "'I'll go first. I know the way.' Sam hesitated at the top. There's just so many steps, he sighed before he started down. Jojen followed, then Summer, then Hodor with Bran riding on his back. Mira took the rear, with her spear and net in hand. It was a long way down. The top of the well was bathed in moonlight, but it grew smaller and dimmer every time they went around. Their footsteps echoed off the damp stones, and the water sounds grew louder. "'Should we have brought torches?' Jojen asked. "'Your eyes will adjust,' said Sam. "'Keep one hand on the wall and you won't fall.' The well grew darker and colder with every turn. When Bran finally lifted his head around to look back up the shaft, the top of the well was no bigger than a half-moon. "'Hodor,' Hodor whispered. "'Hodor, Hodor, 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 Hodor,' the well whispered back. The water sounds were close, but when Bran peered down, he saw only blackness. A turn or two later, Sam stopped suddenly. He was a quarter of the way around the well from Bran and Hodor, and six feet farther down, yet Bran could barely see him. He could see the door, though. The Black Gate, Sam had called it, but it wasn't black at all. It was white weirwood, and there was a face on it. A glow came from the wood like milk and moonlight, so faint it scarcely seemed to touch anything beyond the door itself, not even Sam standing right before it. The face was old and pale, wrinkled and shrunken. He looks dead. 
its mouth was closed, and its eyes, its cheeks were sunken, its brow withered, its chin sagging. If a man could live for a thousand years and never die but just grow older, his face might come to look like that. The door opened its eyes. They were white, too, and blind. Who are you? the door asked, and the well whispered, Who, 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 who? I am the sword in the darkness, Samuel Tarley said. I am the watcher on the walls. I am the fire that burns against the cold, the light that brings the dawn, the horn that wakes the sleepers. I am the shield that guards the realms of men. Then pass, the door said. Its lips opened, wide and wider and wider still, until nothing at all remained but a great gaping mouth and a ring of wrinkles. Sam stepped aside and waved Jojin through ahead of him. Summer followed, sniffing as he went, and then it was Bran's turn. Hodor ducked, but not low enough. The door's upper lip brushed softly against the top of Bran's head, and a drop of water fell on him and ran slowly down his nose. It was strangely warm and salty as a tear. Daenerys Meereen was as large as Astapor and Yunkai combined. Like her sister cities, she was built of brick. But where Astapor had been red and Yunkai yellow, Meereen was made with bricks of many colors. Her walls were higher than Yunkai's and in better repair, studded with bastions and anchored by great defensive towers at every angle. Behind them, huge against the sky, could be seen the top of the Great Pyramid, a monstrous thing, eight hundred feet tall, with a towering bronze harpy at its top. "'The harpy is a craven thing,' to Ario Nahara said when he saw it. "'She has a woman's heart and a chicken's legs. Small wonder her sons hide behind their walls.' But the hero did not hide. He rode out the city gates, armored in scales of copper and jet, and mounted upon a white charger whose striped pink and white barding matched the silk cloak flowing from the hero's shoulders. The lance he bore was fourteen feet long, swirled in pink and white, and his hair was shaped and teased and lacquered into two great curling ram's horns. Back and forth he rode beneath the walls of multicolored bricks, challenging the besiegers to send a champion forth to meet him in single combat. Her blood riders were in such a fever to go meet him that they almost came to blows. Blood of my blood, Denny told them. Your place is here by me. This man is a buzzing fly no more. Ignore him. He will soon be gone. Ago, Jogo, and Rakaro were brave warriors, but they were young and too valuable to risk. They kept her Kalasar together, and were her best scouts, too. "'That was wisely done,' Sir Jorah said, as they watched from the front of her pavilion. "'Let the fool ride back and forth, and shout until his horse goes lame. He does us no harm.' "'He does,' Austan Whitebeard insisted. "'Wars are not one with swords and spears alone, sir. Two hosts of equal strength may come together, but one will break and run whilst the other stands.' This hero builds courage in the hearts of his own men and plants the seeds of doubt in ours. Sir Jorah snorted. And if our champion were to lose, what sort of seed would that plant? A man who fears battle wins no victories, sir. We're not speaking of battle. Marine's gates will not open if that fool falls. Why risk a life for naught? For honor, I would say. I have heard enough. Danny did not need their squabbling on top of all the other troubles that plagued her. Meereen posed dangers far more serious than one pink-and-white hero shouting insults, and she could not let herself be distracted. Her host numbered more than eighty thousand at the Yunkai, but fewer than a quarter of them were soldiers. The rest, well, Sir Jorah called them mouths with feet, and soon they would be starving. The great masters of Meereen had withdrawn before Danny's advance, harvesting all they could and burning what they could not harvest. Scorched fields and poisoned wells had greeted her at every hand. Worst of all, they had nailed a slave child up on every milepost along the coast road from Yunkai, nailed them up still living with their entrails hanging out and one arm always outstretched to point the way to Meereen. 
Leading her van, Ario had given orders for the children to be taken down before Danny had to see them, but she had countermanded him as soon as she was told. I will see them, she said. I will see every one and count them and look upon their faces, and I will remember. By the time they came to Marine, sitting on the salt coast beside her river, the count stood at one hundred and sixty-three. I will have this city, Denny pledged to herself once more. The pink and white hero taunted the besiegers for an hour, mocking their manhood, mothers, wives, and gods. Marine's defenders cheered him on from the city walls. His name is Osnak Zopal. Brown Ben Plum told her when he arrived for the war council. He was the new commander of the Second Sons, chosen by a vote of his fellow sellswords. I was bodyguard to his uncle once, before I joined the Second Sons. The great masters were a ripe lot of maggots. The women weren't so bad, though it was worth your life to look at the wrong one the wrong way. I knew a man, Scarb. This Osnack cut his liver out. Claimed to be defending a lady's honor, he did. Said Scarb had raped her with his eyes. How do you rape a wench with eyes, I ask you? But his uncle is the richest man in Mirene, and his father commands the city guard, so I had to run like a rat before he killed me, too. They watched Osnak Zopal dismount his white charger, undo his robes, pull out his manhood, and direct a stream of urine in the general direction of the olive grove, where Dany's gold pavilion stood among the burnt trees. He was still pissing when Daario Naharis rode up, a rock in hand. "'Shall I cut that off for you and stuff it down his mouth, Your Grace?' His tooth shone gold amidst the blue of his forked beard. "'It's his city I want, not his meager manhood.' She was growing angry, however. If I ignore this any longer, my own people will think me weak. Yet who could she send? She needed to Ario as much as she did her blood riders. Without the flamboyant Tarashi, she had no hold on the storm crows, many of whom had been followers of Prendal Nagezin and Salor the Bald. High on the walls of Mirin, the jeers had grown louder, and now hundreds of the defenders were taking their lead from the hero and pissing down through the ramparts to show their contempt for the besiegers. They are pissing on slaves to show how little they fear us, she thought. They would never dare such a thing if it were a Dothraki Kalasar outside their gates. This challenge must be met, Arstan said again. It will be. Danny said, as the hero tucked his penis away again. "'Tell strong Belwas I have need of him.' They found the huge brown eunuch sitting in the shade of her pavilion, eating a sausage. He finished it in three bites, wiped his greasy hands clean on his trousers, and sent Arstan Whitebeard to fetch him his steel. The aged squire honed Belwas's arak every evening and rubbed it down with bright red oil. When Whitebeard brought the sword, strong Belwas squinted down the edge, grunted, slid the blade back into its leather sheath, and tied the sword belt about his vast waist. Arstan had brought his shield as well, a round steel disc no larger than a pie plate, which the eunuch grasped with his offhand, rather than strapping to his forearm in the manner of Westeros. Find liver and onions, Whitebeard, Belwas said. Not for now, for after. Killing makes strong Belwas hungry. He did not wait for a reply, but lumbered from the olive grove toward Osnak Zopal. Why that one, Khaleesi? Rakaro demanded of her. He is fat and stupid. Strong Belwas was a slave here in the fighting pits. If this high-born Osnak should fall to such, the great masters will be shamed. Well, if he wins, well. It is a poor victory for one so noble, one that Mirene can take no pride in. And unlike Sir Jorah, Daario, Brown Ben, and her three blood riders, the eunuch did not lead troops, plan battles, or give her counsel. He does nothing but eat and boast and bellow at our stand. Belwas was the man she could most easily spare, and it was time she learned what sort of protector Magister Illyrio had sent her. A thrum of excitement went through the siege lines when Belwas was seen plodding toward the city, and from the walls and towers of Mirene came shouts and jeers. Osnak Zopal mounted up again and waited, his striped lance held upright. The charger tossed his head impatiently and pawed the sandy earth. 
As massive as he was, the eunuch looked small beside the hero and his horse. A chivalrous man would dismount, said Ostan. Osnak Zopal lowered his lance and charged. Belois stopped with legs spread wide. In one hand was a small round shield, in the other the curved a rock that Ostan tended with such care. His great brown stomach and sagging chest were bare above the yellow silk sash knotted about his waist, and he wore no armor but his studded leather vest, so absurdly small that it did not even cover his nipples. We should have given him chain mail, Danny said, suddenly anxious. Mail would only slow him, said Sir Jorah. They wear no armor in the fighting pits. It's blood the crowds come to see. Dust flew from the hooves of the white charger. Osnak thundered toward Strong Belwas, his striped cloak streaming from his shoulders. The whole city of Meereen seemed to be screaming him on. The besiegers' cheers seemed few and thin by comparison. Her unsullied stood in silent ranks, watching with stone faces. Belwas might have been made of stone as well. He stood in the horse's path, his vest stretched tight across his broad back. Osnak's lance was leveled at the center of his chest. Its bright steel point winked in the sunlight. He's going to be impaled, she thought, as the eunuch spun sideways, and quick as the blink of an eye the horseman was beyond him, wheeling, raising the lance. Belawas made no move to strike at him. The Miranese on the wall screamed even louder. What is he doing? Danny demanded. Giving the mob a show, Sir Jorah said. Osnak brought the horse around Belwas in a wide circle, then dug in with the spurs and charged again. Again Belwas waited, then spun and knocked the point of the lance aside. She could hear the eunuch's booming laughter echoing across the plain as the hero went past him. "'The lance is too long,' said Jorah said. "'All Belwas needs do is avoid the point. Instead of trying to spit him so prettily, the fool should ride right over him.' Osnak's old Paul charged a third time, and now Danny could see plainly that he was riding past Belwas the way a Westerosi knight might ride at an opponent in a tilt, rather than at him like a Dothraki riding down a foe. The flat, level ground allowed the charger to get up a good speed, but it also made it easy for the eunuch to dodge the cumbersome fourteen-foot lance. Marine's pink-and-white hero tried to anticipate this time and swung his lance sideways at the last second to catch strong Belwas when he dodged. But the eunuch had anticipated, too, and this time he dropped down instead of spinning sideways. The lance passed harmlessly over his head, and suddenly Belwas was rolling and bringing the razor-sharp arak around in a silver arc. They heard the charger scream as the blade bit into his legs, and then the horse was falling, the hero tumbling from the saddle. A sudden silence swept along the brick parapets of Mirene. Now it was Dany's people who were screaming and cheering. Osnak leapt clear of his horse and managed to draw his sword before strong bell was on him. Steel sang against steel, too fast and furious for Danny to follow the blows. It could not have been a dozen heartbeats before bell chest was awash in blood from a slice below his breasts, and Osnak's opal had an rock planted right between his ram's horns. The eunuch wrenched the blade loose and parted the hero's head from his body with three savage blows to the neck. He held it up high for the Miranese to see, then flung it toward the city gates and let it bounce and roll across the sand. "'So much for the hero of Mirene,' said to Ario, laughing. "'A victory without meaning,' said Jorah cautioned. "'We will not win Mirene by killing its defenders one at a time.' "'No,' Denny agreed, "'but I am pleased we killed this one.' The defenders on the walls began firing their crossbows at Belwas, but the bolts fell short or skittered harmlessly along the ground. The eunuch turned his back on the steel-tipped rain, lowered his trousers, squatted, and shat in the direction of the city. He wiped himself with Osnak's striped cloak, and paused long enough to loot the hero's corpse and put the dying horse out of his agony before trudging back to the olive grove. The besiegers gave him a raucous welcome as soon as he reached the camp. Her Dothraki hooted and screamed, and the Unsullied sent up a great clangor by banging their spears against their shields. "'Well done,' Sir Jorah told him, and Brown Ben tossed the eunuch a ripe plum and said, "'A sweet fruit for a sweet fight!' Even her Dothraki handmaids had words of praise. "'We would braid your hair and hang a bell in it, strong Belwas,' said Jicky. "'But you have no hair to braid.' 
Strong Belwas needs no tinkly bells. The eunuch ate Brown Ben's plum in four big bites and tossed aside the stone. Strong Belwas needs liver and onions. You shall have it, said Danny. Strong Belwas is hurt. His stomach was red with the blood sheeting down from the meaty gash beneath its breast. It is nothing. I let each man cut me once before I kill him. He slapped his bloody belly. Count the cuts, and you will know how many strong Belwas has slain. But Dany had lost Carl Drogo to a similar wound, and she was not willing to let it go untreated. She sent Missandy to find a certain Yunkish freedman renowned for his skill in the healing arts. Belwas howled and complained, but Dany scolded him and called him a big, bald baby until he let the healer staunch the wound with vinegar, sew it shut, and bind his chest with strips of linen soaked in fire wine. Only then did she lead her captains and commanders inside her pavilion for their council. "'I must have the city,' she told them, sitting cross-legged on a pile of cushions, her dragons all about her. Eerie and Jicky poured wine. "'Her granaries are full to bursting. There are figs and dates and olives growing on the terraces of her pyramids, and casks of salt fish and smoked meat buried in her cellars.' "'And fat chests of gold, silver, and gemstones as well,' the Ario reminded them. "'Let us not forget the gemstones.' "'I have had a look at the landward walls, and I see no point of weakness,' said Sir Jorah Mormont. "'Given time, we might be able to mine beneath the tower and make a breach. "'But what do we eat while we're digging? Our stores are all but exhausted.' "'No weakness in the landward walls?' said Danny. Meline stood on a jut of sand and stone, where the slow brown Skahazadan flowed into Slaver's Bay. The city's north wall ran along the river bank, its west along the bay shore. Does that mean we might attack from the river or the sea? With three ships? We'll want to have Captain Grolio take a good look at the wall along the river, but unless it's crumbling, that's just a wetter way to die. What if we were to build siege towers? My brother Viserys told tales of such. I know they can be made. From wood, Your Grace. Sir Jorah said. The slavers have burnt every tree within twenty leagues of here. Without word, we have no trebuchets to smash the walls, no ladders to go over them, no siege towers, no turtles, and no rams. We can storm the gates with axes, to be sure, but— Did you see them bronze heads above the gates? asked Brown Ben Plum. Rows of harpy heads with open mouths. The Miranese can squirt boiling oil out their mouths and cook your axemen where they stand. The Ario Naharis gave Grey Worm a smile. Perhaps the Unsullied should wield the axes. Boiling oil feels like no more than a warm bath to you, I have heard. This is false. Grey Worm did not return the smile. These ones do not feel burns as men do. Yet such oil blinds and kills. The Unsullied do not fear to die, though. Give these ones rams, and we will batter down these gates or die in the attempt. You would die said Brown Ben. At Yunkai, when he took command of the Second Sons, he claimed to be the veteran of a hundred battles. Though I will not say I fought bravely in all of them. There are old sellswords and bold sellswords, but no old bold sellswords. She saw that it was true. Danny sighed. I will not throw away unsullied lives, Grey Worm. Perhaps we can starve the city out. Sir Jorah looked unhappy. We'll starve long before they do, Your Grace. There's no food here, nor fodder for our mules and horses. I do not like this river water either. Mirene shits into the Skahazadan, but draws its drinking water from deep wells. Already we've had reports of sickness in the camps, fever and brown leg, and three cases of the bloody flux. There will be more if we remain. The slaves are weak from the march. Freed men? Danny corrected. They are slaves no longer. Slave or free, they are hungry, and they'll soon be sick. The city is better provisioned than we are, and can be resupplied by water. Your three ships are not enough to deny them access to both the river and the sea. Then what do you advise, Sir Jorah? You will not like it. I would hear it all the same. As you wish. I say, let this city be. You cannot free every slave in the world, Khaleesi. Your war is in Westeros. I have not forgotten Westeros. 
Danny dreamt of it some nights, this fabled land that she had never seen. If I let Meereen's old brick walls defeat me so easily, though, how will I ever take the great stone castles of Westeros? As Aegon did, Sir Jorah said, with fire. By the time we reach the Seven Kingdoms, your dragons will be grown, and we will have siege towers and trebuchets as well, all the things we lack here. But the way across the lands of the long summer is long and grueling, and there are dangers we cannot know. You stopped at Astapor to buy an army, not to start a war. Save your spears and swords for the Seven Kingdoms, my queen. Leave Meereen to the Meereenese, and march west for Pentos. Defeated? said Danny, bristling. When cowards hide behind great walls, it is they who are defeated, Galisi, Kojogo said. Her other blood riders concurred. Blood of my blood, said Rakaro. When cowards hide and burn the food and fodder, great calls must seek for braver foes. This is known. It is known, Jicky agreed as she poured. Not to me. Danny set great store by Sir Jorah's counsel, but to leave Meereen untouched was more than she could stomach. She could not forget the children on their posts, the birds tearing at their entrails, their skinny arms pointing up the coast road. Sir Jorah, you say we have no food left. If I march west, how can I feed my freedmen? You can't. I am sorry, Carissi. They must feed themselves or starve. Many and more will die along the march, yes. That will be hard, but there is no way to save them. We need to put this scorched earth well behind us. Danny had left a trail of corpses behind her when she crossed the Red Waste. It was a sight she never meant to see again. No, she said, I will not march my people off to die. My children, there must be some way into the city. I know a way. Brown Ben Plum stroked his speckled gray and white beard. Sewers. Sewers? What do you mean? Great brick sewers empty into the Skahazadan, carrying the city's wastes. They might be a way in for a few. That was how I escaped Meereen after Scarb lost his head. Brown Ben made a face. The smell has never left me. I dream of it some nights. Sir Jorah looked dubious. Easier to go out than in, it would seem to me. These sewers empty into the river, you say. That would mean the mouths are right below the walls. And closed with iron grates, Brown Ben admitted. Though some have rusted through, else I would have drowned in shit. Once inside, it is a long, foul climb in pitch dark through a maze of brick where a man could lose himself forever. The filth is never lower than waist high and can rise over your head from the stains I saw on the walls. There's things down there, too. Biggest rats you ever saw and worse things. Nasty. The Ario Naharis laughed. As nasty as you when you came crawling out. If any man were fool enough to try this, every slaver in Nereen would smell them the moment they emerged. Brown Ben shrugged. Her Grace asked if there was a way in, so I told her. But Ben Plum isn't going down in them sewers again, not for all the gold in the Seven Kingdoms. If there's others want to try it, though, they're welcome. Argo, Jogo, and Grey Worm all tried to speak at once, but Danny raised her hand for silence. These sewers do not sound promising. Grey Worm would lead his unsullied down the sewers if she commanded it, she knew. Her blood riders would do no less. But none of them was suited to the task. The Dothraki were horsemen, and the strength of the unsullied was their discipline on the battlefield. Can I send men to die in the dark on such a slender hope? I must think on this some more. Return to your duties. Her captains bowed and left her with her handmaids and her dragons. But as Brown Ben was leaving, Viserion spread his pale white wings and flapped lazily at his head. One of the wings buffeted the sellsword in his face. The white dragon landed awkwardly with one foot on the man's head and one on his shoulder, shrieked and flew off again. "'He likes you, Ben,' said Danny. "'And well he might,' Brown Ben laughed. "'I have me a drop of the dragon blood myself, you know.' "'You?' Danny was startled. Plum was a creature of the free companies, an amiable mongrel. He had a broad brown face with a broken nose and a head of nappy gray hair, 
and his Dothraki mother had bequeathed him large, dark, almond-shaped eyes. He claimed to be part Bravosi, part Summer Islander, part Ebenese, part Cohoric, part Dothraki, part Dornish, and part Westerosi. But this was the first she had heard of Targaryen blood. She gave him a searching look and said, How could that be? Well, said Brown Ben, there were some old plum in the Sunset Kingdoms who wed a dragon princess. My grandmama told me the tale. He lived in King Aegon's day. Which King Aegon? Danny asked. Five Aegons have ruled in Westeros. Her brother's son would have been the sixth, but the usurper's men had dashed his head against the wall. Five were there. Well, that's a confusion. I could not give you a number, my queen. This old plum was a lord, though, must have been a famous fellow in his day, the talk of all the land. The thing was, begging a royal pardon, he had himself a cock six foot long. The three bells in Danny's braid tinkled when she laughed. You mean inches, I think. Feet, Brown Ben said firmly. If it was inches, who'd want to talk about it now, Your Grace? Danny giggled like a little girl. Did your grandmother claim she'd actually seen this prodigy? That the old crone never did. She was half Ebenese and half Cohoric, never been to Westeros. My grandfather must have told her. Some Dothraki killed him before I was born. And where did your grandfather's knowledge come from? One of them tales told the tit, I'd guess. Brown Ben shrugged. That's all I know about Aegon the Unnumbered, or old Lord Plum's mighty manhood, I fear. I best see you to my sons. Go do that, Danny told him. When Brown Ben left, she lay back on her cushions. If you were grown, she told Drogon, scratching him between the horns, I'd fly you over the walls and melt that harpy down to slag. But it would be years before her dragons were large enough to ride, and when they are, who shall ride them? The dragon has three heads, but I have only one. She thought of Daario. If ever there was a man who could rape a woman with his eyes. To be sure, she was just as guilty. Dany found herself stealing looks at the Tarashi when her captains came to council, and sometimes at night she remembered the way his gold tooth glittered when he smiled. That and his eyes. His bright blue eyes. On the road from Yunkai, Daario had brought her a flower or a sprig of some plant every evening when he made his report. To help her learn the land, he said. Wasp willow, dusky roses, wild mint, ladies' lace, dagger leaf, broom, prickly ben, harpy's gold. He tried to spare me the sight of the dead children, too. He should not have done that, but he meant it kindly. And to Ario Naharis made her laugh, which Sir Jorah never did. Dany tried to imagine what it would be like if she allowed to Ario to kiss her, the way Jorah had kissed her on the ship. The thought was exciting and disturbing both at once. It is too great a risk. The Tarashi sellsword was not a good man. No one needed to tell her that. Under the smiles and the jests, he was dangerous, even cruel. Salor and Prendal had woken one morning as his partners. That very night he'd given her their heads. Carl Drogo could be cruel as well, and there was never a man more dangerous. She had come to love him all the same. Could I love Daario? What would it mean if I took him into my bed? Would that make him one of the heads of the dragon? Sir Jorah would be angry, she knew, but he was the one who'd said she had to take two husbands. Perhaps I should marry them both and be done with it. But these were foolish thoughts. She had a city to take, and dreaming of kisses and some sellsword's bright blue eyes would not help her breach the walls of Meereen. I am the blood of the dragon, Denny reminded herself. Her thoughts were spinning in circles like a rat chasing its tail. Suddenly she could not stand the close confines of the pavilion another moment. I want to feel the wind on my face and smell the sea. Miss Andy? she called. Have my silver saddled, your own mount as well. The little scribe bowed. As your grace commands, shall I summon your blood riders to guard you? We'll take our stand. I do not mean to leave the camps. She had no enemies among her children, 
and the old squire would not talk too much as Belwas would, or look at her like to Ario. The grove of burnt olive trees in which she'd raised her pavilion stood beside the sea, between the Dothraki camp and that of the Unsullied. When the horses had been saddled, Dany and her companions set out along the shoreline, away from the city. Even so, she could feel Meereen at her back mocking her. When she looked over one shoulder, there it stood, the afternoon sun blazing off the bronze harpy atop the great pyramid. Inside, Meereen, the slavers would soon be reclining in their fringed tow-cars to feast on lamb and olives, unborn puppies, honeyed dormice, and other such delicacies, whilst outside her children went hungry. A sudden wild anger filled her. "'I will bring you down,' she swore. As they rode past the stakes and pits that surrounded the eunuch encampment, Ganey could hear Grey Worm and his sergeants running one company through a series of drills with shield, short sword, and heavy spear. Another company was bathing in the sea, clad only in white linen breech clouts. The eunuchs were very clean, she had noticed. Some of her cell swords smelled as if they had not washed or changed their clothes since her father lost the Iron Throne. But the unsullied bathed each evening, even if they'd marched all day. When no water was available, they cleansed themselves with sand, the Dothraki way. The eunuchs knelt as she passed, raising clenched fists to their breasts. Danny returned the salute. The tide was coming in, and the surf foamed about the feet of her silver. She could see her ships standing out to sea. Belirion floated nearest, the great cog once known as Sadulion, her sails furled. Further out were the galleys, Maraxes and Vagar formerly Joso's prank and Summer Sun. They were Magister Illyrio's ships, in truth, not hers at all, and yet she had given them new names with hardly a thought. Dragon names, and more. In old Valyria, before the doom, Valyrian, Meraxes, and Vagar had been gods. South of the ordered realm of stakes, pits, drills, and bathing eunuchs, lay the encampments of her freedmen, a far noisier and more chaotic place. Dany had armed the former slaves as best she could with weapons from Astapor and Yunkai, and Sir Jorah had organized the fighting men into four strong companies, yet she saw no one drilling here. They passed a driftwood fire where a hundred people had gathered to roast the carcass of a horse. She could smell the meat and hear the fat sizzling as the spit boys turned, but the sight only made her frown. Children ran behind their horses, skipping and laughing. Instead of salutes, voices called to her on every side in a babble of tongues. Some of the freedmen greeted her as mother, while others begged for boons or favors. Some prayed for strange gods to bless her, and some asked her to bless them instead. She smiled at them, turning right and left, touching their hands when they raised them, letting those who knelt reach up to touch her stirrup or her leg. Many of the freedmen believed there was good fortune in her touch. If it helps give them courage, let them touch me, she thought. There are hard trials yet ahead. Danny had stopped to speak to a pregnant woman who wanted the mother of dragons to name her baby when someone reached up and grabbed her left wrist. Turning, she glimpsed a tall, ragged man with a shaved head and a sunburnt face. Not so hard, she started to say, but before she could finish, he'd yanked her bodily from the saddle. The ground came up and knocked the breath from her as her silver whinnied and backed away. Stunned, Danny rolled to her side and pushed herself onto one elbow. And then she saw the sword. "'There's that treacherous sow,' he said. "'I knew you'd come to get your feet kissed one day.' His head was bald as a melon, his nose red and peeling, but she knew that voice and those pale green eyes. "'I'm going to start by cutting off your tits.' Denny was dimly aware of Masandi shouting for help. A freedman edged forward, but only a step. One quick slash, and he was on his knees, blood running down his face. Miro wiped his sword on his breeches. Who's next? I am. Arstan Whitebeard leapt from his horse and stood over her, the salt wind riffling through his snowy hair, both hands on his tall hardwood staff. Grandfather, Miro said, run off before I break your stick in two and bugger you it. The old man fainted with one end of the staff pulled it back, and whipped the other end about faster than Danny would have believed. The titan's bastard staggered back into the surf, spitting blood and broken teeth from the ruin of his mouth. Whitebeard put Danny behind him. Miro slashed at his face. The old man jerked back, cat-quick. The staff thumped Miro's ribs, sending him reeling. 
Our stance splashed sideways, parried a looping cut, danced away from a second, checked a third mid-swing. The moves were so fast she could hardly follow. Miss Sandy was pulling Danny to her feet when she heard a crack. She thought our stand's staff had snapped until she saw the jagged bone jutting from Mero's calf. As he fell, the titan's bastard twisted and lunged, sending his point straight at the old man's chest. Whitebeard swept the blade aside almost contemptuously and smashed the other end of his staff against the big man's temple. Miro went sprawling, blood bubbling from his mouth as the waves washed over him. A moment later the freedmen washed over him too, knives and stones and angry fists rising and falling in a frenzy. Danny turned away, sickened. She was more frightened now than when it had been happening. He would have killed me. Your Grace, Austan knelt. I am an old man, and shamed. He should never have gotten close enough to seize you. I was lax. I did not know him without his beard and hair. No more than I did. Denny took a deep breath to stop her shaking. Enemies everywhere. Take me back to my tent, please. By the time Mormont arrived, she was huddled in her lion pelt, drinking a cup of spiced wine. I had a look at the river wall, Sir Jorah started. It's a few feet higher than the others, and just as strong, and the Murinese have a dozen firehawks tied up beneath the ramparts. She cut him off. You might have warned me that the titan's bastard had escaped. He frowned. I saw no need to frighten you, Your Grace. I have offered a reward for his head. Pay it to Whitebeard. Miro has been with us all the way from Yunkai. He shaved his beard off and lost himself amongst the freedmen, waiting for a chance for vengeance. Ostan killed him. Sir Jorah gave the old man a long look. A squire with a stick slew Mero of Bravos. Is that the way of it? A stick, Danny confirmed, but no longer a squire. Sir Jorah, it's my wish that Ostan be knighted. No! The loud refusal was surprise enough. Stranger still, it came from both men at once. Sir Jorah drew his sword. The titan's bastard was a nasty piece of work, and good at killing. Who are you, old man? A better knight than you, sir, Ostan said coldly. Knight? Denny was confused. You said you were a squire. I was, your grace. He dropped to one knee. I squired for Lord Swan in my youth, and at Magister Illyrio's behest I have served strong Belwas as well. But during the years between, I was a knight in Westeros. I have told you no lies, my queen. Yet there are truths I have withheld, and for that and all my other sins I can only beg your forgiveness. What truths have you withheld? Danny did not like this. You will tell me, now. He bowed his head. At Carth, when you asked my name, I said I was called Arstan. That much was true. Many men had called me by that name while Belwas and I were making our way east to find you. But it is not my true name. She was more confused than angry. He has played me false, just as Jorah warned me. Yet he saved my life just now. Sir Jorah flushed red. Miro saved his beard, but you grew one, didn't you? No wonder you looked so bloody familiar. You know him? Danny asked the exile knight, lost. I saw him perhaps a dozen times, from afar most often, standing with his brothers or riding in some tourney. But every man in the Seven Kingdoms knew Baristan the Bold. He laid the point of his sword against the old man's neck. Khaleesi, before you kneels Sir Baristan Selmy, Lord Commander of the King's Guard, who betrayed your house to serve the usurper Robert Baratheon. The old knight did not so much as blink. The crow calls the raven black, and you speak of betrayal. Why are you here? Danny demanded of him. If Robert sent you to kill me, why did you save my life? He served the usurper. He betrayed Rhaegar's memory and abandoned Viserys to live and die in exile. Yet if he wanted me dead, he need only have stood aside. I want the whole truth now, on your honor as a knight— are you the usurper's man or mine? Yours, if you will have me. Sir Baristan had tears in his eyes. I took Robert's pardon, I, 
I served him in King's Guard and Council, served with a King Slayer and others near as bad, who soiled the white cloak I wore. Nothing will excuse that. I might be serving in King's Landing still, if the vile boy upon the Iron Throne had not cast me aside. It shames me to admit. But when he took the cloak that the white bull had draped about my shoulders, and sent men to kill me that selfsame day, it was as though he'd ripped a call off my eyes. That was when I knew I must find my true king, and die in his service. "'I can grant that wish,' said Joris, said darkly. "'Quiet,' said Dany. "'I'll hear him out.' "'It may be that I must die a traitor's death,' Sir Baristan said. "'If so, I should not die alone. "'Before I took Robert's pardon, I fought against him on the trident. "'You were on the other side of that battle, Mormont. "'Were you not?' "'He did not wait for an answer. "'Your grace, I am sorry I misled you. "'It was the only way to keep the Lannisters from learning that I had joined you. "'You are watched, as your brother was.' Lord Varys reported every move Viserys made for years. Whilst I sat on the small council, I heard a hundred such reports. And since the day you wed Karl Drogo, there has been an informer by your side selling your secrets, trading whispers to the spider for gold and promises. He cannot mean... You are mistaken. Denny looked at Jorah Mormont. Tell him he's mistaken. There's no informer. Sir Jorah, tell him. We crossed the Dothraki Sea together and the Red Waste. Her heart fluttered like a bird in a trap. Tell him, Jorah. Tell him how he got it wrong. The others take you, Selmy, said Jorah, flung his long sword to the carpet. Khaleesi, it was only at the start, before I came to know you, before I came to love— Do not say that word! She backed away from him. How could you? What did the usurper promise you? Gold? Was it gold? The Undying had said she would be betrayed twice more, once for gold and once for love. Tell me what you were promised. Varys said, I might go home. He bowed his head. I was going to take you home. Her dragons sensed her fury. Viserion roared and smoke rose gray from his snout. Drogon beat the air with black wings, and Rhaegal twisted his head back and belched flame. I should say the word and burn the two of them. Was there no one she could trust, no one to keep her safe? Are all the knights of Westeros so false as you two? Get out before my dragons roast you both. What does roast liar smell like? As foul as brown bins sewers? Go! Sir Baristan rose stiff and slow. For the first time he looked his age. Where shall we go, your grace? To hell, to serve King Robert. Dany felt hot tears on her cheeks. Drogon screamed, lashing his tail back and forth. The others can have you both. Go, go away forever, both of you. The next time I see your faces, I'll have your traitors' heads off. She could not say the words, though. They betrayed me. But they saved me. But they lied. You go. My bear, my fierce, strong bear, what will I do without him? And the old man, my brother's friend. You go. Go. Where? And then she knew. Tyrion. Tyrion dressed himself in darkness, listening to his wife's soft breathing from the bed they shared. She dreams, he thought, when Sansa murmured something softly, a name, perhaps, though it was too faint to say, and turned on to her side. As man and wife, they shared a marriage bed, but that was all. Even had tears she hoards to herself. He had expected anguish and anger when he told her of her brother's death, but Sansa's face had remained so still that for a moment he feared she had not understood. It was only later, with a heavy oaken door between them, that he heard her sobbing. Tyrion had considered going to her then to offer what comfort he could. Now, he had to remind himself, she will not look for solace from a Lannister. 
The most he could do was to shield her from the uglier details of the Red Wedding as they came down from the twins. Santa did not need to hear how her brother's body had been hacked and mutilated, he decided, nor how her mother's corpse had been dumped naked into the green fork in a savage mockery of House Tully's funeral customs. The last thing the girl needed was more fodder for her nightmares. It was not enough, though. He had wrapped his cloak around her shoulders and sworn to protect her, but that was as cruel a jape as the crown the phrase had placed atop the head of Rob Stark's direwolf after they'd sewn it onto his headless corpse. Sansa knew that as well. The way she looked at him, her stiffness when she climbed into their bed, when he was with her, never for an instant could he forget who he was, or what he was, no more than she did. She still went nightly to the God's Wood to pray, and Tyrion wondered if she were praying for his death. She had lost her home, her place in the world, and everyone she had ever loved or trusted. Winter is coming, warned the stark words, and truly it had come for them with a vengeance. But it is high summer for House Lannister. So why am I so bloody cold? He pulled on his boots, fastened his cloak with a lion's head brooch, and slipped out into the torchlit hall. There was this much to be said for his marriage. It had allowed him to escape Magor's holdfast. Now that he had a wife and household, his lord father had agreed that more suitable accommodations were required, and Lord Giles had found himself abruptly dispossessed of his spacious apartments atop the kitchen keep. And splendid apartments they were, too with a large bedchamber and adequate solar, a bath and dressing-room for his wife, and small adjoining chambers for Pod and Sansa's maids. Even Bronze's cell by the stair had a window of sorts. Well, more an arrow slit, but it lets in light. The castle's main kitchen was just across the courtyard, true, but Tyrion found these sounds and smells infinitely preferable to sharing Magor's with his sister. The less he had to see of Circe, the happier he was like to be. Tyrion could hear Brella's snoring as he passed her cell. Shay complained of that, but it seemed a small enough price to pay. Varys had suggested the woman to him. In former days she had run Lord Renly's household in the city, which had given her a deal of practice at being blind, deaf, and mute. Lighting a taper, he made his way back to the servant's steps and descended. The floors below his own were still, and he heard no footsteps but his own. Down he went to the ground floor and beyond to emerge in a gloomy cellar with a vaulted stone ceiling. Much of the castle was connected underground, and the kitchen keep was no exception. Tyrion waddled along a long, dark passageway until he found the door he wanted and pushed through. Within, the dragon skulls were waiting, and so was she. I thought my lord had forgotten me. Her dress was draped over a black tooth near as tall as she was, and she stood within the dragon's jaws, nude. Valyrian, he thought. Or was it Vagar? One dragon skull looked much like another. Just the sight of her made him hard. Come out of there. I won't. She smiled her wickedest smile. The Lord will pluck me from the dragon's jaws, I know. But when he waddled closer, she leaned forward and blew out the taper. She he reached, but she spun and slipped free. You have to catch me, her voice came from his left. My lord must have played monsters and maidens when he was little. Are you calling me a monster? No more than I'm a maiden. She was behind him, her steps soft against the floor. You need to catch me all the same. He did, finally, but only because she let herself be caught. By the time she slipped into his arms, he was flushed and out of breath from stumbling into dragon skulls. All that was forgotten in an instant, when he felt her small breasts pressed against his face in the dark, her stiff little nipples brushing lightly over his lips and the scar where his nose had been. Tyrion pulled her down onto the floor. "'My giant,' she breathed as he entered her. "'My giant's come to save me.' After, as they lay entwined amongst the dragon skulls, he rested his head against her, inhaling the smooth, clean smell of her hair. "'We should go back,' he said reluctantly. "'It must be near dawn. Sansa will be waking.' 
You should give her dream wine, Shay said, like Lady Tanda does with Lalas. A cup before she goes to sleep, and we could fuck in bed beside her without her waking. She giggled. Maybe we should some night. Would my lord like that? Her hand found his shoulder and began to knead the muscles there. Your neck is hard as stone. What troubles you? Tyrion could not see his fingers in front of his face, but he ticked his woes off on them all the same. My wife, my sister, my nephew, my father, the Tyrells. He had to move to his other hand. Varys, Purcell, Littlefinger, the Red Viper of Dawn. He had come to his last finger. The face that stares back out of the water when I wash. Shay kissed his maimed, scarred nose. A brave face, a kind and good face. I wish I could see it now. All the sweet innocence of the world was in her voice. Innocence? Fool, she's a whore. All she knows of men is the bit between their legs. Fool, fool! Better you than me, Tyrion said. We have a long day before us, both of us. You shouldn't have blown out that taper. How are we to find our clothing? She laughed. Maybe we'll have to go naked. And if we're seen, my lord father will hang you. Hiring Shay as one of Sansa's maids had given him an excuse to be seen talking with her, but Tyrion did not delude himself that they were safe. Varys had warned him. I gave Shay a false history, but it was meant for Lalas and Lady Tanda. Your sister is of a more suspicious mind. If she should ask me what I know— You will tell her some clever lie. No. I will tell her that the girl is a common camp follower that you acquired before the battle on the Green Fork, and brought to King's Landing against your lord father's express command. I will not lie to the Queen. You have lied to her before? Shall I tell her that? The eunuch sighed. That cuts more deeply than a knife, my lord. I have served you loyally, but I must also serve your sister when I can. How long do you think she would let me live if I were of no further use to her whatsoever? I have no fierce sellsword to protect me, no valiant brother to avenge me, only some little birds who whisper in my ear. With those whisperings I must buy my life anew each day. Pardon me if I do not weep for you. I shall. But you must pardon me if I do not weep for Shay. I confess I do not understand what there is in her to make a clever man like you act such a fool. You might if you were not a eunuch. Is this not the way of it? A man may have wits or a bit of meat between his legs, but not both? Varys tittered. Perhaps I should be grateful I was cut, then. The spider was right. Tyrion groped through the dragon-haunted darkness for his small clothes, feeling wretched. The risk he was taking left him tight as a drumhead, and there was guilt as well. The others can take my guilt, he thought, as he slipped his tunic over his head. Why should I be guilty? My wife wants no part of me, and most especially not the part that seems to want her. Perhaps he ought to tell her about Shay. It was not as though he was the first man ever to keep a concubine. Sansa's own oh-so-honorable father had given her a bastard brother. For all he knew, his wife might be thrilled to learn that he was fucking Shay, so long as it spared her his unwelcome touch. No, I dare not. Vows or no, his wife could not be trusted. She might be maiden between the legs, but she was hardly innocent of betrayal. She had once spilled her own father's plans to Cersei and girls her age were not known for keeping secrets. The only safe course was to rid himself of Shay. I might send her to Chataya, Tyrion reflected reluctantly. In Chataya's brothel, Shay would have all the silks and gems she could wish for, and the gentlest high-born patrons. It would be a better life by far than the one she had been living when he'd found her. Or if she was tired of earning her bread on her back, he might arrange a marriage for her. Bran, perhaps. The sellsword had never balked at eating off his master's plate, and he was a knight now, a better match than she could elsewise hope for. Or Sir Tollard. 
Tyrion had noticed that one gazing wistfully at Shea more than once. Why not? He's tall, strong, not hard to look upon. Every inch the gifted young knight. Of course, Tollard knew Shea only as a pretty young lady's maid in service of the castle. If he wed her and then learned she was a whore— My lord, where are you? Did the dragons eat you up? No. Here. He groped at a dragon skull. I have found a shoe, but I believe it's yours. My lord sounds very solemn. Have I displeased you? No, he said, too curtly. You always please me. And therein is our danger. He might dream of sending her away at times like this, but that never lasted long. Tyrion saw her dimly through the gloom, pulling a woolen sock up a slender leg. I can see. A vague light was leaking through the row of long, narrow windows set high in the cellar wall. The skulls of the Targaryen dragons were emerging from the darkness around them, black amidst gray. Day comes too soon. A new day, a new year, a new century. I survived the Green Fork and the Blackwater. I can bloody well survive King Joffrey's wedding. Shea snatched her dress down off the dragon's tooth and slipped it over her head. I'll go up first. Brella will want help with the bathwater. She bent over to give him one last kiss upon the brow. My giant of Lannister, I love you so. And I love you as well, sweetling. A whore she might well be, but she deserved better than what he had to give her. I will wed her to Sir Tullard. He seems a decent man. And tall. Sansa that was such a sweet dream, Sansa thought drowsily. She had been back in Winterfell, running through the godswood with her lady. Her father had been there, and her brothers, all of them, warm and safe. If only dreaming could make it so. She threw back the coverlets. I must be brave. Her torments would soon be ended one way or the other. If Lady was here, I would not be afraid. Lady was dead, though. Rob, Bran, Rickon, Arya, her father, her mother, even Septa Mordain. All of them are dead but me. She was alone in the world now. Her lord husband was not beside her, but she was used to that. Tyrion was a bad sleeper and often rose before the dawn. Usually she found him in the solar, hunched beside a candle, lost in some old scroll or leather-bound book. Sometimes the smell of the morning bread from the ovens took him to the kitchens, and sometimes he would climb up to the roof garden or wander all alone down Traitor's Walk. She threw back the shutters and shivered as goose prickles rose along her arms. There were clouds massing in the eastern sky, pierced by shafts of sunlight. They looked like two huge castles afloat in the morning sky. Sansa could see their walls of tumbled stone, their mighty keeps and barbicans, Wispy banners swirled from atop their towers and reached for the fast-fading stars. The sun was coming up behind them, and she watched them go from black to gray to a thousand shades of rose and gold and crimson. Soon the wind mushed them together, and there was only one castle, where there had been two. She heard the door open as her maids brought the hot water for her bath. They were both new to her service. Tyrion said the women who'd tended to her previously had all been Cersei's spies just as Sansa had always suspected. "'Come see,' she told them. "'There's a castle in the sky.' They came to have a look. "'It's made of gold.' Shea had short, dark hair and bold eyes. She did all that was asked of her, but sometimes she gave Sansa the most insolent looks. "'A castle all of gold. There's a sight I'd like to see.' "'A castle, is it?' Brella had to squint. "'That tower's tumbling over, looks like. It's all ruins, that is.' Sansa did not want to hear about falling towers and ruined castles. She closed the shutters and said, "'We are expected at the Queen's breakfast. Is my lord husband in the solar?' "'No, my lady,' said Brella. "'I have not seen him.' "'Might be he went to see his father,' Shay declared. "'Might be the King's hand had need of his counsel.' Brella gave a sniff. "'Lady Sansa, you'll be wanting to get into the tub before the water gets too cool.' Sansa let Shay pull her shift up over her head and climbed into the big wooden tub. She was tempted to ask for a cup of wine to calm her nerves. 
The wedding was to be at midday in the great sept of Balor across the city. And come even fall, the feast would be held in the throne room. A thousand guests and seventy-seven courses, with singers and jugglers and mummers. But first came breakfast in the Queen's ballroom, for the Lannisters and the Tyrell men, the Tyrell women would be breaking their fast with Margaery, and a hundred odd knights and lordlings. They have made me a Lannister, Sansa thought bitterly. Brella sent Shay to fetch more hot water while she washed Sansa's back. You are trembling, milady. The water is not hot enough, Sansa lied. Her maids were dressing her when Tyrion appeared. Podrick Payne in tow. You look lovely, Sansa, he turned to his squire. Pard, be so good as to pour me a cup of wine. There will be wine at the breakfast, my lord, Sansa said. There's wine here. You don't expect me to face my sister sober, surely? It's a new century, my lady. The three hundredth year since Aegon's conquest. The dwarf took a cup of red from Podrick and raised it high. To Aegon! What a fortunate fellow! Two sisters, two wives, and three big dragons. What more could a man ask for? He wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. The imp's clothing was soiled and unkempt, Sansa noticed. It looked as though he'd slept in it. Will you be changing into fresh garb, my lord? Your new doublet is very handsome. The doublet is handsome, yes. Tyrion put the cup aside. Come, pard, let us see if we can find some garments to make me look less dwarfish. I would not want to shame my lady wife. When the imp returned a short time later, he was presentable enough, and even a little taller. Podrick Payne had changed as well, and looked almost a proper squire for once, although a rather large red pimple in the fold beside his nose spoiled the effect of his splendid purple, white, and gold raiment. He is such a timid boy. Sansa had been wary of Tyrion's squire at first. He was a Payne, cousin to Sir Illyn Payne, who had taken her father's head off. However, she'd soon come to realize that Pod was as frightened of her as she was of his cousin. Whenever she spoke to him, he turned the most alarming shade of red. "'Are purple, gold, and white the colors of House Payne, Podrick?' she asked him politely. "'No, I mean, yes,' he blushed. "'The colors. Our arms are purple and white checky, my lady, with gold coins in the checks. Purple and white. Both.' He studied her feet. "'There's a tail behind those coins.' said Tyrion. No doubt Pod will confide it to your toes one day. Just now we are expected at the Queen's ballroom, however. Shall we? Sansa was tempted to beg off. I could tell him that my tummy was upset or that my moon's blood had come. She wanted nothing more than to crawl back in bed and pull the drapes. I must be brave. Like Rob, she told herself, as she took her lord husband stiffly by the arm. In the Queen's ballroom they broke their fast on honey cakes baked with blackberries and nuts, gammon steaks, bacon, fingerfish crisped in bread crumbs, autumn pears, and a Dornish dish of onions, cheese, and chopped eggs, cooked up with fiery peppers. Nothing like a hearty breakfast to whet one's appetite for the seventy-seven course feast to follow, Tyrion commented as their plates were filled. There were flagons of milk and flagons of mead and flagons of a light, sweet golden wine to wash it down. Musicians strolled among the tables, piping and fluting and fiddling, while Sir Dantos galloped about on his broomstick horse, and Moonboy made farting sounds with his cheeks and sang rude songs about the guests. Tyrion scarce touched his food, Santa noticed, though he drank several cups of the wine. For herself, she tried a little of the Dornish eggs, but the peppers burned her mouth. Otherwise, she only nibbled at the fruit and fish and honey cakes. Every time Joffrey looked at her, her tummy got so fluttery that she felt as though she'd swallowed a bat. When the food had been cleared away, the queen solemnly presented Joff with the wife's cloak that he would drape over Marguerite's shoulders. It is the cloak I donned when Robert took me for his queen, the same cloak my mother, Lady Joanna, wore when wed to my lord father. Sansa thought it looked threadbare, if truth be told, but perhaps because it was so used. Then it was time for gifts. It was traditional in the Reach to give presents to bride and groom on the morning of their wedding. On the morrow they would receive more presents as a couple, but today's tokens were for their separate persons.
From Jalabar show, Joffrey received a great bow of golden wood and quiver of long arrows, fletched with green and scarlet feathers. From Lady Tanda, a pair of supple riding boots. From Sir Kevin, a magnificent red leather jousting saddle. A red gold brooch wrought in the shape of a scorpion from the Dornishman, Prince Oberyn. Silver spurs from Sir Adam Marbrand. A red silk tourney pavilion from Lord Mathis Rowan. Lord Paxter Redwine brought forth a beautiful wooden model of the war galley of two hundred oars, being built even now on the arbor. "'If it please your grace, she will be called King Joffrey's Valor,' he said, and Joff allowed that he was very pleased indeed. "'I will make it my flagship when I sail to Dragonstone to kill my traitor Uncle Stannis,' he said. "'He plays the gracious king today.' Joffrey could be gallant when it suited him, Sansa knew, but it seemed to suit him less and less. Indeed, all his courtesy vanished at once when Tyrion presented him with their own gift, a huge old book called Lives of Four Kings, bound in leather and gorgeously illuminated. The king leafed through it with no interest. And what is this, uncle? A book? Sansa wondered if Joffrey moved those fat, wormy lips of his when he read. Grand Maester Caith's history of the reigns of Daeron the Young Dragon, Baelor the Blessed, Aegon the Unworthy, and Daeron the Good, her small husband answered. A book every king should read, Your Grace, said Sir Kevin. My father had no time for books. Joffrey shoved the tome across the table. If you read less, Uncle Imp, perhaps Lady Sansa would have a baby in her belly by now. He laughed. And when the king laughs, the court laughs with him. Don't be sad, Sansa. Once I've gotten Queen Marguerite with child, I'll visit your bedchamber and show my little uncle how it's done. Sansa reddened. She glanced nervously at Tyrion, afraid of what he might say. This could turn as nasty as the bedding had at their own feast. But for once the dwarf filled his mouth with wine instead of words. Lord Mace Tyrell came forward to present his gift, a golden chalice three feet tall, with two ornate curved handles and seven faces glittering with gemstones. Seven faces for your grace's seven kingdoms, the bride's father explained. He showed them how each face bore the sigil of one of the great houses, ruby lion, emerald rose, onyx stag, silver trout, blue jade falcon, opal sun, and pearl direwolf. A splendid cup, said Joffrey. But we'll need to chip the wolf off and put a squid in its place, I think. Santa pretended that she had not heard. Marguerite and I shall drink deep at the feast, good father. Joffrey lifted the chalice above his head for everyone to admire. The damned thing's as tall as I am, Tyrion muttered in a low voice. Half a chalice and Joff will be falling down drunk. Good, she thought. Perhaps he'll break his neck. Lord Tywin waited until last to present the king with his own gift, a longsword. Its scabbard was made of cherry wood, gold, and oiled red leather, studded with golden lion's heads. The lions had ruby eyes, she saw. The ballroom fell silent as Joffrey unsheathed the blade and thrust the sword above his head. Red and black ripples in the steel shimmered in the morning light. Magnificent, declared Mathis Rowan. A sword to sing of, sire, said Lord Redwine. A king's sword, said Sir Kevin Lannister. King Joffrey looked as if he wanted to kill someone right then and there. He was so excited. He slashed at the air and laughed. A great sword must have a great name, my lords. What shall I call it? Sansa remembered Lion's Tooth, the sword Arya had flung into the trident, and Heart Eater, the one he'd made her kiss before the battle. She wondered if he'd want Marguerite to kiss this one. The guests were shouting out names for the new blade. Joff dismissed a dozen before he heard one he liked. "'Widow's Whale!' he cried. "'Yes! It shall make many a widow, too!' he slashed again. "'And when I face my Uncle Stannis, it will break his magic sword clean in two. Joff tried a downcut, forcing Sir Balan Swan to take a hasty step backward. Laughter rang through the hall at the look on Sir Balan's face. "'Have a care, Your Grace,' Sir Adam Marbrand warned the king. "'Valyrian steel is perilously sharp.' "'I remember,' Joffrey brought Widow's Whale down in a savage two-handed slice, on to the book that Tyrion had given him. 
The heavy leather cover parted at a stroke. Sharp! I told you I am no stranger to Valyrian steel. It took him half a dozen further cuts to hack the thick tome apart, and the boy was breathless by the time he was done. Sansa could feel her husband struggling with his fury as Sir Osmond Kettleblack shouted, I pray you never turn that wicked edge on me, sire. See that you never give me cause, sir. Joffrey flicked a chunk of lives of four kings off the table at sword point, then slid Widow's Wail back into its scabbard. Your Grace, Sir Garland Tyrell said, perhaps you did not know. In all of Westeros there were but four copies of that book illuminated in Kate's own hand. Now there are three. Joffrey undid his old sword belt to don his new one. You and Lady Sansa owe me a better present, Uncle Imp. This one is all chopped to pieces. Tyrion was staring at his nephew with his mismatched eyes. Perhaps a knife, sire, to match your sword, a dagger of the same fine Valyrian steel, with a dragon-bone hilt, say. Joff gave him a sharp look. You— Yes, a dagger to match my sword. Good, he nodded. A, a gold hilt with rubies in it. Dragon bone is too plain. As you wish, your grace. Tyrion drank another cup of wine. He might have been all alone in his solar for all the attention he paid Sansa, but when the time came to leave for the wedding, he took her by the hand. As they were crossing the yard, Prince Oberyn of Dorne fell in beside them, his black-haired paramour on his arm. Sansa glanced at the woman curiously. She was base-born and unwed, and had borne two bastard daughters for the prince. But she did not fear to look even the queen in the eye. Shea had told her that this Elaria worshipped some Lacine love-goddess. She was almost a whore when he found her, my lady, her maid confided. And now she's near a princess. Sansa had never been this close to the Dornish woman before. She is not truly beautiful, she thought. Something about her draws the eye. I once had the great good fortune to see the Citadel's copy of Lives of Four Kings, Prince Oberyn was telling her lord husband. The illuminations were wondrous to behold, but Kate was too kind by half to King Viserys. Tyrion gave him a sharp look. Too kind? He scants Viserys shamefully, in my view. It should have been Lives of Five Kings. The prince laughed. Viserys hardly reigned a fortnight. He reigned more than a year, said Tyrion. Oberyn gave a shrug. A year or a fortnight, what does it matter? He poisoned his own nephew to gain the throne, and then did nothing once he had it. Baylor starved himself to death fasting, said Tyrion. His uncle served him loyally as hand, as he had served the young dragon before him. Viserys might only have reigned a year, but he ruled for fifteen, while Daron warred and Baylor prayed. He made a sour face. And if he did remove his nephew, can you blame him? Someone had to save the realm from Baylor's follies. Sansa was shocked. But Baylor the Blessed was a great king. He walked the Boneway barefoot to make peace with Dorne, and rescued the Dragon Knight from a snake pit. The Vipers refused to strike him because he was so pure and holy. Prince Oberyn smiled. If you were a Viper, my lady, would you want to bite a bloodless stick like Baylor the Blessed? I'd sooner save my fangs for someone juicier. "'My prince is playing with you, Lady Sansa,' said the woman, Elaria, Sand. "'The septons and singers like to say that the snakes did not bite Baylor, but the truth is very different. He was bitten half a hundred times, and should have died from it.' "'If he had, Viserys would have reigned a dozen years,' said Tyrion, "'and the seven kingdoms might have been better served. Some believe Baylor was deranged by all that venom.' "'Yes,' said Prince Oberyn. But I've seen no snakes in this red keep of yours, so how do you account for Joffrey? I prefer not to. Tyrion inclined his head stiffly. If you will excuse us, our litter awaits. The dwarf helped Sansa up inside and clambered awkwardly after her. Close the curtains, my lady, if you'd be so good. Must we, my lord? Sansa did not want to be shut behind the curtains. The day is so lovely. The good people of King's Landing are like to throw dung at the litter if they see me inside it. Do us both a kindness, my lady. Close the curtains. She did as he bid her. They sat for a time as the air grew warm and stuffy around them. I was sorry about your book, my lord, she made herself say. It was Joffrey's book. He might have learned a thing or two if he'd read it. He sounded distracted. 
I should have known better. I should have seen a good many things. Perhaps the dagger will please him more. When the dwarf grimaced, his scar tightened and twisted. The boy's earned himself a dagger, wouldn't you say? Thankfully, Tyrion did not wait for her reply. Joff quarreled with your brother Rob at Winterfell. Tell me, was there ill feeling between Bran and his grace as well? Bran? The question confused her. Before he fell, you mean? She had to try and think back. It was all so long ago. Bran was a sweet boy. Everyone loved him. He and Tommen fought with wooden swords, I remember, but just for play. Tyrion lapsed back into moody silence. Sansa heard the distant clank of chains from outside. The portcullis was being drawn up. A moment later there was a shout, and their litter swayed into motion. Deprived of the passing scenery, she chose to stare at her folded hands, uncomfortably aware of her husband's mismatched eyes. Why is he looking at me that way? You loved your brothers, much as I loved Jamie. Is this some Lannister trap to make me speak treason? My brothers were traitors, and they've gone to traitors' graves. It is treason to love a traitor. Her little husband snorted. Rob rose in arms against his rightful king. By law, that made him a traitor. The others died too young to know what treason was. He rubbed his nose. Sansa, do you know what happened to Bran at Winterfell? Bran fell. He was always climbing things, and finally he fell. We always feared he would. And Theon Greyjoy killed him, but that was later. Theon Greyjoy, Tyrion sighed. Your lady mother once accused me— Well, I will not burden you with the ugly details. She accused me falsely. I never harmed your brother Bran. And I mean no harm to you. What does he want me to say? That is good to know, my lord. He wanted something from her, but Sansa did not know what it was. He looks like a starving child, but I have no food to give him. Why won't he leave me be? Tyrion rubbed the discarded, scabby nose yet again, an ugly habit that drew the eye to his ugly face. You have never asked me how Rob died, or your lady mother. I would sooner not know. It would give me bad dreams. Then I will say no more. That... That's kind of you. Ah, oh, yes, said Tyrion. I am the very soul of kindness. And I know about bad dreams. Tyrion The new crown that his father had given the faith stood twice as tall as the one the mob had smashed, a glory of crystal and spun gold. Rainbow light flashed and shimmered every time the high septon moved his head, but Tyrion had to wonder how the man could bear the weight. And even he had to concede that Joffrey and Marguerite made a regal couple as they stood side by side between the towering gilded statues of the father and the mother. The bride was lovely in ivory silk and mirish lace, her skirts decorated with floral patterns picked out in seed pearls. As Renly's widow, she might have worn the Baratheon colors, gold and black, yet she came to them a Tyrell, in a maiden's cloak made of a hundred cloth of gold roses sewn to green velvet. He wondered if she really was a maiden. Not that Joffrey is like to know the difference. The king looked near as splendid as his bride in his doublet of dusky rose, beneath a cloak of deep crimson velvet blazoned with a stag and lion. The crown rested easily on his curls, gold on gold. I saved that bloody crown for him. Tyrion shifted his weight uncomfortably from one foot to the other. He could not stand still. Too much wine. He should have thought to relieve himself before they set out from the Red Keep. The sleepless night he spent with Shea was making itself felt too, but most of all he wanted to strangle his bloody royal nephew. I am no stranger to Valyrian steel, the boy had boasted. The septons were always going on about how the Father above judges us all. If the Father would be so good as to topple over and crush Joff like a dung beetle, I might even believe it. He ought to have seen it long ago. Jamie would never send another man to do his killing, and Cersei was too cunning to use a knife that could be traced back to her. But Joff, arrogant, vicious, stupid little wretch that he was— 
He remembered a cold morning when he'd climbed down the steep exterior steps from Winterfell's library to find Prince Joffrey jesting with a hound about killing wolves. "'Send a dog to kill a wolf,' he said. Even Joffrey was not so foolish as to command Sandor Clagane to slay a son of Eddard Stark, however. The hound would have gone to Cersei. Instead the boy found his cat's paw among the unsavory lot of free-riders, merchants and camp-followers who had attached themselves to the king's party as they made their way north. Some poxy lackwit willing to risk his life for a prince's favor and a little coin. Tyrion wondered whose idea it had been to wait until Robert left Winterfell before opening Bran's throat. Joff's, most like. No doubt he thought it was the height of cunning. The prince's own dagger had a jeweled pommel and inlaid gold work on the blade, Tyrion seemed to recall. At least Joff had not been stupid enough to use that. Instead he went poking among his father's weapons. Robert Baratheon was a man of careless generosity, and would have given his son any dagger he wanted. But Tyrion guessed that the boy had just taken it. Robert had come to Winterfell with a long tail of knights and retainers, a huge wheelhouse, and a baggage train. No doubt some diligent servant had made certain that the king's weapons went with him, in case he should desire any of them. The blade Joff chose was nice and plain. No gold work, no jewels in the hilt, no silver inlay on the blade. King Robert never wore it, had likely forgotten he owned it. Yet the Valyrian steel was deadly sharp. Sharp enough to slice through skin, flesh, and muscle in one quick stroke. I am no stranger to Valyrian steel. But he had been, hadn't he? Else he would never have been so foolish as to pick Littlefinger's knife. The why of it still eluded him. Simple cruelty, perhaps. His nephew had that in abundance. It was all Tyrion could do not to retch up all the wine he'd drunk, piss in his breeches, or both. He squirmed uncomfortably. He ought to have held his tongue at breakfast. The boy knows I know now. My big mouth will be the death of me, I swear it. The seven vows were made, the seven blessings invoked, and the seven promises exchanged. When the wedding song had been sung and the challenge had gone unanswered, it was time for the exchange of cloaks. Tyrion shifted his weight from one stunted leg to the other, trying to see between his father and his uncle Kevin. If the gods are just, Joff will make a hash of this. He made certain not to look at Sansa, lest his bitterness show in his eyes. You might have knelt, damn you. Would it have been so bloody hard to bend those stiff stark knees of yours and let me keep a little dignity? Mace Tyrell removed his daughter's maiden cloak tenderly, while Joffrey accepted the folded bride's cloak from his brother Tommen and took it out with a flourish. The boy king was as tall at thirteen as his bride was at sixteen. He would not require a fool's back to climb upon. He draped Marguerite in the crimson and gold and leaned close to fasten it at her throat. And that easily she passed from her father's protection to her husband's. But who will protect her from Joff? Tyrion glanced at the Knight of Flowers, standing with the other king's guard. You had best keep your sword well honed, Sir Loras. With this kiss I pledge my love, Joffrey declared in ringing tones. When Marguerite echoed the words, he pulled her close and kissed her long and deep. Rainbow lights danced once more about the high septon's crown, as he solemnly declared Joffrey of the houses Baratheon and Lannister, and Marguerite of House Tyrell, to be one flesh, one heart, one soul. Good, that's done with. Now let's get back to the bloody castle so I can have a piss. Sir Loras and Sir Merin led the procession from the sept in their white scale armor and snowy cloaks. Then came Prince Tommen, scattering rose petals from a basket before the king and queen. After the royal couple followed Queen Cersei and Lord Tyrell. Then the bride's mother, arm in arm, with Lord Tywin. The Queen of Thorns tottered after them, with one hand on Sir Kevin Lannister's arm and the other on her cane, her twin guardsmen close behind her in case she fell. Next came Sir Garland Tyrell and his lady wife, and finally it was their turn. "'My lady,' Tyrion offered Sansa his arm. She took it dutifully, but he could feel her stiffness as they walked up the aisle together. She never once looked down at him. He heard them cheering outside even before he reached the doors. The mob loved Marguerite so much they were even willing to love Joffrey again. 
She had belonged to Renly, the handsome young prince who had loved them so well he had come back from beyond the grave to save them. And the bounty of Highgarden had come with her, flowing up the Rose Road from the south. The fools didn't seem to remember that it had been Mace Tyrell who closed the Rose Road to begin with, and made the bloody famine. They stepped out into the crisp autumn air. I feared we'd never escape, Tyrion quipped. Sansa had no choice but to look at him then. I— Yes, my lord, as you say. She looked sad. It was such a beautiful ceremony, though. As ours was not. It was long, I'll say that much. I need to be turned to the castle for good piss. Tyrion rubbed the stump of his nose. Word that I'd contrived some mission to take me out of the city. Little Finger was the clever one. Joffrey and Marguerite stood surrounded by King's Guard atop the steps that fronted on the broad marble plaza. Sir Adam and his gold cloaks held back the crowd, while the statue of King Baelor the Blessed gazed down on them benevolently. Tyrion had no choice but to queue up with the rest to offer congratulations. He kissed Marguerite's fingers and wished her every happiness. Thankfully there were others behind them waiting their turn, so they did not need to linger long. Their litter had been sitting in the sun, and it was very warm inside the curtains. As they lurched into motion, Tyrion reclined on an elbow while Sansa sat staring at her hands. She is just as comely as the Tyrell girl. Her hair was a rich autumn auburn, her eyes a deep tully blue. Grief had given her a haunted, vulnerable look. If anything, it had only made her more beautiful. He wanted to reach her, to break through the armor of her courtesy. Was that what made him speak, or just the need to distract himself from the fullness in his bladder? I had been thinking that when the roads are safe again, we might journey to Casterly Rock, far from Joffrey and my sister. The more he thought about what Joff had done to the lives of four kings, the more it troubled him. There was a message there, oh, yes. It would please me to show you the Golden Gallery and the Lion's Mouth and the Hall of Heroes where Jamie and I played as boys. You can hear thunder from below where the sea comes in. She raised her head slowly. He knew what she was seeing, the swollen, brutish brow, the raw stump of his nose, his crooked pink scar and mismatched eyes. Her own eyes were big and blue and empty. I shall go wherever my lord husband wishes. I had hoped it might please you, my lady. It will please me to please my lord. His mouth tightened. What a pathetic little man you are. Did you think babbling about the lion's mouth would make her smile? When have you ever made a woman smile but with gold? No, it was a foolish notion. Only a Lannister can love the rock. Yes, my lord, as you wish. Tyrion could hear the commons shouting out King Joffrey's name. In three years that cruel boy will be a man ruling in his own right, and every dwarf with half his wits will be a long way from King's Landing. Old Town, perhaps, nor even the free cities. He had always had a yen to see the titan of Bravos. Perhaps that would please Sansa. Gently he spoke of Bravos, and met a wall of sullen courtesy as icy and unyielding as the wall he had walked once in the north. It made him weary. Then and now. They passed the rest of the journey in silence. After a while Tyrion found himself hoping that Sansa would say something, anything, the merest word, but she never spoke. When the litter halted in the castle yard, he let one of the grooms help her down. "'We will be expected to the feast in an hour hence, my lady. I will join you shortly.' He walked off stiff-legged. Across the yard he could hear Marguerite's breathless laugh as Joffrey swept her from the saddle. "'The boy will be as tall and strong as Jamie one day,' he thought, "'and I'll still be a dwarf beneath his feet. "'And one day he's like to make me even shorter.' He found a privy and sighed gratefully as he believed himself of the morning's wine. There were times when a piss felt near as good as a woman, and this was one. He wished he could relieve himself of his doubts and guilts half as easily. Padrick Payne was waiting outside his chambers. I laid out your new doublet, not here, on your bed, in the bedchamber. Yes, that's where we keep the bed. Sansa would be in there, dressing for the feast. Shea as well. Wine, bud. 
Tyrion drank it in his window seat, brooding over the chaos of the kitchens below. The sun had not yet touched the top of the castle wall, but he could smell bread's baking and meat's roasting. The guests would soon be pouring into the throne room, full of anticipation. This would be an evening of song and splendor, designed not only to unite Highgarden and Casterly Rock, but to trumpet their power and wealth as a lesson to any who might still think to oppose Joffrey's rule. But who would be mad enough to contest Joffrey's rule now, after what had befallen Stannis Baratheon and Rob Stark? There was still fighting in the Riverlands, but everywhere the coils were tightening. Sir Gregor Clegane had crossed the trident and seized the ruby ford, then captured Harrenhal almost effortlessly. Seaguard had yielded to Black Walder Frey. Lord Randall Tarley held Maidenpool, Duskendale, and the King's Road. In the west, Sir David Lannister had linked up with Sir Forley Prester at the Golden Tooth for a march on River Run. Sir Ryman Frey was leading two thousand spears down from the twins to join them and Paxter Redwine claimed his fleet would soon set sail from the arbor to begin the long voyage around Dorne and through the Stepstones. Stannis's Lassini pirates would be outnumbered ten to one. The struggle that the maesters were calling the War of the Five Kings was all but at an end. Mace Tyrell had been heard complaining that Lord Tywin had left no victories for him. "'My lord,' Pod was at his side, "'will you be changing? I laid out the doublet on your bed for the feast.' Feast? said Tyrion sourly. What feast? The wedding feast. Pod missed the sarcasm, of course. King Joffrey and Lady Marguerite. Queen Marguerite, I mean. Tyrion resolved to get very, very drunk tonight. Very well, young Podrick, but to go make me festive. Shea was helping Sansa with her hair when they entered the bedchamber. Joy and grief, he thought when he beheld them there together. Laughter and tears. Sansa wore a gown of silvery satin trimmed in veil, with daggered sleeves that almost touched the floor, lined in soft purple felt. Shea had arranged her hair artfully in a delicate silver net, winking with dark purple gemstones. Tyrion had never seen her look more lovely, yet she wore sorrow on those long satin sleeves. Lady Sansa, he told her, you shall be the most beautiful woman in the hall tonight. My lord is too kind. My lady, said Shea wistfully, couldn't I come serve at table? I so want to see the pigeons fly out of the pie. Santa looked at her uncertainly. The queen has chosen all the service. And the hall will be too crowded, Tyrion had to bite back his annoyance. There will be musicians strolling all through the castle, though, and tables in the outer ward with food and drink for all. He inspected his new doublet, crimson velvet with padded shoulders and puffed sleeves, slashed to show the black satin underlining. A handsome garment. All at once is a handsome man to wear it. Come, Pod, help me into this. He had another cup of wine as he dressed, then took his wife by the arm and escorted her from the kitchen keep to join the river of silk, satin, and velvet flowing toward the throne room. Some guests had gone inside to find their places on the benches. Others were milling in front of the doors, enjoying the unseasonable warmth of the afternoon. Tyrion led Sansa around the yard to perform the necessary courtesies. She is good at this, he thought, as he watched her tell Lord Giles that his cough was sounding better, compliment Eleanor Tyrell on her gown, and question Jalabar Show about wedding customs in the Summer Isles. His cousin Sir Lancel had been brought down by Sir Kevin the first time he'd left his sick bed since the battle. He looks ghastly. Lancel's hair had turned white and brittle, and he was thin as a stick. Without his father beside him holding him up, he would surely have collapsed. Yet when Sansa praised his valor and said how good it was to see him getting strong again, both Lancel and Sir Kevin beamed. She would have made Joffrey a good queen and a better wife if he'd had the sense to love her. He wondered if his nephew was capable of loving anyone. "'You do look quite exquisite, child.' Lady Olena Tyrell told Sansa when she tottered up to them in a cloth of gold gown that must have weighed more than she did. The wind has been at your hair, though. The little old woman reached up and fussed at the loose strands, tucking them back into place and straightening Sansa's hairnet. I was very sorry to hear about your losses, she said as she tugged and fiddled. Your brother was a terrible traitor, I know, but if we start killing men at weddings, they'll be even more frightened of marriage than they are presently. 
That's better. Lady Olenna smiled. I am pleased to say I shall be leaving for High Garden the day after next. I have had quite enough of this smelly city, thank you. Perhaps you would like to accompany me for a little visit, whilst the men are off having their war? I shall miss my Marguerite so dreadfully, and all her lovely ladies. Your company would be such sweet solace. You are too kind, my lady, said Sansa. But my place is with my lord husband. Lady Olenna gave Tyrion a wrinkled, toothless smile. Oh, forgive the silly old woman, my lord. I did not mean to steal your lovely wife. I assumed you would be off leading a Lannister host against some wicked foe. A host of dragons and stags. The master of coin must remain at court to see that all the armies are paid for. To be sure. Dragons and stags, that's very clever. And dwarfs' pennies as well. I have heard of these dwarfs' pennies. No doubt collecting those is such a dreadful chore. I leave the collecting to others, my lady. Oh, do you? I would have thought you might want to tend to it yourself. We can't have the crown being cheated of its dwarfs' pennies now, can we? Gods forbid. Tyrion was beginning to wonder whether Lord Luther Tyrell had ridden off that cliff intentionally. If you will excuse us, Lady Olenna, it is time we were in our places. Myself as well. Seventy-seven courses, I dare say. Don't you find that a bit excessive, my lord? I shan't eat more than three or four bites myself, but you and I are very little, aren't we? She patted Sansa's hair again and said, Well, off with you, child, and try to be merrier. Now where have my guardsmen gone? Left, right, where are you? Come help me to the dais. Although Evenfall was still an hour away, the throne room was already a blaze of light, with torches burning in every sconce. The guests stood along the tables as heralds called out the names and titles of the lords and ladies making their entrance. Pages in the royal livery escorted them down the broad central aisle. The gallery above was packed with musicians, drummers and pipers and fiddlers, strings and horns and skins. Tyrion clutched Sansa's arm and made the walk with a heavy, waddling stride. He could feel their eyes on him, picking at the fresh new scar that had left him even uglier than he had been before. Let them look, he thought as he hopped up onto his seat. Let them stare and whisper until they've had their fill. I will not hide myself for their sake. The Queen of Thorns followed them in, shuffling along with tiny little steps. Tyrion wondered which of them looked more absurd. Him with Sansa, or the wizened little woman between her seven-foot-tall twin guardsmen. Joffrey and Margaery rode into the throne room on matched white chargers. Pages ran before them, scattering rose petals under their hooves. The king and queen had changed for the feast as well. Joffrey wore striped black and crimson breeches and a cloth of gold doublet with black satin sleeves and onyx studs. Margaery had exchanged the demure gown that she had worn in the sept for one much more revealing, a confection in pale green samite, with a tight-laced bodice that bared her shoulders and the tops of her small breasts. Unbound, her soft brown hair tumbled over her white shoulders and down her back almost to her waist. Around her brows was a slim golden crown. Her smile was shy and sweet. A lovely girl, thought Tyrion, and a kinder fate than my nephew deserves. The king's guard escorted them on to the dais, to the seats of honor beneath the shadow of the iron throne, draped for the occasion in long silk streamers of Baratheon gold, Lannister crimson, and Tyrell green. Cersei embraced Marguerite and kissed her cheeks. Lord Tywin did the same, and then Lancel and Sir Kevin. Joffrey received loving kisses from the bride's father and his two new brothers, Loras and Garlin. No one seemed in any great rush to kiss Tyrion. When the king and queen had taken their seats, the high septon rose to lead a prayer. At least he does not drone as badly as the last one, Tyrion consoled himself. He and Sansa had been seated far to the king's right, beside Sir Garland, Tyrell, and his wife, the Lady Leonette. A dozen others sat closer to Joffrey, which a pricklier man might have taken for a slight, given that he had been the king's hand only a short time past. Tyrion would have been glad if there had been a hundred. Let the cups be filled! Joffrey proclaimed when the gods had been given their due. His cup-bearer poured a whole flagon of dark arbor red into the golden wedding chalice that Lord Tyrell had given him that morning. The king had to use both hands to lift it. To my wife, the queen! Marguerite! The hall shouted back at him. Marguerite! Marguerite! 
to the queen. A thousand cups rang together, and the wedding feast was well and truly begun. Tyrion Lannister drank with the rest, emptying his cup on that first toast, and signaling for it to be refilled as soon as he was seated again. The first dish was a creamy soup of mushrooms and buttered snails, served in gilded bowls. Tyrion had scarcely touched the breakfast, and the wine had already gone to his head, so the food was welcome. He finished quickly. One done, seventy-six to come. Seventy-seven dishes. Now oh, there are still starving children in the city, and men who would kill for a radish. They might not love the Tyrells half so well if they could see us now. Sansa tasted a spoonful of soup and pushed the bowl away. Not to your liking, my lady? Tyrion asked. There's to be so much, my lord. I have a little tummy. She fiddled nervously with her hair and looked down the table to where Joffrey sat with his Tyrell queen. Does she wish it were her in Marguerite's place? Tyrion frowned. Even a child should have better sense. He turned away, wanting distraction, but everywhere he looked were women. Fair, fine, beautiful, happy women— who belonged to other men. Marguerite, of course, smiling sweetly as she and Joffrey shared a drink from the great seven-sided wedding chalice. Her mother, Lady Allery, silver-haired and handsome, still proud beside Mace Tyrell. The Queen's three young cousins, bright as birds. Lord Merriweather's dark-haired, mirish wife, with her big, black, sultry eyes. Elaria Sand, among the Dornishmen, Cersei had placed them at their own table, just below the dais, in a place of high honour, but as far from the Tyrells as the width of the hall would allow, laughing at something the Red Viper had told her. And there was one woman, sitting almost at the foot of the third table on the left, the wife of one of the Fossaways, he thought, and heavy with his child. Her delicate beauty was in no way diminished by her belly, nor was her pleasure in the food and frolics. Tyrion watched as her husband fed her morsels off his plate. They drank from the same cup, and would kiss often and unpredictably. Whenever they did, his hand would gently rest upon her stomach, a tender and protective gesture. He wondered what Sansa would do if he leaned over and kissed her right now. Flinch away, most likely. Or be brave and suffer through it, as was her duty. She is nothing if not dutiful, this wife of mine. If he told her that he wished to have her maidenhead tonight, she would suffer that dutifully as well and weep no more than she had to. He called for more wine. By the time he got it, the second course was being served, a pastry coffin filled with pork, pine nuts, and eggs. Sansa ate no more than a bite of hers, as the heralds were summoning the first of the seven singers. Grey-bearded Hamish the Harper announced that he would perform, For the ears of gods and men, a song ne'er heard before on all the seven kingdoms. He called it, Lord Renly's Ride. His fingers moved across the strings of the high harp, filling the throne room with sweet sound. From his throne of bones the Lord of Death looked down on the murdered Lord. Hamish began, and went on to tell how Renly, repenting his attempt to usurp his nephew's crown, had defied the Lord of Death himself, and crossed back to the land of the living to defend the realm against his brother. And for this poor Simon wound up in a bowl of brown, Tyrion mused. Queen Marguerite was teary-eyed by the end, when the shade of brave Lord Renly flew to High Garden to steal one last look at his true love's face. Renly Baratheon never repented of anything in his life, the imp told Sansa. But if I'm any judge, Hamish just won himself a gilded lute. The harper also gave them several more familiar songs. A rose of gold was for the Tyrells, no doubt, as the reigns of Castamere was meant to flatter his father. Maiden, mother, and crone delighted the high septon, and my lady wife pleased all the little girls with romance in their hearts, and no doubt some little boys as well. Tyrion listened with half a ear as he sampled sweet corn fritters and hot oat bread baked with bits of date, apple, and orange, and gnawed on the rib of a wild boar. Thereafter dishes and diversions succeeded one another in a staggering profusion, buoyed along upon a flood of wine and ale. Hamish left them, his place taken by a smallish elderly bear who danced clumsily to pipe and drum, while the wedding guests ate trout cooked in a crust of crushed almonds. Moonboy mounted his stilts and strode around the tables in pursuit of Lord Tyrell's ludicrously fat fool butterbumps, and the lords and ladies sampled roast herons and cheese and onion pies. 
A troop of Pentoshi tumblers performed cartwheels and handstands, balanced platters on their bare feet, and stood upon each other's shoulders to form a pyramid. Their feats were accompanied by crabs boiled in fiery eastern spices, trenchers filled with chunks of chopped mutton stewed in almond milk with carrots, raisins, and onions, and fish tarts, fresh from the ovens, served so hot they burned the fingers. Then the heralds summoned another singer, Calio Aquinas of Tirosh, who had a vermilion beard and an accent as ludicrous as Simon had promised. Callio began with his version of The Dance of the Dragons, which was more properly a song for two singers, male and female. Tyrion suffered through it with a double helping of honey-ginger partridge and several cups of wine. A haunting ballad of two dying lovers amidst the doom of Valyria might have pleased the whole more if Callio had not sung it in high Valyrian, which most of the guests could not speak. But Bessa the barmaid won them back with its ribald lyrics. Peacocks were served in their plumage, roasted whole and stuffed with dates, while Callio summoned a drummer, bowed low before Lord Tywin, and launched into the reigns of Castamere. If I have to hear seven versions of that, I may go down to Flea Bottom and apologize to the stew. Tyrion returned to his wife. So which did you prefer? Sansa blinked at him. My lord? The singers. Which did you prefer? I, I'm sorry, my lord, I was not listening. She was not eating either. Sansa is all amiss? He spoke without thinking and instantly felt the fool. All her kin are slaughtered, and she's wed to me, and I wonder what's amiss. No, my lord. She looked away from him and feigned an unconvincing interest in Moon Boy, pelting Sir Dantos with dates. Four master pyromancers conjured up beasts of living flame to tear at each other with fiery claws, whilst the serving men ladled out bowls of blandisori, a mixture of beef broth and boiled wine sweetened with honey and dotted with blanched almonds and chunks of capon. Then came some strolling pipers and clever dogs and sword-swallowers, with buttered peas, chopped nuts, and slivers of swan poached in a sauce of saffron and peaches. Not swan again, Tyrion muttered, remembering his supper with his sister on the eve of battle. A juggler kept a half-dozen swords and axes whirling through the air as skewers of blood sausage were brought sizzling to the tables, a juxtaposition that Tyrion thought passing clever, though not perhaps in the best of taste. The heralds blew their trumpets. "'To sing for the golden lute!' one cried. "'We give you Galleon of Quee!' Galleon was a big barrel-chested man with a black beard, a bald head, and a thunderous voice that filled every corner of the throne room. He brought no fewer than six musicians to play for him. "'Noble lords and ladies fair, I sing but one song for you this night,' he announced. "'It is the song of the Blackwater, and how a realm was saved.' The drummer began a slow, ominous beat. "'The Dark Lord brooded high in his tower,' Galdian began, "'in a castle as black as the night. "'Black was his hair, and black was his soul,' the musicians chanted in unison. A flute came in. "'He feasted on bloodlust and envy, and filled his cup full up with spite,' sang Galdian. "'My brother once ruled seven kingdoms,' he said to his harrod and wife. I'll take what was his and make it all mine. Let his son feel the point of my knife. A brave young boy with hair of gold, his players chanted as a wood harp and a fiddle began to play. If I am ever hand again, the first thing I'll do is hang all the singers, said Tyrion too loudly. Lady Leonette laughed lightly beside him, and Sir Garland leaned over to say, A valiant deed on sung is no less valiant. The Dark Lord assembled his legions, they gathered around him like crows, and thirsty for blood they boarded their ships. And cut off poor Tyrion's nose, Tyrion finished. Lady Leonette giggled. Perhaps you should be a singer, my lord. You rhyme as well as this galleon. No, my lady, Sir Garland said. My lord of Lannister was made to do great deeds, not to sing of them. But for his chain and his wildfire, the foe would have been across the river. And if Tyrion's wildlings had not slain most of Lord Stannis's scouts, we would never have been able to take him unawares. His words made Tyrion feel absurdly grateful, and helped to mollify him as Galleon sang endless verses about the valor of the boy king and his mother, the Golden Queen. She never did that, Sansa blurted out suddenly. 
Never believe anything you hear in a song, my lady. Tyrion summoned a serving man to refill their wine cups. Soon it was full night outside the tall windows, and still Galleon sang on. His song had seventy-seven verses, though it seemed more like a thousand. One for every guest in the hall. Tyrion drank his way through the last twenty or so, to help resist the urge to stuff mushrooms in his ears. By the time the singer had taken his bows, some of the guests were drunk enough to begin providing unintentional entertainments of their own. Grand Maester Purcell fell asleep, while dancers from the summer isles swirled and spun in robes made of bright feathers and smoky silk. Roundels of elk stuffed with ripe blue cheese were being brought out when one of Lord Rowan's knights stabbed a Dornishman. The gold cloaks dragged them both away, one to a cell to rot and the other to get sewn up by Maester Balabar. Tyrion was toying with a lesh of brawn, spiced with cinnamon, cloves, sugar, and almond milk, when King Joffrey lurched suddenly to his feet. "'Bring on my royal jousters!' he shouted in a voice thick with wine, clapping his hands together. "'My nephew is drunker than I am,' Tyrion thought, as the gold cloaks opened the great doors at the end of the hall. From where he sat he could only see the tops of two striped lances as a pair of riders entered side by side. A wave of laughter followed them down the center aisle toward the king. "'They must be riding ponies,' he concluded, until they came into full view. The jousters were a pair of dwarfs. One was mounted on an ugly gray dog, long of leg and heavy of jaw. The other rode an immense spotted sow. Painted wooden armor clattered and clacked as the little knights bounced up and down in their saddles. Their shields were bigger than they were, and they wrestled manfully with their lances as they clomped along, swaying this way and that, and eliciting gusts of mirth. One knight was all in gold, with a black stag painted on his shield. The other wore gray and white, and bore a wolf device. Their mounts were barded likewise. Tyrion glanced along the dais at all the laughing faces. Joffrey was red and breathless. Tommen was hooting and hopping up and down in his seat. Circe was chuckling politely, and even Lord Tywin looked mildly amused. Of all those at the high table, only Sansa Stark was not smiling. He could have loved her for that, but if truth be told, the Stark girl's eyes were far away, as if she had not even seen the ludicrous riders loping toward her. The dwarfs are not to blame, Tyrion decided. When they are done, I shall compliment them and give them a fat purse of silver. And come the morrow, I will find whoever planned this little diversion and arrange for a different sort of thanks. When the dwarfs reined up beneath the dais to salute the king, the wolf knight dropped his shield. As he leaned over to grab for it, the stag knight lost control of his heavy lance and slammed him across the back. The wolf knight fell off his pig, and his lance tumbled over and boinked his foe on the head. They both wound up on the floor in a great tangle. When they rose, both tried to mount the dog. Much shouting and shoving followed. Finally they regained their saddles, only mounted on each other's steed, holding the wrong shield and facing backward. It took some time to sort that out, but in the end they spurred to opposite ends of the hall and wheeled about for the tilt. As the lords and ladies guffawed and giggled, the little men came together with a crash and a clatter, and the wolf knight's lance struck the helm of the stag knight and knocked his head clean off. It spun through the air, spattering blood to land in the lap of Lord Giles. The headless dwarf careened around the tables, flailing his arms. Dogs barked, women shrieked, and Moon Boy made a great show of swaying perilously back and forth on his stilts, until Lord Giles pulled a dripping red melon out of the shattered helm, at which point the stag knight poked his face up out of his armor, and another storm of laughter rocked the hall. The knights waited for it to die, circled around each other, trading colorful insults, and were about to separate for another joust, when the dog threw its rider to the floor and mounted the sow. The huge pig squealed in distress, while the wedding guests squealed with laughter, especially when the stag knight leapt on to the wolf knight, let down his wooden breeches, and started to pump away frantically at the other's nether portions. "'I yield, I yield!' the dwarf on the bottom screamed. "'Good sir, put up your sword!' "'I would, I would, if you'll stop moving the sheath,' the dwarf on the top replied, to the merriment of all. Joffrey was snorting wine from both nostrils. Gasping, he lurched to his feet, almost knocking over his tall, two-handed chalice. "'A champion!' he shouted. "'We have a champion!' The hall began to quiet when it was seen that the king was speaking. The dwarfs untangled, no doubt anticipating the royal thanks. 
Not a true champion, though, said Joff. A true champion defeats all challengers. The king climbed up on the table. Who else will challenge our tiny champion? With a gleeful smile, he turned toward Tyrion. Uncle, you'll defend the honor of my realm, won't you? You can ride the pig. The laughter crashed over him like a wave. Tyrion Lannister did not remember rising nor climbing on his chair, but he found himself standing on the table. The hall was a torch-lit blur of leering faces. He twisted his face into the most hideous mockery of a smile the Seven Kingdoms had ever seen. "'Your Grace,' he called, "'I'll ride the pig, but only if you ride the dog.' Joff scowled, confused. "'Me? I'm no dwarf. Why me?' "'Stepped right into the cut, Joff. "'Why, you're the only man in the hall that I'm certain of defeating.' He could not have said which was sweeter. The instant of shocked silence, the gale of laughter that followed, or the look of blind rage on his nephew's face. The dwarf hopped back to the floor well satisfied, and by the time he looked back, Sir Osmond and Sir Merrin were helping Joff climb down as well. When he noticed Circe glaring at him, Tyrion blew her a kiss. It was a relief when the musicians began to play. The tiny jousters led dog and sow from the hall, the guests returned to their trenchers of brawn, and Tyrion called for another cup of wine. But suddenly he felt Sir Garland's hand on his sleeve. "'My lord, beware,' the knight warned. "'The king!' Tyrion turned in his seat. Joffrey was almost upon him, red-faced and staggering, wine slopping over the rim of the great golden wedding chalice he carried in both hands. "'Your grace!' was all he had time to say before the king up into the chalice over his head. The wine washed down over his face in a red torrent. It drenched his hair, stung his eyes, burned in his wound, ran down his cheeks, and soaked the velvet of his new doublet. "'How do you like that, imp?' Joffrey mocked. Tyrion's eyes were on fire. He dabbed at his face with the back of a sleeve and tried to blink the world back into clarity. "'That was ill done, your grace.' he heard Sir Garland say quietly. "'Not at all, Sir Garland. Tyrion dare not let this grow any uglier than it was, not here, with half the realm looking on. Not every king would think to honor a humble subject by serving him from his own royal chalice. A pity the wine spilled.' "'It didn't spill,' said Joffrey, too graceless to take the retreat Tyrion offered him. "'And I wasn't serving you either.' Queen Marguerite appeared suddenly at Joffrey's elbow. "'My sweet king,' the Tyrell girl entreated, "'come, return to your place. There's another singer waiting.' "'Alaric of Isen, said Lady Olena Tyrell, leaning on her cane and taking no more notice of the wine-soaked dwarf than her granddaughter had done. "'I do so hope he plays us the reins of Castamir. It has been an hour. I've forgotten how it goes.' "'Sir Adam has a toast he wants to make as well,' said Marguerite. "'Your grace, please.' I have no wine, Joffrey declared. How can I drink a toast if I have no wine? Uncle Imp, you can serve me. Since you won't joust, you'll be my cupbearer. I would be most honored. It's not meant to be an honor, Joffrey screamed. Bend down and pick up my chalice. Tyrion did as he was bid, but as he reached for the handle, Joff kicked the chalice through his legs. Pick it up! Are you as clumsy as you are ugly? He had to crawl under the table to find the thing. Good. Now fill it with wine. He claimed a flagon from a serving girl and filled the goblet three quarters full. No, on your knees, dwarf. Kneeling, Tyrion raised up the heavy cup, wondering if he was about to get a second bath. But Joffrey took the wedding chalice one-handed, drank deep, and set it on the table. You can get up now, uncle. His legs cramped as he tried to rise and almost spilled him again. Tyrion had to grab hold of a chair to steady himself. Sir Garland lent him a hand. Joffrey laughed, and Circe as well. Then others. He could not see who, but he heard them. "'Your Grace,' Lord Tywin's voice was impeccably correct. "'They are bringing in the pie. Your sword is needed.' "'The pie?' Joffrey took his queen by the hand. "'Come, my lady, it's the pie!' 
The guests stood shouting and applauding and smashing their wine cups together as the great pie made its slow way down the length of the hall, wheeled along by a half-dozen beaming cooks. Two yards across it was, crusty and golden brown, and they could hear squeaks and thumpings coming from inside it. Tyrion pulled himself back into his chair. All he needed now was for a dove to shit on him, and his day would be complete. The wine had soaked through his doublet and small clothes, and he could feel the wetness against his skin. He ought to change, but no one was permitted to leave the feast until the time came for the bedding ceremony. That was still a good twenty or thirty dishes off, he judged. King Joffrey and his queen met the pie below the dais. As Joff drew his sword, Marguerite laid a hand on his arm to restrain him. Widow's wail was not meant for slicing pies. True. Joffrey lifted his voice. Sir Illyn! Your sword! From the shadows at the back of the hall, Sir Illyn Payne appeared. The spectre at the feast, thought Tyrion, as he watched the king's justice stride forward, gaunt and grim. He had been too young to have known Sir Illyn before he'd lost his tongue. He would have been a different man in those days, but now the silence is as much a part of him as those hollow eyes that rusty chain-mail shirt and the great sword on his back. Sir Illyn bowed before the king and queen, reached back over his shoulder, and drew forth six feet of ornate silver, bright with runes. He knelt to offer the huge blade to Joffrey, hilt first. Points of red fire winked from ruby eyes on the pommel, a chunk of dragon-glass carved in the shape of a grinning skull. Sansa stirred in her seat. What sword is that? Tyrion's eyes still stung from the wine. He blinked and looked again. Sir Illyn's great sword was as long and wide as ice, but it was too silvery, bright. Valyrian steel had a darkness to it, a smokiness in its soul. Sansa clutched his arm. What has Sir Illyn done with my father's sword? I should have sent ice back to Rob Stark, Tyrion thought. He glanced at his father, but Lord Tywin was watching the king. Joffrey and Marguerite joined hands to lift the great sword and swung it down together in a silvery arc. When the pie crust broke, the doves burst forth in a swirl of white feathers, scattering in every direction, flapping for the windows and the rafters. A roar of delight went up from the benches, and the fiddlers and pipers in the gallery began to play a sprightly tune. Joff took his bride in his arms and whirled her around merrily. A serving man placed a slice of hot pigeon pie in front of Tyrion and covered it with a spoon of lemon cream. The pigeons were well and truly cooked in this pie, but he found them no more appetizing than the white ones fluttering about the hall. Sansa was not eating either. You are deathly pale, my lady, Tyrion said. You need a breath of cool air, and I need a fresh doublet. He stood and offered her his hand. Come. But before they could make their retreat, Joffrey was back. Uncle, where are you going? You're my cupbearer, remember? I need to change into fresh garb, your grace. May I have your leave? No, I like the look of you this way. Serve me my wine. The king's chalice was on the table where he'd left it. Tyrion had to climb back onto his chair to reach it. Joff yanked it from his hands and drank long and deep, his throat working as the wine ran purple down his chin. "'My lord,' Marguerite said, "'we should return to our places. Lord Buckler wants to toast us.' "'My uncle hasn't eaten his pigeon pie.' Holding the chalice one-handed, Joff jammed his other into Tyrion's pie. "'It's ill luck not to eat the pie,' he scolded as he filled his mouth with hot, spiced pigeon. "'See, it's good!' Spitting out flakes of crust, he coughed and helped himself to another fistful. "'Dry, though. Needs washing down.' Joff took a swallow of wine and coughed again more violently. "'I want to see—see <coughs> see you ride that <coughs> pig, uncle. I want—' His words broke up in a fit of coughing. Marguerite looked at him with concern. "'Your grace, it's <coughs> the pie, not <coughs> pie!' Joff took another drink, or tried to, but all the wine came spewing back out when another spate of coughing doubled him over. His face was turning red. "'I—I <coughs> I can't. <coughs> The chalice slipped from his hand, and dark red wine went running across the dais. "'He's choking!' Queen Marguerite gasped. Her grandmother moved to her side. "'Help the poor boy!' 
the Queen of Thorns screeched in a voice ten times her size. Dolts, will you all stand about gaping? Help your king! Sir Garland shoved Tyrion aside and began to pound Joffrey on the back. Sir Osmond Kettleblack ripped open the king's collar. A fearful, high, thin sound emerged from the boy's throat, the sound of a man trying to suck a river through a reed. Then it stopped, and that was more terrible still. "'Turn him over!' Mace Tyrell bellowed at everyone and no one. "'Turn him over! Shake him by his heels!' A different voice was calling, "'Water! Give him some water!' The high septon began to pray loudly. Grand Maester Purcell shouted for someone to help him back to his chambers to fetch his potions. Joffrey began to claw at his throat, his nails tearing bloody gouges in the flesh. Beneath the skin the muscles stood out hard as stone. Prince Tommen was screaming and crying. He is going to die, Tyrion realized. He felt curiously calm, though pandemonium raged all about him. They were pounding Joff on the back again, but his face was only growing darker. Dogs were barking, children were wailing, men were shouting useless advice at each other. Half the wedding guests were on their feet, some shoving at each other for a better view, others rushing for the doors in their haste to get away. Sir Merrin pried the king's mouth open to jam a spoon down his throat. As he did, the boy's eyes met Tyrion's. He has Jamie's eyes. Only he had never seen Jamie look so scared. The boy's only thirteen. Joffrey was making a dry, clacking noise, trying to speak. His eyes bulged white with terror, and he lifted a hand, reaching for his uncle, or pointing. Is he begging my forgiveness, or does he think I can save him? No! Cersei wailed. Father, help him! Someone help him! My son! My son! Tyrion found himself thinking of Rob Stark. My own wedding is looking much better, in hindsight. He looked to see how Sansa was taking this, but there was so much confusion in the hall that he could not find her. But his eyes fell on the wedding chalice, forgotten on the floor. He went and scooped it up. There was still a half inch of deep purple wine in the bottom of it. Tyrion considered it a moment, then poured it on the floor. Marguerite Tyrell was weeping in her grandmother's arms as the old lady said, be brave, be brave. Most of the musicians had fled, but one last flutist in the gallery was blowing a dirge. In the rear of the throne room, scuffling had broken out around the doors, and the guests were trampling on each other. Sir Adam's gold cloaks moved in to restore order. Guests were rushing headlong out into the night, some weeping, some stumbling and retching, others white with fear. It occurred to Tyrion belatedly that it might be wise to leave himself. When he heard Cersei's scream, he knew that it was over. I should leave. Now. Instead, he waddled toward her. His sister sat in a puddle of wine, cradling her son's body. Her gown was torn and stained, her face white as chalk. A thin black dog crept up beside her, sniffing at Joffrey's corpse. The boy is gone, Cersei. Lord Tywin said. He put his gloved hand on his daughter's shoulder as one of his guardsmen shooed away the dog. Unhand him now. Let him go. She did not hear. It took two king's guard to pry loose her fingers, so the body of King Joffrey Baratheon could slide limp and lifeless to the floor. The high septon knelt beside him. Father above, judge our good king Joffrey justly, he intoned, beginning the prayer for the dead. Marguerite Tyrell began to sob, and Tyrion heard her mother, Lady Allery, saying, "'He choked, sweetling. He choked on the pie. It was not to do with you. He choked, we all saw.' "'He did not choke.' Cersei's voice was sharp as Sir Illyn's sword. "'My son was poisoned.' She looked to the white knights, standing helplessly around her. "'King's guard, do your duty.' "'My lady?' said Sir Loras Tyrell, uncertain. "'Arrest my brother!' she commanded him. "'He did this, the dwarf! Him and his little wife! They killed my son! Your king! Take them! Take them both!' Sansa Far across the city a bell began to toll. Sansa felt as though she were in a dream. "'Joffrey is dead?' She told the trees to see if that would wake her. He had not been dead when she left the throne room. 
He had been on his knees, though, clawing at his throat, tearing at his own skin as he fought to breathe. The sight of it had been too terrible to watch, and she had turned and fled, sobbing. Lady Tonda had been fleeing as well. "'You have a good heart, my lady,' she said to Sansa. "'Not every maid would weep so for a man who set her aside and wed her to a dwarf.' "'A good heart. I have a good heart.' Hysterical laughter rose up her gullet, but Sansa choked it back down. The bells were ringing, slow and mournful. Ringing, ringing, ringing. They had rung for King Robert the same way. Joffrey was dead. He was dead. He was dead. 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 Why was she crying when she wanted to dance? Were they tears of joy? She found her clothes where she had hidden them the night before last. With no maids to help her, it took her longer than it should have to undo the laces of her gown. Her hands were strangely clumsy, though she was not as frightened as she ought to have been. "'The gods are cruel to take him so young and handsome at his own wedding feast,' Lady Tonda had said to her. "'The gods are just,' thought Sansa. Rob had died at a wedding feast as well. It was Rob she wept for. "'Him and Marguerite. Poor Marguerite, twice wed and twice widowed. Sansa slid her arm from a sleeve, pushed down the gown, and wriggled out of it. She balled it up and shoved it into the bowl of an oak, shook out the clothing she had hidden there. Dress warmly, Sir Dantas had told her, and dress dark. She had no blacks, so she chose a dress of thick brown wool. The bodice was decorated with freshwater pearls, though. The cloak will cover them. The cloak was a deep green with a large hood. She slipped the dress over her head and donned the cloak, though she left the hood down for the moment. There were shoes as well, simple and sturdy, with flat heels and square toes. The gods heard my prayer, she thought. She felt so numb and dreamy. My skin has turned to porcelain, to ivory, to steel. Her hands moved stiffly, awkwardly, as if they had never let down her hair before. For a moment she wished Shay was there to help her with a net. When she pulled it free, her long auburn hair cascaded down her back and across her shoulders. The web of spun silver hung from her fingers, the fine metal glimmering softly, the stones black in the moonlight. Black amethysts from a shy. One of them was missing. Sansa lifted the net for a closer look. There was a dark smudge in the silver socket where the stone had fallen out. A sudden terror filled her. Her heart hammered against her ribs, and for an instant she held her breath. Why am I so scared? It's only an amethyst, a black amethyst from a shy, no more than that. It must have been loose in the setting, that's all. It was loose, and it fell out, and now it's lying somewhere in the throne room or in the yard, and this— Sir Dantos had said the hairnet was magic, that it would take her home. He told her she must wear it tonight at Joffrey's wedding feast. The silver wire stretched tight across her knuckles. Her thumb rubbed back and forth against the hole where the stone had been. She tried to stop, but her fingers were not her own. Her thumb was drawn to the hole as the tongue is drawn to a missing tooth. What kind of magic? The king was dead, the cruel king who had been her gallant prince a thousand years ago. If Dantos had lied about the hairnet, had he lied about the rest as well? What if he never comes? What if there is no ship, no boat on the river, no escape? What would happen to her then? She heard a faint rustle of leaves and stuffed the silver hairnet down deep in the pocket of her cloak. "'Who's there?' she cried. "'Who is it?' The god's wood was dim and dark, and the bells were ringing Joff into his grave. "'Nay!' He staggered out from under the trees, reeling drunk. He caught her arm to steady himself. "'Sweet Jonquil, I've come. Your Florian has come. Don't be afraid.' Sansa pulled away from his touch. "'You said I must wear the hairnet, the silver net with—' "'What sort of stones are those?' "'Amethysts. Black amethysts from a shy, my lady.' "'They're no amethysts, are they? Are they? You lied.' "'Black amethysts,' he swore. "'There was magic in them.' "'There was murder in them.' "'Softly, my lady, softly. No murder.' He choked on his pigeon pie. Dantos chortled. Oh, tasty, tasty pie. Silver and stones, that's all it was. Silver and stone and magic. 
The bells were tolling, and the wind was making a noise like he had made as he tried to suck a breath of air. You poisoned him. You did. You took a stone from my hair. Hush, you'll be the death of us. I did nothing. Come, we must away. They'll search for you. Your husband's been arrested. Tyrion? She said, shocked. Do you have another husband? The imp, the dwarf uncle, she thinks he did it. He grabbed her hand and pulled at her. This way we must away quickly now. Have no fear. Sansa followed unresisting. I could never abide the weeping of women, Joff once said, but his mother was the only woman weeping now. In old Nan stories, the Grumkins crafted magic things that could make a wish come true. Did I wish him dead? she wondered, before she remembered that she was too old to believe in Grumkins. Tyrion poisoned him? Her dwarf husband had hated his nephew, she knew. Could he truly have killed him? Did he know about my hairnet? About the black amethysts? He brought Joff wine. How could you make someone choke by putting an amethyst in their wine? If Tyrion did it, they will think I was part of it as well, she realized with a start of fear. How not? They were man and wife, and Joff had killed her father and mocked her with her brother's death. One flesh, one heart, one soul. Be quiet now, my sweetling, said Dantos. Outside the god's wood we must make no sound. Pull up your hood and hide your face. Sansa nodded and did as he said. He was so drunk that sometimes Sansa had to lend him her arm to keep him from falling. The bells were ringing out across the city, more and more of them joining in. She kept her head down and stayed in the shadows, close behind Dantos. While descending the serpentine steps, he stumbled to his knees and retched. My poor Florian, she thought, as he wiped his mouth with a floppy sleeve. Dress dark, he'd said, yet under his brown hooded cloak he was wearing his old surcoat, red and pink horizontal stripes, beneath a black chief bearing three gold crowns, the arms of House Hollard. Why are you wearing your surcoat? Joff decreed it was death if you were caught dressed as a knight again. He— Oh, nothing Joff had decreed mattered any longer. I want it to be a knight. For this, at least. Dantos lurched back to his feet and took her arm. Come, be quiet now, no questions. They continued down the serpentine and across a small sunken courtyard. Sir Dantos shoved open a heavy door and lit a taper. They were inside a long gallery. Along the walls stood empty suits of armor, dark and dusty, their helms crested with rows of scales that continued down their backs. As they hurried past, the taper's light made the shadows of each scale stretch and twist. The hollow knights are turning into dragons, she thought. One more stair took them to an oaken door, banded with iron. Be strong now, my junk wool, you are almost there. When Dantos lifted the bar and pulled open the door, Sansa felt a cold breeze on her face. She passed through twelve feet of wall, and then she was outside the castle standing at the top of the cliff. Below was the river, above the sky, and one was as black as the other. We must climb down, Sir Dantos said. At the bottom a man is waiting to row us out to the ship. I'll fall. Bran had fallen, and he had loved to climb. No, you won't. There's a sort of ladder, a secret ladder, carved into the stone. Here, you can feel it, my lady. He got down on his knees with her and made her lean over the edge of the cliff, groping with her fingers until she found the handhold cut into the face of the bluff. Almost as good as rungs. Even so, it was a long way down. I can't. You must. Isn't there another way? This is the way. It won't be so hard for a strong young girl like you. Hold on tight and never look down and you'll be at the bottom in no time at all. His eyes were shiny. Your poor Florian is fat and old and drunk. I'm the one should be afraid. I used to fall off my horse, don't you remember? That was how we began. I was drunk and fell off my horse, and Joffrey wanted my fool head, but you saved me. You saved me, sweetling. He's weeping, she realized. And now you have saved me. Only if you go. If not, I have killed us both. It was him, she thought. He killed Joffrey. She had to go for him as much as for herself. You go first, sir. If he did fall, she did not want him falling down on her head and knocking both of them off the cliff. As you wish, my lady. He gave her a sloppy kiss and swung his legs clumsily over the precipice, kicking about until he found a foothold. 
Let me get down a bit and come after. You will come now. You must swear it. I'll come, she promised. Sir Dantos disappeared. She could hear him huffing and puffing as he began the descent. Sansa listened to the tolling of the bell, counting each ring. At ten, gingerly, she eased herself over the edge of the cliff, poking with her toes until they found a place to rest. The castle walls loomed large above her, and for a moment she wanted nothing so much as to pull herself up and run back to her warm rooms in the kitchen keep. Be brave, she told herself, be brave, like a lady in a song. Santa dared not look down. She kept her eyes on the face of the cliff, making certain of each step before reaching for the next. The stone was rough and cold. Sometimes she could feel her fingers slipping, and the handholds were not as evenly spaced as she would have liked. The bells would not stop ringing. Before she was halfway down, her arms were trembling, and she knew that she was going to fall. One more step, she told herself. One more step. She had to keep moving. If she stopped, she would never start again, and dawn would find her still clinging to the cliff, frozen in fear. One more step, and one more step. The ground took her by surprise. She stumbled and fell, her heart pounding. When she rolled onto her back and stared up at, from where she had come, her head swam dizzily and her fingers clawed at the dirt. I did it. I did it. I didn't fall. I made the climb, and now I'm going home. Sir Dantos pulled her back onto her feet. This way. Quiet now. Quiet. Quiet. He stayed close to the shadows that lay black and thick beneath the cliffs. Thankfully, they did not have to go far. Fifty yards downriver, a man sat in a small skiff, half hidden by the remains of a great galley that had gone aground there and burned. Dantos limped up to him, puffing. Us well? No names, the man said. In the boat. He sat hunched over his oars, an old man, tall and gangling, with long white hair and a great hooked nose, with eyes shaded by a cowl. Get in, be quick about it, he muttered. We need to be away. When both of them were safe aboard, the cowled man slid the blades into the water and put his back into the oars, rowing them out toward the channel. Behind them the bells were still tolling the boy king's death. They had the dark river all to themselves. With slow, steady, rhythmic strokes, they threaded their way downstream, sliding above the sunken galleys, past broken masts, burned hulls, and torn sails. The oarlocks had been muffled, so they moved almost soundlessly. A mist was rising over the water. Sansa saw the embattled ramparts of one of the imps' winch towers looming above, but the great chain had been lowered, and they rode unimpeded past the spot where a thousand men had burned. The shore fell away, the fog grew thicker, the sound of the bells began to fade. Finally, even the lights were gone, lost somewhere behind them. They were out in Blackwater Bay, and the world shrank to dark water, blowing mist, and their silent companion stooped over the oars. How far must we go? she asked. No talk. The oarsman was old, but stronger than he looked, and his voice was fierce. There was something oddly familiar about his face, though Sansa could not say what it was. Not far. Sir Dantos took her hand in his own and rubbed it gently. Your friend is near, waiting for you. No talk! The oarsman growled again. Sound carries over water, sir fool. Abashed, Sansa bit her lip and huddled down in silence. The rest was rowing, rowing, rowing. The eastern sky was vague with the first hint of dawn when Sansa finally saw a ghostly shape in the darkness ahead, a trading galley, her sails furled, moving slowly on a single bank of oars. As they drew closer, she saw the ship's figurehead, a merman with a golden crown blowing on a great seashell horn. She heard a voice cry out, and the galley swung slowly about. As they came alongside, the galley dropped the rope ladder over the rail. The rower shipped the oars and helped Sansa to her feet. Up now. Go on, girl, I got you. Sansa thanked him for his kindness, but received no answer but a grunt. It was much easier going up the rope ladder than it had been coming down the cliff. The oarsman Oswell followed close behind her while Sir Dantos remained in the boat. Two sailors were waiting by the rail to help her onto the deck. Sansa was trembling. She's cold, she heard someone say. He took off his cloak and put it around her shoulders. There's that better, my lady. Rest easy, the worst is past and done. She knew the voice. He's in the vale, she thought. Sir Lothar Broom stood beside him with a torch. 
Lord Peter, Dantos called from the boat. I must needs row back before they think to look for me. Peter Baelish put a hand on the rail. But first you'll want your payment. Ten thousand dragons, was it? Ten thousand? Dantos rubbed his mouth with the back of his hand. As you promised, my lord. Sir Lothar, the reward. Lothar Brune dipped his torch. Three men stepped to the gunwale, raised crossbows, fired. One bolt took Dantos in the chest as he looked up, punching through the left crown on his surcoat. The others ripped into throat and belly. It happened so quickly neither Dantos nor Sansa had time to cry out. When it was done, Lothar Brune tossed the torch down on top of the corpse. The little boat was blazing fiercely as the galley moved away. You killed him! Clutching the rail, Sansa turned away and retched. Had she escaped the Lannisters to tumble into worse? My lady, Littlefinger murmured, your grief is wasted on such a man as that. He was a sot and no man's friend. But he saved me. He sold you for a promise of ten thousand dragons. Your disappearance will make them suspect you in Joffrey's death. The gold cloaks will hunt, and the eunuch will jingle his purse. Dantos, well, you heard him. He sold you for gold, and when he'd drunk it up, he would have sold you again. A bag of dragons buys a man's silence for a while, but a well-placed quarrel buys it forever. He smiled sadly. All he did, he did at my behest. I dared not befriend you openly. When I heard how you saved his life at Joff's tourney, I knew he would be the perfect cat's paw. Sansa felt sick. He said he was my Florian. Do you perchance recall what I said to you that day your father sat the Iron Throne? The moment came back to her vividly. You told me that life was not a song, that I would learn that one day to my sorrow. She felt tears in her eyes, but whether she wept for Sir Dantos Hollard, for Joff, for Tyrion, or for herself, Sansa could not say. Is it all lies, forever and ever, everyone and everything? Almost everyone, save you and I, of course, he smiled. Come to the God's Wood tonight, if you want to go home. The note, it was you? It had to be the God's Wood. No other place in the Red Keep is safe from the eunuch's little birds, or little rats, as I call them. There are trees in the God's Wood instead of walls, sky above instead of ceiling, roots and dirt and rock in place of floor. The rats have no place to scurry. Rats need to hide, lest men skewer them with swords. Lord Peter took her arm. Let me show you to your cabin. You have had a long and trying day, I know. You must be weary. Already the little boat was no more than a swirl of smoke and fire behind them, almost lost in the immensity of the dawn sea. There was no going back. Her only road was forward. Very weary, she admitted. As he led her below, he said, Tell me of the feast. The queen took such pains. The singers, the jugglers, the dancing bear. Did your little lord husband enjoy my jousting dwarfs? Yours? I had to send to Bravos for them, and hide them away in a brothel until the wedding. The expense was exceeded only by the bother. It is surprisingly difficult to hide a dwarf, and Joffrey— You can lead a king to water, but with Joff one had to splash it about before he realized he could drink it. When I told him about my little surprise, his grace said, Why would I want some ugly dwarfs at my feast? I hate dwarfs. I had to take him by the shoulder and whisper, Not as much as your uncle will. The deck rocked beneath her feet, and Sansa felt as if the world itself had grown unsteady. They think Tyrion poisoned Joffrey. Sir Dantos said they seized him. Littlefinger smiled. Widowhood will become you, Sansa. The thought made her tummy flutter. She might never need to share a bed with Tyrion again. That was what she'd wanted, wasn't it? The cabin was low and cramped, but a feather bed had been laid upon the narrow sleeping shelf to make it more comfortable, and thick furs piled atop it. It will be snug, I know, but you shouldn't be too uncomfortable. Littlefinger pointed out a cedar chest under the porthole. You'll find fresh garb within, dresses, small clothes, warm stockings, a cloak. Wool and linen only, I fear. 
Unworthy of a maid so beautiful, but they'll serve to keep you dry and clean until we can find you something finer. He had this all prepared for me. My lord, I, I do not understand. Joffrey gave you Harrenhal, made you Lord Paramount of the Trident. Why? Why should I wish him dead? Littlefinger shrugged. I had no motive. Besides, I am a thousand leagues away in the Vale. Always keep your foes confused. If they are never certain who you are, or what you want, they cannot know what you are like to do next. Sometimes the best way to baffle them is to make moves that have no purpose, or even seem to work against you. Remember that, Sansa, when you come to play the game. But what game? The only game. The game of thrones. He brushed back a strand of her hair. You are old enough to know that your mother and I were more than friends. There was a time when Cat was all I wanted in this world. I dared to dream of the life we might make and the children she would give me. But she was a daughter of River Run and Hoster Tully. Family, duty, honor, Sansa. Family, duty, honor meant I could never have her hand. But she gave me something finer, a gift a woman can give but once. How could I turn my back upon her daughter? In a better world you might have been mine, not Eddard Starks, my loyal, loving daughter. Put Joffrey from your mind, sweetling. Dantos, Tyrion, all of them. They will never trouble you again. You are safe now. That's all that matters. You are safe with me, and sailing home. Jamie. The king is dead, they told him, never knowing that Joffrey was his son as well as his sovereign. The imp opened his throat with a dagger, a costermonger declared at the roadside inn, where they spent the night. He drank his blood from a big gold chalice. The man did not recognize the bearded, one-handed knight with a big bat on his shield, no more than any of them, so he said things he might otherwise have swallowed had he known who was listening. It was poison did the deed, the innkeeper insisted. The boy's face turned black as a plum. May the father judge him justly, murmured a septon. The dwarf's wife did the murder with him, swore an archer in Lord Rowan's livery. Afterward, she vanished from the hall in a puff of brimstone, and a ghostly direwolf was seen prowling the red keep, blood dripping from his jaws. Jamie sat silent through it all, letting the words wash over him, a horn of ale forgotten in his one good hand. Joffrey, my blood, my firstborn, my son. He tried to bring the boy's face to mind, but his features kept turning into Circe's. She will be in mourning, her hair in disarray and her eyes red from crying, her mouth trembling as she tries to speak. She will cry again when she sees me, though she'll fight the tears. His sister seldom wept, but when she was with him, she could not stand for others to think her weak. Only to her twin did she show her wounds. She will look to me for comfort and revenge. They rode hard the next day at Jamie's insistence. His son was dead, and his sister needed him. When he saw the city before him, its watchtowers dark against the gathering dusk, Jamie Lannister cantered up to steal Shanks Walton behind an age with a peace banner. "'What's that awful stink?' the Northman complained. "'Death,' thought Jamie, but he said, "'Smoke, sweat, and shit. King's Landing, in short. If you have a good nose, you can smell the treachery, too.' You've never smelled a city before? I smelled White Harbor. It never stank like this. White Harbor is to King's Landing as my brother Tyrion is to Sir Gregor Clegane. Nage led them up a low hill, the seven-tailed peace banner lifting and turning in the wind, the polished seven-pointed star shining bright upon its staff. He would see Cersei soon, and Tyrion, and their father. Could my brother truly have killed the boy? Jamie found that hard to believe. He was curiously calm. Men were supposed to go mad with grief when their children died, he knew. They were supposed to tear their hair out by the roots, to curse the gods and swear red vengeance. So why was it that he felt so little? The boy lived and died believing Robert Baratheon, his sire. 
Jamie had seen him born, that was true, though more for Circe than the child, but he had never held him. How would it look? His sister warned him when the women finally left them. Bad enough Joff looks like you without you mooning over him. Jamie yielded with hardly a fight. The boy had been a squalling pink thing who demanded too much of Circe's time, Circe's love, and Circe's breast. Robert was welcome to him. And now he's dead. He pictured Joff lying still and cold with a face black from poison, and still felt nothing. Perhaps he was the monster they claimed. If the father above came down to offer him back his son or his hand, Jamie knew which he would choose. He had a second son, after all, and seed enough of many more. If Circe wants another child, I'll give her one. And this time I'll hold him, and the others take those who do not like it. Robert was rotting in his grave, and Jamie was sick of lies. He turned abruptly and galloped back to find Brienne. Gods know why I bother. She is the least companionable creature I have ever had that misfortune to meet. The wench rode well behind, and a few feet off to the side, as if to proclaim that she was no part of them. They had found men's garb for her along the way, a tunic here, a mantle there, a pair of breeches and a cowled cloak, even an old iron breastplate. She looked more comfortable dressed as a man, but nothing would ever make her look handsome. Nor happy. Once out of Harren Hall, her usual pig-head stubbornness had soon reasserted itself. I want my arms and armor back, she had insisted. Oh, by all means, let us have you back in steel, Jamie replied. A helm especially. We'll all be happier if you keep your mouth shut and your visor down. That much Brienne could do, but her sullen silences soon began to fray his good humor, almost as much as Kyburn's endless attempts to be ingratiating. I never thought I would find myself missing the company of Cleos Frey, God's help me. He was beginning to wish he had left her for the bear after all. King's Landing, Jamie announced when he found her. Our journey's done, my lady. You've kept your vow and delivered me to King's Landing, all but a few fingers and a hand. Brienne's eyes were listless. That was only half my vow. I told Lady Caitlin I would bring her back her daughters, or Sansa at the least. And now... She never met Rob Stark, yet her grief for him runs deeper than mine for Joff. Or perhaps it was Lady Caitlin she mourned. They had been at Brindlewood when they had that news from a red-faced tub of a knight named Sir Bertram Beesbury, whose arms were three beehives on a field striped black and yellow. A troop of Lord Piper's men had passed through Brindlewood only yesterday, Beesbury told them, rushing to King's Landing beneath a peace banner of their own. With the young wolf dead, Piper saw no point of fighting on. His son is captive at the twins. Brienne gaped like a cow about to choke in her cud, so it fell to Jamie to draw out the tale of the Red Wedding. Every great lord has unruly bannermen who envy him his place, he told her afterward. My father had the Reigns and Tarbex, the Tyrells of the Florence. Hoster Tully had Walder Frey. Only strength keeps such men in their place. The moment they smell weakness... During the Age of Heroes, the Boltons used to flay the Starks and wear their skins as cloaks. She looked so miserable that Jamie almost found himself wanting to comfort her. Since that day, Brienne had been like one half-dead. Even calling her wench failed to provoke any response. The strength is gone from her. A woman had dropped a rock on Robin Riger, battled a bear with a tourney sword, bitten off Vargo Howitt's ear, and fought Jamie to exhaustion. But she was broken now. Done. I'll speak to my father about returning you to Tarth, if it please you, he told her. Or, if you would rather stay, I could perchance find some place for you at court. As a lady companion to the queen, she said dully. Jamie remembered the sight of her in that pink satin gown and tried not to imagine what his sister might say of such a companion. Perhaps a post with a city watch. I will not serve with oath-breakers and murderers. And why did you ever bother putting on a sword? He might have said, but he bit back the words. As you will, Brienne. One-handed, he wheeled his horse about and left her. The gate of the gods was open when they reached it, but two dozen wains were lined up along the roadside, loaded with casks of cider, barrels of apples, bales of hay, and some of the biggest pumpkins Jamie had ever seen. 
Almost every wagon had its guards, men-at-arms wearing the badges of small lordlings, cell swords in mail and boiled leather, sometimes only a pink-cheeked farmer's son clutching a homemade spear with a fire-hardened point. Jamie smiled at them all as he trotted past. At the gate the gold cloaks were collecting coin from each driver before waving the wagons through. "'What's this?' Steel Shanks demanded. "'They got to pay for the right to sell inside the city.' by command of the king's hand and the master of coin. Jamie looked at the long line of wains, carts, and laden horses. If they still line up to pay, there's good coin to be made here now that the fighting's done, the miller in the nearest wagon told them cheerfully. It's the Lannisters hold the city now, old Lord Tywin of the Rock. They say he shits silver. Gold, Jamie corrected dryly, and Littlefinger minced the stuff from goldenrod, I vow. The imp is master of coin now, said the captain of the gate, or was till they arrested him for murdering the king. The man looked at the northman over suspiciously. Who are you, lot? Lord Bolton's men come to see the king's hand. The captain glanced at Nage with his peace banner. Come to bend the knee, you mean. You're not the first. Go straight up to the castle and see you make no trouble. He waved them through and turned back to the wagons. If King's Landing mourned its dead boy king, Jamie would never have known it. On the street of seeds, a begging brother in threadbare robes was praying loudly for Joffrey's soul, but the passers-by paid him no more heed than they would a loose shutter banging in the wind. Elsewhere, milled the usual crowds, gold cloaks in their black mail, baker's boys selling tarts and breads and hot pies, whores leaning out of windows with their bodices half unlaced, gutters redolent of night soil. They passed five men trying to drag a dead horse from the mouth of an alley, and elsewhere a juggler spinning knives through the air to delight a throng of drunken Tyrell soldiers and small children. Riding down familiar streets with two hundred Northmen, a chainless maester and an ugly freak of a woman at his side, Jamie found he scarcely drew a second look. He did not know whether he ought to be amused or annoyed. They do not know me, he said to Steel Shanks as they rode through Cobbler Square. "'Your face has changed, and your arms as well,' the Northman said, "'and they have a new Kingslayer now.' The gates to the Red Keep were open, but a dozen gold cloaks armed with pikes barred the way. They lowered their points as Steel Shanks came trotting up, but Jamie recognized the white knight commanding them. "'Sir Merrin!' Sir Merrin Trant's droopy eyes went wide. "'Sir Jamie!' "'How nice to be remembered. Move these men aside.' It had been a long time since anyone had leapt to obey him quite so fast. Jamie had forgotten how well he liked it. They found two more king's guard in the outer ward, two who had not worn white cloaks when Jamie last served here. I like Circe to name me Lord Commander and then choose my colleagues without consulting me. Someone has given me two new brothers, I see, he said as he dismounted. We have that honor, sir. The knight of flowers shone so fine and pure in his white scales and silk that Jamie felt a tattered and tawdry thing by contrast. Jamie turned to Merrin Trant. Sir, you've been remiss in teaching our new brothers their duties. What duties? said Merrin Trant defensively. Keeping the king alive. How many monarchs have you lost since I left the city? Two, is it? Then Sir Balin saw the stump. Your hand? Jamie made himself smile. I fight with my left now. It makes for more of a contest. Where will I find my lord father? In the solar with Lord Tyrell and Prince Oberyn. Nice Tyrell and the Red Viper breaking bread together. Strange and stranger. Is the queen with them as well? No, my lord, Sir Balin answered. You'll find her in the sept, praying over King Juff. You! The last of the Northmen had dismounted, Jamie saw, and now Loras Tyrell had seen Brienne. Sir Loras. She stood stupidly, holding her bridle. Loras Tyrell strode toward her. Why, he said, you will tell me why. He treated you kindly, gave you a rainbow cloak. Why would you kill him? I never did. I would have died for him. You will, Sir Loras drew his long sword. It was not me. Amon Kui swore it was with his dying breath. He was outside the tent. He never saw. There was no one in the tent but you and Lady Stark. 
Do you claim that old woman could cut through hardened steel? There was a shadow. I know how mad it sounds, but I was helping Renly into his armor, and the candles blew out, and there was blood everywhere. It was Stannis, Lady Caitlin said. His, his shadow. I had no part in it on my honor. You have no honor. Draw your sword. I won't have it said that I slew you while your hand was empty. Jamie stepped between them. Put the sword away, sir. Sir Loras edged around him. Are you a craven as well as a killer, Brienne? Is that why you ran with his blood on your hands? Draw your sword, woman! Best hope she doesn't. Jimmy blocked his path again. Or it's like to be your corpse we carry out. The wench is as strong as Gregor Clegane, though not so pretty. This is no concern of yours. Sir Loras shoved him aside. Jimmy grabbed the boy with his good hand and yanked him around. I am the Lord Commander of the King's Guard, you arrogant pup. Your commander, so long as you wear that white cloak. Now sheathe your bloody sword, or I'll take it from you and shove it up some place even Renly never found. The boy hesitated half a heartbeat, long enough for Sir Balan Swan to say, Do as the Lord Commander says, Loras. Some of the gold cloaks drew their steel then, and that made some dreadfort men do the same. Splendid, thought Jamie. No sooner do I climb down off my horse than we have a bloodbath in the yard. Sir Loras Tyrell slammed his sword back into its sheath. That wasn't so difficult, was it? I want her arrested, Sir Loras pointed. Lady Brienne, I charge you with the murder of Lord Renly Baratheon. For what it's worth, said Jamie, the wench does have honor. More than I have seen from you. And it may even be she's telling it true. I'll grant you she's not what you'd call clever, but even my horse could come up with a better lie if it was a lie she meant to tell. As you insist, however. Sir Balan, escort Lady Brienne to a tower cell and hold her there under guard, and find some suitable quarters for Steel Shanks and his men until such time as my father can see them. Yes, my lord. Brienne's big blue eyes were full of hurt as Balan Swan and a dozen gold cloaks led her away. You ought to be blowing me kisses, wench, he wanted to tell her. Why must they misunderstand every bloody thing he did? Ares. But all grows from Ares. Jamie turned his back on the wench and strode across the yard. Another knight in white armor was guarding the doors of the royal sept, a tall man with a black beard, broad shoulders, and a hooked nose. When he saw Jamie, he gave a sour smile and said, And where do you think you're going? Into the sept. Jamie lifted his stump to point. That one right there? I mean to see the queen. Her grace is in mourning. And why would she be wanting to see the likes of you? Because I'm her lover and the father of her murdered son, he wanted to say. Who in seven hells are you? A knight of the King's Guard, and you'd best learn some respect, cripple, or I'll have that other hand and leave you to suck up your porridge of a morning. I am the Queen's brother, sir. The White Knight thought that funny. Escaped, have you? And grown a bit as well, my lord? Her other brother, dolt. And the Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Now stand aside, or you'll wish you had. The dolt took a long look this time. Is it... Sir Jamie? He straightened. My pardons, my lord. I did not know you. I have the honor to be Sir Osmond Kettleblack. Where's the honor in that? I want some time alone with my sister. See that no one else enters the set, sir. If we're disturbed, I'll have your bloody head. Aye, sir, as you say. Sir Osmond opened the door. Circe was kneeling before the altar of the mother. Joffrey's beer had been laid out beneath a stranger who led the newly dead to the other world. The smell of incense hung heavy in the air, and a hundred candles burned, sending up a hundred prayers. Joffs liked to need every one of them, too. His sister looked over her shoulder. Who? she said then. Jamie? She rose, her eyes brimming with tears. Is it Truly you? She did not come to him, however. She has never come to me, he thought. She has always waited, letting me come to her. She gives, but I must ask. You should have come sooner, she murmured when he took her in his arms. Why couldn't you have come sooner to keep him safe, my boy? Our boy? I came as fast as I could. He broke from the embrace and stepped back a pace. It's war out there, sister. You look so thin, and your hair, your golden hair. The hair will grow back. Jamie lifted his stump. 
She needs to see. This won't. Her eyes went wide. The stocks. No, this was Varga Howitt's work. The name meant nothing to her. Who? The goat of Harrenhal, for a little while. Circe turned to gaze at Joffrey's beer. They had dressed the dead king in gilded armor, eerily similar to Jamie's own. The visor of the helm was closed, but the candles reflected softly off the gold, so the boy shimmered bright and brave in death. The candlelight woke fires in the rubies that decorated the bodice of Circe's morning dress as well. Her hair fell to her shoulders, undressed and unkempt. He killed him, Jamie, just as he'd warned me. One day, when I thought myself safe and happy, he would turn my joy to ashes in my mouth, he said. Tyrion said that? Jamie had not wanted to believe it. Kinslaying was worse than kingslaying in the eyes of gods and men. He knew the boy was mine. I loved Tyrion. I was good to him. Well, but for that one time. But the imp did not know the truth of that. Or did he? Why would he kill Joff? For a whore. She clutched his good hand and held it tight in hers. He told me he was going to do it. Joff knew. As he was dying, he pointed at his murderer. At our twisted little monster of a brother. She kissed Jamie's fingers. You'll kill him for me, won't you? You'll avenge our son. Jamie pulled away. He is still my brother. He shoved his stump at her face, in case she failed to see it. And I am in no fit state to be killing anyone. You have another hand, don't you? I am not asking you to best the hound in battle. Tyrion is a dwarf, locked in a cell. The guards would stand aside for you. The thought turned his stomach. I must know more of this, of how it happened. You shall, Cersei promised. There's to be a trial. When you hear all he did, you'll want him dead as much as I do. She touched his face. I was lost without you, Jamie. I was afraid the Starks would send me your head. I could not have borne that. She kissed him. A light kiss, the merest brush of her lips on his. But he could feel her tremble as he slid his arms around her. I am not whole without you. There was no tenderness in the kiss he returned to her, only hunger. Her mouth opened for his tongue. No, she said weakly when his lips moved down her neck. Not here. The septons. The others can take the septons. He kissed her again, kissed her silent, kissed her until she moaned. Then he knocked the candles aside and lifted her up onto the mother's altar, pushing up her skirts in the silken shift beneath. She pounded on his chest with feeble fists, murmuring about the risk, the danger, about their father, about the septons, about the wrath of gods. He never heard her. He undid his breeches and climbed up and pushed her bare white legs apart. One hand slid up her thigh and underneath her small clothes. When he tore them away, he saw that her moon's blood was on her, but it made no difference. Hurry, she was whispering now. Quickly, quickly now, do it now, do me now. Jamie, Jamie, Jamie. Her hands helped guide him. Yes, Circe said as he thrust. My brother, sweet brother, yes, like that, yes. I have you, you're home now, you're home now, you're home. She kissed his ear and stroked his short, bristly hair. Jamie lost himself in her flesh. He could feel Circe's heart beating in time with his own and the wetness of blood and seed where they were joined. But no sooner were they done than the queen said, Let me up, if we are discovered like this. Reluctantly he rolled away and helped her off the altar. The pale marble was smeared with blood. Jamie wiped it clean with a sleeve, then bent to pick up the candles he had knocked over. Fortunately, they had all gone out when they fell. If the sept had caught fire, I might never have noticed. This was folly, Circe pulled her gown straight. With father in the castle, Jamie, we must be careful. I am sick of being careful. The Targaryens wed brother to sister. Why shouldn't we do the same? Marry me, Cersei. Stand up before the realm and say it's me you want. We'll have our own wedding feast and make another son in place of Joffrey. She drew back. That's not funny. Do you hear me chuckling? Did you leave your wits at River Run? Her voice had an edge to it. Tommen's throne derives from Robert. You know that. He'll have Casterly Rock. Isn't that enough? Let father sit the throne. All I want is you. He made to touch her cheek. Old habits die hard, and it was his right arm he lifted. Circe recoiled from his stump. Don't! Don't talk like this. You're scaring me, Jamie. Don't be stupid. 
One wrong word and you'll cost us everything. What did they do to you? They cut off my hand. No, it's more. You're changed. She backed off a step. We'll talk later. On the morrow, I have Sansa Stark's maids in a tower cell. I need to question them. You should go to father. I crossed a thousand leagues to come to you and lost the best part of me along the way. Don't tell me to leave. Leave me, she repeated, turning away. Jamie laced up his breeches and did as she commanded. Weary as he was, he could not seek a bed. By now his lord father knew that he was back in the city. The Tower of the Hand was guarded by Lannister household guards, who knew him at once. The guards are good to give you back to us, sir, one said as he held the door. The guards had no part in it. Caitlin Stark gave me back, her and the Lord of the Dreadfort. He climbed the stairs and pushed into the solar unannounced, to find his father sitting by the fire. Lord Tywin was alone, for which Jamie was thankful. He had no desire to flaunt his maimed hand for Mace Tyrell or the Red Viper just now, much less the two of them together. Jamie, Lord Tywin said, as if they'd last seen each other at breakfast. Lord Bolton led me to expect you earlier. I had hoped you'd be here for the wedding. I was delayed. Jamie closed the door softly. My sister out to dinner herself, I'm told. Seventy-seven courses and a regicide. Never a wedding like it. How long have you known I was free? The eunuch told me a few days after your escape. I sent men into the Riverlands to look for you. Gregor Clegane, Samuel Spicer, the Brothers Plum. Varys put out the word as well, but quietly. We agreed that the fewer people who knew you were free, the fewer would be hunting you. Did Varys mention this? He moved closer to the fire to let his father see. Lord Tywin pushed himself out of his chair, breath hissing between his teeth. Who did this? If Lady Caitlin thinks— Lady Caitlin held a sword to my throat and made me swear to return her daughters. This was your goat's work. Vargo Hoet, the Lord of Harrenhal. Lord Tywin looked away, disgusted. No longer. Sir Gregor's taken the castle. The sellswords deserted their erstwhile captain almost to a man, and some of Lady Wentz's old people opened a postern gate. Clegane found Howitt sitting alone in the hall of a hundred hearths, half mad with pain and fever from a wound that festered. His ear, I'm told. Jamie had to laugh. Too sweet, his ear. He could scarcely wait to tell Brienne, though the winch wouldn't find it half so funny as he did. Is he dead yet? Soon. They have taken off his hands and feet, but Clegane seems amused by the way the cohoric slobbers. Jamie's smile curdled. What about his brave companions? The few who stayed at Harrenhal are dead. The others scattered. They'll make for ports, I warrant, or try and lose themselves in the woods. His eyes went back to Jamie's stump, and his mouth grew taut with fury. We'll have their heads, every one. Can you use a sword with your left hand? I can hardly dress myself in the morning. Jamie held up the hand in question for his father's inspection. Four fingers, a thumb, much like the other. Why shouldn't it work as well? Good. His father sat. That is good. I have a gift for you, for your return. After Varys told me, unless it's a new hand, let it wait. Jamie took the chair across from him. How did Joffrey die? Poison. It was meant to appear as though he choked on a morsel of food. But I had his throat slit open, and the maesters could find no obstruction. Cersei claims that Tyrion did it. Your brother served the king the poisoned wine with a thousand people looking on. That was rather foolish of him. I have taken Tyrion's squire into custody, his wife's maids as well. We shall see if they have anything to tell us. Sir Adam's gold cloaks are searching for the Stark girl, and Varys has offered a reward. The king's justice will be done. The king's justice. You would execute your own son? He stands accused of regicide and kinslaying. If he is innocent, he has nothing to fear. First we must needs consider the evidence for and against him. Evidence? In this city of liars, Jamie knew what sort of evidence would be found. Renly died strangely as well when Stannis needed him to. Lord Renly was murdered by one of his own guards, some woman from Tarth. That woman from Tarth is the reason I'm here. 
I tossed her into a cell to appease Sir Loras, but I'll believe in Winley's ghost before I believe she did him any harm. But Stannis, it was poison that killed Joffrey, not sorcery. Lord Tywin glanced at Jamie's stump again. You cannot serve in the King's Guard without a sword hand. I can, he interrupted, and I will. There's precedent. I'll look in the white book and find it, if you like. Crippled or whole, a knight of the King's Guard serves for life. Cersei ended that when she replaced Sir Baristan on grounds of age. A suitable gift to the faith will persuade the High Septon to release you from your vows. Your sister was foolish to dismiss Selmy, admittedly, but now that she has opened the gates, someone needs to close them again. Jamie stood. I am tired of having high-born women kicking pails of shit at me, father. No one ever asked me if I wanted to be Lord Commander of the King's Guard, but it seems I am. I have a duty. Do, do. Lord Tywin rose as well. A duty to House Lannister. You are the heir to Casterly Rock. That is where you should be. Tommen should accompany you as your ward and squire. The Rock is where he'll learn to be a Lannister, and I want him away from his mother. I mean to find a new husband for Cersei. Oberyn Martell, perhaps, once I convince Lord Tyrell that the match does not threaten Highgarden. And it is past time you were wed. The Tyrells are now insisting that Margaery be wed to Tommen, but if I were to offer you instead— No! Jimmy had heard all that he could stand. No, more than he could stand. He was sick of it, sick of lords and lies, sick of his father, his sister, sick of the whole bloody business. No, 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 no! How many times must I say no before you'll hear it? Oberyn Martell? The man's infamous, and not just for poisoning a sword. He has more bastards than Robert and beds with boys as well. And if you think for one misbegotten moment that I would wed Joffrey's widow— Lord Tyrell swears the girl still maiden. She can die a maiden, as far as I'm concerned. I don't want her, and I don't want your rock. You are my son. I am a knight of the King's Guard, the Lord Commander of the King's Guard, and that's all I mean to be. Firelight gleamed golden in the stiff whiskers that framed Lord Tywin's face. A vein pulsed in his neck, but he did not speak, and did not speak, and did not speak. The strained silence went on until it was more than Jamie could endure. Father, he began, you are not my son. Lord Tywin turned his face away. You say you are the Lord Commander of the King's Guard, and only that? Very well, sir. Go do your duty. Davos their voices rose like cinders, swirling up into purple evening sky. Lead us from the darkness, O my lord, fill our hearts with fire, so we may walk your shining path. The night fire burned against the gathering dark, a great bright beast whose shifting orange light threw shadows twenty feet tall across the yard. All along the walls of Dragonstone the army of gargoyles and grotesques seemed to stir and shift. Davos looked down from an arched window in the gallery above. He watched Melisandre lift her arms as if to embrace the shivering flames. The Lord, she sang in a voice loud and clear, you are the light in our eyes, the fire in our hearts, the heat in our loins. Yours is the sun that warms our days, yours the stars that guard us in the dark of night. Lord of light, defend us. The night is dark and full of terrors. Queen Selyse led the responses, her pinched face full of fervor. King Stannis stood beside her, jaw clenched hard, the points of his red-gold crown shimmering whenever he moved his head. He is with them, but not of them, Davos thought. Princess Shireen was between them, the mottled gray patches on her face and neck almost black in the firelight. Lord of light, protect us, the queen sang. The king did not respond with the others. He was staring into the flames. Davos wondered what he saw there. Another vision of the war to come? Or something closer to home? The Lord who gave us breath, we thank you, sang Melisandre. The Lord who gave us day, we thank you. We thank you for the sun that warms us, Queen Elise and the other worshippers replied. We thank you for the stars that watch us. We thank you for our hearths and for our torches. 
that keep the savage dark at bay. There were fewer voices saying the responses than there had been the night before, it seemed to Davos. Fewer faces flushed with orange light about the fire. But would there be fewer still on the morrow? Or more? The voice of Sir Axel Florent rang loud as a trumpet. He stood barrel-chested and bandy-legged, the firelight washing his face like a monstrous orange tongue. Davos wondered if Sir Axel would thank him after. The work they did tonight might well make him the king's hand, as he dreamed. Melisandre cried, We thank you for Stannis, by your grace, our king. We thank you for the pure white fire of his goodness, for the red sword of justice in his hand, for the love he bears his leal people. Guide him and defend him, Relor, and grant him strength to smite his foes. Grant him strength, answered Queen Selyse, Sir Axel, Devon, and the rest. Grant him courage, grant him wisdom. When he was a boy, the Septons had taught Davos to pray to the crone for wisdom, to the warrior for courage, to the smith for strength. But it was the mother he prayed to now, to keep his sweet son Devon safe from the red woman's demon god. Lord Davos, we'd best be about it, Sir Andrew touched his elbow gently. My lord? The title still rang queer in his ears, yet Davos turned away from the window. Aye, it's time. Stannis, Melisandre, and the Queen's men would be at their prayers an hour or more. The Red Priests lit their fires every day at sunset to thank Belor for the day just ending, and beg him to send his son back on the morrow to banish the gathering darkness. A smuggler must know the tides and when to seize them. That was all he was at the end of the day, Davos the smuggler. His maimed hand rose to his throat for his luck and found nothing. He snatched it down and walked a bit more quickly. His companions kept pace, matching their strides to his own. The bastard of Night Song had a pox-ravaged face and an air of tattered chivalry. Sir Gerald Gower was broad, bluff, and blond. Sir Andrew Estermont stood a head taller, with a spade-shaped beard and shaggy brown eyebrows. They were all good men in their own ways, Davos thought, and they will all be dead men soon if this night's work goes badly. Fire is a living thing, the red woman told him, when he asked her to teach him how to see the future in the flames. It is always moving, always changing, like a book whose letters dance and shift even as you try to read them. It takes years of training to see the shapes beyond the flames, and more years still to learn to tell the shapes of what will be from what may be or what was. Even then it comes hard. Hard! You do not understand that, you men of the sunset lands. Davos asked her then how it was that Sir Axel had learned the trick of it so quickly. But to that she only smiled enigmatically and said, Any cat may stare into a fire and see red mice at play. He had not lied to his king's men about that or any of it. The red woman may see what we intend, he warned them. We should start by killing her, then urged Lewis, the fishwife. I know a place where we could waylay her, four of us with sharp swords. You doom us all, said Davos. Maester Cresson tried to kill her, and she knew at once. From her flames, I'd guess. It seems to me that she is very quick to sense any threat to her own person, but surely she cannot see everything. If we ignore her, perhaps we might escape her notice. There is no honor in hiding and sneaking, objected Sir Tristan of Tally Hill, who had been a sunglass man before Lord Gunther went to Melisandre's fires. Is it so honorable to burn? Davos asked him. You saw Lord Sunglass die, is that what you want? I don't need men of honor now, I need smugglers. Are you with me or no? They were. Gods be good, they were. Maester Pylos was leading Edric Storm through his sums when Davos pushed open the door. Sir Andrew was close behind him. The others had been left to guard the steps and cellar door. The maester broke off. That will be enough for now, Edric. The boy was puzzled by the intrusion. Lord Davos, Sir Andrew, we were doing sums. Sir Andrew smiled. I hated sums when I was your age, cause. I don't mind them so much. I like history best, though. It's full of tales. Edric? said Maester Pylos. Run and get your cloak now. You are to go with Lord Davos. I am? 
Edric got to his feet. Where are we going? His mouth set stubbornly. I won't go pray to the Lord of Light. I am a warrior's man, like my father. We know, Davos said. Come, lad, we must not dawdle. Edric donned a thick hooded cloak of undyed wool. Maester Pylos helped him fasten it and pulled the hood up to shadow his face. Are you coming with us, Maester? the boy asked. No. Pylos touched the chain of many metals he wore about his neck. My place is here on Dragonstone. Go with Lord Davos now, and do as he says. He is the king's hand, remember. What did I tell you about the king's hand? The hand speaks with the king's voice. The young maester smiled. That's so. Go now. Davos had been uncertain of Pylos. Perhaps he resented him for taking old Crescent's place. But now he could only admire the man's courage. This could mean his life as well. Outside the maester's chambers, Sir Gerald Gower waited by the steps. Edric Storm looked at him curiously. As they made their descent, he asked, Where are we going, Lord Davos? To the water. A ship awaits you. The boy stopped suddenly. A ship? One of Salador Sands. Salar is a good friend of mine. I shall go with you, cousin, Sir Andrew assured him. There's nothing to be frightened of. I am not frightened, Edric said indignantly. Only, is Shireen coming too? No, said Davos. The princess must remain here with her father and mother. I have to see her then, Edric explained, to say my farewells, otherwise she'll be sad. Not so sad as if she sees you burn. There is no time, Davos said. I will tell the princess that you were thinking of her, and you can write her when you get to where you're going. The boy frowned. Are you sure I must go? Why would my uncle send me from Dragonstone? Did I displease him? I never meant to. He got that stubborn look again. I want to see my uncle. I want to see King Stannis. Sir Andrew and Sir Gerald exchanged a look. There's no time for that, cousin, Sir Andrew said. I want to see him, Edric insisted louder. He does not want to see you. Davos had to say something to get the boy moving. I am his hand, I speak with his voice. Must I go to the king and tell him that you would not do as you were told? Do you know how angry that will make him? Have you ever seen your uncle angry? He pulled off his glove and showed the boy the four fingers that Stannis had shortened. I have. It was all lies. There had been no anger in Stannis Baratheon when he cut the ends off his onion knight's fingers. Only an iron sense of justice. But Edric Storm had not been born then, and could not know that. And the threat had the desired effect. He should not have done that the boy said, but he let Davos take him by the hand and draw him down the steps. The bastard of Night Song joined them at the cellar door. They walked quickly across a shadowed yard and down some steps under the stone tail of a frozen dragon. Lewis the fishwife and Omer Blackberry waited at the postern gate, two guards bound and trussed at their feet. The boat? Davos asked them. Merch there, Lewis said. Four oarsmen. The galley is anchored just past the point. Mad Prendos. Davos chuckled. A ship named after a madman. Yes, that's fitting. Sala had a streak of the pirate's black humor. He went to one knee before Edric Storm. I must leave you now, he said. There's a boat waiting to row you out to a galley, and it's off across the sea. You are Robert's son, so I know you will be brave, no matter what happens. I will, only— The boy hesitated. Think of this as an adventure, my lord. Davos tried to sound hale and cheerful. It's a star of your life's great adventure. May the warrior defend you. And may the father judge you justly, Lord Davos. The boy went with his cousin, Sir Andrew, out the postern gate. The others followed, all but the bastard of night song. May the father judge me justly, Davos thought ruefully. But it was the king's judgment that concerned him now. These two? asked Sir Roland of the guards when he had closed and barred the gate. Drag them into a cellar, said Davos. You can cut them free when Edric's safely underway. The bastard gave a curt nod. There were no more words to say. The easy part was done. Davos pulled his glove on, wishing he had not lost his luck. He had been a better man and a braver one with that bag of bones around his neck. He ran his shortened fingers through thinning brown hair and wondered if it needed to be cut. He must look presentable when he stood before the king. Dragonstone had never seemed so dark and fearsome. He walked slowly, his footsteps echoing off black walls and dragons. Stone dragons who will never wake, I pray. 
The stone drum loomed huge ahead of him. The guards at the door uncrossed their spears as he approached. Not for the Onion Knight, but for the King's Sand. Davos was the hand going in at least. He wondered what he would be coming out. If I ever do. The steps seemed longer and steeper than before, or perhaps it was just that he was tired. The mother never made me for tasks like this. He had risen too high and too fast and up here on the mountain the air was too thin for him to breathe. As a boy he'd dreamed of riches, but that was long ago. Later, grown, all he had wanted was a few acres of good land, a hall to grow old in, a better life for his sons. The blind bastard used to tell him that a clever smuggler did not overreach, nor draw too much attention to himself. A few acres, a timbered roof, a sare before my name. I should have been content. If he survived this night, he would take Devon and sail home to Cape Wrath and his gentle Maria. We will grieve together for our dead sons, raise the living ones to be good men, and speak no more of kings. The chamber of the painted table was dark and empty when Davos entered. The king would still be at the night fire with Melisandre and the queen's men. He knelt and made a fire in the hearth to drive the chill from the round chamber and chase the shadows back into their corners. Then he went around the room to each window in turn, opening the heavy velvet curtains and unlatching the wooden shutters. The wind came in strong with the smell of salt and sea, and pulled at his plain brown cloak. At the north window he leaned against the sill for a breath of the cold night air, hoping to catch a glimpse of mad Prendos raising sail. But the sea seemed black and empty as far as the eye could see. Is she gone already? He could only pray that she was, and the boy with her. A half-moon was sliding in and out amongst thin high clouds, and Davos could see familiar stars. There was the galley, sailing west. There the crone's lantern, four bright stars that enclosed a golden haze. The clouds hid most of the ice dragon, all but the bright blue eye that marked due north. The sky is full of smuggler stars. They were old friends, those stars. Davos hoped that meant good luck. But when he lowered his gaze from the sky to the castle ramparts, he was not so certain. The wings of the stone dragons cast great black shadows in the light from the night fire. He tried to tell himself that they were no more than carvings, cold and lifeless. This was their place once, a place of dragons and dragon lords, the seat of House Targaryen. The Targaryens were the blood of old Valyria. The wind sighed through the chamber, and in the hearth the flames gusted and swirled. He listened to the logs crackle and spit. When Davos left the window, his shadow went before him, tall and thin, and fell across the painted table like a sword. And there he stood for a long time, waiting. He heard their boots on the stone steps as they ascended. The king's voice went before him. "'There's not three, he was saying. Three is three came Alessandra's answer. I swear to you, your grace, I saw him die and heard his mother's wail. In the night, friar. Stannis and Alessandra came through the door together. The flames are full of tricks. What is, what will be, what may be, you cannot tell me for a certainty. Your grace, Davos stepped forward. Lady Melisandre saw it true. Your nephew Joffrey is dead. If the king was surprised to find him at the painted table, he gave no sign. Oh, Davos, he said, he was not my nephew, though for years I believed he was. He choked on a morsel of food at his wedding feast, Davos said. It may be that he was poisoned. He is the third, said Melisandre. I can count, woman. Stannis walked along the table, past Old Town and the Arbor, up toward the Shield Islands and the mouth of the Mander. Weddings have become more perilous than battles, it would seem. Who was the poisoner, is it known? His uncle, it said, the imp. Stannis ground his teeth. A dangerous man. I learned that on the Blackwater. How do you come by this report? Well, uh, the Sini still trade at King's Landing. Salador Sun has no reason to lie to me. I suppose not. The king ran his fingers across the table. Joffrey. I remember once this kitchen cat the cooks were wont to feed her scraps and fish heads. One told the boy that she had kittens in her belly, thinking he might want one. Joffrey opened up the poor thing with a dagger to see if it were true. 
When he found the kittens, he brought them to sell to his father. Robert hit the boy so hard, I thought he'd killed him. The king took off his crown and placed it on the table. Dwarf or leech, this killer served the kingdom well. They must send for me now. They will not, said Melisandre. Joffrey has a brother. Tommen, the king said the name grudgingly. They will crown Tommen and rule in his name. Stannis made a fist. Tommen is gentler than Joffrey, but born of the same incest. Another monster in the making. Another leech upon the land. Westeros needs a man's hand and not a child's. Melisandre moved closer. Save them, sire. Let me wake the stone dragons. Three is three. Give me the boy. I drink storm, Debar said. Stannis rounded on him in a cold fury. I know his name. Spare me your reproaches. I like this no more than you do, but my duty is to the realm. My duty... He turned back to Melisandre. You swear there is no other way. Swear it on your life, for I promise you shall die by inches if you lie. You are he who must stand against the other, the one whose coming was prophesied five thousand years ago. The Red Comet was your herald. You are the prince that was promised, and if you fail, the world fails with you. Melisandre went to him, her red lips parted, her ruby throbbing. Give me this boy, she whispered, and I will give you your kingdom. He can't, said Davos. Edric Storm is gone. Gone? Stannis turned. What do you mean, gone? He is aboard a Lucini galley, safely out to sea. Davos watched Melisandre's pale, heart-shaped face. He saw the flicker of dismay there, the sudden uncertainty. She did not see it. The king's eyes were dark, blue bruises in the hollows of his face. The bastard was taken from Dragonstone without my leave. A galley, you say? If that Lucine pirate thinks to use the boy to squeeze gold for me... This is your hand's work, sire. Melisandre gave Davos a knowing look. You will bring him back, my lord. You will. The boy is out of my reach, said Davos, and out of your reach as well, my lady. Her red eyes made him squirm. I should have left you to the dark, sir. Do you know what you have done? My duty. Some might call it treason. Stannis went to the window to stare out into the night. Is he looking for the ship? I raised you up from dirt, Davos. He sounded more tired than angry. Was loyalty too much to hope for? Four of my sons died for you in the Blackwater. I might have died myself. You have my loyalty always. Davos Seaworth had thought long and hard about the words he said next. He knew his life depended on them. Your Grace, you made me swear to give you honest counsel and swift obedience, to defend your realm against your foes, to protect your people. Is not Edric Storm one of your people? One of those I swore to protect? I kept my oath. How could that be treason? Stannis ground his teeth again. I never asked for this crown. Gold is cold and heavy on the head. But so long as I am the king, I have a duty. If I must sacrifice one child to the flames to save a million from the dark, sacrifice is never easy, Davos. For it is no true sacrifice. Tell him, my lady. Melisandre said, Azor, a high tempered light bringer with the heart's blood of his own beloved wife. If a man with a thousand cows gives one to God, that is nothing. But a man who offers the only cow he owns. She talks of cows, Davos told the king. I am speaking of a boy, your daughter's friend, your brother's son. A king's son, with the power of king's blood in his veins. Melisandre's ruby glowed like a red star at her throat. Do you think you've saved this boy, Onion Knight? When the long night falls, Edric Storm shall die with the rest wherever he is hidden. Your own sons as well. Darkness and cold will cover the earth. You meddle in matters you do not understand. There's much I don't understand, Davos admitted. I have never pretended elsewise. I know the seas and rivers, the shapes of the coasts where the rocks and shoals lie. 
I know hidden coves where a boat can land unseen, and I know that a king protects his people. Or he is no king at all. Stannis's face darkened. Do you mock me to my face? Must I learn a king's duty from an onion smuggler? Davos knelt. If I have offended, take my head. I'll die as I lived, your loyal man. But hear me first. Hear me for the sake of the onions I brought you and the fingers you took. Stannis slid Lightbringer from its scabbard. Its glow filled the chamber. Say what you will, but say it quickly. The muscles in the king's neck stood out like cords. Davos fumbled inside his cloak and drew out the crinkled sheet of parchment. It seemed a thin and flimsy thing, yet it was all the shield he had. A king's hand should be able to read and write. Mr. Pylos has been teaching me. He smoothed the letter flat upon his knee and began to read by the light of the magic sword.